Wow. Hi, Rich. It's eight oh, o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm very well. Eight o'clock in the morning in the UK. And uh, we're going to have Anti Chafee join us shortly. Uh, just for everybody that's uh, tuning in. Um, if you're watching the playback, I need to get this right at the beginning. We've had to split it into three bits on YouTube, all right? And in my uh, link tree, there is links to all the three bits. And also, every single video's description has the links to three bits. So, yeah, Rich, uh, or Richard Smith, the Keto Pro, do you want to introduce yourself? Good morning, Stephen Thomas. How are you this morning? I well, I'm very good. Yeah. Bright eyed and bushy tail, 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Yeah, um, Richard Smith, nutritionist, uh, founder of the Keto Pro. Um, I don't know if many people know my backstory, but I've come from being type 2 diabetic, clinically obese, suffering with daily debilitating migraines, chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety. Uh, and now, uh, similar story to Stephen, after adopting a ketogenic and carnivore lifestyle and completely changing my life, I now teach others to do the same. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work with the likes of Stephen and the people like Anthony Chafee, uh, amongst others. And I must say that, um, yeah, this is the first ever, to my knowledge, 24 hour live on Carnivore and Keto. So I am super excited, despite being um, early in the morning on, on, on a Sunday morning. I am yeah, re fired up and, uh, and ready to go. So I hope that's... Uh, a similar situation with you, Stephen, because we're in for for the long haul today, uh, a full twenty four hours. Uh, I don't know how my bum's going to be uh, feeling at the end, <laughs> at the end of this way, but uh, but yeah, looking forward. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. I mean, just for people that don't know me, uh, four years carnivore before that keto, before that low carb. So the low carb started nine years ago. One of the things that I've noticed about being carnivore, actually was the food freedom so if i was going to do something for 24 hours when i was high carb i would have been just basically um thinking oh i've got to eat i've got to drink i'd be constantly worried about all the different things i've got to do because it's 24 hours and i need to get three meals in this is when i was high carb uh i would have panicked the day before um but whereas carnivore it's like i can do 24 hours interesting richard there is is sitting i'm actually standing so um, I do have a secret weapon today, which is a chair, a sort of high chair, which is behind me. Um, but I, I feel maybe I'll be able to stand for 24 hours. But that's that's the thing with carnivore. It does make you look at food in a completely different way. It doesn't mean it's, it's bad or it's negative. It's just what it is. So we're just waiting for Anthony Chafee to join. It's 3 p.m., in Australia, in Perth, where he is. So um, we will be getting him on to do the questions that everyone's kindly, very kindly submitted. But uh, let's get Richard back on the screen because you don't want to see me yabbering on. Um, Nobody so yes. wants to see my ugly mug. No, but yeah, <laughs> it, uh, just just to reiterate a point that you made there, now, I was um, thinking yesterday in regards to what I can eat and timings and whether I should eat on screen and which wouldn't be a problem. I think that'll be good for, uh, for people to see the type of food that we eat. But to be honest, I'm thinking now that it, it may be a good opportunity to throw in uh, a good 24, 36 hour fast, uh, which <laughs> as you say, you know, we could comfortably do, you know, that that's uh, one of the, um, uh, the booties of us being keto and carnivore is we are never under pressure to consume food. We never feel hungry. Hey, Sabrina. Um, yeah, so this may be a good opportunity. Obviously, I, I, I haven't eaten this morning. Um, the last meal I consumed was was last night. So I may power through and, and just do uh, an extended fast. Um, but I could not ever contemplate doing this on carbohydrate. I would be crashing and burning. Uh, and coming back to a point you made about standing, yeah, I, I, you may see me uh, fluctuating <laughs> between the seat and standing as we go through throughout the day because uh, I don't think I'm built for sitting for, for a full 24 hours. But I like your backup plan, a nice high chair. Sounds yeah, good. yes. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like one of those old crooners. You know, when I sit on that chair, I'll be like, hey, everybody, uh, this isn't a fundraiser. No, this is not a fundraiser. Um, yeah, it's just it's just uh, talking about carnivore and getting lots and lots of people on. So it's nice that I popped up in somebody's feed, uh, which is uh, Bella. 
brat for you. Oh, and um, the man himself is going to appear. So shall we uh, put Sir Anthony, Dr. Chafee on? Let's have a look. <laughs> good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Richard, say hello. How are we doing, my man? Are you okay? Hey, good, man. Yeah, how are you? Yes, good, good. I did just reply to the message you sent on Insta. Apologies, a little hmm. bit delayed, but yeah, feel awesome, free to, to live stream. Feel free to live stream by all means. The more, the awesome. more we spread the message, the better, isn't it? So yeah, just, just, yeah. just for the viewers out there, to, uh, uh, Doctor Chief, he wanted to know if, if he if he could stream this on on his YouTube. But by all means, you know, as uh, uh, Stephen just said, this is a free event. It's educational. We're trying to spread the word on Carnival. So yeah, by all means, feel free to. Um, to, to share and and, uh, and stream away. It's not a fundraiser. That's uh, I just want to make sure everyone knows that. It's, it's nothing to do with that. It's just to do a 24-hour carnival conversation. Uh, as you can see from Richard's backdrop, you can talk about keto. In fact, that's the great thing about carnivore. Um, actually, we're not very much like a cult. If you want to have an avocado, you're not going to be sacked by the carnivore police. Um, but we will be talking mainly carnivore, but we will be talking low carb and keto if you want to talk about it. Um, it's 3 p.m. in Australia, in Perth, where uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee is. And I'm going to give him a little introduction unless he wants to do it himself. Oh, wh whatever whatever you prefer. Happy. Happy for whatever. Yeah, it's you see, this is why you're great, Anthony, because you're so laid back. Um, but for people that don't know him, firstly, you really should. And secondly, he's a medical doctor, formal professional rugby player, and he's giving a fresh leaf, leash of life to thousands of people around the world by professionally helping them shed weight and optimize health without any medication and helping to revitalize their lives and activity. So, yeah, an MD in medical science. Uh, right. So I've written this long introduction, but I think mm -hmm. if you don't know him, I'll be very surprised and it will come out. Former professional rugby player, lots of good things um, to say about Dr. Chafee. So, uh, fire away, Rich. Have you got any questions for him? Um, I think we've got lots lined up, haven't we? Um, have you got the list there? Uh, I have. You got right yeah. Yeah, Surely you've got something you want to ask to kick us off. Yeah. Um, do you want to kick off with one of the questions? Well, well, yeah, let's, let's, do a very, let's do a very basic question. I've got some very detailed ones. but um, So, Dr. Chafee, why, mm -hmm. why do you think carnivore is the optimal way to eat? Oh, well, I just think that's it's because that's our biologically appropriate species-specific diet. Like any animal in the wild, uh, they have very, very, we have very specific dietary requirements, just like a zebra or giraffe or any other animal would have. And, and when you don't meet those requirements, you can get very sick or when you're eating things that you don't have the specific, um, you know, bioengineering to detoxify and eliminate different sorts of uh, indwelling toxins, you can get very sick from that. So animals in the wild, they eat very, very specific diets, humans included. And we've been eating a very specific diet throughout uh, you know, our origins as humans. And we have diverged from that, especially in the last, you know, 50 to 100 years. And we have seen a marked decline in our health during that time. Now, people may say, well, our, our average life expectancy is actually going up. This means everyone's getting healthier. Uh, that's not true. We're actually getting much, much worse. The prevalence of these diseases is getting far more worse, far, far worse. And um, in, in fact, the life expectancy uh, was an issue before because of infant mortality. That's the issue. And these, these uh, you know, sort of more uh, primitive uh, cultures, if you want to call them that, that eat a more hunter-gatherer lifestyle, really just a hunter-gatherer, a hunter lifestyle. Um, you know, they say, well, you know, their life expectancy is really 60 years, like with the Inuit. Um, well, no, actually, that's that's because their infant mortality rate is actually very, very high. And when you're out in the in the Arctic Circle, uh, thousands of miles away from a major university hospital um, or or any sort of uh, uh, you know uh, maternity care center. You're, you're not going to be able to get the care that you need if your child is is sick or hurt and has all these other sorts of issues that, that they can run into in those extreme circumstances. And so kids die, unfortunately. And that's one of the ways that we've increased our life expectancy. But those people in those situations when dying of old age actually go way longer than we do uh, in a lot of cases. And so, you know, in some uh, cases far longer to the point that, that people don't believe them. You have some, you know, a uh, 102 year old lady 
uh, in the Nanette uh, tribe that are still herding caribou and out there, you know, working 14 hour days in the snow and the tundra. And she's like, yeah, I'm 102. And they're like, bullshit. That can't be true. She looks like she's 60. Well, she looks like she's 60 because metabolically she is. Uh, and she's as healthy or more healthy than 60 year old people in America or the UK. And that's simply because she's more metabolically healthy. Uh, but we know as geneticists, we're supposed to live 120 years on average, meaning that if you just stay out of your own way and don't mess up, you should make it to 120 years without doing anything special. So why are we dying in our 60s and 70s? Why is a life expectancy of 78? Oh, that's really good. That's good. No, that's horrible. That's middle-aged, right? And so these people are actually living that long. And um, and if you eat the way you're supposed to eat, you know, you can you can do that as well and be healthy as you're doing it. Yeah, that that's brilliant. See, what a great answer. So um, we do have some questions from people. Uh, this one is from... Uh, Joe, so I'm going to put the question hopefully up on the screen. <laughs> Take a lot of time. Paleo with a lot of meat, 10 years plus, carnivore one month, uh, 38 years. Um, it's one month, but anyway, he's 38 years, six foot three, 195 pounds. I did this for autoimmune issues, not weight loss. I have always been lean. Tips for gaining mass on carnivore? Um, yeah, well, you just need to eat. You need to eat more meat, and you need to uh, work out. So if you're if you're lifting weights, if you're um, you know sprinting, doing anaerobic workouts, you're going to be stimulating your your muscle growth. You're also going to be stimulating the production of testosterone and growth hormone, and suppressing cortisol. Whereas if you're doing a lot of cardio, it goes the other way around. So growth hormone, and testosterone get suppressed in men, and cortisol levels go up. So that's the the antithesis of laying down healthy, lean body mass. Um, and that's pretty much it. You know, you, you need to stimulate your body. You need to stimulate your muscles to grow. And then you need to provide the, the energy and nutrients that are required. A lot of people under eat on a carnivore diet. It's very easy to do that. Uh, you just feel very satiated and very satisfied. So you have to keep eating until meat stops tasting good. If you're still getting that positive feedback in your body saying, Hey, we want some more of that. Listen to it. Keep, keep giving it more. You might have to eat twice a day. Uh, don't force yourself, but just definitely, Give your body what it needs, and uh, you know. I see if uh, Richard agrees with that or has anything to add. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add in that uh, you and I recently recorded um, a podcast on athletic performance, which I think included yeah. building lean lean mass. Um, yeah, hundred uh, percent. I'm a firm believer in around sort of one gram uh, of protein per pound of lean body mass, and it's the activation of mTOR uh, that we need to uh, to elicit this. Um, uh, muscle protein synthesis so we need stimulation uh, as dr chafee says we need to be training uh, but we need adequate adequate protein the mtor reset is also very important so um what we can do be in keto or carnivore is we can tap into this mtor reset so typically what people from a carbohydrate high uh, background tend to do is consume carbohydrates all day long this will elicit an mTOR activation, which is continuous throughout the day because these, these guys are eating every two hours. But where we benefit from is the mTOR reset, uh, which typically takes about four hours. So if we were to train fasted, for example, now this is, is a, a dream situation, which doesn't fall in or fit to everyone's lifestyle. But if we were to train, for example, uh, weight trainer, 8 a.m., we elicit an mTOR activation. Um, so this is one spike. We could eat four hours later uh this is another m to activation four hours fall in that and four hours fall in that now we need three three grams of leucine in order to activate m to which works at anywhere between 30 to 50 grams of, of meat depending on the source um i'd be uh, i'd preference towards 50 to, to to make sure but doing this and consuming your last meal around 8 p.m would allow you to fast technically for 16 hours and elicit four m to activations which is um, four times more than a typical bodybuilder who's consuming food every two hours. Uh, and this is what uh, I've put down to my body's ability to gain mass so quickly early on in my career when I began bodybuilding. Uh, but quality nutrients, red meat preferenced. People tend to, to preference chicken. We need protein and fat. Protein and fat elicits uh, higher protein uh, muscle protein synthesis. Um, protein alone can do this with the three grams of leucine, but studies... Uh, as uh, Dr. Chafee and I highlighted in this uh, podcast, um, will elicit the, the response, but
but to further elicit muscle protein synthesis, we need protein with fat. We need to consume the protein as nature intended. Carbohydrates do not further elicit uh, muscle protein synthesis, but protein and fat does. Protein and fat is essential. So if you want to build muscle, protein and fat, particularly from red meat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think oh, I was that, gonna... oh, sorry, yeah. go on. Yeah, I was going to say, for those that don't really understand why maybe adding fat, there is an added bonus to fat, and that's the production of bile. If you keep your bile production up, believe it or not, that's not just helping absorb fat. That is definitely helping to absorb amino acids. So some people are a little little um, unsure about why we're saying fatty meat sometimes, because it's so ingrained that you've got to avoid fat. And all you're going to do is you're not going to gain muscle. You're just going to get fatter, and that's, that's not the case, um, unless you eat way too much fat and you go beyond your satiety which is is which is really tough that's the other thing it's very yeah. tough to overeat when it comes to fat it's not like carbohydrates i think the minnesota prison study which uh, which pretty much proved that you can overeat by carbohydrates that was an experiment with humans you know a captive audience you know no pun intended where they could eat half of the prison could eat as much as they like with carbohydrates and the other the other half could eat fats and proteins and i think the fats and proteins group they they overate over eight, the sort of estimated calorie intake for a day by about 800. But the carbohydrate group, it was about 10 times as much. So it's much easier to overeat on carbs. So don't be, don't be, don't fear the fat. That's all I was going to say. Yeah. It's also, it's also very difficult to absorb it as well. You know, if you eat a lot more, uh, you do need that bile to absorb the fat. You can, you can still absorb some, but it's, it's not as much. You, it's a very small percentage, you know, anywhere from like 10 to 15% of the fat past the bile. Um, that you can absorb. So you can absorb that. You can absorb if your if your body doesn't it runs out of bile. I mean, that's how much fat your body wants, right? So that's how much bile it's made for it. Uh, and then after that, you can still absorb some. Usually, like medium chain fatty acids are a bit easier for your body to absorb without bile, but uh, it's not that much. And so you really have to overdo it. And it's, first of all, it's not going to taste good. You're going to be sort of fighting yourself, and then you're also going to get you know, 85 to 90% of that fat uh, being excreted, which is going to give you explosive diarrhea, and that's not going to be fun. And so you're going to want to like just naturally pull back on that. You can do it, uh, but it's difficult. It's easier to, to, to um, you know, eat more protein, things like that, the lean sort of stuff. But you actually, you, you sort of have a limit on the amount of, of fat you can absorb as well. But you can certainly overeat on, on pretty much anything. It's just more difficult, much more difficult to do on a carnivore diet because first and foremost, it just starts tasting bad and it just start, you start, stop enjoying it. Um, and so you want to stop. Whereas with carbs, you get in that carb cycle where, oh my God, I'm hungry. I have to eat. I have to eat. I have to eat. And you eat and you're hungry an hour later because now your blood sugar's dropped and you know, you can't stimulate, um, lipolysis or proteolysis because your insulin's up. Right. So, uh, that's very easy to overeat as well. Um, I was going to ask, uh, Richard, you know, we were talking about those two spikes in mTOR. So you work out and you get that mTOR hit and then you want to wait four hours and then eat a big meal. So, you know, you know, there's always the, the, um, the idea that you want to eat directly after, you know, a big workout and hit that, you know, anabolic window. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. It's anabolic window. Yeah. It's, it's a myth. It, 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 I, I, again, my opinion in regards to the research that I've carried out, um, I'm, I'm sure you've come to the same conclusion. Um, so this is in regards to research and uh, personal experience. As long as we are consuming adequate amounts of protein throughout the day, that anabolic window is, is a myth. Um, it certainly didn't hinder me and it allowed me in order to build lean mass at, at an incredible rate. So to put this into perspective, um, you know, somebody who is supplementing with performance enhancing drugs, which is rampant within, within the bodybuilding community, uh, and, and this is the reason that I came away from it. I'm not, I'm not against it. I'm not against anyone who, who does. So I work with people who, who supplement. Uh, you know, this is personal preference, but this is something that I didn't want to do. Um, but typically, they can gain lean mass around uh, 0.8 pounds per month, which is around 10, 10 pounds of lean body mass per year. Yet, when you listen to people on these YouTube channels, they'll say they've 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 gained 90k of lean mass in a month, which is just ridiculous. Yes, you may have gained 30k of, of weight, but you certainly mm. haven't gained 30 kilograms of lean mass. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Even Ronnie Coleman, towards the end of his career, was saying that he used to gain maybe between four to five pounds and heavily supplemented. So if you can gain mm. 10 pounds of lean mass a year, you you are right at the top end. Um, I gained on average for the first four years around eight pounds of lean mass. Um, 
some some years you could argue it, it was 10 which is right at the top end and, and i put this down to the diet that i was living not just because i'm eating highly nutrient dense foods as in and red meats which um uh, contain fats as nature intended superior amino profile high levels of leucine which is the anabolic amino acid um but also um, you know, we're devoid of things like grains uh, and, and other. So I, quite early on, I was predominantly keto. I, I was eating um, lots of greens. Um, I, I used to do my spinach smoothies with my turmeric, um, which, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we, we now know that, uh, you know, that this is 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 far from optimal and, and probably quite damaging. But that's where I began my journey, but I was uh, abstaining heavily from grains, which are high in phytic acid and lectins, which block the absorption of these nutrients, amongst other things. Um, and further down my career and education, you know, I learned that a lot of these vegetables also contain, you know, phytohemagglutinin and uh, another phyto, uh, um, phytic acids, uh, uh, another toxins which prevent the body from absorbing nutrients. These foods are anti-nutrients. So the more that I gravitated into um an animal based lifestyle a meat based lifestyle the easier that it seemed for me to build muscle which goes against everything that the typical bodybuilder will, will do because bodybuilder diet is like pasta and chicken so you've got the lean chicken without the fat uh, mm. and then you've got um, the lectins and phytic acid from the pasta um which is absolutely counterintuitive and it just makes you wonder um how somebody who is genetically predispositioned to pack on muscle uh, you know, would do on a carnival lifestyle. I'm not a big person. I'm five foot nine. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quite short. I, I think uh, I'm not uh, big in regards to frame. Um, and I used to win on condition. So it was my um, it, almost an illusion on stage in regards to body composition and uh, and, and, and body fat percentage. Um, and that, that's what allowed me to, to achieve the things that I could. But my myostatin levels are naturally high within my body, which myostatin is a protein in the body that prevents you from building muscle. It's almost your body's safety mechanism tells you that, whoa, now you need to stop building muscle. Um, a lot of these muscle, you know, beasts on stage these days were heavily supplemented, have low myostatin um, and perhaps even take myostatin inhibitors. Uh, but it would be interesting to find somebody who is early on in their career, who is genetically predispositioned to pack on muscle, to live the carnival lifestyle and actually see if we can achieve, you know, these feats of um, uh, of uh, these mass monsters that do, you know, supplement it. And I believe that we can, um, you know, the things that we can achieve on this lifestyle go far beyond any expectation that you can possibly imagine unless you've lived the lifestyle you know, the three of us know the benefit from from doing so and from, from living this lifestyle and again that's why we're here today is to spread this word isn't it um you know we've, we've gone off track i think with with the bodybuilding thing again but it yes. um this comes back down to health and well-being isn't it um which brings me back to to a question for you know for for dr chafee um I'm guessing there are lots of people on you know on the show now who are already living the lifestyle. But what would your tips be for adopting the lifestyle? If you were starting from scratch, um, would you recommend somebody to begin going full carnivore? Would you increment it? Um, is 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 it okay to do both, or depending on the type of person you are? Uh, and what would you what would you implement? Uh, you know, in order to, to to make this progression at least into becoming carnivore. Well, I'm, I'm, I, my, my sort of frame of, of mind is, is more of one of, uh, you know, just go after it. You know, if you've made a decision, strike while the iron's hot, just do it. And, uh, and so that's what works for me. That's when I decided that, that, you know, plants were toxic and my professor said, you know, plants are trying to kill you. I'm like, right, I'm out. And I'm just not going to eat any plants after that. Uh, that works for me. Uh, and that works for a lot of people. I find that, that a lot of people, when they get that idea in their head and they want to they want to do it like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this. It's really, really beneficial if they just do it right then, you know, as, as sales people will tell you, you know, like a car salesman, someone comes on the lot and they're looking at a car and they're sort of interested in something. If, if they say, well, I'll think about it and I'll come back 95% of the time, they do not come back. And so you really need to get on board when your mind is like, Ooh, do I want to do this? You need to do it because most often that's when you'll have success. Now there, there are some people that are just, they're not like, oh, I wanna do this. They're like, oh God, I don't know. I mean, I, I want to, but 
you know, obviously that's someone coming at a different place. So like, okay, why don't, why don't we ratchet things down and, uh, and, and sort of, you know, and, and sort of ease our way into this. Um, you know, um, Maria Emmerich said that her, herself when she, she sort of came around this, um, you know, she came to keto first, uh, and was keto for a very long time and is, is really mostly carnivore now, but she, you know, um, you know, has, has some sort of plant stuff here and there, but it's predominantly animal based. She was saying that it, the type of person she was, if she just said, yeah, you can only eat meat, she'd be like, absolutely not. You know, that doesn't give me the options. I'm, I'm not going to be able to cook. I'm not going to be able to use any ingredients, like not going to do it. Um, and so you'll, you'll meet people like that. You know, I meet people in a special circumstance. People come to me when they want to do this and they, and they want some help and advice to get on this, or they're sick and they have a lot of health issues. Those are highly motivated people because, you know, they're are in a, in a tight spot and I can say, look, this, I think this will help you. They go, okay, look, whatever you suggest, I'm, I'm just going to do it, you know? And so I find that those people have a really good success of really just going, you know, hammering at home, going full on. You see this also in, um, smoking cessation and, and other sorts of drugs and alcohol. It, people do have a better time going cold Turkey and not easing off. You know, you have those people that oh, I've been cutting down smoking, I'm trying to quit. And they're, trying to quit for 20 years, you know, and then they're, and they're smoking more than they were before. And people go on methadone to help them try and quit heroin. And 20 years later, they're on a higher dose of methadone and still doing heroin. So it's like, you know, if you, if you just go cold at, at some point, if, even if you wean down, eventually you will have to stop. Right. And so why can't that just be today? Right. Um, so I find that that works well. And I, and if someone does decide that that's what they want to do, then um, I think you I think you go all in, you know, you, you toss out all the food in your house if you can, you know, if you're if you're have that luxury, you know, sometimes people are, are living with people that have no interest in following their footsteps. But you know, if you're in a position that you know, you're on your own, or your family is behind you and willing to do this with you, just throw it all out, you know, you know, throw the food out of the pantry, throw the st stuff out of the, the fridge, give it to someone that you don't like and want to eat poison, you know, whatever you want to do. You know, you can give it to them and get rid of it and uh, you don't need it in the house. You know, if you're, if you're going to try to just quit smoking or quit drinking, you don't just leave a bunch of cigarettes and booze around the house, you know, for two reasons. One, you, you want that out of there. You don't want the temptation out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and also number two, you know, if you're keeping it, well, well I spent money on that. I don't want to throw it away. And the next part of that sentence that you don't say is when I decide to go back to smoking or drinking, right? So you've already decided that you're going to go back to this. You've already set yourself up for failure. So you get rid of it, throw all that crap out. When the people go, well, I've just bought a whole bunch of groceries and, you know, and, and I'll, I'll use those up and then I'll do it. They never do it. They never do it. Again, that's, a, that's that 5% of people that actually come back to the, the car dealership. So, um, it's, it, it's much better to strike while the iron iron is hot. No, you know, if you've said, okay, this is what I want to do, you are never going to be more committed to that and than that moment right then. So you need to put yourself into a position that you can have as much success as possible. If you are going to say, okay, well, I'm going to ease my way into this. That's what's going to work better for me. Fine, but you need to have that in a graduated manner. You need to put, you need to get a calendar and mark a day. Today, I'm cutting out all carbs, grains, sugars, alcohol all of them. You know, the next week you put an X, I'm cutting out all seeds, legumes, and uh, oxalate, you know, high oxalate foods. The next week, you know, you're cutting out something else. And by, you know, week three, week four, it's like absolutely no plants, nothing but meat after this day. All right. And you need, you need those hard checkpoints. Oh, sometime next week I'll stop. You know, the diet starts tomorrow. The diet starts Monday. That's the, you know, it's the, the cliche sort of thing. It's always tomorrow. You know, I'll, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll love you tomorrow, right? It's, it's only a day away, but it never comes, you know, it's, you know, it's only today. So you need to mark on your calendar when that's going to happen and you need to action it. And, uh, and you know, you're only, you're only hurting yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's yourself that you have to hold yourself, you, you hold yourself accountable to yourself. Sometimes it's easier to be held accountable by other people that, like, well, I don't want to let, you know, this person down. Sometimes that's easier. So sometimes you can do it with, you know, your spouse, or, you know, a boyfriend, girlfriend, your kids just be like, Hey, why don't we, why don't we do this together? And then you keep each other strong. Hey, you know, let's not eat that. Oh, let's do this. So let, oh, how about we, instead of doing that, let's go to the gym together. Let's go on a, go on a walk or let's, you know, get a steak or something like that. So you can, you can have that support as well. But I, I personally like the cold Turkey, just get after method. 
Yeah, I think there's um, there's two kinds of people, isn't it? There's step change and incremental change. Mm -hmm. um, I've always seen myself as a step change, which is basically all mm -hmm. or nothing. Um, but I must admit that I did gravitate into this slowly because uh, I wasn't familiar with carnival per se. Um, you know, Keto came up to me in regards uh, into the early stages of my journey. Um, and I almost gravitated into it, thinking that I was doing things correctly. And I learned extra things as, as I went along, even, even until recently. Um, so I've been keto for 10, 11 years, which carnivore is a ketogenic state, by the way. Mm. So people tend to differ differentiate between the two. If you're in, if you're carnivore, you're ketogenic. Um, but there's different variations, isn't it? Um, no, I, I'd, I became carnivore, or what I regard as carnivore, maybe four, five years ago. But even then, I was still consuming things um, that contained plants. I mean, I, I've been a lover of coffee, for example, until recently. Um, so I mean, it's only in recent times that I take that. But it's through education because you, even though it sounds very simple, coffee comes from a plant. You don't actually think about it until because it's not something you're eating. It's a drink. So again, it's these education pieces. But I think it's an important point that you made there in regards to family members because. Um, a lot of clients that I work with find it incredibly difficult when they do this alone because their partner is consuming uh, a takeaway or some fast food or some junk. They will buy this food and it's in the cupboard um, and this food calls to you in the night. It screams to you because it, it, food addiction is a real thing. Now, I did um, a podcast recently with Dr. Jen Anwin, who's coming on uh, later this afternoon, um, in regards to food addiction. Now, food addiction is not recognized in the UK, at least, as an addiction. So we, we have gambling addiction, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, but food addiction, which is, in my opinion, the most damaging, is not recognized as an addiction. But this is uh, incredibly important because it affects the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters, which is these neurotransmitters that affect the way that we we think and feel it affects things like dopamine serotonin and when we're not getting these hits that we need uh, in our brain we begin to search them from other sources um you know we, we are uh, we've evolved to chase these dopamine hits and if we are not receiving them through the foods we eat or we, we're not receiving the correct signal we will look for these hits through foods that we consume and typically these are sugary treats so it is incredibly difficult to come away because food is an addiction. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't give that the, the recognition that it deserves. It, it is incredibly hard. So to do this alone without the support of a family member can be incredibly difficult. So what I find is that um, a lot of clients I work with tend to like the incremental approach. Um, the people who do better uh, are the families that do it together who as you say completely remove you know all literally pour the seed oils in the bin or or, or down the sink i don't know if you're allowed to do that can you can you pour seed oils on the mm -hmm. sink because it's not a, yeah. you know uh, it might be like a hazardous waste sort of thing which should yeah. tell you something about uh you know putting it in your body you know exactly. it's, it's yeah. like dangerous chemical disposal only then um yeah you definitely shouldn't be eating that nonsense and that's yeah. exactly what it is, yeah. High in an oxidized omega-6 called linoleic acid, mm -hmm. um, detrimental to, to, to our health. Which brings me on to, Steve, oh, did Richard, you want to talk about I've got, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, got I mean, list, I've got a list of things to throw at. Uh, you at have, I've got a list of questions <laughs> too. <laughs> not, not, not from me, by the way. Uh, just behind the scenes, just to tell, uh, tell you what I've been saying, a few people have said to me, why are you doing 24 hours? I said, well, have you ever heard Richard speak? You need 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, um, Anthony, Anthony's the same. Uh, yeah. I'm sure oh, no. you wouldn't disagree. We, uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, I think we could talk about uh, Keto Carnival for, uh, uh, for 24 hours. hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I just wanted to add a little bit that I tell all my clients is other ways of eating tend to be very negative, like don't eat this, don't eat that, don't do this. When you come over to carnivore, I think it's better for your subconscious mind. One of the things is to be positive. Don't wake up going, uh, I'm not going to have ice cream today. Wake up saying today, I'm going to eat some protein. Today, I'm going to have some fat. Today, I'm going to be carnivore. And if you think in a positive frame of mind, and I know it's corny, but uh, if you tell your brain not to think about pink elephants, you have to think about mm -hmm. pink elephants to do it. So it's a little tip there is just to sort of be very positive and um 
think in a more positive way. So today I'm going to have beef, today I'm going to have bacon, eggs, butter. That's going to be a great day. And I just think that can help people. And what you said about friends and family, uh, I've actually dealt with two people who are having big arguments with their partner. And if you're wanting to eat this way, and sadly, one of them actually is refusing to buy the food. So they've they become quite individual when it comes to food. And my advice was just stick at it. You will become the example. And it's very tough to say to somebody in six weeks or six months, hey, you know, you've lost a ton of weight. You're off your meds. Please don't eat like this. Because if that person truly wants to be with you, they're going to love that. So, yeah, um, if you don't mind, I'll just do a couple of the pre-submitted questions because people have been kind enough to do that. And we've got tons in the comments. I am trying to get to them all, but these answers are brilliant. So here's a nice easy one. This is from Roxana. Um, do you feel that dairy puts weight on? It can. Yeah. I mean, especially like milk and things like that, where you're going to have, uh, you know, enough lactose to raise your insulin. It's going to put you into a fat storage metabolism as, as opposed to a fat burning metabolism. And, uh, some people have an inflammatory Well, everyone's going to have a bit of an inflammatory response to casein, especially a one, uh, casein proteins. And, uh, and some people have a very large uh, inflammatory reaction to that. You're going to you know, retain water weight and uh, it's going to sort of mess you up in other ways, especially if you have autoimmune issues. Um, but, Regardless of all that, this is just something that, that we see. You know, we see a lot of people stall when they're using dairy. So, um, you know, people get it. You know, you hear the carnivore diet, and you know, you you just eating meat and drinking water, and like dairy, ooh, it's a bit of a gray area. You know, yeah, you can have some of it as a condiment, put like a slice of cheese on on a burger patty or something like that. But really, what you're eating, you're supposed to be eating meat. They hear that, oh, great, I can eat dairy, and they they just eat like just an absolute ton of dairy. And, uh, and then they're just, I was like, oh, I'm not really losing weight. In fact, I'm like putting on weight. You know, I lost like 20 pounds at first and now I put on like, you know, 15 pounds. Like, well, what the hell is going on? You ask them what they're eating and you're just eating just, just piles of dairy. Um, you know, our body chases nutrients, doesn't chase calories, you know? And so you, you need different nutrients from meat. Dairy is not a complete nu nutrition source. And so, um, you know, especially like pasteurized sort of things. And um, so, you know, your, your body's still going to need like the different nutrients from meat. And then you're going to be eating meat. A lot of people eat this, basically the same amount of meat that they do without the dairy, but they're also eating the dairy. And so you're just getting more, more than you need. And uh, it goes back to that sort of difficult to overeat, but you can do it sort of uh, part of, of, of this equation. And that's what, um, what I've noticed a lot of people when they're stalling, they're either still using artificial sweeteners uh, or dairy or maybe both. And, uh, you know, some of those every now and then, you know, your body can work through it, but it is something your body has to work through. And so, um, you know, I do find that people have difficulty with dairy and can, can definitely put on weight or, uh, and not, not good weight. You know, you're not putting on muscle mass, you know, you people will put on a bit more fat or, or find it more difficult to lose fat. There are other things in the equation too, though, you know, when people are working out, lifting weights, especially, uh, guys that get really, you know, into the gym because they feel so much better and they're just lifting weights, you know, four days a week. And they're like, Ooh, I'm stalling. I'm not really losing weight. Well, that's because you're putting on muscle and the muscle is offsetting the fat that you're losing. So, you know, just because you're not losing as much weight as you want, you know, it may not be, uh, because you're not losing fat. It may be because you're putting on muscle as well. But uh, definitely something to keep in mind. You can definitely eat, you know, you can definitely run into problems eating too much dairy, absolutely. And too much being more than a very little bit. You know, it's like more than a condiment. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you have a cheese platter and you're just eating chunks of cheese, too much. You know, if you're, if you're drinking, you know, multiple glasses of milk a day, too much. You know, and so you just, as a condiment to meat, you shouldn't have dairy on its own. Yeah, and the simp a simple thing about dairy is as well, it's odd, the odd chain fatty acids. You always end up with a free carbon fragment, which is a substrate that the liver loves to make glucose out of. So that's uh, one of the things I say about the, the dairy. Richard, you wanted to jump in there, didn't you? Yeah, only really quickly. I mean, it's uh, I look at, I know this sounds stupid, I, I quite often look at cheese and dairy as almost two separate things because of the way that it's made and treated with the enzymes, renin mm. and things. I think milk is highly problematic. Um, what I find is that real cheese, a lot of people uh, can get on with in, in small quantities. Um, milk for me is, is the biggest issue. And what I find and see in the Facebook groups uh, at the moment, uh, and in my group in particular, somebody mentioned about A2 milk, um, uh, you know, and raw milk being okay and things. And But what many people don't understand is that 
it still contains casein and it will still contain um uh, it will still cause intestinal permeability so even um and, and this comes back down to um uh the, 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 the oh my god what's the, what's the tribe uh in in africa my goodness it's um yeah so is it the hands the hads no it wasn't the hadza um it wasn't the hadza tribe um yeah i can't remember the tribe but basically no, no. one of the what was the that Masai uh, and the, yes the mass the, the Masai. so the Masai and the akakuyu are neighboring tribes aren't they um and the akakuyu who are, who are uh vegan or you know uh, predominantly vegetarian or vegan based and we have the Masai who are meat based um the Masai outperformed the akakuyu on every health level bone mm -hmm. mineral density muscle mass height strength age uh, everything apart from one metric which was intestinal permeability and that's because they still con uh, consumed unpasteurized a2 milk so uh, for me milk across the board is is a no-no um mm. even the a2 although a2 is better but then i i almost put cheese into a different category whereas you know i think it's okay to consume in in moderation but as you say you know it still contains uh casein morphine which is highly addictive more so in milk so uh, you know there's lots of reasons to abstain from from the milk but i do often put cheese into into a, a slightly different subsection i do consume cheese uh, real cheese uh not an awful lot of it but uh, you know it, it is uh, it's not something i can consume every day but it is something i'll consume you know uh, as you say as uh, as a condiment isn't it but it wouldn't make up a meal i wouldn't <laughs> You know, but um, but yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Anthony. But it, if, uh, I'd almost put them into into two separate yeah. categories to a to a degree. You know, no, I, I think you're right. You know, and and cheeses, you know, from especially like you know traditionally like fermented and 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 uh, grown cheeses or manufactured cheeses, whatever it is. You know, those, those are very different. You know, as as um, you know, a friend, uh, Dr. Bill Schindler talked about and he you know he's a professor of paleoanthropology and and archaeology and and you know he studies this sort of stuff and um and uh, and he was saying that you know when when babies are drinking breast milk it goes into their stomach and actually turns it curdles and actually turns into cheese and then they sort of break that down and and eat it so that's sort of that same process you know when, you, when you're adding sort of different sort of chemicals uh to uh basically turn milk into cheese, that's sort of what you're doing. Then you're eating that. It's much more bioavailable. It's much better for you. Um, babies are different than, than adults, obviously, but, um, but it's, I, I would I definitely think put those in two different categories. The fermented dairies are going to be fermented. Anything's are going to be better than the non-fermented anything. So, uh, except for maybe meat, I don't, I don't think you need to go rotting your meat and doing the high meat thing you know, teach their own. You want to do that. That's fine. Uh, maybe like just the bee's knees, but you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm good where I'm at. I'm feeling great. <laughs> I don't think I need to do that. Um, but, uh, uh, with the fermented dairy, uh, yeah, that, that can be very different. And, you know, and the bacteria and things like that will eat up, you know, the lactose or at least a lot of the lactose. And so if you're doing that in a traditional manner, uh, it's very different. The, um, you know, the, the Mongols, traditionally would, would drink fermented mare's milk or, or uh, use fermented mare's milk products. And, um, and you would think that because they, they use a lot of, you know, cow dairy or sorry, horse dairy, um, and then we just eat meat as well and drink the blood that uh, they probably be pretty used to lactose and things like that. No, they are not. They are some of the, the mo most lactose intolerant populations in the world uh almost all of them are, are lactose intolerant if not all of them and so uh it's because it's all fermented they, they do not come across lactose they're always coming it's always fermented and you know they've been doing that for a very very long time now is that the best thing that they could ever do i don't think so i think if you're getting if you're able to get enough fatty meat then that's obviously the ideal but um uh you know i do think that yeah fermented Fermented dairy is definitely in a different category than than unfermented and um, like milk and things like that. Yeah, yeah. that's a pretty just, just a so, sorry, Sim, just a touch base on one of the things you mentioned about the meat. That, <coughs> is that, um, you know, is that there would be an argument to go against aged meat because of the increase in oxidation and an increase in mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, linoleic acid content, isn't it? So, um, aged meats, I don't believe um, you know are as good for you as fresh. I think fresh is best. 
Um, that's why I consume all of my meat fresh. Um, yeah, the oxidation of the meat can, can cause issues, I guess, in, in the same way. Um, so I'm not a fan of aged meat. So I thought I'd uh, put that in there. You get more, you get more histamine, of course, when it's aged. More histamine, for sure. Yeah. 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 Just going to put another question up. Um, here we go. So just for the people watching who have submitted questions, um, the deal here is we've got 24 hours, okay? So um, we'll get round to it. And and Dr. Anthony Chafee has given us three hours of his time. Uh, you know, um, behind the scenes, if you don't know how this works, no money changes hands. We're all doing this because we want to do this, all right? So um, if we don't get to your question, we'll, uh, I mean, I'll collate them. I'll send them to, to Anthony and... Um, Maybe we'll just do another one, just to, like a mm. catch up, believe it or not, 24 hour plus or something we'll call yeah. it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I thought that uh, when the questions were literally flooding in, which is really nice for you guys out there that have done that, I thought we really are not going to have enough time. Uh, really. So let, here we go. So Peter's put six weeks on strict carnivore, suddenly inflammation markers right up and blood's low, RBC, et cetera, et cetera. Thoughts. Great question. Probably would need a little bit more information there on inflammation markers. Uh, how long have you been not eating carnivore? Because six weeks, yeah, you're going to see some changes. But anyway, that's for uh, Dr. Chafee. Any thoughts? Well, also, also, which inflammatory markers, you know, because there's some that, that are, you know, like, I mean, you know, high sensitivity, you know, CRP and that goes up. Okay. Well, that, that's high sensitivity. Sensitivity is right in the name. But, you know, there's other, other inflammatory markers, uh, you know, such as, you know, platelets or your ferritin levels and, and different sorts of things that you can look at and that, that can be indicative of increased inflammation. You know, there's nothing on carnivore that's going to increase your inflammation, but there are other things that, that maybe it can increase and we would generally associate them with increased inflammation that are not in, in, increased inflammation. Um, if your high, high sensitivity CRP is going up, Okay, maybe you need to look around at what, at what you're doing and, and what you're putting in your body. Uh, you know, are you using seed oils? Are you cooking your steak in olive oil? Are you um, have you gotten rid of you know stevia and and erythritol and, and monk fruit sugar and things like that? Um, you know, those sorts of things matter. You know, and, um, and and they will they will cause a problem. So, you know, there's there's nothing in meat that will increase your your um, you know, nothing in meat that will increase your inflammation inherently. So if, if your inflammatory markers are indeed going up, then there's something else going on and you need to identify that and eliminate that. Now it could be as, as simple as uh, you respond really poorly to uh, the linoleic acid in pork. You know, all these things just fed with just soy and, and processed, you know, oils and things like that as well. And that gets into their fat. And then we eat them and we eat that fat and we get that seed oil direct from the animal, right? So that's um, that's a problem as well. That's why, you know, you know some people have a, a serious reaction to pork, chicken, and certainly farmed fish, dairy, uh, and eggs, you know, because they're, they're, the animals are being fed things that they shouldn't be fed. And so you can, you know, and, and uh, omega-6s are, are quite pro-inflammatory. And so if you are eating a lot of those uh, high linoleic acid meats because they're being fed garbage, then um, that can that can do that. You know, it, it's, it would be weird that, you know, you'd go from like a standard, if we just assume you're on a standard American diet, which is very pro-inflammatory and you cut off all that crap and all you're having now is a bit of linoleic acid that's in pork, you know, it still should be a disparity. It should be still going in the right direction. So I would think that there, there's, yeah, need more information. And um, I would, I would wonder if you're, if you're not being perfectly strict, exactly what markers are we talking about? Exactly. When did you get them checked? When do you check them again? Also, how did you get your blood test done? This changes. Your blood test will change. If you get your bloods taken five times over the course of the day, your bloods are going to be different five times during the day, except for like your RBCs and hemoglobin and, and things like that. That'll, that'll remain pretty consistent. But uh, a lot of your inflammatory markers can change. Your cholesterol can certainly change. Your, your hormones will definitely change. And, uh, and a lot of other things as well, even your minerals. And so, so what I tell my patients is that you need to take your blood test in a very consistent manner. You have to take it in the morning between 8 and 9 a.m. You have to be fasting from 9 p.m. the night before, only drinking water after that. You drink two glasses of water right when you wake up, at least an hour or two before you get your blood test. No more than four glasses of water um, you know, in that time as well. So you want the same fasting status, the same time of day, the same hydration status, and you want to be resting for a day or two before that. So for the day of the test and the day before the test, and maybe even the day before that, 
You should not be working out, not going to the gym, not going on a run, not having sex. All of these things will affect your, your blood results. And so you just need to keep a consistent pattern to all of this and you will get, you will get more consistent results that you can test. And, you know, at the end of the day, a test is only as good as a retest. So you have some you know weird markers on your, on your blood test now. Okay. Keep doing what you're doing. See how you feel. If you're feeling good, great in a few weeks time, get another blood test and, and see where you're at and, uh, and see if you need to make an adjustment. And if you are eating anything except meat, uh, you know, red meat and water, go to red meat and water and see what that does for you. I think with the with the um, phlebotomy hat on, as I'm a qualified phlebotomist, I've seen thousands of bloods. And when you go carnivore, some things do go up anyway, like the blood urea mm. nitrogen, because you're eating more protein. So uh, you'll get a red flag for your buns reading um, because you're just basically producing more nitrogen waste from the protein synthesis. Um, and there are other things as well. When you've got a reference range, that is a normative range. It doesn't mean it's optimal. For instance, Anthony just mentioned the high sensitivity CRP. The range is, is very minimal and uh, you need some context here because I've had people really panicked because their CRP is five, where I've seen CRPs of 80 and also hundreds and even thousands. So um, you've got to understand that they're very dynamic, as, as as Anthony just said, but there's also a lot of nuance to it. And I think um, the hydration status and also tests for kidney function tests, the cystatin C is a much better test than the estimated glomerulus filtration rate, for instance. So yeah. there's lots of things you can do with your bloods, but it's, it's probably better to get someone who understands bloods in the context of low-carb, keto, or carnivore, because there is yeah. some nuance to that as well, which I think, you know, is underestimated. I was just going to say as well, you know, if, if your inflammatory markers are up, you know, sure, fine. Okay, we covered that. But then blood's being low, like your RBCs are going down. So if your RBCs have gone down in six weeks, that's not from carnivore. Like you could be bleeding somewhere, you know, or having like, a, um, you know, or, or having, you know, if you have the, you know, the MTHFR gene, um, you know, that that's, you're not going to process folate, you know, as well. You could, you know, get some uh, form of, of anemia from that. Um Check your folate, yeah, right? Yeah, and presentation of symptoms there, Anthony, as well. You know, yeah. you said about being anemic. If you're looking at yourself mm. and you've got perfect blood, but you know, don't don't think the bloods are telling you the story because yeah, always question how you're feeling. I mean, presentation of symptoms actually is a big deal for you know, when I was doing bloods ever such a lot. Um you know, people would say I've got low folate, and then you'd look at well, is there any clinical presentation here? Yeah. And you just have to go through. Well, you're not got bleeding, gl bleeding glum, gums. It's difficult for you to say eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, all those other things. You have to look at the whole person, the context. Sorry, Richard. Yeah, you wanted. To yeah, in. yeah. Just, just quick. On, I think um, you know, it's easy to ignore external factors as well. You know, it's it's, it's quite easy to blame. Uh, you, you've begun a new lifestyle, uh, and you know th these results are showing what they are. You you could be you you may have come down with some sort of virus or infection. There are lots of external factors going on, um, so definitely as as, uh, as Dr. Chafee recommends, a retest is is super important. Um, a lot of clients that I work with will begin the journey. They'll have um, one negative. Uh, outcome from something and then it's to do with their change in diet yet they weren't willing to accept that every ill health in their life leading up to this point was to do with their diet it was always it was some, some other factor you know uh, but the second you change your diet and, and something goes awry then it's because you've changed your diet but there's lots of external factors involved as well um but th this in my opinion is uh the healthiest way to live and, I, and i'm sure that um you know you're going to see improvements should you stick to the lifestyle but good point on um on uh the sources of meats and linoleic acid and uh, are you consuming processed meats um yes processed meats are better than eating a lot of junk um but ideally we want to go with with fresh meats particularly red meat in my opinion uh chicken and pork as you say um should be uh you know exercised lightly um I do love pork and chicken, but uh, they're not a staple uh, for me on a daily basis. Red meat is what I eat every day without, <laughs> without I've fail. Got, I've got a fabulous question. Uh, just to finish the first hour, I think. This is from Andrea. Uh, what is your experience and guidance for a post-RNY gastric bypass page? patient that's carnivore? I'm 54, postmenopausal, carnivore 1.5 years. 
25 years plus post op. Um, starting weight was 460. Wow, well done. And current is 165. Yeah, that's brilliant. Sorry, I, nice. I was reading ahead, guys. When you when I went, wow, I mean, that's, that's a ton of weight uh, at five for eight. It's very hard to get nutrients in unless you eat three to five times a day. Does that tank blood sugar and fat burning? Great question, Andrea. Um, well, you know, it, and, and sorry, this is in the context of a gastric bypass sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. I think because when you've had the bypass, yeah. your stomach volume yeah. is, is smaller. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, I just want to make sure I heard that right. So, um, uh, yeah, so it, uh, that's fine. you eat five times a day. That's fine. You know, if you're eating, if you're eating, uh, meat, then, then that's okay. That's not, a, that's not a problem. Um, you're going to need to do that, right? Because you, you're going to need to eat a different amount of, of meat than your body's going to allow you to do by sheer, you know, lack of vol volume available. Uh, another thing you can do is don't drink water during the meal or two hours before the meal, you want every square inch of uh, space in there uh, to be for food and for, for fatty meat in particular, focus on fatty meat. That's going to have more nutrients uh, per area of volume, right? So no water during or before the meal. So this is your stomach is empty and then you just fill it up with fatty meat, right? Let your body digest you get on with your day and then, uh, and then you do it again and, and you may have to do that a few times and that's okay. You still need to get enough food. You still need, you know, it'd be, it would have been nice if, if, uh, we could have gotten to you before, uh, you had the surgery because, um, you know, you would have had very good results with that as well. And I think just as good, if not better, uh, with that. And, um, and then you would be able to, to eat to satiety and not have to, not have to, um, worry about it, but you're in the position you are now and that's okay. You know, you just, you just, eat one when you're hungry until you're full. And uh, if you have to eat more than once a day, that's fine. As long as you're eating the correct thing, which is meat. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of people within the keto carnivore community get caught up in fasting, uh, which fasting mm. is fantastic. But what many don't realize is that being keto and carnivore will elicit the same responses uh, of autophagy, mitophagy, brown fat activation, lipolysis. Um, we will benefit, uh, we'll receive the same benefit from just being in that ketogenic state, uh, as well as, um, you know, compared to, to fasting for long periods of time. So as, as, as much as I'm a fan, fan of fasting, um, you know, these responses and these results can be achieved from purely being in that ketogenic state. So I wouldn't get too caught up with, with going too long without fasting. If you need to eat four or five times a day, um, then eat four or five times a day. Richard, you you caught me out there being brief. <laughs> <laughs> Not on the board. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, let's do a quick question then to take us to the first hour. Um, I found one here. Let's show this. Hi, all is hint water okay to drink on carnivore diet? Is that something in America? I've not heard of hint water. I don't know if that's a brand. Maybe that's a typo. Um hint water i don't know if, if that's a if that's a brand i haven't heard of it if it's not a brand i still haven't heard of it um so i haven't heard okay. of it but uh that's yes water is fine to drink on carnivore yeah there's a good hint there you go yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah just so normal sure. water i mean you shouldn't shouldn't have anything sort of flavorings or any sort of crap like that you know it should you know if, if there's a bottle and has an ingredients list it should say water right and um you know and so that, that, that's pretty much it. Filtered water, I think, is best. There's a whole bunch of garbage that's in, in city water, and, and you do want to filter that out. Charcoal filters uh, get most stuff out. Does not not going to get everything out. Um, you know, Some people do the reverse os osmosis one. That's fine. The, the distillation ones actually uh, work just as well um, and uh, are much cheaper. So, um, But yeah, but the reverse osmosis ones are getting che cheaper and cheaper as they go as well, but you know, at least some, some sort of filter. Uh, unless you're out in the country and you're just drinking, you know, branch water, go for it. You know, that, that's the yeah. best you can do, really, as long as it's not contaminated with some sort of filth, atrazine, all that sort of weird things that like change the sex of frogs and things like that. Like, no, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I think maybe sh should we celebrate that we've done our first hour? But anyway, um, yeah. maybe I should add a bell or something. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> One down, twenty-three to go. Rich, mate, twenty-three to go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 
So code is asked. Uh, been carnivore for over a year. Lost seventy pounds. Congratulations on that. Feel great. But been tracking blood sugar and ketones, and my blood sugar will not with emphasis, go below 100 unless I fast for multiple days. Ketones around 2.5. Any comments, guys? Personally, I don't think that's an issue. I mean, what is, I just Googled what is 100 in, in UK. I think that's about 5.6 million. Well, that's, that's normal. It's just just, just I mean, at, the, at the border of, of, of normal. Yeah. You wouldn't want to go so above I mean, that. So, I mean, to me, that's fine. It's more important that the ketone levels are 2.5. And not to forget that um, we create glucose ourselves through gluconeogenesis, which is mm. something Stephen and I covered recently with my um, continuous blood glucose monitor. Um, you know, we have the ability to create glucose as and when we need it. And uh, when I did a 10K run, uh, mine went from 3.8 up to 10.6 after 40 minutes of running, which is absolutely incredible. But um, personally, I don't know what your, your opinion is, Anthony. You're probably way more qualified in, in in this than i am but i i think that's perfectly okay um you know ketone mm. levels 2.5 uh, ideally it, it'd be good to be lower but i don't i, I wouldn't i wouldn't be concerned with that yeah and, and think, oh yeah go for it yeah firstly um going back to blood test when are you taking it is it in the morning mm. because obviously you've got the dawn effect that's a possible i know you're yeah. saying here you fast multiple days if you fast for multiple days your liver is still going to produce glucose um it does that overnight gluconeogenesis is there you may be someone that runs at 100 i'm sorry to say that uh again this is it. I'm a specialist practitioner in obesity and diabetes. Thousands of people. Uh, I've seen mm. thousands of bloods. And at 100, there are probably 90% of people I see first time would give their right arm for 100. You know, it isn't that high. Your ketones at 2.5 sort of show that your body's in a really good metabolic state, to be honest. Um, I would only worry about that if there were symptoms. If you're feeling dizzy, you're feeling anxious, uh, like you can't burn up energy, you can't sleep. Personally, if you've lost 70 pounds and you are feeling great and you've got 2.5 ketones there, I think you're doing all the right things. Personally, it could be stress is another thing that will push your blood glucose up. You, and I know this sounds a strange thing to say. You, if you're stressing over it being 100, that could actually add to it. So mm -hmm. try and be relaxed when you take bloods. Don't worry too much. Um, like I say, I don't think 100 is a particular issue of um yeah, honestly, about 80% of the people I've seen for the first time, if I said to them, you know, in six months, you're going to be 70 pounds down, you're going to have 2.5 ketones, and you're going to have 100. Will you take that now? They would all take that, I promise you. Um, so, yeah, and also look at your variation. And, and fasting multiple days is just showing your liver's working. It's making the glucose that you require. Don't forget you need uh, about 120 grams of glucose just to run your brain. If you're reading books, if you're very academic, your brain needs more energy. Uh, that's been proven. So it could be your activity, your mental activity is just demanding a little bit more glucose. So personally, I wouldn't worry about that. Do you want to do a question, Rich? I mean, I've got tons here from people that have uh, submitted. Well, I, was, I was just going to just hop in on that one as well. Yeah. Um, totally, totally agree with you know everything you guys have said. Um, uh, also, also, you know, I mean, where are you coming from? You know, like you, like like Richard said, you know, it's like, are, are are you diabetic? Have you been on medication? Are you should you still be on your medication? Um, a lot of people will go on a carnivore diet and they'll, um, you know, you've been on it for a year, so I mean, you should you should be pretty good at this point, you know, even if you were on medication, a lot of people can come off their medication, even insulin. However, you know, some people may need to be on it a bit, a bit longer. So, you know, sometimes people prematurely come off their, their diabetes medication, uh, just because they're excited and they're like, Hey, people are getting off their medication. That means I can stop taking my medication. Well, you know, eventually maybe, but, um, you know, you need to do that in a, in a graduated manner and you, and you can't just necessarily just come straight off of it. Maybe you still have a bit of a, a bit of a need. It, it can take some people, uh, multiple years before they come off of, uh, of their medications completely, or, um, you know, some people just have to stay on a little bit and that that's okay too. But a hundred, uh, you know, level of a hundred is pretty good. Uh, you're definitely in ketosis because you're making ketones, right. And you're not dead. So, um, if you're, if you're fasting for multiple days and you still have blood sugar and you still have ketones, where are those coming from? Well, you're making them right. And so you're in, you're in the right metabolic state. Uh, and so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. You know, um, so your insulin is going to be nice and low, which is great. Um, you're, uh, most likely, you know, 
know, because you're, you're able to make all the blood sugar and ketones and, um, you know, yeah. And it can matter at different times of day. So you take multiple times a day, chill out, you know, if you're stressed out, that can, that can raise that up as well. And, and there's a lot of other factors as well. I, at the end of the day, I just take it easy. If you were on medication, came off early, talk to your doctor, maybe you need to be on those things, uh, uh for a bit longer and otherwise just relax, you know, and just, just eat and eat and be happy. If you're feeling good, don't worry about it. If you're not feeling good, go and talk to a doctor. I've got another quick question, Rich. Rich, we haven't no, worked no. out a little secret signal here. Yeah, it's, I know. Question. We should do. We should do what we did in the PHC, where we put the hands up. Is there? Yeah, on, on, on do that, like kids. Do. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Well, um, maybe I can do that moving forward. I'll, I'll put. I'll put my hand up. Look good. So can I ask a question? Yeah, I, I've got a list as long as my arm. But look, you, you fire away. Uh, we've got. We've got Doctor Chafee for another. Uh, two, uh, two more two, hours, two hours. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the poor guy. He's got to put up with my <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. We're, we're uh, that for sure. <laughs> right. Um, a very simple one. Rebecca has given me a novel to read, and I have uh, basically diluted it down to, um, do you think that decaf coffee is as bad as coffee in terms of inflammation and uh, those sort of things? Oh, uh, Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, I mean, we, we always focus on, um, on caffeine, you know, because that's, you know, the thing in coffee, oh, caffeine, caffeine is a drug and it's addictive and it's a neurotoxin and it's an insecticide. All those things are true. That is one of 150,000 chemicals that exist in, in uh, coffee. Right. And the coffee is a bean. A bean is a seed. A seed is a plant's baby. And, and uh, organisms protect their babies more than anything. And this is where you'll generally find the highest concentration of different sort of toxic chemicals. So, and, and caffeine is one of them. Caffeine is a neurotoxin. It was developed as an insecticide. This, this fries the brains of uh, unwitting insects that try to eat that leaf or that bean or that seed. So it um, has a different response in us. We're much bigger animals. But, uh, you know, I know people that have uh, fixed their epilepsy with a carnivore diet and then they have uh, uh, caffeine or coffee and, and, then, and then they've had a seizure as a result of that. So, you know, that's why I refer to it as, as a, a neurotoxin, you know, because it's, it's affecting your brain. So this is a toxin it is as, as, as clinically defined, you know, by, you know, Oxford dictionary and, uh, and it's affecting your brain. So that's a neurotoxin, right? Um, but there are a lot of other things that, that cause problems as well. And so, uh, people just go, Oh, I'm just drinking decaf rice. Why are you drinking it at all? Then, you know, you just want the horrible flavor. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, you want the caffeine, but you're just drinking the, the garbage that comes with it. You know, I mean, that, that's sort of, that's sort of the backwards. So what I suggest to people is actually doing it the other way around, which is, you know, getting a bottle of like no dose or caffeine pills and having, one or half or a quarter of that to give you that caffeine hit that you're looking for and uh, and give you a bit of energy spike that you want and not bringing on the 150,000 other chemicals as well. And um, this is something people people will see, you know, they don't you know, you don't get sore on carnivore and so oh well I still get sore. Do you drink coffee? Yes, I do. Well, there you go. Oh, that doesn't cause it. Stop drinking coffee and find out. You know, and um you know, I I drank coffee uh, once I tried it out, I was sore for two days after that. I wasn't sore before that. Uh, you know, I, I went uh, lifting weights with uh, um, a, surge, a surgical colleague of mine, and um, you know, and, and he like I put him through my workout, and like maybe because he was doing carnivore, so I was like pushing him through my thing. He's like, oh, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to really go too too hard because I don't want to be sore. Uh, you know, because I'm operating tomorrow, I'm like, well, you know, you won't be sore if you've actually been strict. If you've only been eating meat and water, you won't be sore. And he's just like looking at me all scants but uh, he's like well i'm really so he ended up doing it and he's like mm, i'm really interested to see if you're if you're right i, I don't know about this I, I'm, I'm interested to see if you're right and i just looked at him and i was like yeah i'm interested to see if you've actually been strict you know and uh so he's like mm, okay next day he wasn't sore and he was pissed he said he's just like he's like i really wanted you to be wrong I really wanted to wake up this morning and be sore and be like, hey, you let me wrong, all this sort of stuff. He's like, but I'm not. I'm not. I just, you were right. This is crazy. I should be sore right now. And I, you know, I pushed him. You know, we were there for like two hours and, you know, we, we did a lot of work. And, um, and, uh, and then sort of in the middle of the day where everyone's sort of hanging out in the break room and some of the, the reps came and bought everyone coffee, obviously uh, declined. And, um, but he, you know, he got one and, uh, you know, I didn't say anything. And, uh, and then all of a sudden he, you know, sort of, you know, 
20 minutes later, he's just like, well, you know, actually, you know, actually, I am a bit sore. Actually, I'm, I'm feeling a bit sore. I'm starting to get sore. And I just pointed at the coffee cup in front of him and said, what's that? And he was just like, oh, damn it. You know, so it does, you know, it does affect you. It does cause inflammation. And, um, and it, it objectively has these different uh, chemical compounds in them that we avoid other plants for having. And yet we say it's okay in coffee somehow. It's like, well, I don't, I don't know. You know, I mean, if we're going to avoid it in other plants, you know, if we're not going to eat other plants because they contain these, these, uh, compounds, you know, why, why are we making an exception for coffee? Well, it's a drug and it's, and it has caffeine. Fine. Take the caffeine, you know, and just skip the rest of the crap. It may be, it may be also because it's a liquid version of a plant and it's just so different that people just don't make that connection. I've got a great question that ties onto this um, because Anthony are talking about real world experience. And, th and this is one thing about carnivore, um, social situations, working long hours. I'm new to carnivore. How do I know if I actually need to eat because I work long hours and I feel I'm ruled by the clock? And uh, mm. Anthony, at the beginning bit, Richard and I were just talking about when we were high carb thinking of a 24 hour live stream, we would be like, right, I've got to eat at 10. I've got to eat at three. I've got to eat at seven. And so we totally get what you're saying. So what, what's your views, Anthony, on that? Yeah. So, uh, well, if you, you need to eat when you need to eat, you know, so, you know, the, the best thing about, about carnivore is that you don't need to eat. Uh, you feel great. You know, you, if you're eating high density nutrition, you don't need to eat as much or as often. And so most people find that they, they eat just once a day or maybe twice a day. And that's not intentional. That's not doing intermittent fasting or OMAD be, for the sake of doing OMAD because you don't get any other physiological benefits, as Richard uh, said earlier. You, know, you get all those benefits from just having low insulin, basically, and just not putting that garbage in your body. So, you know, the benefits of fasting um, in general are that you're not eating stupid crap and your body can just, just be, you know? And so if you're just eating meat, you're not eating stupid crap and the same, same results happen. And in, in fact, you get better results because you're actually getting nutrition and there are some improvements on, um, the fasting mimicking diets, which is just ketogenic diet, high in meat and fat and, uh, and fasting they actually, you, you don't have the same side effects. Like some people will lose their hair or you know, at least temporarily when they're, they're doing longer term fast. You don't see that when you're doing keto or at least having 100 grams of protein a day. Um, so there are benefits of actually uh, consuming nutrition as you may expect. Um, as far as uh, working long hours, you know, are, are you feeling bad? Are you feeling sick? Are you feeling tired? Are you feeling off? You know, those could be signs that you're hungry. Um, your hunger signals are going to change on a, on a carnivore diet. It's very easy to under eat. I mean, I didn't, when I was in my early twenties, I, I wouldn't eat for like three, four days straight because I'm like, I am just not hungry. And I didn't have time either, you know, because I was, I was up, you know, first thing in the morning, I was off to, to school at, at uh, uh, university. I was going to university of Washington at the time. And, uh, and then directly after class, I go straight to uh, my university rugby team. And as soon as I finished that, I go directly to uh, my men's premiership team that I played for as well. And I'd get home and then I, you know, I'd go to the gym and lift weights sometimes as well. And so I'd be home at like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And I basically need to like read a chapter of OCAM and then go to bed, you know? And, uh, and so I was just like, well, don't really have time to eat. Just drink a bunch of water and study and go to bed. And it would be days. It'd be days. And then all of a sudden I'd have, I'd be home at, you know, seven instead of 11 and be like, Oh, Hey, I've got time to eat. I should, I should probably eat because I haven't eaten yesterday and I didn't eat the day before. Did I eat the day before? I'm like, Jesus, okay, I, I need to eat. But I didn't feel like I needed to eat because I didn't feel like I was hungry in, in how I used to feel hungry. Um, but I was definitely hungry. Now I can now I know my my hunger signals. You have to relearn your hunger signals. So try to eat once a day. If you don't feel you need to eat, if you don't feel you're tired and out of it, don't eat. If you are feeling a bit tired, if you are feeling a bit out of it, if you are getting like carb cravings, bread smells really good, ask yourself, is this what hunger feels like? Try eating some meat. If it tastes good, keep eating it. You know, keep eating it until it stops tasting good. If you're eating during the day and you eat until you're full, you can get a bit lethargic naturally. You just go into a rest and digest mode. You know, a lot of your blood goes to your digestive tract as opposed to your brain and your muscles, and you'll just get naturally tired. Um, so, you know, I, that's why I tend to eat my big meal at the end of the day. And um, and if you do that, you'll generally find that you don't need to eat during the day. If you're working out a lot and pushing yourself and you're already at a lean body mass, then, uh, then you might, you might have to eat twice a day. You may not be able to get enough in one sitting. Um, so, you know, 
you just have to listen to your body. You have to relearn your hunger signals. And, um, and I think a big part of that is just well, going by how you feel, um, getting cravings, and then just how meat tastes. If it tastes good, you're hungry. If a steak doesn't taste good, you're not hungry. I don't care who you are. And, um, and I would just go by that. If you're, if you're going throughout your whole workday and you feel fine, you're fine. You know, just make sure you get enough after you're done with your workday. Rich? <laughs> Did you want to add anything to that? <laughs> no, I agree with everything. Um, just to circle back to one of the points we made of the coffee in, in the previous comment, uh, a compound called acrylamide, which is created during the roasting, pro roasting process, is responsible for a lot of the inflammation in coffee. Um, so, yeah, acrylamide, which is a, a known carcinogen as well, so uh, and another reason to avoid decaf coffee. Uh, in regards to eating windows and things, yeah, I, I do it intuitively. Um, I think goals are, are important. Uh, a lot of people get stuck into the circadian rhythm, so they eat at specific times of the day. Um, the issue with this is that the body will release ghrelin uh, about 10 to 15 minutes prior to your usual meal time. Um, so you'll find that you may feel hungry coming towards a standard meal time. So the, the way to, to address this, if you want to break that habit, is to change up your meal times. You could move your meal time forward by an hour and then the next day move it back by an hour uh, and your body begins to trick ghrelin. Ghrelin stops being released and then you find that these, these fake hunger signals tend to go away uh, and then you can eat intuitively. Uh, and as Dr. Chafee says, you know, eat when you're hungry. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Uh, coming back to the lean body mass thing, even uh, someone with a 6% body fat still carries around 150,000 kilojoules of energy as stored body fat. So you're not going to starve. Uh, you're not going to go hungry. Um, you know, we can go a long period of time without consuming food, but it is best to do it intuitively. Uh, I do, uh, as Anthony just alluded to there, uh, something that goes against the grain, um, you know, quite literally what we do uh, against the grain. But I eat not long before bed. Um, we're coming back to a convo that um, Dr. Chafee and I had in a recent podcast. Um, you know, what does uh, the lion and the cheetah do after it's caught and eaten its prey? It goes to sleep, you know? So I, I eat quite late in the day before I go to bed. The body absorbs and process a, process a lot of the nutrients as we sleep. Uh, and then I wake up, I'm not hungry. Uh, I tend not to eat then for uh, a long period of time. It, I, I may eat at 12 midday. I may eat at six in the evening. It may be eight or 10. Sometimes I don't eat at all. Um, so I do do this intuitively. If I'm hungry, I'll eat. If I'm not hungry, then I don't eat. Um, and I, th I think it's as simple as that. I think people make, uh, make it too difficult. I've noticed some of the comments in the side about how many calories should I consume a day? This is my weight, blah, blah, blah. Ignore the calories. It's not the calories that govern whether we gain or lose weight. It's the endocrine system. And the reason being is that the, the caloric model is highly flawed. It doesn't account for the effect of insulin. It doesn't account for the thermic effect of food, metabolic rate, ketogenesis, and the effect of lectins. Um, so, uh, you know, to put that into perspective, I can consume anywhere between four to 6,000 calories on uh, a carnivore lifestyle and maintain weight compared to around two and a half to 2,700 on a high carb lifestyle and gain fat day on day on day. So it's not the calories. Energy needs to be accounted for. And I use the term energy over calories because not all calories are created equal. Drop the calories. It's not the calories. Eat until you're satisfied. Uh, if, if, you know, if you're not hungry, then don't eat it. Do it intuitively. If you're looking to further lose weight on carnivore, um, then you need to come back to, as, as Anthony said earlier, you know, look at the dairy products, the high fat, because the body can use dietary fat or stored body fat. So one of the techniques that I use uh, when it came to cutting for competition is I would reduce the amount of dietary fat. So I, I would lean over to slightly leaner cuts. Um, you know, but th this is to push your body to an extremity. But um, the body's incredibly clever and it's going to fight you. Uh, every step of the way, when you get to a level of homeostasis, when the body feels comfortable, it will let you know. Um, but you can move the needle should you wish to do so for, for, for whatever reason. But um, just eat, eat intuitively. And that, that's, uh, that's the best advice I think that we can give, isn't it? Definitely. Caught you off guard again, have I, Steve? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, eat intuitively. It... Uh, 
Oh, yeah. you've, I think your mic is off, Steve. Steve, I think your mic's off. Yeah, we uh, it was actually well spotted. Um, my first deliberate mistake of the day. So yeah, uh, I think when you're talking about being intuitive, it, it is it is all about trying to go with the body. I mean, this is one of the things I find difficult when people come to this way of eating and they say, "I'm not digesting the fat. Shall I take some ox bile?" And what what that is actually saying is, I want to exceed my natural production yeah. of bile and and that might get you over the hump temporarily but long term it's better to just listen to your body and think right okay if i'm going to eat fatty meat and this plate for which i've i've seen somebody online demonstrate you know and they're eating two pounds maybe someone like sean baker and you're you know you're five foot eight <laughs> you're not going to eat that amount of meat you don't need that amount so be intuitive but don't um be suckered into you've got to eat x amount of uh, protein x amount of fat in this ratio at this time because as rich mm. said actually when i first met rich and by the way i'm going to give you a plug rich because your youtube channel that needs more subscribers because you an absolute you know font of information that uh, is is amazing and i was really really um and i admit when i don't understand or know something and i've never heard somebody actually talking about eating just before going to bed and it being a good for him a good thing for him and, th and this is it there's no right or wrong way and i guarantee the three people on the screen now all eat differently but probably all get about the same results you know feel amazing um, not craving for stuff so just try and listen to your body a bit more sorry to give a little bit of a, a, a preaching moment there but um just listening to Rich, he's full of he's full of great information, and uh, sometimes you can get a really quick answer from him. But if you want a longer <laughs> answer, go to his YouTube channel, and it's gold dust. It is absolutely amazing, right? So um, we that. did have another question. Just and the reason I uh, I'm trying to be clever here and segue into these questions, you see. So we got someone here. I've been tracking macros: seventy percent fat, twenty four percent. Protein, I'm assuming six percent carbs. Do I need to change my macros? So I might have preempted the answer there, but what do you think, Dr. Chafee? Well, I think it depends on where all those are coming from. You know, if those are some you know six percent of carbs from you know plants. Then yeah, change your macros, get rid of that crap. You know, if it's if it's glycogen from liver, don't worry about it. Um, if it's uh, lactose from dairy, you know, change your macros. You know, so for for optimal. Right. So this is this is, you know, when we talk about this, you know, we're talking about the absolute what we think is the absolute gold standard. This is the best way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. It's not the only way to be healthy and it's certainly relatively uh, healthy as compared to, you know, if you're eating a bunch of you know processed foods with seed oils and, and garbage or even being a whole food vegan uh, or vegetarian, this is going to be much better. Um, you know, even in that spectrum, it's going to get just better and better and better. But so what we talk about, we're, we're talking about optimal. We're saying, Hey, look, this is, this is the, the mark to shoot for. And, you know, if you, if you don't quite get there, if you're just in that ballpark, you're still going to get improvements. It's not an all or nothing thing. Um, everyone's going to be different. You know, you're going to, you need enough fat, you need enough protein, you need no carbohydrates whatsoever. Um, your body will make all of those. And there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Um, so as far as, as far as, you know, 70, 30 fat to protein is roughly gram for gram fat and protein, right? So one gram of fat, one gram of protein that roughly shakes out to 70% uh, calories from fat. And that's fine for a lot of people. That's a, that's a mark to shoot for. Um, but again, getting enough fat, enough protein, listening to your taste, that tastes good. Oh, I, I like a little bit fattier. That tastes better to me now. Well, about your body needs a bit more fat. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and that can change, you know, depending on what you're doing, depending on your activity level, depending on how much, you know, excess, you know, body fat that you have on your person and how much, uh, you are exercising, you are going to change the amount of, of food that and nutrition that you need. Um, so you can, you can aim for that aim for gram, gram for gram, uh, fat and protein, and then adjust, you know, if your body, if your body is wanting more fat, give it more fat. I think that, you know, going by our stools is a really good, uh, way of doing that something we alluded to earlier for those that were were on at that time um you know if your body's going to have a limited capacity to absorb fat and i think that's that's also why you don't want to you know because of the bile that you have i think that's also a good reason not to uh take ox bile because 
your body didn't make a mistake on how much bile that it made. It made, it made a specific amount of bile because it wanted a specific amount of fat. And if you're forcing it to absorb a lot more fat, that's going to be too much fat by definition, because it's more fat than your body is asking for it. Right. And so unless you're in this very special situation where something weird is going on, maybe you don't have a, of a, a gallbladder and you're at a big meal and you just want to eat that big meal right then fine, but it's, that's not going to be ideal. Um, but your body has made a specific amount of bile because it wants a specific amount of fat. And so if you're, if you're not eating enough fat, then your body's going to absorb every ounce of that fat and none of it's going to get over into your stools. You're going to be very constipated. You're going to be very dry, hard, uh, difficult to pass stools. And, um, and, and that's why. So if you eat enough fat and then some, it's where there's that spillover, you know, that, that overflow valve from your body not being able to absorb fat, you're going to have softer stools. And so at least then, you know, you're saturating your body's ability to absorb fat and you're not getting way overboard, uh, because you're not getting diarrhea. Right. And so I think that that's what you want to aim for. So if you're, if you're eating, you know, 70, 30, you know, gram for gram fat and protein, and you're finding you're having dry, hard stools, well, you, your body is wanting more fat. You're making a lot more bile than you're bringing in fat. So increase the fat, you know, add, add a bit more fat, get fattier cuts, um, and, and, uh, and do what you have to do to sort of get that up to the point that you're not, you're not getting dry, hard, rocky, pebbly stools and, uh, and see how you go. Or it could be that you're getting loose stools and you're not drinking coffee. You're not using artificial sweeteners. Those are all laxatives, right? So that'll, that'll off, that'll throw things off. But let's say you're you're getting diarrhea at that. Okay, well maybe your body doesn't want as much fat, and um, and so on. And then you know, and then you know, Richard could probably talk more about this. But if you're you're doing something very specific, like trying to cut uh, down to really low body fat percentage when you're getting ready for a competition, maybe you switch up your macros then too. But um, you know, I think that would be individual as well. But either way, if you're just if you're just a normal person and you're just trying to optimally feed your body, then you just need to get you can aim for that mark, but then adjust for your own, for your own person. You need to get enough fat. You need to get enough protein. And that's going to be different for everybody in their individual state, whether they're gaining, losing, trying to stay the same, or their body wants to stay the same, or, or they're working out a lot or exercising a lot or not. So it's going to be different for everyone. That's a mark to shoot for. That's great. And then you have to adjust for your own particular set of circumstances. Rich? Love that. Yeah, totally agree. Nothing to add, to be honest. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't track. Uh, I eat as nature yeah. intended. Uh, I eat foods, you know, that, that nature provides to me. Nature gives us this perfectly packaged present of combination of protein and fat. Uh, and that's uh, how I eat everything that we consume in nature contains protein and fat. An egg is almost equal quantities of protein to fat, uh, around six grams of, of protein to five grams of fat. Uh, depending on the size of the egg or see chicken breast with skin on is protein and fat steak depend no every cut of steak is protein and fat this varies depending on cut but um i yeah i eat as nature intended uh and you know as, as dr chafee says that uh, it is goal dependent if you're looking to to lose weight for you know a specific reason then you know i'd gravitate into lowering the dietary fat ever so slightly but you know just remember the fat is essential um you know we need fat it's essential for life we need saturated fats and cholesterol. Cholesterol uh, is imperative for life. It's essential for cell formation, cell communication, nutrient absorption, nutrient transportation, the production of hormones. It's essential for healing. You know, we cannot live without uh, you know, the, the saturated fats uh, and other fats that we find in, in, in meats. Um, so don't avoid the fat switch. If Unless you have another question you wanted to jump on, uh, Steve, I'd, I'd like to jump on to some of the fears uh, and run these by Anthony really quickly, you know, in regards to beginning a ketogenic or carnivore lifestyle. I mean, some of the fears that, that crop up are, you know, what about the saturated fats, you know, and, and its effect on my cholesterol? Um, you know, what about the, the lack of grains and, and fiber within the diet? And um, should I be consuming these seed oils to help lower my mm -hmm. cholesterol level? And what about meat causing cancer? These are all the fears that, that I get um, thrown at me on a daily basis. Now, no, we're all well versed in, in the answers to these, uh, but I think given mm -hmm. you know that we've got uh, you know uh, in my opinion number one in the world in in the, in the carnival <laughs> space on um, you know let's tap into his knowledge. What would your answers be in regards to these mm -hmm. these fears? Um, you know cholesterol, I think yeah. is the biggest one, and within the community, I mean we know that you know it's laughable, but for anybody new, yeah. this is the biggest 
the biggest fear factor, Main one. isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, no, absolutely. And you know, it's like, do you, do you want to, you know, you know, take a bunch of seed oils and linoleic acid and you know, all these sorts of things? You know, because seed oils are very high in linoleic acid, so that's what you're getting. But you get the, you know, want to see some unsaturated fat and replace the saturated fats with that to help help your heart. Well, there's a randomized controlled trial, um, you know, with thousands of people where they did just that. They they you know supplanted the saturated fat with. Um, polyunsaturated fats and you know which are predominantly from seed oils and those are predominantly linoleic acid and uh, it did indeed lower LDL cholesterol and it did indeed uh, kill more people uh, more people died of heart attacks and strokes and had had more uh, cardiovascular events in in the treatment group where they they gave them a bunch of unsaturated fat and lowered their LDL so no, that's not what you want to do. You definitely don't want to do that. Saturated fat is not and has never been a risk factor for any disease, let alone heart disease. The Journal of the American College of Cardiology actually published that position statement in uh, 2020. And they, they, they published a large literature review where they looked at all the the, the best available evidence, the randomized controlled trials, the meta-analyses, all the highest level uh, highest tiers of evidence, and they found that there was no association between re, uh, increased saturated fat intake and heart disease. None did not do it, right? And so, um, in fact, they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat consumption and uh, stroke. So if you eat more saturated fat, you have a lower risk of, of getting a stroke. And if you eat less saturated fat, you have a higher risk of getting a stroke. Um, there was just a, a recent one off. Oh, I really wish I, I remembered the author's name. Um, just, just, just published this thing recently. Anyway, it was, it was a, it was a, a um, uh, an opinion paper, but you know, published in, a, in, a, in a large, in a large paper. Um, I want to say BMJ, I'll, I'll look it up, but, um, Anyway, so he, he was talking about how this is this is basically the, the, the new sort of guidelines on, on saturated fat and, and what to eat uh, are basically all they are is, is to promote uh, pharmaceutical sales. That's really all it is. And it is not actually to, to help and benefit health. And he was just saying that this, this is actually ridiculous, you know, that we're, we're vilifying saturated fat and cholesterol. I mean, the, like the jury's out at this point. I mean, it, the decision has come back. This stuff is not. A problem. This does not cause harm, and uh, and you know now they're saying that fifty percent of people over the age of forty should be on a statin. Well, I bet the statin companies are saying that fifty percent of people should be on a statin. I have no doubt in my mind that they feel very strongly about that. Um, well, I feel very strongly uh, in the opposite direction that um, you shouldn't need a whole bunch of medications uh, to be healthy. You know, in fact, uh, that that is that is antithetical to life on Earth. Life on Earth is is healthy and robust and lean and dominant, and we are the most dominant species that's ever existed. Now we can dominate because we're, we've got a foothold, right? And we have all this technology, and you know we're not you know we're not going to go anywhere unless we we blow ourselves up. But it took you know some hard yards to get to where we are, right? So you know that's. Um, you know, and why is that? Was that, that because we're all just fat, sick, and diabetic, and dying of cancer, and had all this heart disease at you know uh, at early ages? Because well, we just didn't have the miracle of statins thirty thousand years ago, and so just you know everyone was just in pieces and just you know you know having you know just rotting colons and and things like that, and just cancer all over the place. That's just nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Cancer is a disease of civilization. Period. It does not exist. In, in the, you know, in the, um, uh, you know, more, more, you know, primitive tribes and things like that, where they don't eat all this crap that we eat. Uh, in fact, uh, Wilhelm Stefansson, who wrote The Fat of the Land, lived with the Inuits for 12 years, a professor at Harvard, um, you know, he actually uh, wrote many books. One of them was called just that, Cancer is a Disease of, of Civilization, I think it's called. And he's just arguing, hey, this, this doesn't happen. If you just eat real, if you just eat real food, you're not eating this processed crap, you're not eating a bunch of plants, just eat meat, fat, fat and meat, you know? That's what you need to eat, and uh, and we're and we're seeing this with Otto Warburg's work, you know, Nobel Prize winner in cancer research, and he just said, hey, this is a mitochondrial disease. This is this is dysfunction of the mitochondria. Professor Thomas Seafried from Boston College has has followed up his work and added to that work, and showed that yes, indeed, this is exactly what that is, and you can you can improve your mitochondrial function by 
eating meat and not eating carbohydrates and being on a ketogenic diet, right? And so, you know, it's um, it, it's literally the opposite of everything they've been telling us. And you know that already. You don't need a study to tell you that. Why? Because we've been getting these stupid guidelines since the night since 1977. They were saying, you know, fat's bad, meat's bad, cholesterol's bad. Stop eating all of that crap. And we reduced that, increased fruits and vegetables, and everyone's gotten fatter and sicker. The more we listen to these assholes, the worse we get. And then you have millions of people around the world that are pulling back and being like, nope, not doing that crap. And they're going carnivore, they're going keto, and uh, and they're getting healthy. And they're oh, better not do that. Oh my God, you better watch out. Yeah, I bet. You know, because that's gonna that's gonna affect people's bottom lines, and you really don't want to piss people off. You, know, you mess with their money. That's the best way to piss them off. Um, no, it, it is just ridiculous. You know, you get you improve all your markers. You drop your you know your CRP goes down. You're you're not anemic anymore. Your blood markers all improve. Um, your B12 goes up. Your magnesium and zinc go up. Your testosterone is going up. Your your growth hormone is going up. Um, you know your your HbA1c is going down to normal. Your fasting insulin is normal. Uh, all these markers are improving. Your your antibodies for your autoimmune disease have gone away. And they're saying, oh, you better stop that. Oh, that's dangerous. Like, yeah, you're out of your mind. Like, what, what did you just see? You just saw someone improve their health dramatically in ways that that doctors, most doctors will tell you cannot happen. You know, I, I had I had people try to try to um you know threaten to like uh, you know um you know report me because I was talking I was showing people studies, peer-reviewed studies in the peer-reviewed you know literature, randomized controlled trials, interventional trials. Um, you know, a whole bunch of different, different sorts of studies and trials, uh, on different, on different diseases. And just like these, these can be dramatically affected. There are thousands of studies on, on ketogenic diets now. And it's very, very, very strong, very high level evidence. And, um, you know, buy fat meat based, um, ketogenic diets and people are improving and they're getting better and they're reversing diseases that people say cannot be reversed. And yet we've been reversing them for a hundred years with dietary interventions, namely a carnivore diet. So Dr. Salisbury in the 1800s uh, was curing rheumatoid arthritis, tuberculosis, gout, Crohn's, Lyme disease, reversing these things and fixing people by putting them on a pure red meat and water diet because he noticed this long before processed foods were around. He noticed that people that were just eating more plants and grains were getting diseases other people simply weren't, and especially like with the Native Americans. In the 1800s, they were the healthiest population on earth. They were also the tallest population on earth, and they were routinely living to be 115, 120 years old, routinely, by their own records. And so people discount that. I don't. And um, and Salisbury didn't either. He found these, these people were healthy as hell. And when you were putting people on their diet, which is just red meat and water, they were just doing buffalo drops and just scaring buffalo over the cliff. And, uh, and they were eating that for the rest of the year. And, um, you know, that people were improving dramatically. And people kept doing this. This was this was uh, you know said in different different circles. It was, it was the first fad diet. People followed this for decades. It was, it was very very popular for a lot of people. It got a lot of people very very healthy. Then you have the you know the the uh, artificial food companies like Kellogg's, one of the first uh, pushing the Seventh Day Adventist narrative that plant based eating is is more holy because meat causes lustful feelings and lust is a sin and therefore meat is a sin and you have to stop eating. That is the honest to God origin of Kellogg cereal. They tried to suppress people's hormones and health so that they didn't want to have sex as much. That's insane. That is someone who is crazy and is trying to force his will on other people and they're they're mission statement is still out there that's what they're still they're putting out this toxic crap in order to make people less healthy so that they don't jack off like i swear to god that is what dr kellogg was all about and that's why he you know he pushed all this stuff and the seventh day adventist per, uh, church you know pushed all this stuff as well and they're still pushing it and they run the nutritional curriculum they they have they have people everywhere on every board walter willett from harvard he's like the, the main sort of nutritional researcher there he's a seventh day adventist vegan i wonder what kind of studies are he's going to come out with um but you know even then there was a hundred years post salisbury where there was studies and papers and experiments and books just dozens of books by dozens of different doctors and researchers um you know stefanson uh Wilhelmer stefanson uh and then but many others as as recently as 1975 there's a book by uh dr 
Vokelin. And he was, a, he was a gastroenterologist and he wrote a book called The Stone Age Diet. And he basically argued that humans are carnivores. Here's the evidence for that. You know, humans are apex predators. We have been for millions of years. Like that's a fact. And uh, apex predators don't eat a bunch. Of, they don't graze. They don't eat salads. They just, they eat meat. That's the definition of, of the term, right? Is that apex predator, you eat all the things below you on the, on the food chain, which is everything if you're at the apex, right? And so... You know, he he wrote that and he argued that basically, you know, all the diseases that he treats in gastroenterology don't need to exist if you don't eat plants. Basically, if you just eat meat, you don't eat plants, you don't need him as a profession. You don't need gastroenterology as a profession. You don't need most medical specialties at all. And, you know, and I, I fully agree with that. And I, and I want to get back to that state where people are much more healthy. The cancer thing, that's just garbage. You know, that the WHO in 2015 came out and said that processed meat is a uh, is a uh, uh, you know likely carcinogen or you know is 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 a carcinogen but low level and so oh yeah so it's a class one carcinogen but they put a ranking number of relative risk factor next to it I think it was six and they said oh it's the same category as cigarettes and plutonium oh my god well first of all are cigarettes the same as plutonium idiot then why why are you not seeing that right why are you not seeing that this category is a broad category right it has it has a wide range of of what is is um carcinogenic or not they're like oh my god you know uh processed meats is the same as cigarettes and plutonium well that means that cigarettes are the same as plutonium and no one in their right mind is saying that right and so you know the the relative risk factor you know next to to processed meat was six the relative risk factor next to um uh cigarettes something like 340,000, right not the same and then the, the risk factor next to plutonium is 8.6 million, right? Okay, so this is not the same. These are not the same things. Anyone who suggests they are, are it is a, a fraud and is someone who's trying to sell you something and convince you something is ideologically driven. Um, and also, what are, what are processed meats processed with? It's not other meat. It's plants, it's sugar, it's seed oils, it's, you know, artificial ingredients and all that sort of garbage, you know, so that's not the meat's fault. There's nothing inherent in meat that's a problem. And even the WHO said, well, red meat is a probable carcinogen. Name one thing in meat that has ever been shown to even, even you know, to, to increase risk of, of cancer. And there's all these, these, these theoreticals. It's just like, no, you have not proved anything. Um, and so, you know, the, the, you know, and, and the, the main thing with that is, is that that panel, that was a panel decision that wasn't like, oh, all the best scientists in the world. This was a bureaucratic decision. Um, and, uh, and the administrators at, uh, the WHO just decided this, um, there were other people on that panel and there were other people that completely disagreed with that decision to classify these things in that manner. And they said that this, this was, this was fraud, that this was bullshit, um, one of them, I can't, I can't remember the man's name, but he said that this was, it was the most painful thing he's ever had to experience in his professional career because he saw people, um, you know, purposefully throw out very high level pieces of evidence. So there's this hierarchy of evidence, right? So there's meta, you know, uh, you know, randomized control trial and then meta analyses of randomized control trial. You can have meta analyses of epidemiological garbage and that's, garbage in garbage out so that's not useful but randomized control trial trials like well-designed randomized control trials with a lot of large populations and then meta-analyses of those that's that's the highest level so they had these things and they had high level evidence and they threw those out because they said that yeah no there's absolutely no relationship between you know meat consumption and and uh cancer risk just absolutely none. and so they threw those out because they went against their narrative and they kept in studies that um, they kept in studies that were very weak, very poor epidemiological studies that were absolutely garbage, horribly, horribly done and designed. You know, the things that they they said that um, uh, they said, oh, when you eat less meat and you eat more fruits and vegetables, uh, that, you know, cancer rate goes down and not even that much. You know, I mean, like a very, very, very small fractional reduction in risk. And uh, to the point that it's just like it's not it's not statistically significant when you're talking about epidemiological studies that have so many confounding factors. One of those confounding factors, which was actually intentional, was that they lumped in processed foods with meat because sometimes there are there's meat in the ingredients of processed food. Therefore, because 
pizza has sometimes has uh, toppings that are meat. Therefore, pizza is meat. And so you reduce the amount of pizza you eat. You're reducing the amount of meat you eat. Oh, when you reduce meat, people get better. Oh, no wonder. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they do. And then, you know, fast food, like, you know, going to McDonald's, you know, how often you go and get a, you know, a, a quarter pounder meal or whatever, you know, and, and you have to, first of all, remember that this is like a survey of the last year of eating. I mean, who can, in any way is going to be able to answer that accurately, right? Me, I steak, that's everyday steak, right? But, you know, the, the, the McDonald's thing is like, they're saying, well, that counts as meat because of the burger. And that's what people say. They're oh my God, you're eating that fast food with all that meat and fat in it. I'm like, no, dude, like that's the, that's only like 10% of the meal, you know, and certainly like 10% of the calories, maybe even less because you're, you're getting all the, you know, the buns and the sugary sauces, all the different, you know, plants and vegetables and tomatoes that are on there. Uh, but then you're getting, you know, potatoes deep fried and it used to be trans fats, you know, now it's seed oils, which is, you know, nearly as bad. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, a giant drink with a bunch of sugar or a bunch of noxious chemicals that kind of taste sweet, but really just taste like noxious chemicals. And, uh, what the hell is that doing for you? That's going to be awful. And you're calling that meat. So, I mean, that's a fraud. You know, these people are frauds. I mean, they should be, they should lose all licenses that, that have been provided to them. They should be sued into extinction and they should go to jail, you know, because they're absolute criminals. They're, they're purposefully doing this and it is affecting hundreds of millions and billions of people's lives. This is absolute bullshit. And, um, you know, especially the WHO. So, you know, the, the people that dissented have, have reported this and be like, this is what happened. This is bullshit. And, uh, and they said, because the guys who were, were pushing for this, the guys and, and, you know, ladies and gentlemen who were doing this fraud and perpetrating this fraud on the world, um, guess what? Vegans, vegetarians, and Seventh Day Adventists, all of them, right? Or the majority of them, or at least people that had serious industry ties as well, because you know Kellogg's pays for a lot of research. Coca Cola pays for eleven times the amount of uh, research on nutrition than the NIH does, and Nestle and and Pepsi and Kellogg's and the Seventh Day Adventists and Sanitarium here in Australia, which are owned by the Seventh Day Adventists, they get tax exempt status because they're owned by the Seventh Day Adventists. It's a church sort of organization. Um, you know, they all, they all pump out billions of dollars in research money in nutrition to push their product and their absolute poison on people. It's like if, you know, Esco, you know, Pablo Escobar was allowed to put out, you know, research on how great cocaine is, you know, like he'd do it, you know, and Coca-Cola is doing it right. Um, and so that was a fraud. The university of Washington in Seattle, um, last year published a massive study looking at all the literature available literature looked at hundreds of studies um you know talking about how meat is bad and, and meat causes cancer or the extremely low increased risk of of uh, colorectal cancer um and uh they found it and they they you know said that these were extremely weak lazy studies very poor science, very poorly designed, extremely bad studies, and that there is actually no evidence that meat and especially unprocessed red meat has confers any risk of cancer or any other disease. So this is this is a fraud. And, uh, and I, I think that people should start there. They should start by investigating the fraud. They should investigate um, and look at the fact that um, that uh, that this is an absolute con and and crime against humanity. You can go to uh, YouTube. You can find a lot of people that talk about this. I think some of the best uh, reporting on this is by a lady named Belinda Fetke, who's from Tasmania, who's married to Gary Fetke, who's, you know, who's a great guy and, and you know, has done a lot of talks in low-carb space, got into a lot of trouble because he was suggesting that his patients were actually helping his patients get better by suggesting low-carb, and the, and the dietitians said, like, you're not allowed to do that. And they they tried to get his license taken away, and thankfully they weren't able to. But um, you know, this is this is how crazy this is. You know, you try to as a doctor, you try to help your patients, and you try to get them better, um, and uh, by doing by doing things that go against uh, the purse strings, and and they and they try to crucify you for it. You know, and that's because you know these people are in control, and so we need we as the people, you know, as the base need to understand this. And to just be like, absolutely not, because they only have, they only, they only profit if we buy their crap, right? 
They make no money if we do not give them money. So we need to make sure people know that they should not give them any money and uh, and get them to actually do something that benefits people as opposed to you know trying to knock them down. So people should go to YouTube and look up Belinda Fetke and look up her talks on uh, nutrition. I think it's called nutrition, uh, nutritional science. How did we get here? Um, and she has a, a number of talks on there. Watch all of them. You know, they all, all give a bit of different information, but um, you know, they that it's it's very interesting. And you you look in there and you go like, oh my god, this is this is corrupt to the teeth, and it has been for 150 years. And um, you know, you then you you will never look at nutrition again uh, the same way. You will never look at nutritional sciences the same way. You will never look at these studies the same way because the majority of them are put out by the by the sugar companies and the food companies. The majority, the vast majority, and the other ones are pretty suspect too because they're probably funded by them or the people involved with them have industry ties and have been paid off or on boards here and there. Um, you know, at, at different times. So you know, it is it is intensely corrupt and um and you, you just have to understand the facts and this is why you know, people say well you should never uh, well you know it, it, the problem is is that doctors aren't taught nutrition in medical school thank god they're not taught nutrition in medical school because it's going to be coming from the same people the seventh day adventist church sets the curriculum they wrote the first textbook on Nut uh, university nutrition in 1925 it's 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 still in print in its current edition it's still being taught sally uh sally norton that was her textbook at cornell university when she was getting her her, her undergrad and masters in nutrition from cornell right so this is it is still corrupt. They're still completely controlled. These are the puppet masters. They are the man behind the curtain. They are in charge and they are not telling you about it. So they're not on the forefront like we are talking about this. They are 19 steps removed. They're pulling all the strings. You know, Coke, Kellogg's is one of the largest uh, companies in the world. It, it's one of those, you, know, you see the pie charts of those companies that own everything like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle. Kellogg's is one of them. And they are in, insanely wealthy and extremely entrenched in every institution. They have people everywhere. And so does the, the Seventh-day Adventist church who work hand in hand with Kellogg's and Coca-Cola and Nestle and all the rest as well. So understanding that and understanding just how corrupt the system is, um, is, is armor. It's, it's armor against the assault. And I, I encourage everyone to, to do that and look into that. That's a, that's a great answer. Can I try a screen share for people that are a little bit, um, maybe on the, on the fence. Is that all right with you, Anthony? Just want to sure. show you something. Yeah. Cool. Right. Here we go. So here is something. Um, here, here's a study. Let's add it to the stream. Okay. Right. There's the study. And I was reading this the other day. Mm. And if you've ever seen studies like this, you can go down to the list of authors, okay? And you see this high details? It was hidden naturally from the people, <laughs> okay? So I had, to click, I had to click to see the affiliation. There you go. Oh, yeah. Now, that study, without clicking on that, is quite convincing for people. And I've actually seen this quoted quite a few times when we talk about skipping breakfast. I'm not recommending skipping breakfast. I'm just saying this is what it was talking about. And this study's conclusion was, well, you know, you could put in the comments, what do you reckon if it's funded by Kellogg's? What do you think the thing was for a recommendation uh, when it came to breakfast? Well, obviously it was don't skip breakfast, have cereal. Mm, eat some, eat some cornflakes. Yeah, and it really is as blunt as that. Um, well, but that, well, that's where they came from too. Kellogg, Doctor Kellogg, came up with that th that that idea back in well, the late eighteen hundreds. He said, "Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You have to start off strong and eat Kellogg's cornflakes. That's the most important thing. The most important way to start the day. That's where that came from. People often didn't eat breakfast back then. They they were like us, you know. They they ate actual nutrition and they they would eat later in the day. They wake up, they get going. Now, like, oh, no, 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 breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Oh, you got to eat it, but you got to eat my thing, you know. And uh, it's absolute absolute garbage." Yeah, I agree. While we're on the sharing uh, side, Stephen, can I can I share this end? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of one uh, of the things just to explain to people watching the live stream is we've never done a live stream 
for 24 uh, hours with more than two people uh, with lots of outside stuff. So if it's a little bit clunky at the moment, I do apologize. And by this time tomorrow morning, I'll be tucked up in bed thinking, whoa, whoa we managed it. <laughs> so yeah, sh share your screen. If I've set this thing up, can I, am I the only one that can share it or can you share it? So I've, I I've just clicked on share screen. It, it says that I'm sharing this and I don't know if you need to click on the relative screen. Um, uh, let's have a look. Let's unless, have a look. Oh, there, there we are. Okay. Perfect. So this is, I believe, one of the studies that you were mentioning about the cholesterol. So this is the study on the BMJ that covers 68,000 participants. Uh, and this yeah. was to investigate the relationship between high LDL and all-cause mortality. And as Dr. Chafee says, the results showed an inverse association representing 92% of the participants. In other words, the lower your LDL, the higher your risk of death. This is a study on the BMJ. This is a massive study. Uh, this is no coincidence. Uh, mm -hmm. cholesterol is is essential and i just really quickly share something else which is this is one of the presentations that uh, that's available on uh, on my uh, youtube channel but this is a statement uh, which was released in 2015 by the dietary uh, advisory uh, guidelines committee uh, in association with the american heart association and they deemed on their website in 2015 that cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption so the people that have been telling us for the last 50 years, the cholesterol is detrimental to our health. I've, I've released this on their website. It's, it's, it's difficult to find, but it is on there. So this is from the horse's mouth that um, cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption. Uh, and cracking presentation, this goes on for uh, pages and pages. I think this is condensed into a 15 minutes about how important um, uh, cholesterol is uh, for life. But uh, but yeah, th there it is. There's, there's two pieces of evidence there. Uh, and quickly coming back to another point that uh, Dr. Chafee mentioned in regards to statins. Um, statins lower cholesterol by blocking something called the mevalonate pathway. The mevalonate pathway uh, is, is partly used for the production of DNA. Um, so when you were taking statins, you were preventing your body from producing DNA, which is never a good thing. So statins, mm -hmm. uh, obviously I can't give medical advice, uh, but in my opinion, we should not be consuming something that's preventing the body from creating DNA. Um, yeah, and a few other points that I wanted to touch base on there as well. Uh, I mean, we touched base on on the cancer side. You know, I, I, I had a message. I don't know if, if, if she's listening today, but a fellow PHC ambassador who is a vegetarian. Um, uh, and, and they are looking at basically, uh, you know, the effect of food on mental health. Uh, she's a vegetarian, um, which, you know, as she states, goes against a lot of the vice of the PHC, which, uh, you know, which we are ambassadors for. Um, but she says there lots, there's lots of evidence which show that um, a no meat diet for cancer, uh, as it's acidic, uh, as in meat is acidic, is, is a good protocol for cancer and for uh, anxiety and depression. Um, I'll just put my two pens in and then, you know, I'll let um, Dr. Chafee jump on board with that. But in, in regards to anxiety and depression, again, this comes back to the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters. Um, you know, we need uh, certain uh, cofactors like iron, vitamin B12, zinc, uh, magnesium, amongst others. And when we consume vegetables, we block a lot of these cofactors, which prevents the body from creating these neurotransmitters, which leads to things like anxiety and depression, which is why I used to suffer severely, I believe, with anxiety and depression. Now that I'm plant-free, my depression and anxiety uh, have completely gone away. Um, now, I did, as I say, in the early days of being keto, I was consuming lots of vegetables. Um, you know, I was following the Dr. Berg protocol. Um, you know, I was consuming stupid amounts of, of vegetables per day. Um, I still suffered. Yes, I was healthier, but I still suffered with anxiety and depression. It's only since I removed them completely. So we need to look at the neurotransmitter synthesis, the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis, uh, and regards to the nutrients that we consume that are blocking the absorption of cofactors, allowing us to process these neurotransmitters. So I don't believe that, you know, being, and I'm not against the vegan or vegetarian. I work with vegans and vegetarians. I respect anybody's dietary choices, uh, but I do believe that they are misinformed. I think that the information that is out there uh, is, is misinformed. Um, and I don't believe that consuming vegetables is the best way. Being a vegetarian lacks vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is essential for methylation. Um, it's essential for, you know, the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis. Uh, and all of these things will lead to depression and anxiety. 
And then in regards to cancers, you know, as Dr. Chafee has stated many times, you know, plants are trying to kill us. Um, plants contain known carcinogens. Every plant, you know, in the supermarket uh, contains uh, stupid amounts of, uh, of cancer causing chemicals. Um, I've worked success successfully with two cancer patients uh, on a carnivore based diet. Uh, all cancer cells are fueled by glucose uh, and glutamine. Uh, but glucose predominantly cancer cells are metabolically inflexible. They cannot be fueled by ketones. Uh, to me, it doesn't make sense to consume vegetables to combat cancer. One, because of the glucose content of carbohydrate. Uh, two, because of the other uh, copious amounts of, of known carcinogens within these plants. Um, now, there is an argument, you know, when we look at things like sulfur pain, Dr. Chafee and I you know, covered this in an earlier podcast that um, broccoli contains sulfur pain, which is used in the treatment for cancers. Um, so broccoli sprouts, uh, you know, are used successfully in the treatment. Um, but I do believe that this is a conjunction with being ketogenic. Um, and, and I believe that it's, it's, it's predominantly being ketogenic over the consumption of, you know, this, this sulfur pain that's, uh, that's leading to that. But sulfur pain uh, is going to cause uh, cancer, I, I believe, in, in a situation in, in high quantities if we do not have cancer. Why would you take a chemotherapy pill if you do not have cancer? Uh, but the, these are some of the questions that um, I won't mention the person's name, but I don't know if she's listening. I, I have passed her a link, but basically, you know, long story short, um, you know, she's a big believer in in um, the vegan and vegetarian movement in, in regards to helping fight um, anxiety, depression and, and cancer. Um, you know, as I just explained, I think it's the opposite. Uh, what's what's your opinion, Dr. Chafee? Yeah, well, I think everything is is always compared to what, right? So, you know, if you're if you're comparing uh, someone eating a you know a processed food diet with a bunch of processed carbs and sugar and seed oils, all from plants, by the way, uh, and going to a more whole food uh, plant based approach. You know that that can confer benefits, right? But is it because you're dropping meat, or is it because you're dropping the the rampant amount of omega sixes, seed oils, um, uh, you know, processed sugars and carbs? You know, like you're, you're changing more than one variable there. Um, you know, so if you're paying like that, that stuff is absolutely toxic. And people say, oh, well, there's all these benefits of it. Well, maybe in certain circumstances at certain doses, but you know, a you're, you're not necessarily just getting that in, you know, with the broccoli or whatever, you're getting all this other stuff with it as well. You know, what are those things doing for you? Are they all positive for you as well? Um, you know, e eating a certain amount of broccoli, does that help or whatever? Again, you know, what comparing uh, to what, you know, what, you know, what, where were you coming from before that now you're, you're eating more broccoli, you're more health conscious, you're not smoking, you're not drinking, you're not staying out late, you're exercising, you're more health focused, there's a healthy user bias as well. Um, so there's a lot of different things that go in there. Um, you know, and so, you know, if you're, if you are going away from alcohol and drugs and, um, you know, uh, and, and eating more clean and just being more health conscious, that's going to help your mental health significantly. Um, but, you know, we also see people with, you know, clinically proven with going on a ketogenic diet, help their mental, mental health, even, even curing schizophrenia, right? That's, that's not because they're, they're eating more vegetables. It's because they're eating less carbs and eating less uh, sugar and alcohol and things like that. Um, and, uh, and in fact, I've seen people improve even better when they get rid of all the plants as, as well. There's some sort of, um, you know, factor that is going to be in these plants that, that are going to act as a, you know, a neurotoxin, just like the caffeine will, that whether or not they have carbohydrates, you know, they're not going to be good, uh, for your brain. And, um, you know, and, and people have serious problems. Jordan Peterson was one of these. He went keto, just eating, you know, steaks and salads and it cured a lot of his issues, but he still had the depression and anxiety. Then he dropped the salads and in three weeks, his, his depression and anxiety were gone. I've seen that happen a number of times. And so, you know, you can have people, well, wow, this person goes plant-based and they improve. Great. From where, from what starting point to where they are now, you know, you have to look at all the different factors that, that are in there. And then also, you know, you have to, you have to say, okay, so that, that improves from there, but then why are people improving when they only eat meat, right? You're saying you're eating less meat and you get better. I'm saying you only eat meat and you get way better. And in fact, mine is clinically proven at Harvard. 
right? Where's yours? Where are your studies? Where are your randomized controlled trials with human subjects? They don't exist. And so people are saying that like, wow, th this helps people going to a vegetarian diet. What? And I, that's something I get all the time. It's just like, well, if, if uh, plants are so bad for you, why is it that so many people are, are, are curing their cancer and curing their diseases by going vegan or vegetarian? Well, first of all, are they? Is that clinically proven? Have, they, have there actually been randomized controlled trials or at least interventional trials where they, they've changed that one variable and actually had better outcomes or these you know people, individuals that have had a good outcome but are also doing standard of care, getting chemo and radiation and they went vegetarian at the same time. Well, which one did it? Was it going vegetarian or was it the chemo and the radiation? You know, chemo and radiation actually do work for people. You know, depending on the cancer, it can be it can work extremely well. There are, there are some cancers that we can absolutely cure with chemo and radiation and surgery, and a combination of all three. So you know, it has, may have nothing to do with what you did. Maybe it actually would have uh, been better if you hadn't done that. But again, where did you come from? Were you eating a whole bunch of processed garbage? Every time I talk to people. And they say, well, I actually improved. I went, I went uh, vegetarian, I went plant-based, I went vegan, and I, I just got so much better. My health got so much better. And I said, okay, was the only thing you changed uh, that you stopped eating meat? Oh, yeah, as soon as I, I went vegan, I got better. No, no, no. So that's in the name. So they think, vegan, no meat. I got better when I went vegan, when I said I'm a vegan, right? But what did you actually do when you went vegan? I say, okay, so... So you still eat cake and and uh, drink alcohol and um, you know smoke cigarettes and drink sodas and do all these sorts of oh no 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 I don't I don't do any of that I don't eat out anymore I don't go to restaurants I eat all at home it's all whole foods no processed carbs I cut out sugar I don't drink sodas I stop drinking alcohol I don't smoke anymore it's like okay okay so you you've changed on nine thousand things in your life all of which were were plant based. You know, except like when so you you threw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay, you get improvements. I'm really glad to hear that. You've made very positive moves in your life, you know. But I think that getting rid of meat was not one of those positive moves because I see people and I have people uh, who are my patients that I that I track their bloods, I track their numbers, and they clinically and objectively improve and reverse very serious diseases by going on an only meat diet. So where you know what where's the where's the common ground the common ground is that you're eliminating a lot of bad things you know and um you know if you're eating plants stuff like that you're not going to be as good as if you're only eating meat but you are going to improve from the processed food diet but you know oreo cookies are vegan so so is heroin <laughs> right so you know is that gonna is that gonna help people going on an oreo cookie and and uh heroin diet is that is that you know, is your plant-based friend going to recommend that diet well it's plant-based there's no meat, and the only bad thing on earth is meat. So therefore, uh, Oreo cookies and heroin should be great. They're plant-based. They're vegan, right? So no, obviously that's insane. There are a lot of bad things in this world, right? And uh, the majority of them come from plants, right? Because that's plants make them. They make them on purpose to stop you from eating them. And so, you know, the the idea that you can only, you know, because someone has gotten better on a vegetarian diet, therefore vegetarianism is good. I mean, that's, a, that's you know, uh, fallacious uh, at the start, but uh, it's also not paying attention, you know, because there are other people that are improving just as much, if not more, in fact, more uh, when they're just eating meat, when they're doing the exact opposite. You know, so that's what people don't understand is that it's, it's the processed foods that, that that they're getting rid of, that that's making the, the marked improvement. And those processed foods are plants. Those are plant based processed foods, you know, and that's what's causing harm. This this food that is not food. And I would mm. argue that plants are not food for our species because spe food is very species specific and you know, animals in the wild eat very specific things. But you cannot say that these processed foods are food because they didn't even exist a hundred years ago. Some of them didn't even exist yesterday, you know? So it's, uh, you, you cannot call this stuff food. This stuff is not food. It is it's just highly processed garbage that can provide some nutrition, some nutrients, but that does not make it food. You can get nutrients like, you know, that, that you need, you know, like minerals and, and, uh, you know, like iron and zinc and copper and magnesium, uh, from eating dirt, right? That doesn't make us dirtivores, right? You can get calories, <laughs> which you have to have, you know, from, from drinking Coca-Cola. So, so is eating dirt, drinking Coke and taking a multivitamin. Is that, is that just good enough? You know, is that, is that food? You know, I mean, like, honestly, that would be better than some of the crap people are eating now, 
you know? And so, you know, it, it's a bit, it's a bit, and it's all vegan, you know, dirt and Coca-Cola diet, that's vegan, right? So it must be good for you. So obviously that's, that's not the case. It's a bit, it's a bit silly, but it, it's a bit of a silly argument that you just stop eating meat and, and your life improves so much. Okay. Well, what the hell does that mean? That could mean anything, you know, like a, like a vegan diet just means lack of meat. But, but what, what is the positive? You're talking about the negative is, is, is defined by its negative, which is not eating meat. But what's the positive? What the, what the hell are you supposed to eat? You know, because you can eat fast food all day and be vegan, right? Good luck with that. Yeah, it's a, that's, that's such a great answer. Um, I'm, and I think people forget about the healthy user bias. I have never had anyone come to me and say, I'm going to do one thing for my health today. Because when you start thinking about your health, you realize there are so many things that you you, you can change. And, and I've just never met any. If anyone goes vegan, first thing is well, they're trying their best, aren't they? They're thinking about their health. Yeah. But I bet your bottom dollar, they might start running. They might start, like you say, stop smoking. So I um, just want to get into the super chats. Now, we're not mm -hmm. doing this. is not a fundraiser. It's not a money raising thing. People have been very kind to donate. Um, I think there's quite a few on your channel, Anthony, have. And I think it'd just be nice to just whistle through some of those questions because they've been very kind to, to, to do that. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Uncle Jonga, so we're going to have some great names coming up. Dr. Chavy, how do you manage to stay at your current weight when you've said you often eat OMAD? So I'm assuming they think, how do you keep your muscle? Because it's only mm -hmm. OMAD. And would you share details of your workouts, please? Yeah. So I, I've, I've answered some of these in, in the chats just to make sure that, that people were sort of getting them. But um, yeah, so um, for that, you know, I mean, there's, there's nothing really nothing wrong with doing OMAD, you know? So, I mean, that, that's, that's how much I need to eat. You know, remember if you're eating high density nutrition, you don't need to eat as much or as often. And so I find that if I'm, if I'm just having a normal day, sedentary day where I'm just, you know, working on the computer or at the hospital or seeing patients, I'm, you know, I, I don't need to, I don't need to eat all that much, you know? So I, well, I still eat a lot. I still eat like, you know, two pounds of ribeye, you know, which is, you know, scares some people and other people who are in this space going like, Oh my God, is that all you eat? You know? And so you know, it's different for everyone, but when I'm working out, when I'm able to work out, when I have time to, uh, that will, that will double, that will easily double. I'll be doing, you know, you know four pounds of, of fatty ribeye a day. If it's more lean, it's going to be more than that. Um, so that, so that goes up, but you know, the, the, that's the, the wonderful thing about carnivore is that, you know, you don't, you never get out of shape. This, this is out me out of shape. This is where I'm at out of shape because I, I work out maybe once a month at this point and I just, I just haven't had time. And now I, I, you know, I need to sort of, I need to make time and I need to get back into the routine right now. I'm not in the routine. I work out like once a month. And so this is, this is what it looks like for me when I, I really don't work out. Right. So I never get out of shape. I can get in a lot better shape. And when I work out consistently, I get much more muscular, much more lean and I feel much better too. So I like that. I like working out. Um, and I get, but I never get worse than this. It never gets worse than this, right? Which is kind of nice, you know, but then that's just eating intuitively, just eating as much as or as little as your body is telling you to eat. When I am working out, uh, I, I like to be consistent. I like to work out like at least four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. That was my old schedule when I was playing rugby. So I'd have my rugby, my rugby games and practices on top of that. That was just my lifting schedule. So I've sort of continued on with that. And then, you know, obviously that's not, not always enough for me. So when I have time, I try to add in extra workouts an extra leg day, an extra sprint day, or like, you know, sprint Hills or stairs or something like that. Um, on the, on the other days as well. Uh, and if I'm doing that, I, you know, I feel absolutely amazing and I get very muscular and, uh, even more lean. I, I usually hover around 10% body fat. If I'm not working out, I'll, I'll easily drop down to 6% body fat, uh, without trying just eating, you know, four pounds of beef a day, um, and just working out, you know, and I'm sure I could lean down more than that if I wanted to. Um, but I, I don't particularly care to, I'm not like in a competition or anything like that. Uh, as long as I've got, you know, veins popping out of my abs, like, I think that's, I think that's more than fine. And so, um, so that's what I do. So that's, that's my workout routine is, uh, work out when I can. And when I do, I hit it hard, you know, I mean, I've been working out since I was a kid and, you know, I've, I've been working out at a high level, uh, since I was 14 years old, you know, and so I, I do push myself very, very hard when I do work out. So I get a lot out of it. And because I'm on carnivore, I get a lot out of that. And, um, and so, 
you know, I really enjoy that, that side of things. And so I, I get a lot of, you know, I, I, I do like that, but, um, if you're able to work out, then just go four days a week, you know, start with that, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, set up your workouts for each of those days and, uh, and push it hard, you know, work to exhaustion. You're trying to wear yourself out and let your body, you know, rebuild and regrow. You're on a carnivore diet. You're going to be able to rebuild and you're going to be able to push yourself a lot harder. You're not gonna be able to wear yourself out as nearly as easily and you're going to recover a lot faster and you're going to get a lot more out of it and then you just need to eat enough you have to eat if that's once a day that's fine if it's twice a day it's fine if it's six times a day it doesn't matter just make sure you're getting enough for you and whatever you're doing um and um you know and and that's going to be different for different people most people won't need to eat more than twice a day if they're eating maximally if they're eating to the point of uh of satiety and um even if they're working out a lot. So that's what I would suggest people do. Excellent. Next uh, question. We'll rattle through these. T Alexander, is there a perfect, I think actually think we've covered this, but let's do a quick one. Yeah. Is there a perfect fat to protein rate, protein ratio you should consume daily? Yeah. Yeah. Really just, just, you know, uh, for the individual, you know, aim for that one to one gram, gram for gram, and then adjust from there, you know, depending on if you're working out a lot or you're leaning down or you have a lot of excess body fat or, or you're, you're very slender and you need to put on weight, you know, you might need a different, uh, amount of fat and protein. Most people need around a gram of fat and a gram of protein, um, you know, equal equivalent parts, but you know, some people need a bit more fat. Some people need a bit more protein. You need enough fat. You need enough protein. Listen to your body, listen to your taste signals and uh, just give your body what it needs. That's brilliant. Uh, Nick Ale, will I gain the same amount of muscles doing intermittent fasting 16.8, two meals a day or not fasting and eating breakfast, but I gain the same nutrition during the day? Um, and that's the question basically. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, look, if I, if I think you're eating maximally and, and you're eating to uh, satiety and you're eating to the point that, that meat stops tasting good, um, you probably won't need to eat, uh, multiple times a day. I don't think you need to stick in an eating window. I don't, I, I think that only applies when you're eating carbohydrates and your insulin's going up. And so, you know, you, you get, you get the, the value of doing that intermittent fasting or long-term fasting or whatever, just, just by being, uh, on a ketogenic diet, which carnivore diet is. And so, you know, but, but there might be some, some idiosyncrasies with that, you know, eating like a big bolus of, uh, was it leucine? And then, you know, getting your, your mTOR kick and things like that for, for muscle, um, hypertrophy. So, you know, if you're sort of spacing out smaller meals throughout the day, maybe you're not getting that, that big mTOR hit, the way uh, Richard was talking about. So, um, you know, what, what would you think on that one, Richard? I, I moved it myself there. Yeah, completely agree. Again, it, um, yeah, I completely agree. It, it, you know, it comes back to the point we made earlier, isn't it? About, um, uh, you know, the myth of the, the, the anabolic window um, and consuming these nutrients. But leucine, leucine is the key. Uh, and leucine is found in abundance in, in red meats in particular. We need around three grams to activate mTOR. Um, so typically, you know, uh, any meal that we consume being carnivore is going to activate uh, mTOR and allow us to, to build muscle. I think we can, um, I think we can wait it one way or another through the, the mTOR reset every four hours. Um, but it is, it is incredibly difficult to, to hit this on a daily basis, even with the best will in the world. Um, you know, it's incredibly difficult to activate mTOR four times due to work and lifestyle. Um, but the key is in the mTOR reset. No carbs required, fats and protein. Um, you know, I tend to uh, I tend to recommend around one gram uh, of protein per pound uh, of body weight for a male and around uh, 0.9 for, for a female. But I go considerably over this. Uh, I don't think there's any further advantage to building muscle. <coughs> Once mTOR is activated, you know, you're, you're at the upper threshold. Um, but I love eating meat. I love, <laughs> I love <laughs> my food. So I, um, you know, I, again, I eat until I'm satisfied. And coming back to the point that, uh, you know, Dr. Chafee made about, you know, the volume of food. You know, I can eat stupid amounts of, of food <laughs> some days. And I can go days with eating very little. Um, same situation to Dr. Chafee. I came away from uh, competing professionally last May. Uh, so just over a year ago, um, I'm down three stone in weight, but I'm only down two kilograms in lean body mass, so in muscle mass. 
um, which is incredibly interesting because uh, you know I haven't actually lost an awful lot of muscle. I'm training weights less than than once a week, but I've still you know I've still got the shape. My I'm still ripped with abs uh, and veins running down my arms. Um, uh, I was recently uh, called um, Action Man over He Man, so uh, apparently I used to look like He Man, and now I look like Action Man. But I'll take Action Man. Um, but it just goes to show that you know training once a month or you know, once every few weeks, when you've built this lean mass and you were con- consuming highly nutrient dense food, your body will maintain the shape. If, if I um, I was working away uh, recently with with Phil Taylor, uh, the X star player. Um, 16 times world champion. We went there to support him in, in a comeback. Um, and uh, I went to the gym in, in, in the day. First time I've trained in, in, in three weeks in the gym. Uh, I wore a vest and I was a little bit shady walking into the gym initially because I felt sort of, uh, I felt almost like a little boy because I'd lost all this weight because I'm used to, to bodybuilding instead of running and cycling. Um, within five minutes lifting weights, everything lumped and bumped, everything came back. Um, and, and I was quite pleased with the way that it looked in the mirror. And I'm hardly doing any training. And, and again, you know, uh, I'm sitting similar to, to Dr. Chafee between 8 and 10% body fat from doing very, very little. So this is heavily weighted towards nutrition. Uh, you can't out-train a bad diet. Bad diet. Uh, nutrition is key. Um, and, and I believe, truly believe that carnivore, uh, at least heavily weighted towards animal-based uh, lifestyle is is the key to this. You know, it, you 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 can train all you want, but nutrition is is the number one uh, key to this. Um, so yeah, on to the Brilliant next question. Answer. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just going to put the disclaimer up because we should. This is not medical advice. We're not giving one to one advice. This is purely for education and informational purposes. So if you've got a very very specific question, we can't really do the the patient. Uh, doctor sort of relationship is just giving you some information you can do your own research so ls very kindly donated um father is 72 diabetic on dialysis almost passed away three weeks ago sorry to hear that he's back home now can barely walk is eggs beef the best diet for him what is most optimal for him to do i see him tomorrow uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's 100% the best um, thing for him and, and for anyone to do, you know, regardless of our, of our medical conditions and, pre, and preconditions, we're, we're all still human. So, you know, the, the best thing for us to eat is, is a proper human diet, our biologically appropriate species specific diet, what we are biologically and biochemically designed to eat and benefit the most from and eliminating out all those things that harm us. That's very, very important, right? And that's 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 the why on why you don't eat plants, right? Because they they cause harm. There are some benefits. There are some nutrients that you can get out of them. Not not as much because a lot of them are, are not bioavailable, and they're or as bioavailable. And there are no nutrients that you that are in plants that you have to have that you cannot get from meat. But the reverse uh, is the case. You there are nutrients you have to have that you can only get from meat. You cannot get from plants. So you know, being a, a diabetic, one hundred percent, this is clinically proven to reverse diabetes. Is going on uh, a ketogenic diet, especially when you eliminate out seed oils and linoleic acid and things like that. And a carnivore diet is the perfect one to do for that because you're getting all the animal fats and proteins and all that sort of stuff. You're getting the perfect nutrition and you're eliminating out all the carbs and and seed oils and things like that. So that will reverse diabetes, type two diabetes, type one diabetes. It will will perfectly control because you'll get, you'll get perfectly controlled blood sugar and uh, you only have to take, you know, uh, you'll take a much, much less insulin as a result of that, which is very beneficial for a lot of reasons. Um, And then on dialysis, dialysis is, is, tough you know your, your kidneys are not really functioning anymore they may not ever function again and you know and, and uh you know normally here to we thought that they would never function again that that that's sort of it but i've seen you know anecdotally that i've seen now three people come off of dialysis uh on a carnivore diet it took like from nine months to a year but they actually started making urine again which is insane um, but what you're doing is you're, you're eliminating out a lot of things that are nephrotoxic. So they're toxic to the kidneys, right? Uh, like oxalates, but many other things are, are nephrotoxic as well. And you're providing actual proper nutrition for your body. And, uh, people think, Oh my goodness, you know, uh, you know, 
protein gets broken down into to uh, you know ammonia and that it turns into urea and that's that, that's a problem for clearance out of our, our of our kidneys so that's going to be harder on your kidneys in fact that's that's not the case in in the actual studies that have have looked at this they actually find that no actually more protein equals better kidney function now you don't have any kidney function it may be a bit of a moot point but it's certainly not going to make it worse and um, and if you don't have kidney function at all anyway, it's definitely not going to make it worse because how can how can you get worse than zero, right? So um, it's going to help in many 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 other ways. Um, it will definitely help with the diabetes. It I can't say it's going to fix the, the dialysis because you know that's that there's there's such a thing as damage done, and people can um, you know you can you can permanently damage your organs unfortunately. Uh, but it's certainly not going to hurt him. It's certainly not going to hurt them. And um, you, you never know. I just, I've ceased, I, I, I never cease to be amazed. Like I've seen when, when I, I say this before, but like when, when you start seeing, you know, people with Huntington's disease start to improve on a carnivore diet, then you're like, okay, what the hell is going on? This is just nuts. That's supposed to be like a hundred percent penetrance. If you have that gene, you will get that disease period. There's nothing you can do. You're never going to stop it. It doesn't matter. It's coming. And that's horrible. That's a really scary thing to deal with. And, you know, it's just a matter of time. And once it's gone, well, you have a little shake. Oh shit. Is it starting? Oh my God. Have I got, have I got, you know, you know, my, is the clock ticking already? You know, like that's terrifying. Now people are getting better on that. That is nuts. That is nuts. And then, you know, again, three people getting, coming off dialysis, you know, that, that could have been a complete fluke. You never know. But it's going to be better in a lot of other ways as well. Certainly not going to hurt, and um, and it will. It, I, I think it will help uh, in a lot of in a lot of ways. So yeah, definitely beef and eggs. I think he also asked in there um, about water. Uh, when you're not making when you're not making urine, you know it doesn't matter if you're on carnivore or not. You have to you have to limit the amount of water that you drink uh, because it's only coming off with dialysis and you know, sweat things like that. Um, so that just whatever direction there his doctor is saying on 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 how much water to drink is should just stick with that rich did you want to add anything let me unmute that um no i mean spot on the, the only thing that i wanted i think dr chief has answered everything in regards to that but i mean coming back to you know watching and seeing huntington's disease being reversed and things uh you know dementia which we're told is uh you know mm -hmm. hereditary and, and uh uh, and genetic, you know, it, it's uh, dementia is 99.9% um, preventable, um, you know, just going off on one really quickly, I, I know we're under pressure with this, but, you know, Alzheimer's is affected by the glucaminergic neurotransmitters, um, and these need rapid energy from glucose, uh, and some of the nerve cells can only use glucose for energy, uh, so, you know, because they don't have mitochondria, uh, and only mitochondria can use ketones for energy. You know, glucose passes into the brain through the GLUT1 transporter, and most of the cells use GLUT3 transporters, both of which are insulin independent, meaning they do not need insulin. But the hippocampus also uses GLUT4 transporter, which is insulin dependent, which means the hippocampus requires insulin. Now, the issue with this is in a situation of insulin resistance, we flood the brain, uh, uh, the blood brain barrier with insulin, and over time it causes receptors to downregulate, meaning the brain can literally be swimming in a sea of glucose. Uh, unable to utilize it for energy um, and this is why dietary intervention is, is so important too much carbohydrates leads to this insulin resistance uh, these oxidative foods uh, high in the nitric acid cause all of these issues uh, and, and this is why it is diet related all of these these illnesses and diseases that we look at and we believe are hereditary and um, you know cancers because it runs in my family we eat what our parents uh, eat you know we are mm. um, we are uh, you know prodigies of, of, of our parents and me so you know it's not the case of it's the genetics it's the foods that we are eating and yeah Huntington has been reversed Alzheimer's preventable and 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 maintainable manageable um the things that I've seen the diet achieve and reverse is absolutely incredible but apologies going off for one again there but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay um and the final one on the super chat uh, which is carny for health what would you suggest for blastocystis uh, hominis which is, uh, just for people that don't know what that is that's a single cell parasitic thing that grows in your uh, digestive tract unless anthony wants to put me right uh mm. carnivore for over four years ibsd over 20 years what would you suggest yeah. 
Uh, you know, unfortunately, that's not, not something that I that I treat, so I wouldn't have a great uh, answer for that. But you know, as far as nutrition is concerned, keep doing what you're doing with carnivore. You could add in some, uh, you know, sort of fermented sort of dairy products. You know, the live culture uh, yogurt. You know, without any any sugar or anything like that. Um, you know, people like you know kefir, kefir, however you, you want to pronounce it. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've looked at a lot of uh, the products, and they have tons of sugars in them. So I don't know if they add those back in or, or what, but they're not supposed to, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be fully fermented out of there. Um, but so don't get those. Um, and I would, um, yeah, I would just eat that way. And then, you know, you need to sort of, you know, talk to your, your doctor and see if you need to be on any sort of, um, pharmacological treatments as well. I don't, I don't think that, you know, you know, medicines are always out of bounds. It's just, you know, in, in specific things, I think the vast majority of illnesses we can treat with, with diet and diet alone. And in fact, those are the only treatments for it because it's the diet that's causing them, you know, so they only, you have to, you have to address the diet to address the root cause. But, uh, there are other things like you have, you know, blastocystis hominis where you're, uh, you know, you have, you have some little bug that's running around and, um, if your body's having trouble clearing it, that's, that's a time when, uh, medications can be very helpful. You could, I suppose you could look at sort of nature's antibiotics, like maybe ginger or, um, garlic, apparently, uh, I'm, I'm not great with herbs, but that's just, I'll just put that into the mix, but yeah, uh, Rich. Yeah, look, I mean, it's, you know, we're carnivore. Uh, we preach this way of living where we do not consume any vegetables, but less, you know, medicines come from, from plants. Uh, and I believe that, um, you know, that's what they're there for. They're there to treat certain things. I would be dead now if I hadn't consumed or taken medication at diff you know, various points in my life. So there's a place for it. But medication, um, you know, is a tool. You know, we should not be we, we, we don't consume medication unless we're sick. Uh, if we're sick, you know, OK, take some medication. Um, but look at the root cause. Let's let's look at what's causing this problem. And uh, what's my <laughs> Steve going off on it? But uh, you know, it, I'm I'm not a lover of plants, but I, I think you know, as you know, Doctor Chief, he says there's um, there's definitely a case for for medication as and when. But um, mm. t take it as and when you need it, but not it's not preventative. You can't use you don't take medication unless you have a problem. And if you live this lifestyle, it's very likely that you won't have the problem in the first place. Um, you know, I can't remember the last time that I've, I've taken medication, you know, of, of any kind. Um, yeah, I, I genuinely can't. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, years and years since I've taken medication because I'm not um, I'm not becoming sick. I don't you know, I, I, I don't feel sick. I don't get tired anymore uh, it, it, it comparatively to carbohydrates. Um, I don't come down with illnesses. Um, it's been a long time since I've had to take any medication for the doctor. And to, just to circle back to a point that um, the doctor chief you made earlier, um, you know, I went to my doctor after reversing my type two diabetes, um, which he couldn't do with medication uh, and said, fantastic, you've reversed your diabetes, but now I recommend you come off this diet uh, as it's gonna mm -hmm. make you sick. And it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, I just reversed my diabetes when you couldn't with medication and now you're telling me to eat the way that I was eating that made me sick in the first place. I have not been back to my doctor since, uh, and that was 10, 11 years ago. Um, and it just baffles me how people who are clearly intelligent can't take a step back, look at the bigger picture and realize that the way that we are living um, is, is healing and, and, and repairing the body and reversing things in ways that they can't do with medication. So look, I'm not against medication. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, you take medication if you're sick, if you live this lifestyle, um, you'll find that you're not sick very often. Well, I think in the, in the most basic way of looking at it, bacteria will thrive on what you feed it. So if you, mm. if you take out what it likes, it's going to die off anyway, which is, which is why we get some improvements, isn't it? Once you get the carbohydrates out, a lot of the bacteria are not getting the food they need. So I think, carnivore does resolve most most issues that i come across with where it's gut issues i think the, the improvement is huge but things like parasites are a little bit different aren't they um right warwick what do i do if i'm not producing stomach acid he's used uh, B, uh hcl and digestive enzymes they don't seem to work yeah well, well so 
you know, I mean, is this, is this an actual fact that you don't produce stomach acid? Because I think you'd be the only one, you know, um, and, and you know, may, you may have, you know, symptoms that you feel that you're not, you're not having as good digestion, or maybe you're feeling that you're getting bloated or, or weird sort of symptoms, um, you know, and that, and that's one thing, but you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not creating any stomach acid. It'd be very difficult for you to be alive right now if you weren't making any stomach acid. Um, because you, you need it, right? You do need this stuff to start uh, the initial process of, of breaking down your food, any food. And so the 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 B10 HCL, um, I'm not. I mean, I've never used that, but from my understanding, that's like a like a like an herbal supplement sort of thing. Um, and I, I don't know if that is actually very acidic. I don't I don't really know. I understand that some people take that to sort of help them digest and things, but I I don't, I don't know. Um, and, uh, digestive enzymes don't seem to work. So, I mean, the, the main problem is, is not, you know, so you, you sort of diagnose yourself, you say, I don't produce stomach acid. So how do I fix that? But what are your symptoms? What are you feeling? What is the problem? Um, because it could be something else. It could be that there's something else that's going on that's causing the symptoms that you're experiencing it has nothing to do with stomach acid. If you, if you do want to maximize your stomach acid and the acidity of your stomach, then you need to avoid drinking water, but you know, around meals. So you have to like for two hours before a meal, you don't drink any water. You don't, you don't put anything in your body. You don't, you don't, don't put anything down your mouth. And, um, and, uh, and then you'll, you'll eat and then that will concentrate this up. So, you know, if you have, you know, a half a cup of stomach acid sort of sitting around and you drink eight cups of, uh, of water, you know, during the day or four cups of water during the day, you're, you're going to dilute the, that down to a 12th of what it was before. And so you're, you're going to have a much more dilute, um, much more dilute, uh, stomach acid, right? So that's not what you want. Uh, you want that stuff to be very potent and very acidic. And so you don't want to dilute it. And so, you know, just don't, don't drink water for a couple hours before you eat a meal. See how you go, you know, see what that does for you. Don't drink water during the meal. Don't drink water for another hour or two after your meal. See what that does for you. Um, but again, I, I don't know what, what symptoms you're experiencing. And so I, I don't really know how, how much better to help you because, um, you know, you're taking all these digestive enzymes. So obviously you have some sort of digestive issue, um, if you don't have stomach acid, um, I don't think you'd be here. So, you know, it's like, like you have to be making stomach acid, you know, you really, and maybe you're not, but, uh, if you're not, then you're not. And you just have to sort of, <laughs> you sort of deal with that as best you can. You still need to eat meat. You know, meat is what we're designed to eat and it's going to be the most bioavailable. It's going to be easiest to break down. So, you know, if you're eating plants, you definitely need your stomach acid. You need to start, you know, really, 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 you know, put the chemical thumb screws to this stuff to uh, try to extract any nutrients out of that crap. And so, you know, you want to, um, you know, you want to eat what's very bioavailable, which is, which is meat. So, you know, eat meat, drink water, but don't drink water two hours before or after your meals and, and see how you go. Can I uh, just add a little bit there as well? And don't forget your mechanical digestion. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe chew your food more, just yeah. Uh, actually enjoy it a little bit more look at it before you start eating it uh just to get everything flowing a bit just take your time but i think mechanical digestion is is really really underrated you know i know i sound like your your parents now but if you yeah. chew your food properly it's going to help a little bit definitely going to help um mm. yeah rich sorry no fantastic yeah nothing to add with, with any of that that's uh, fantastic um one want... of the comments that, that have popped up on the side though by low carb low drama um dr chafee any link to the debate you have done with a guy who convinced mccola long-term ketosis was unhealthy you know dr chafee and i recorded a little piece with this didn't we which we haven't released and i think we're going to redo when we um but you you did record one with um um uh georgie is it georgie yeah georgie um, dinkoff yeah. yeah yeah georgie dinkoff that's it yeah so i guess they're looking for a link to, to that but i i think you and i are still on for recording mm -hmm. uh our thing to this which we did prior to this one isn't it but um yeah. um yeah so, so they've just asked that question there which i thought i'd just read out now as it uh, uh as it was something yeah. you know, that we put a lot of effort into wasn't it we did yeah and so you know uh which yeah i thought i thought that was great we did um we, we addressed sort of all the different points that was made that were made in that in that discussion uh with marcola and um there's there's certainly evidence to the contrary 
You know, one of the main points of evidence to the contrary is that, you know, I've been doing this for six years and I don't have high cortisol and I don't have abdominal fat and, uh, adipo and, and, and central adiposity and, and visceral fat. Um, you know, and so, you know, and, and we see this a lot. And in fact, there are actual studies, you know, with, uh, with patients that are put on a ketogenic diet and, uh, one in one study, uh, after eight weeks, their, uh, cortisol levels actually significantly went down. You know, and so there's a, there's a mix. Some go up, some go down. There was one that, that followed people for two years. It was, it was a very long-term study for, for ketosis or people on keto. Is this safe long-term? And this followed people for two years. And so the argument was like, well, if you're on, if you're on uh, keto, eventually your, your cortisol will go up uh, high enough that you actually, you'll stall your weight loss. You won't lose any, you won't lose any weight. But, you know, in this study with two, uh, for people with two, for two years follow-up, they found that actually they lost a lot of weight and it was statistically significant. So they, uh, statistically, st statistically significant, they lost a statistically significant amount of weight, um, uh, that was significant. So they lost a significant amount of weight that was statistically significant. Jesus, that was harder to say than it should have been. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, so, you know, and, and their cortisol levels actually hadn't changed, you know, and, and, and in fact, they found that all the symptoms, of hypercortisolism were ameliorated, right? And that's actually something that that shows up, you know, in, in study after study after study, is that when you are, um, regardless of what your cortisol level is, the symptoms and signs of hypercortisolism, so having higher than physiologically acceptable levels of cortisol, uh, they go away. You know, they get better, right? And even to the extent that people actually really do have like Cushing's disease or Cushingoid syndrome or Cushing's syndrome, Cushing's disease, um, you know, that they are going to need surgery or medical intervention. They're put on a ketogenic diet beforehand because this actually helps ameliorate the, the effects of hypercortisolism being in ketosis, right? And so they're put on a ketogenic diet before and after surgical or medical intervention to, to treat the primary cause. So that, I mean, that, that's very telling, you know, um, is that, you know, that, that people actually get better. They, they don't have the hypercortisol problems on ketosis. In fact, th those problems get better. Um, and people wondering about, you know, well, are you going to gain weight? Well, no, there's that, that study for two years. No, they didn't gain weight. They got lost a lot of weight. There's a study looking at kids with, uh, epilepsy. They're put on a ketogenic diet. Um, because their doctors had some damn sense and they, uh, you know, they were very slender, slim kids. They're like, Oh, Hey, you know, uh, maybe they're too skinny. Maybe this isn't, this isn't healthy. And so they came off a ketogenic diet, uh, and they found that as soon as they came off, they just, pff, their weight slammed up. Right. And so they actually gained, they gained a significant amount of weight after that. And so it's, um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's differences in the literature. And so it just depends on the studies that you're looking at. And, but if you're looking at, you know, broad range of these, you know, you, you'll, you'll set definitely find examples of, of very big, you know, high level, you know, very high quality, uh, studies that actually show, Hey, actually, you know, you know, it, this doesn't increase cortisol or if it does, it's, it's marginal. And in fact, the, the, but it's not giving the symptoms of high, of high cortisol. Some people think that in fact, that, that rise in cortisol that you see in some of these studies is, is actually good. That's that, that they were actually, below where they should have been physiologically. And now this is actually correcting back up to where it should be. And people with metabolic syndrome, which is a lot of people, um, you have, you have, um, depressed cortisol levels. So, you know, this is something that I've, that, that people who listen to me know, you know, that I've spoken about that, that, that the reference ranges and uh, studies in, or in lab, labs and things like that are just garbage because it's just the average for the community. So the first 2000 people that come into get te lab tests that year, that's the reference ranges, right? Because it's the average for your community. Well, you're in, you're in that range, you're in that good range of what people are at. Well, people are sick, you know, 92% of Americans have at least one metabolic, uh, issue. 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. The rest of the world is right there with us. All right. So some of them are worse. Um, you know, as far as, as far as obesity is concerned, America's only number 19 which is way higher than it should be. But it's like there's 18 other countries with higher obesity rates in America. So people talking about, you know, just mad trash about how, you know, fat and obese Americans, there's 18 other ones that are worse, 
right? And a lot worse, actually. I think we're at like 42%. I think some of the Pacific Islands are like 60% obesity, not even overweight and obese, but obesity. So, you know, you don't want to measure yourself up against the average person. So, you know, it, you, you can have these differences in reference ranges. And so you're looking at your cortisol and you're going like, oh, wow, their cortisol um, level goes up a bit. And, oh, that's not good. It's, it's above the reference range, or maybe it's on the high end of that reference range. It's like, okay, well, maybe everyone else is too low. And maybe that's what that reference range is looking at. You're looking at a bunch of sick people with metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome is known to depress uh, cortisol below, you know, sub physiological levels. So there, there's a lot of a lot of sort of um, uh, you know reasons why that could be. But at the end of the day, there is no such thing as as essential carbohydrate. And um, you know, a number of different um, you know uh, bodies. There was the International Institute of Medicine or something. I, I'm, I'm butchering the name, but. Um, you know, they, they, they've said that, you know, there's, you know, absolutely no such thing as an essential carbohydrate, you know, the amount of carbohydrates you need throughout your entire life to, you know, to, uh, be healthy is, uh, is apparently zero, you know, because there are, you know, a number of different, uh, you know, civilizations alive right now that don't eat any carbohydrates or maybe just like, you know, once a year when, when fruits in season, uh, for a couple of weeks and the rest of you that don't eat any or others that don't eat any carbohydrates at all throughout their entire existence, generation after generation, and with seemingly no, uh, uh, negative health outcomes and health ramifications because of this. So, uh, you don't need them. You know, if you had, if you had a whole bunch of hormonal, um, issues, thyroid depression, things like that, uh, the Inuit would be dead. All of our ancestors during the ice ages would be dead. Uh, they would all have been, um, you know, bred out because you get cretinism. That's what what uh, hyper uh, hy <laughs> congenital hypocortisolism is is cretinism, or sorry, congenital hypothyroidism is 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 um, cretinism, and that and that is a very serious. Um, birth defect and congenital abnormality where people don't develop properly, have very short stature, small brains, uh, you know, changes, you know, very specific changes to their facial features, and they're quite intellectually impaired and uh, and physically weaker and impaired as well. So, I mean, that that, that doesn't go too far when you're out there in, in the the tundra hunting mammoth and things like that. Like, so you're, like you're on your game or you're dead, and so um, that that doesn't make any sense. So. You know, there's a lot, of, there's a lot for that. But you know, I actually like that debate. It was, uh, you know, George is actually a really nice guy. We actually, you actually see eye to eye on a lot more than that. That Mercola interview, I think, I think is, um, uh, is, is, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that's, I think it's, it's sort of harsher, I guess, than than what it appeared that he actually, you know, sort of espoused during our discussion. He was just like, actually, I'm I'm fine with carnivore. Uh, I just think that you should do it in a very specific way to you know maximize your your health and results. And I was like, no, that's that's, that's fair enough. Um, and you know, we we agreed on a lot of things, and we you know, we differed on a few others. But it was very it was very uh, collegial. I was uh, actually it was a very enjoyable discussion. Um, that's going to be on Brian Grin's. Uh, podcast so G R Y N, um, and I did. I was on his podcast before, and uh, he hasn't. I haven't haven't gotten an email from him uh, yet. But he was saying he's going to try to get it out in the next sort of couple of weeks. But I don't think it's out yet. So long winded answer. <laughs> um, it's not out yet. <laughs> yeah. You see, Anthony, you've been hanging around with Richard too long. No. Yeah. <laughs> and with a bad crowd, I've or maybe he's been hanging out with me. Like I've never been good at that. I've. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a great question, Rich, if it's okay, just one of the submitted ones, because I feel people have gone out of their way. Is that is that okay, Rich? Because I know you've got some there. But this might interest you as well as Dr. Chafee. Um, the, the question is, why would I have tested low in folate after more than two years carnivore and eight months of beef, beef fat only? Uh, could low folate cause anxiety, which I currently suffer? And she's put a little bit of context in, because, Anthony, you were asking for a bit more context yeah. she's currently stage three bone she currently has stage three bone cancer which has been stable for two years i suspect some damage from the ct scan contrast dye and i've switched mm. to mri scans so it's, it's basically why is it low why is it low folate um i know a little bit more that that person was told actually she wouldn't be around to be asking this question a year ago so um yeah why would she have tested low folate with eight months beef and beef fat only 
Yeah. Well, look, every, everyone has a bit of, you know, different demands, um, you know, that their, their body goes through and you'll have a different sort of metabolism as well. People have the MTH, uh, FR genes. I always look at that. And I always think it's the mother effer gene and, um, and <laughs> that's what it, that's what it is. And, um, but, uh, that, it, you know, impairs your ability to, um, you know, to process folate. So, so you can, you can be getting in dietary folate and it's not really going to be doing as much for you. It's just, it's just sort of impairs that. And, um, uh, and that's okay. You know I mean? Actually, you know, when, when you're eating regeneratively raised, uh, you know, beef or, or wild animals and things like that, you know, you're going to have a much higher level of folate. So, uh, for example, I saw a regeneratively, uh, regenerative farmer, rancher um uh, who's giving a talk i think at hillsdale and he was saying that that um that normal chicken eggs in america that's like the usda puts out that they're they're marked as having 41 milligrams of folate uh per egg right but his eggs have over a thousand milligrams per egg right so you, you're talking you know, 25, 30 times the amount of folate in, in a chicken that's just fed with the hell it's supposed to eat, you know, which is not hard to do, you know? And so, you know, it's much more nutrient nutritionally dense. And so, uh, you know, from, from a, a, you know, bang for your buck sort of point of view, it's like, well, it's more expensive to do that. It's like, yeah, but you're, you don't need to eat as much because, you know, it's much more nutriently, nutritionally, uh, packed. Um, same with beef, you know, there, I've spoken to different ranchers. They do regeneratively raised, uh, you know, uh, beef, um, you know, grass fed and finished, you know, rotating their cows around different pastures and they, and they, and they're reporting and publishing their nutritional values are like four or five times in like every micronutrient vitamin and mineral that you care to look at, you know, even, even getting like, you know, 120, 150 milligrams of vitamin C, you know, which is like people say, oh, there's not enough vitamin C. Like, well, then, then, then that, you know, there's, there's more than you need. There's all more than you need anyway, um, because you just need far less when you're not eating a bunch of plants. But, um, you know, so we're not eating what we're, what is perfect for us anymore. Right. So we're not eating, you know, just wild caught mammoth, which is what we sort of, uh, you know, grew up eating and just wild animals in general. So the wild animals are going to be more healthy. The regeneratively raised animals are going to be more healthy. Um, some people, you know, like with the, those, that gene variation are going to need uh, a bit more folate. And if you're not getting that from just the store-bought uh, sort of meat and eggs that you're getting, you know, you probably need to add in some uh, liver. Liver's got a lot of folate. Um, you know, most people don't need it. Most people do just fine with just uh, skeletal, uh, skeletal uh, meat and fat, but um, you know it's uh, it is much more packed with nutrients. And so if you if you find yourself deficient for whatever reason, you know, fine, you know, just just eat you know eat some more organs, you know, eat some more liver or something like that. Don't go go overboard and go too far on the other end because then you get hypervitaminosis and you get you can get a, a, you know a, too much vitamins and minerals sort of building up, especially the fat soluble vitamins and, you know, copper and things like that from beef liver. And so, you know, you just, just add that back in you. It may be that you, you have that gene variation and you just need a bit more folate and just for, you know, the type of, uh, meat that you have access to, it, you know, it's not enough, but you know, it could potentially cause some anxiety. Um, you know, stranger things have happened. Generally that's not, I, I don't think that's, um, I, you know, I don't know if, that, if that's a typical, uh, side effect of this, but there are, are other ones that are more typical of low folate levels. But uh, but either way, you know, you feel like there's something a bit off. You have this number that's a bit off. You can correct it and see how that goes. Just add in a bit of liver, you know, to, you know, sort of have that, you know, a, a, you know, a bit of that, you know, a couple ounces a day or a couple ounces, you know, three times a week. Check it again in uh, a month and see where you're at. And if you have to eat more liver, eat more liver. If you got to take a folate vitamin, take a folate vitamin. It's not a big deal. Rich, did you uh, want to get back to your questions that you got for Dr. Chafee? Apologies, uh, I've got so many. I don't. I don't think eight <laughs> minutes. I don't think would be long enough. But I mean, just 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 to add to that as well that you know medications can prevent the absorption. Uh, for it uh, overcooking your meats can do so as well so i mean this is mm -hmm. why i tend to you know cook my steak rare um and and source of of uh, of nutrients as as dr chafee 
like he says about the source of eggs, it's the same with the source of meats and things. So all of these things, uh, I'm a big fan of organ meats, uh, beef liver in particular, fantastic source. Um, for lit, I, I did a, a, an interesting podcast recently with, um, oh my goodness, uh, Patrick Holford, who um, is an expert in Alzheimer's. Uh, and these neurotransmitter signals in the brain, um, you know, affect Alzheimer's as well as mood and depression and anxiety. Uh, and folate, uh, as well as B12 and omega-3, is a big factor. Um, so folate is, is definitely uh, an issue, B12, B6. Um, you know, uh, homocysteine uh, is an amino acid. Uh, vitamin B, B12, B6 and folate break on homocysteine to create other chemicals that the body needs in high homocysteine levels. Um, may mean that you have a, a vitamin deficiency. Um, so, so we need to treat that with, you know, extra vitamins and minerals. And, and as Dr. Chafee says, the, one of the best sources uh, is uh, animal proteins, particularly uh, organ meats. I'm a big lover of, uh, of beef liver. Um, I haven't been able to consume it raw yet, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if, if, if you've, uh, if you've, if you're a lover and connective tissue as well. Connective tissue mm. is, is a thing that a lot of people tend to miss. Um, you know, I eat the gristle on the bone and, and all the stringy bits on the steak and, and on the bone and things. And these are pieces that people cut off, which are highly nutrient dense and, and full of collagen and other vitamins and minerals. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's one thing that I wouldn't mind hitting you with before, <laughs> before you go. So it within the keto and carnival community uh, recently, I noticed there's been a shift over to cycling carbohydrate, especially with with females around um, cycles, uh, particularly to do with the production of progesterone. Um, we're told that we need, you know, a week before cycle uh, to increase carbohydrates, to increase uh, progesterone. And I, I, the research that I've done has led me to believe that it's not so much the carbohydrates, it's the case that we just need to be consuming the nutrients. And this could be as simple as consuming more nutrients from a carnival ketogenic lifestyle, uh, not typically consuming from carbohydrate, um, uh, and while avoiding fasting. Uh, but you know, th there are a few influencers who I, I highly respect within the community who have posted this a, a few times lately about cycling carbohydrates for a week before cycling and, and not fasting. The not fasting, I agree with. The carbohydrates, I can't, I can't get my head around that because mm. I just don't understand from an evolutionary perspective. Men and women were consuming the same foods. I don't understand why a female would be consuming more carbohydrate around certain times of the month. And I, and I, I believe that it's to do with lack of nutrients from just in general, as in protein and fat, and not, you know, carbohydrates. So we we do see an increase in progesterone where we increase carbohydrate. But we also see an increase when we increase meats and fat. So, do, do you have an opinion on that? Is it a case of do we need carbohydrate? I I, I think I already know the answer, uh, but it's uh, um, you know it's it's nice to to, to have a soundboard. But I, you know this is what I advise to to, to the, the female clients that I work with: eat more a week leading up to your cycle, but you do not need to cycle carbohydrate. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think you need to either. Um, you know, like like you said, people were eating the same things. You know, I mean, like you know, female lions eat the same thing as as male lions, even during estrus or leading up to estrus, and same with every single other animal on earth. Um, animals eat what animals eat. They eat the same thing. You know, once you're weaned, um, you know, from your mother's milk as a mammal, you eat what the adults eat basically until you die. You know, and, and that's pretty much it. And, you know, the other animals don't, they don't, they don't sort of eat slightly different variation, variation wise, not really, you know, they, they, you know, especially, you know, predators, they hunt, they take down the same animal, they eat the same animal, they all eat it together. And, you know, and cows eat grass, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and quality eat eucalyptus. And, um, oh, and there's a, there's a, our resident expert, uh, was pretty apropos for this question on fertility and whether women should, uh, cycle uh, carbs the week before i don't think they they need to i don't think that it makes any um sense that they would um and you know when were they going to have access to this i mean they can't just go down to seize candy and get a box of chocolates you know as they do now and um you know so you especially in a, in a in a, an ice age or something like that you know you're like you may you may want a box of chocolates but guess what you know there aren't any and uh, and so what are, you're eating mammoth you're, you're eating mammoth. That's what you're eating. That's what, but I want you. Well, you're eating mammoth. All right. That's what we have. 
All right. And so, you know, if, if that didn't work uh, for our fertility, we, we wouldn't be here. It's almost it's almost written in the stars that Dr. Robert Kiltz will walk in when we're talking about fertility. So uh, can I just sum up Dr. Anthony Chafee's first three hours? That that was fantastic, <laughs> Anthony, and really appreciate the generosity of your time there no, um, to help us with the kickoff and hand the bat on to a fantastic Dr. Robert Kiltz here, mm. which is great. Um, do you want to give us some final thoughts, Anthony, when you go off? Oh gosh, no! I'm just, I just thank you guys. It's been great. You know, I've been looking forward to this for a while. It's sort of a, it's, it's, it's a very, um, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a big endeavor that you guys are, are taking on. You know, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I think, yeah, I think it'll be fun for people to see. You know, you're on hour 22 and 23. You're not going to be drooling and oh, uh, you know, you're going to be fine. You're going to be, you're going to be a bit more worse for wear. Uh, but you'll be fine. You'll still be talking about everything. You'll still be happy and kill it going. You'll still have a ton of energy. So uh, I'm sure you'll sleep very well after that. But um, you know, you won't need uh, you know caffeine or anything else. And so this will be just to show people like, wow, look at that. Look what you can do uh, when you're when you're giving your body what it needs. So you know, hats off to you guys uh, for doing that. I'm glad I could help. No, oh, appreciate oh, that. Yes, well appreciated. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Doctor Jeffy, where, where can people find you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, thank you for having me on. Um, so, you know, my, my main, uh, YouTube channel is just Anthony Chafee MD and that's where I have you know, most of my podcasts and, and videos everything sort of goes up there. I have my podcast if people just want to listen to it and that's just Anthony Chafee or sorry, that's just the plant free MD. And then my Instagram is just again, Anthony Chafee MD and you can, you can find the rest of my socials all through that, but those, those are the main ones anyway. Fantastic, Rich. We have two fantastic podcasts on, so I, I urge you guys to check those out. Those yeah. are fantastic. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. We'll have a, a third coming out soon. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and I think we've got a few okay. more to record of me. So uh, take care, my mm-hmm. man. Um, yeah, we'll touch base soon. Have a good one. No thanks problem. again. Dr. Kiltz, good to see good you, sir. Uh, Dr. Chafee, always amazing <laughs> to see you. Great, great strength in the story. We appreciate what you are doing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, Amazing. you're very welcome. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, everyone. This is everyone's working very well as a team. It's a good, good team effort. Look forward, forward to seeing you very soon. Connected. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, looking forward you know, to it. I've just, I've just realised I missed a trick. What we should have done is got the person before to inter, intro, introduce the next person. That would have been yeah. quite good. Well, there you go. So, yeah. So well, what, you can you, you, you sort of roll it down for the rest of them. <laughs> Put Dr. Kilt on the spot. Now he's got to come up with an introduction uh, for for whoever's next. Yeah, yeah that's the uh, that's the downside because you two guys were on reverse, weren't you? You know each other, I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Well, uh, let's let's get on to Dr. Robert Kiltz. Thank you, Anthony, okay. once again. That's You're welcome. Great. Good to see you guys and Thank enjoy. You. Have an awesome yeah. day. See ya. Thanks, you too. So, Dr. Kiltz, would you like Hello. to just introduce yourself to the people that don't know you, what, what, what you're about, what your expertise is? Well, my name is Dr. Rob Kiltz, and I'm a fertility specialist. I specialize in helping those that are suffering from fertility issues, can't get pregnant, miscarriages, genetic issues, uh, both uh, medical and surgical treatments. In vitro fertilization is the main thing I practice. I own and run CNY Fertility Centers, which is a large fertility center in America, but we see uh, uh, couples and individuals from all over the globe. Uh, I fell into the uh, keto carnivore space about 15 years ago. I've been focusing mostly on carnivore for myself, but I share both avenues. And health and wellness is something that um, I think is paramount to uh, all of us. And we've been uh, shared the wrong story the master of messaging has basically give us the wrong story of who and what we are. And that's the cause of our suffering. And like the good book that Dr. Uh, uh, Ken Berry's written about the lies my doctor told me, realizing that most of us in in Western medicine essentially uh, fed, um, I believe, a lot of lies that uh, lead us down the wrong direction. We've been taught to treat disease with symptom relief, but not getting to the core foundation of the cause of disease. And so my real passion is to get to the core of the cause and help people uh, become their own doctor, practitioner, and leader of their life instead of uh, wondering and worrying that someone else has to give you numbers and data that 
may be distracting and completely incorrect. So here I am, uh, Fertility Doc, upstate New York mostly, but all around the country and the world. And I'm uh, really grateful that you've invited me here, uh, uh, Stephen and Richard. So thank you. Have you met thank Richard you before? No, no, I, I don't I think so. Whoa. No, I'm, we'll, let um, me do the English thing. Robert, this is Richard. Richard, this is Robert. <laughs> Robert awesome. Nice to meet you. Awesome. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Great. We'll have to get you on the podcast. Um, yeah, fantastic. Stephen and I, uh, we do a weekly live on a Sunday. Obviously, we've both got our own podcast shows. Obviously, you've, you've been on uh, Stephen's, I believe. But it's, uh, yeah, fantastic. We, we're trying to spread the word as best we can and really appreciate you coming on. So thank you. Absolute pleasure. Well, yeah. Again, my, my pleasure. Well, I feel like I already know you, Stephen, uh, for, for a number of years now. And again, really inspired by what everyone's doing in this community. Very positive, sharing ideas that are radical. Uh, but I think we're seeing tremendous amount of improvement uh, in people's health and wellness. Yeah. And I think Richard sure. will be right up your street, Rob, because he is absolutely on it with the science. I mean, really on it with the science. We could have done a 24 hour live stream with just Richard answering one question. <laughs> so, so let's do a nice broad quiz, uh, question for you, Mr. Kiltz. Uh, let's do this. Um, why carnivore? Why did you, you know, what drove you to this crazy way of eating? A crazy concept that carnivore cures. And it really, uh, so much of life is accidental. And, and uh, for me, I, I, I'm a fertility specialist. I actually introduced uh, a lot of um, uh, Eastern medicine into my practice, meditation, prayer, yoga, acupuncture, massage, about 20 years ago. And uh, many of my patients were leaving the fertility treatments because it was too stressful. So anything we can do to reduce stress was so important. Uh, and then, and then uh, many of them were getting pregnant on a diet called paleo. And essentially, I didn't know much about nutrition because none of us know anything about nutrition, I've, I've come to believe. But um, I, I suffered also from arthritis, psoriasis, bowel bleeding, hemorrhoids, kidney stones, ADHD, OCD, uh, depression. As a child, I had severe migraines and bowel problems, and I was uncorrigible. I was uh, kicked out of school in a gang, couldn't read, and my father in jail. I throw that out there a little bit because it's like the training grounds of life. Nothing bad all part of the process. Uh, but uh, as I began to learn more about paleo and then keto, I met Maria Emmerich and we, we did a lot of things together and still do. Uh, I learned and questioned the fuel for the Ferrari. And, and I know as, as Richard talks a little bit about uh, the fuel is ketones, but the fuel ultimately is only fat. And we burn fat, we don't burn sugar, we don't burn proteins. And, and uh, as I dug deep into the science and realized how wrong we were, I went carnivore about 13 years ago when I watched a guy on some video uh, and, and the guy said, uh, I eat meat, I don't exercise. And he was ripped and he looked great and felt great. And I was like, that is the one for me. So I was paleo, Atkins and paleo and keto. And, and, uh, and then when I, when I found carnivore, I was like, wow. And I, uh, one month, all those diseases went away. I've never felt better. My brain energy and my overall energy is amazing. I sleep well and I pretty much stick to uh, bacon, eggs, butter, beef, and salt. Occasionally my ice cream. I've been off coffee for a year, although I've had about five cups in the last uh, three months. Uh, I have a little bit from time to time, but this nutritional way of living uh, eliminates so many diseases gives you the strength to be the lion and the master of your life instead of being the slave to the story, which is basically slaughtering all of us with so many, so much sickness. And uh, so many of my patients, you know, they don't do a carnivore, all of them. Many, some do, some do keto, some don't, but, but you know, it's all part of the process. My job as a doctor is give people options of treatment and ideas that they might go, huh, and, and many of them, uh, so many people I don't even see, I never hear from, and, but I hear stories. Hey, my friend had a baby because they did your diet. Uh, you know, they've been suffering for 13 years, no pregnancies, no children, and voila, they went carnivore or ketovore and bingo a baby. So I think we, we, we need to realize that, that our diet is actually the cause of disease. And 
a healthy diet is a labeled word that may not be true. So we have to very much watch the words that we use. So I use this way of living for myself, but for my patients, uh, my community, my family, my everyone, everyone I run to, I'm just a broken record. It's all I talk about. So, you know, this is our lives. Yeah. And you're very inspirational. And, uh, you know, you do a live. Uh, do you do a live on Instagram every day? Uh, 5 a.m. Monday through Friday, typically Eastern uh-huh. time. So I get you guys, you guys get in a little later. That's all good. But people maybe, you know, in, in between that's a little harder. U.S., you know, get the West Coast is a little hard. But yeah, every day I do Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and I actually do my Mighty Tribe. Everyone's welcome. We just talk about positivity and we talk about uh, faith. We talk about food, faith, food, and fitness. Those are the sort of the three pillars of, of my focus. Yeah. Uh, Richard, do you want to dive in with the question as you've not met Dr. Kiltz before? Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, the whole ethos, uh, you know, f- fantastic. It's, uh, uh, and I think the work that you were doing is, um, yeah, is, is brilliant. It, um, it just further adds weight, doesn't it, to... Uh, the fact that, you know, a conversation that Stephen and I had yesterday in regards to, um, you know, the progression of beginning a ketogenic journey through low carb, then maybe go and do the keto, then standard, then clean, then becoming carnivore and the different variations of carnivore and how uh, people within the, in the community will clamp down on others for maybe not being keto or carnivore. Um, but it, it's a progression. And I think you have to work uh, with you know the individual uh, we're, we're all different uh, and th- this is a convo that we went through yesterday isn't it that the incremental approach seems to be um, you know the most beneficial over time rather than the step change approach where you just get someone to cut out everything uh, you know we see benefits from you know uh, Stephen mentioned a client of his who you know is predominantly dirty keto but has lost stupid amounts of weight reversed almost every illness and disease that he suffers from that could only be a positive thing yes he may still can consume foods that we don't agree with uh, but those results are positive and I think we need to you know we need to celebrate that we need to support that but I think what I try to do and I think and Stephen would agree as well you know the, the two between the two of us we try to promote the options to people and we try to explain the differences between the lifestyles so you can make an educated decision if you don't want to be carnivore and you just want to go low carb or keto these are the benefits fantastic but the further you go down this rabbit hole the more benefits that you're going to see um you know myself included i've been ketogenic for 10 11 years of which uh, i'd class myself as being carnivore for four to five um, but even only recently, you know, have I removed or reduced, I should say, coffee, the same as you. Uh, you know, I still consume coffee occasionally. Uh, and we're live for 24 hours. I'm sure I'm going to be consuming a few <laughs> later on today. Um, you know, but it again, I understand the damage that that causes. It's not something I consume uh, a lot of. And I believe most of the damage comes from the acrylamide, which is accumulative. So, again, used sparingly, you know, is going to see benefit. But that's a long way <laughs> of coming around to my question. Apologies, I do tend to get carried away. So look, you know, we're told uh, to consume certain foods, uh, you know, polyphenols, for example, um, you know, curcumin, which is found in turmeric, uh, resveratrol in berries, quercetin in onions, uh, catechins in tea. Um, look, curcumin and turmeric uh, and, and spinach contain oxalates. Uh, they cause DNA damage, hyperoxaluria, which leads to hypothyroidism uh, and even autism in children. It comes back to damaging, you know, the endocrine system, which is, you know, something you're um, you're a professional in. So what would you say to people who are, you know, searching for these uh, these foods that contain flavonoids and, and resveratrol? Um, in my experience, uh, you know, flavonoids, uh, isoflavones, they're digestive inhib- inhibitors, They block the absorption of vitamin C. They cause a reduction in net protein utilization. Um, They cause uh, infertility, poor sperm count. Uh, Because they are endocrine receptors, they block thyroid peroxidase, in which we need to make thyroid hormone by activating the sending B estradiol receptor, uh, an increase in estrogen, which can lead lead to hyperthyroidism in women, gynomastia in men, uh, and flavonoids also increase inflammatory markers like uh, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, I believe, uh, uh, tumor necrosis al- uh, alpha. You know, the, these are things that we are told to consume, you know, eat, eat our five or seven fruit or veg a day, um, yet they are laden with these, what I believe to be toxic chemicals. So what would you say to people who are searching for these flavonoids and, 
uh, and, you know, and, and these resveratrols and quercetins and cat catechins and etc. Apologies, that's my long approach to a question. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show you this. And it might be that's, backwards <laughs> that's the short answer to my very long question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Occam's it. razor. Occam's razor is simple. Answer is the one. Science is great, but quite often the story is so complicated that it really misses the mark for most humanity. We can't understand it, but it's a marketing message that you need all these things. But we know that is not true because uh, the dose makes the poison. Basically, small amounts of something might make you feel good, just like a little bit of heroin, cocaine, marijuana, nicotine, or caffeine. But cyanide, my friend, in small amounts may kill you quickly. This is the idea that most humanity doesn't understand, is that we're marketing a bunch of drugs to make you feel better from the chronic exposure of the plants and lean meat. Lean meat is deadly for us. Fatty meat is the critical part of the carnivore diet or any keto diet, in my opinion. But ultimately, the message is complicated because someone that we believe has statue in the community because they're really so bright because they have a degree from some major university and or they've been given accolades because of the company they own and market a message that ultimately is deadly. It's like going down in a carbon fiber tank to the bottom of the ocean. We know it's deadly. And then when people say things with the utmost of, of uh, absolute knowledge, but, we, but, but they ultimately are making them a story. And again, I'm telling a story also, by the way. Don't believe me. Don't take what I say at face value. You've got to do your own research and experiment, but there's only one experiment to do, and that's on you. You see, science is, is, is studying thousands, but giving you an average, not realizing that the, that the, 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 the spread is humongous. So, just because you're not that average number, you think, oh, my God, I'm diseased. Just like folate numbers. I was listening to you with Dr. Chavey. Again, we've, we get caught up on a number and a thought, and, and the worrying brain just goes right down the rabbit hole and can't realize that the majority of these things, you know, no animal in the universe is like, let's see, what's my folic acid level or what are those toxins? But Many organisms and animals know the signs of a deadly plant or a dangerous organism, right? We have been masterfully manipulated in order to sort of wipe away maybe those natural instinctual things that say, don't touch that. And now that's basically yeah, that's the, the constant marketing of flavonoids or antioxidants. What's, what's an antioxidant? I have no idea what an antioxidant is. Again, because it's a it's a scientific term that some some really intelligent marketing person wrote this story. Do you know that most scientific papers have to go through an editorial to make sure they kind of like sound like someone's going to read them and believe them? It's, you know, it's if you just want to get the straight numbers, you'd probably look at it and say, "No, wait a minute, these numbers don't match up to your story." But we don't get all the numbers; we just get. Again, it's back to Ansel Keys, the, 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 the seven country studies. It kind of wasn't really true. So the whole point here is that no, no animal, no organism, no plant wants to be eaten. That's number one, right? And so you don't need those drugs, which may be helpful from plants, by the way, to make you feel better in a moment because of sickness or cancer. And we're using drugs that heal you but they also are at risk of causing a secondary disease or cancer. But we're like, oh, really? And so uh, I would say that, that um, it, it's, you just don't need those things of any significance or frequency. But remember, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, nicotine, caffeine, uh, and in a multitude of, of mushrooms and psilocybin and ayahuasca are being utilized by people thinking they're good and okay for you. Well, they're highly addictive. And we know, it, again, back to plants and the sugars and all those chemicals you mentioned, maybe addictive chemicals that like, I love coffee so good for us. Is coffee good for us? It makes us feel good. I even like it. 
Okay, but I really minimize or eliminate it now because I realize the story is a lie to get you to spend your money on something you don't need, which likely cause another disease, which you're going to need more money because the cost of health care is only going up. And so many people in this globe do not have do not have health care. But again, they don't have health care for the disease treatments that are caused by the diet and the flavonoids and the antioxidants that we say are good for us. It's a lie. Yeah, and I'm sorry I interrupted in the middle there, but I wanted to say what you said was brilliant, and I had an actual practical example yesterday because when we moved into this property, um, this makes sense, Rob. Okay, the roof was leaking and everything, and only yesterday when it was dry could we fix everything. We put this varnish down on the floor, and now our puppy right, normally eats with us. He eats in the garden, we eat in the garden, <clears throat> and because we fixed this room, we thought, well, let's eat in here. The varnish smell was horrendous, I think. Uh, I've got a better sense of smell than, than Jane. Our dog would not eat his food in that chemical-laden environment. You know, he's got a lovely duck neck to eat. He's raw carnival, by the way. We literally took it out of that room, put it in the garden, straight to it. So they know. They don't need a tracker. They don't need, hey, this you know, this is good for you. That's They, they know. We put something on his plate. Um... And he will just eat it if it's good. And if we put something that's got plants in it, strangely enough, you know, if we got some food the other day, we said we were all carnivore and feeding the dog raw carnivore and there was, there's plants in it. Didn't want to know. He did not want to know it's So yeah, that's great. Uh, go on then Richard do another, another. Oh, sorry, Rob, go on. Varnish comes from what? Plants. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's straight yeah, away. Well, yes. and, and so again, all of these products from plants are there to protect the plant to, mm. to either attract or repel certain organisms for its life cycle. Yes. Go on, Rich. Did you want to do a follow up? Don't forget. Yeah, we're it was in four hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll keep this. One. <laughs> I'll keep this. I'm one short. good. I'm yeah. good. It's, uh, <laughs> We'll have to do a Carnival 24 round two, I think, wouldn't we? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just to come back to to, to what we made, uh, the statement that uh, the Rob made in regards to antioxidants. You know, antioxidants um, activate the NRF2 pathway. They're in fact pro-oxidants. And the NRF2 pathway is an oxidative stress pathway. Um, you know, the, the same pathway is activated with the, the ingestion of things like arsenic, lead, mercury, um, you know, this will give the same antioxidant effect as consuming vegetables. Um, so if you are to reside to the fact that vegetables have an antioxidant effect and it's positive for us, then you must also admit that consuming arsenic, mercury or lead is good for us, tobacco smoke. And we know it isn't. This is the same outcome from vegetables as consuming these toxic products. This whole thing about antioxidants is the biggest load of rubbish that has ever been probably second only to cholesterol. Um, these are not antioxidants. Uh, I believe that, um, you know, we can, the argument would be uh, for something called homesis, the effect of homesis, which is where we put something that's a little bit toxic in and we have a positive result. Um, now, there's two types of homesis, molecular homesis and environmental. Environmental would be the likes of cold water therapy and heat treatment, which I, I'm a believer in. I, you know, I've looked at the science. I, I believe that cold water dipping carries positive um, uh, uh, results. But these uh, molecular homesis effects from consuming foods, to, to me, and I'm sure Robert will jump in on, on, on this, um, is nothing more than a market employee uh, by, by the food industry. Um, and it's it's rampant. And I still hear it within the keto and carnival community. Antioxidants, this is one of the biggest load of rubbish that we've ever been been spouted. But there we are. That's my, that's my two minutes of... of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has a journal they put out. And last year, they had a, an expert review of nutrition for pregnant and lactating women. It was mostly a plant-based, lean meat, no red meat, or very minimal. And it focused and also said that red wine is okay. And so you got to wonder about the experts that are basically uh, pushed and moved by some marketing money, I suspect, 
or just like we used to recommend tobacco uh, and in, in, as a physician, that it had medicinal properties for people. And again, we're uh, uh, here's, here's a little bit of alcohol. How do you like it? Wow, this is really good. Okay, let's have 10 of those now. Whoa, I don't feel so good anymore. So again, a little bit makes you feel okay or makes you feel good, but a lot. Have 20 cups of coffee in one sitting. Uh, espresso, by the way. It, will that make you feel good? My friends, we know that it won't, but you're right. Uh, how do you feel on this? Science is, is a lot of how do you feel? Wow, I feel great after taking that. That's great. Wow. Let me mark that down. Feels great. Must be good for you. We know that's not true. And that's our challenge in, in, in life. And again, the science is really, I love science. I'm a scientist. I went on this journey to figure out, okay, Glucose somehow has been labeled as our energy source, right? But but uh, 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 type one diabetics has no insulin. They have high glucose levels and they lose weight quickly, right? They get become skinny, right? And then a type two diabetic, right? They're they're fed all of this, they, you know, it's sugar, 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 and and yet their insulin and sugar levels go up. Something's wrong. We call it insulin resistance, right? Well, the question came to me is, well, what is insulin resistance? Is it the insulin that's a problem? Is it the cell that's the problem? And, and I finally found this term called hepatogenous diabetes. Have you guys ever heard of hepatogenous diabetes? I had never heard of it. And if I never heard of it, and yet, it, and it's not recognized by the American Diabetic Association nor the World Health Organization that it is likely that insulin resistance is actually a liver disease. That simply the liver cannot function to do its job. And then the question is, well, what is the liver's job? What would you say the liver's job is? What do most people say? Toxic, it, it removes toxins, right? Well, yeah. what, what, what disease can you name that it doesn't remove a toxin? You can't, because that's not its job. Its job is to make fat. And it makes fat so good. We see it in the world. And it makes fat out of two things, amino acids and simple sugars. And it requires one thing to do that, insulin. Insulin's job is to make fat, not to put sugar into cells. It's to make fat in the liver because if you have liver damage significant, you will become skinny and you will become a type two diabetic. But no one talks about that. And so if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty of understanding the human body, ketones are just a little bit of a, another distraction, by the way. We burn fatty acids that come from fat. You can't take glucose in the, in the cytoplasm and make pyruvate and acetyl-CoA and then think you're going to get your, your ATP produced. It doesn't work that way. You must make fat in the liver via insulin out of amino acids and sugars. Because if you think about it, the majority of the diet in America or in the world is a plant-based lean meat diet. Most people either cut it away, but our cooking methods for meat actually remove the fat. It's cooked on a grill uh, or it's boiled for hours uh, or in an oven and all the grease goes away and the majority of humanity does not eat fat. And really, if you want to simplify all of this, it might not be a carnivore. It still may be simply being an omnivore. You eat plants and meat, but you must eat the fat. And that's the fact that we're missing, I think, in all of this. Now, I do believe that significant plants tend to be part of our damage, but that's a hard one for people to sort of get in their brains that it, it may be as simple as that story. And Rob, that's, that's why you're here, <laughs> because I love the way you think. You think outside the box. I think carnivores are a subset of people. I, I think being a carnivore means you look outside the box and you're prepared to do something that's not generally accepted. 
when you talked about the liver there, um, that is something I, I mean, I'm a specialist practitioner in diabetes and I'd never heard that term. So at 59, this old dog has learned a new trick because you know what? When this 24 hours is over, I'm not going to bed. I'm going to look that up first. <laughs> I'm going to go and learn about that because I, I think that's one of the things I love about this space and I love about you and, and Rich. We'll learn. You know, if, if something um, goes against what we believe or what we think, we don't go, oh, no, it can't be true. We're like, oh, that? If it makes sense, you know, I think – that was brilliant. Thank you for that. No, it's my pleasure. Well, you think about it. All right. So uh, sugar is your fast energy source and fat is your slow energy source. Ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Is it I've true? Uh, not really, is it? I mean, it, uh, you know, it can't be true. Why would the, why would the mitochondria, the TCA cycle, Say, well, wait a minute, we're going to take the glucose now and use glucose for energy, but you got a shitload of acetyl CoA and fatty acids all over, and, and you have short chain, long chain, and medium chain fatty acids everywhere. And why would you ever say, I'm going to take glucose and I'm going to use it for energy right now? And then later on, when your glucose levels are down, now, have you ever measured and found someone's glucose levels are down after a big rut race really fast? Nope. No, they're up. Nope, they're normal. Yeah. It's yeah. not true. Which is what we did recently, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I did a race. And, yeah. And, and so, again, even in the keto carnivore space, we keep on saying sugar is your energy. And the brain requires sugar for energy. It does not. It does not. Now, now glucose is critical along with, with mannose and N-acetylglucosamine, N-acetylgalactosamine are critical for glycosylation, which no one in the carnivore keto space talks about. Glycosylation, which again, we talk about proteins and making proteins. But do you know that the majority of proteins are glycosylated? And if they're not glycosylated, do you know that you will die or be diseased? And there are hundreds of diseases caused by abnormal glycosylation. Remember, glycation is the abnormal binding of sugars onto everything and anything. And glycosylation is the normal binding of a sugar, again, a sugar, which is critical in our body, by the way, but never in our diet. That's the amazing part. And really, when we talk about carbohydrates, we should simplify it because that's too complicated. Plants, plants and or animals. Those are our kind of choices of what to eat. We never have a requirement to eat a plant, but they do taste good and feel good, don't they? Yeah. But when you learn the goodness of eating that fatty meat, that organ meat, the bone marrow, the bone broth, again, if you want to go to all sorts of fancy brain and liver and thymus and kidney and heart, go for it. Um, is it required? I don't know, but I enjoy them. And I imagine if I enjoy them, that means I've convinced myself they're required. But, but ultimately, what's our real requirement, right? Uh, we will die without air, water, amino acids, and fatty acids. And, 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 and really, those are the simplicities of it. Even when we talk about uh, mineral deficiencies, have you ever seen someone with a mineral deficiency? Have you ever measured a mineral deficiency? No, and I was going to say that in phlebotomy. I very rarely see it. I can't even remember seeing it. Well, you might have seen it in sick patients who have a really low potassium or calcium elevation. But, but again, you know, we say, well, I, I think I'm mineral deficient. Well, again, you've been fed a story that makes you think something, but maybe it's not so true. So that's why it's really important that we get a chance to really be open to ideas that are radical and different and maybe again don't believe me don't believe most of everyone out there but go out there and dig deep and do the research to, to and then question everything oh, question everything hepatogenous diabetes because liver failure patients all have type 2 diabetes 
yet they're all skinny and have no fat on their body. They're cachectic. And the question yeah, is, I do. yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's brilliant. It's what's really strange is one of the things I often talk about in my personal training is the minimal, the, the finite amount of glucose we've got stored. And yet we've got days worth of fat energy on us. Even if you're a lean athlete, you can go further and further, but Rob, that was brilliant. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this in a 24 hour span. We haven't got enough time. <laughs> it was a <laughs> no. um, but we've got Ben now uh, from the Big Fat Challenge. So I've tried to link everybody up so it goes from one conversation to the next. Um, so, Dr. Robert Kilts, thank you so much for giving us half an hour of your time. Stephen, Richard, Dr. my Kiltz. pleasure. Ben, you're Being a kick-ass. Being pleasure. These guys are amazing. The story, 24 hours, kick-ass. Remember, fat is the critical food for the Ferrari, and we're Ferraris. So eat like one, you'll feel like one, and be the line. Brilliant. God bless you guys. Have an awesome one. Thanks, Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Right. Right. Absolute pleasure. pleasure. Take care, man. I'm going to enjoy it. Take care. <laughs> Take care, man. Now, there you go, Ben. The big fat challenge. You see? The big fat challenge. You've just been given a perfect bat on. So do you want to just talk about your big fat challenge? Yeah, well, we're, we're basically trying to educate the world in a very simple but uh, apparently radical message, which is that fat is your body's ideal fuel and you've been fed a whole load of nonsense about it. Really that simple. So... Um, ah. it, it's it's basically what what we say to people is um, give it ninety days. Switch to I mean we, I, I like to call it like the manufacturer's recommended fuel. If anyone's ever put diesel into a petrol car and you you get you know half a mile down the down the road and it goes gunk gunk and and you end up on the side of the road with your head in your hands going oh no what have I done waiting for somebody to come out and try and try and rescue your engine. But the difference is and um, I've just kind of alluded to it now is the, this difference between acute toxins and chronic toxins you know a small amount of cyanide can bump you off immediately but the problem is when, when it comes to diet that the uh, the toxins that we're taking in through excess carbohydrates and through things like seed oils are chronic they they build up over time and they they kill you slowly but uh, they do make great customers for the pharmaceutical industry at the same time so uh, you know, it's it's a very good investment if you're um, a director of a corporation. Yeah, so absolutely. Business model. I think I've been rude here and very un-English because I haven't introduced you. I don't know if Richard knows Phil or Ben. Um, but, guys. Hi, uh, guys. Nice to meet you both. <laughs> nice to meet you, Phil and Ben. Hi, Richard. Good to meet you, too. Yes, Richard, I, I you know. In, we, we haven't met before. Were you at the oh, PhD goodness. conference in Sheffield? PhD conference? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. I saw right. you there. I don't think we spoke. Brilliant. Did, did we speak? No. Or did, no. no, but, no uh, right. it, was, uh, it was it was such a fantastic event. Um, but the only downside was the break time uh, didn't leave an awful lot of time for for networking. So you know you travel to these events to speak to people that you've you've met online, uh, and I ended up not speaking or conversing with very many people at all. Unfortunately, there, there uh, but was still a fantastic event. There, there was comedy lunch though, wasn't there? That was, that yeah. was so strange. <laughs> we, we had we had yeah. quinoa and and um, oh, lunch too, and and a, and a bucket full of boiled um, beans of some sort. Very bizarre. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I fasted. It uh, <laughs> strangely enough, I waited for uh, for a steak later on in the evening. But no, ben, uh, ben, st ben stole all the salmon and brought it to us. <laughs> he pretended he was very official and filled up a couple of big boxes of salmon, and we oh, ran away. Very un English. I, I, I jumped the queue and went around <laughs> the wrong side of the table, Stephen, as well. So you know, we're all no one's English here. So just for the the broader audience, by the way, we went to a conference in Sheffield, and it, the guests. Speakers were people like um, uh, Sean Baker and Jen Unwin, David Unwin, you know, some, some really good people, Ben Bickman. And the lunch that Phil refers to was fit for vegans. <laughs> That's about it. I mean, I went out to a local butcher's and found a bag of um, chicken legs 
for about four quid. So that was that was great. Cooked. Obviously. I'll tell you what, we could we there was I wouldn't have eaten that when I was a vegetarian, what they were giving there. It was really weird. It was like storage boxes. It wasn't even something in uh, you know, in like a hot plate or something like that. But Sophia, you know, Sophia Clements, she had some nice um, bison sausages from the Eskimo kitchen. She went back to the hotel and got some for us and they were delicious. So that tidied us over the other day, you know, because we nicked the salmon one day and then expected that uh, it was better the next day because they promised, but there wasn't. But yeah, well, I'm moaning, but it was great. I mean, you know, it was great to see all those people there and people that haven't actually met in person before. It was very cool. It was great, Phil. Now, uh, just quickly for for Richard uh, and uh, and everybody else watching, but mainly for Richard, uh, can you just give him a real brief bit about what you did and uh, what caused you to look at diet and how you resolved your issues? Oh well, you see, my my expertise is being an absolute idiot, and this is what I've done mostly over my life with diet. And I, I was vegetarian and vegan for. Um, let's see, sort of 30 odd years and even wrote books on vegetarian eating. And then I got really sick with full on psoriatic arthritis in 2010 and uh, had to figure it out and uh, ended up writing a book in about 2014 called Arthritis, the best thing that ever happened to me. And I still hadn't quite discovered carnivore. I was very, very close, but I pretty much got it sorted. But then in 2015, I went carnivore and Everything's been great until I cocked something up last year. And then I managed to get out of trouble in three months, whereas it took me about three years last time because I knew what to do this time. But this is a warning. I've just done a, a, an episode with Anthony, uh, with Anthony Chafee on his channel um, that isn't released yet, going really into what I did wrong. And it doesn't take much when you've got autoimmunity in your past. You know, for me, it was, well, it was a lot of other factors outside of diet, but, you know, being a bit of a, uh, uh, having a bit of a rock and roll lifestyle and traveling around playing too many um, festivals and misbehaving. But um, I had, uh, I, I, all it needed was some dairy, some eggs, some pork and some chicken because it's easier to get on the road. And I, I really screwed myself up. I mean, here's, here's an example of it. And I had a CRP in, in uh, November or December, I can't remember, of 192. I mean, I was, I was really... Um, proud of my 82 CRP back in the day, you know, before I wrote the book. Uh, but this was horrific. I brought it down. And I think about three weeks later, I had another test and it was 19 and I haven't done it since then. I'm it's fine now. I'm out of it. But it was a horrific winter. And it, it's I wanted to say that, you know, all of the, the sort of carnivore advice and, uh, and whatever does change when you're autoimmune. You need to be a hell of a lot more strict. And for me, it's fatty beef and lamb. And I can probably take a look at some other stuff short term, but I caned it a bit last year. And I hasten to add, I didn't eat any plants, didn't even take plants to set me off. But uh, there I was. I'm supposed to be this arthritis guru online. I was stuck on the sofa and wasting away, lost three stone. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk about it now because it's a good warning for people who are, who are autoimmune because it's a whole different ball game when you are. So it's it's fatty beef and lamb for you guys. Don't deviate. Yeah, and I think that that's the thing. People think carnivore is the cure-all for everything. And actually, you're right to talk about food, but there's still environmental issues as well. You know, I'm. this is sad to say, the only thing I'm worried about doing a 24-hour live stream is 24 hours looking at a screen. You yeah. know, I don't think... I don't think that's good for me personally, not getting outside, not touching my little doggy, you know, my little puppy, because that de-stresses me, seeing my wife, which sort of stresses me. And, you know, it's... You all right. you strap them both on. <laughs> yeah. right. But um, let's get Ben a little bit of um, uh, a centre stage as well to just talk about his personal journey. Yeah, well, m mine's far less interesting than than Phil's, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, my wife and I moved into this big house about 10, 11 years ago and with a couple of acres of garden, and I got really, really into, into no-dig gardening and thought it would be a great idea to suck loads of carbon out of the air by building soil and stuff like that. I designed and built my own greenhouse here. And um, that then took me to a bunch of conferences and seminars and stuff like that, like the Oxford Real Farming Conference and stuff run by the Sustainable Food Trust, 
And I started hearing uh, people talking about the importance of ruminant animals and not just for the soil, not just for building soil, but also for health. And they were talking about things I'd never heard about before, like uh, DHA and, and conjugated linoleic acid and stuff like that. And I thought, that's interesting. So people talking about how you've got to eat meat, because I like everybody else, I was brought up with this amazing myth, which was that fruits and vegetables are the healthy option. They are the healthiest food that, that there is. And this came as a big surprise to me. So because I, I'm an explorer, you know, I'm, I've, I've done all kinds of things in my life. I start a new project about every 45 minutes, really. And, and I get a new passion. But really, fundamentally, my, when, when I look back with the benefit of hindsight, and my life's been about trying to figure out what it, what it looks like to be a happy, healthy, fulfilled human being walking upon the earth. That, that's kind of it. So that then took me to social media and I, I found Phil's Facebook group, 100% Carnivore and Beyond, and uh, got to know Phil. And then the rest is history. And then about three years later, here we are um, trying to trying to spread the good word that you should fuel your body with fat instead of carbs. Yeah, and I think the yin and yang between you two is 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 evident, and it's great coming in. I've I've come to a couple of your campfire meetings, which you call them on Facebook, which is just so laid back and and relaxed, you know. And Ben comes with all the sensible stuff, and Phil just makes you laugh. It's really good. <laughs> But I've just saw uh, Dr. Chafe is still watching and he's saying that you were brilliant, um, Phil. So that's, that's good to know. So, Richard. Oh, thank right, you. You've thanks, met... Anthony. Thanks for having me on. It's always great to chat to you. So, Richard, you've not met these two guys. You got any questions for them about their big fat challenge or their... Yeah, I, I just wanted to circle back to something that Phil said. You know, it again, as you say, when we say the carnival kit was all, um, you know, it is to do with... Uh, um, specific conditions because there are certain foods within the carnival, carnival community that will affect people who suffer with autoimmune issue um you know cheese and eggs uh you know dairy even a2 dairy can be problematic um certain types of fish so uh, as as phil rightly says you know it um you know beef uh is the key for me um i i do de deviate occasionally uh, i don't suffer so severely with the autoimmune issues that i used to um, but certainly you will see people gravitating into this sort of lifestyle who will be consuming meat, eggs, fish and cheese and still suffering with, with uh, certain conditions. But it comes back to what we mentioned earlier about these incremental changes and not everybody fits into the same box. Um, I'm what I'd regard as being strict carnivore, but I also understand that not everybody wants to or can live the way that I, that I do. And when I look at my journey, um, you know, I began... Uh, low carb and then I became dirty keto and, and all through accident initially because I didn't know what I was doing I just knew the bread brought me um, I don't know if you guys know much about my story but uh, and I'll get through this really quickly I won't bore you too much of it but I used to be clinically obese and type 2 diabetic I suffered with chronic fatigue depression anxiety arthritic pains uh, daily debilitating migraines would make me blind and in my mid to late 20s I could barely walk up the stairs without stopping uh, or being severely out of breath Super long story short, I cut out bread, I began my low carb journey, uh, gravitated in, into keto. And in the UK, keto didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago, nobody knew anything about it. So the information was very scarce. And what was available was misinformation, I believe. Uh, you know, I, I, like many, I gravitated to YouTube, found people like Dr. Berg who were pushing stupid amounts of you know plants every day. Um, and I fell into that category, same as Ben, I began growing my own vegetables and things. And yes, I became fitter and healthier, um, but this improved further as I gravitated uh, into a more carnivore-based lifestyle about four to five years ago. Uh, and, and basically, a long story short, four to five years after beginning my journey, I went on to become a uh, European champion at a professional level in men's physique bodybuilding. So I went from being unable to walk up the stairs uh, to being number one in Europe through changing my lifestyle. I'm not genetically gifted. Uh, if you look at um, pictures of, of my father, who died, unfortunately, two years ago from heart complications, you can see that I was on that tra trajectory. I was on that path of being severely uh, obese uh, and riddled with all sorts of illness and disease, diseases. And I changed that through the food that I consumed. Um, but it is important just to circle back to, to the fact that you know we are all 
on our own journey. And, and I do support anybody who begins their journey, whether it be low carb, dirty keto. You know, Stephen mentioned a story yesterday in regards to one of his clients who has uh, received massive benefits from living a dirty keto lifestyle. And that's fantastic as long as people understand that there's always a better option. The further you you gravitate down this rabbit hole, the more benefit that's going to come. And this is something that, that I've noticed personally, the deeper that I've, I've gone into becoming carnivore. Um, and, you know, as such, re reducing and removing things like A2 milks and foods that contain casein. Um, I seem to get on very well with eggs. They don't seem to be problematic for me. Um, but other clients who I work with who live carnivore lifestyle and deemed to be strict will still suffer with issues and, and they'll question why. But so just circling back to that, it you know, it, we are all individuals. And if you are suffering with severe autoimmune issues, you know, as Phil rightly says, it's, uh, you know, keep it simple. Um, you know, red meat is the way to go. Um, and yeah, that's predominantly how I live. Yeah, yeah. The amazing story there, man. Well done. Um, yes, I, I when whenever I get clients who, um, well, I get them a lot because I'm sort of, I've got all these carnivore groups and a YouTube channel and whatever. And when I, when I get clients, they, and they say carnivore is not working, it's always down to either uh, chicken, pork, dairy, or eggs particularly egg whites. And pretty much every time it's that. But also I deal with all the other things. You know, once you, once you get the symptoms out of the way with a good sort of PKD type diet, um, I'll explain that in a sec if, if listeners don't know. Um, but um, as, soon as, as soon as you get the symptoms out of the way, then there's everything else, you know, like we deal with in the Big Fat Challenge, all the other ancestral disconnects. I'm a big fan of Jack Cruz, who's a friend of mine, and did the foreword to my book. And you know, he's just saying, you, you stop being stop being a, a diet guru, be a light guru. Stop it. Doesn't matter what you eat, as long as you get enough sun. Well, you know, people always have these these, these sort of areas of expertise, and you can pick from all of them, right? I mean, I did a. Um, I, I would really, if anybody's watching this who's autoimmune, please go and have a look at my channel um, and see the interview I did recently with with Sophia, with Dr. Sophia Clements from Paleo Medicina, because. I asked specific questions that somebody who is actually autoimmune would ask. And I think a lot of people, she's been interviewed a lot of times, but nobody's quite done that, you know, by other docs and podcasters and whatever. But I really wanted to go deep on that. And I think she's going to really piss a few people off with her views on dairy. Um, I did a little video where Ben and I were wandering around the Peak District with her as well on that, where she says raw dairy is worse than um, pasteurized dairy. And this this will annoy a lot of people, I'm sure, who have that as a sacred cow. But I understand, I think, what she's saying there, that more of the um, growth factors are, are intact in raw milk. And so down the line, there could be more problems with, um, you know, unusual cell replication. Whereas pasteurized milk will give more initial issues because they messed up the whole sort of enzyme content and whatever. And so that'll give more immediate issues, whereas raw dairy won't. And so I would say that anybody who, who wants to sort of suddenly start shouting, which they have done on my YouTube channel a bit of Sophia for saying that, go and have a listen. And, and, and there's some very interesting stuff on there because, you know, that, that whole autoimmune side is, is what I'm kind of focused on. And um, I found that I had to look at everything. Some people fix it with carnivore diet. I didn't even, not even with a, a PKD diet completely. I had to look into all the emotional stuff, the grounding, the light, the EMFs, everything really and 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 that's how we've been become disconnected from our ancestral heritage and that's what really the big fat challenge is all about not just you know the primary goal of getting people onto fats rather than horrible plant carbohydrates but also you know seeing all the other ways that 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 we become stressed um when can I, can I, the further can I, we get away from our, our our ancestral heritage ben yeah, um, just kind of jumping on on what Richard was saying as well, and 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 what what Phil's just just um, shared, that one of the things that we teach, because fundamentally we're, what we're helping to do is to help coach people from the transition from the the SAD, you know, the shitty average diet, through to something that's appropriate. I think we do all have, uh, it, it, I mean, there's so many myths about. One of the big myths is ev everyone's different, and there is not one ideal diet for humanity well that's not really true i mean it would make us unique amongst the entire animal kingdom if if it, if it were true and things like the blood type diet we were on a, 
the show yesterday and people kept saying, well, what about the blood type does? Absolute nonsense, right? But our circumstances are different, right? So Phil has had to go and, you know, Richard's had to go a lot stricter than, say, I do, because, you know, several times a week I'll, I'll have... I'll have chips fried in tallow and, and I'll, I'll cope perfectly well with that because I didn't ruin my gut. And one of the things that we coach people a lot on the Big Fat Challenge is we really want to drive it home that, uh, apart from the fact that the car, there's not one type of carnivore either, you know, a carnivore is an animal that gets the majority of its, of its calories from eating other animals and not necessarily every single calorie, right? But one of the things that we, we really try and drill home to people is, there's nothing wrong with putting on uh, body fat. It's actually an essential um, evolutionary survival trait. There's nothing wrong with eating some berries and some nuts and even some grass seeds in season in a Paleolithic context because it helps you to lay down body fat and up the insulin and everything else like Robert said. Um, the problem is uh, because our bodies are extremely good at detoxifying. But the thing is, in the, in the in the traditional kind of solar cycle, you you take on all these like high deuterium foods, higher sugars, higher lectins, all this kind of stuff um, in the summertime and in the autumn time. But then you'd be kind of fasting throughout the winter, and you'd be detoxifying, you'd be peeing all this stuff out every day during the winter, and so you've got this this kind of yin yang flow going on. But what people do today on the SAD is they're guzzling a half gallon of high fructose corn syrup when they go to the cinema and, and you know, munching down fruits that have been flown around the world all year round and, and high sugar and everything made out of seed oils. And you are just literally massively overwhelming your body's ability, your body's incredible ability to get rid of environmental toxins by just giving it an absolute tsunami of, of filth. That's the problem. It's not that we can't deal with these things. It's just that we there's no way we can deal with them in in the, in in that kind of quantity. And no wonder people's health collapses because of it. Yes, yeah, but on uh, Jack Cruz has a lovely phrase, doesn't he? That if if the food that's going into your mouth doesn't match the light that's going into your eyes, there's going to be mitochondrial disruption. And that's just a, a, a fancy way, really, of saying that just, you know, eat locally and seasonally what you would have done probably more than 10,000 years ago, wherever you live, and you'll be all right. You might not need to go fully carnivore, but, you know, here where I am and where Ben is, you know, sort of quite a way up in England towards the north, we wouldn't in the winter have been able to find any plant foods. And so what what on earth did we do? This is, this is the thing that amuses me about the vegans, where I, I think... You know, how successful would they have been, you know, before agriculture to, to go on a quinoa hunt in um, Scotland in December? I'm going foraging this afternoon. I'm a, I'm a forager, right? My wife is a forager. She teaches foraging courses. There's no way we could feed ourselves in this lovely kind of gentle um, climate that we've got here in, in nature without animal products. We haven't got hope in hell. We're hopefully going out to get some mushrooms this afternoon. But no, I, it's, I, it's nonsense. I'll just say, I mean, I, I'm actually an animal lover, which people don't seem to think you can be on this way of eating. And I was watching a channel where they were studying animals' behaviour um, and they put a load of bananas and they peeled some of them, some were green, some were ripe, and they stuck them in the forest and they had these uh, fantastic cameras strapped to trees and they genuinely thought that it wasn't a carnivore channel. It was an animal channel looking at their behavior. And the researchers genuinely thought we've put this big stack of bananas on and we will get loads of animals coming in to eat them. Four days later, I will take my hat off to their honesty. Not one bit of banana had been eaten. And they had the footage of all these. And you see, raised eyebrows, raised, you know, I'm open to everything. So um, to, to me, I mean... We, me and Ben, we live in the same sort of part of England. There is no way on earth we could go out and find a banana ever, right? So that's not appropriate for, you know, if we did have no tr air travel, if this is where we were born or where we'd travelled to and settled many, many, you know, generations ago, we'd never have eaten a banana. Certainly not a modern banana with all this high level of sugar. So I think 
that's that's the other thing when you're talking about what's good for us to eat. Even if you think, well, I'm going to still eat, I'm still going to be vegetarian I'm, and I'm going to eat all my fruits. That That isn't appropriate because they're all hybrid. You know, apples in the supermarket are at least a year since they were picked. So we're, we're not eating anything that's particularly natural, even though it looks lovely. You know, it looks natural. I, but, I, Stephen, I feel, but Stephen, bananas are paleo. Don't you know that? Perfect. It's so funny. Isn't it? We go, we go, you know, see, the animals. The animals didn't know though. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, you, you see you see it in the paleo group. It's like it's a banana paleo. And then somebody pops up, isn't there? There's always like two a day or something who just discovered paleo. Oh, have you discovered banana pancakes? All you do is mix bananas and eggs and fry them up. And everyone goes, No, we've never discovered that before. Because <laughs> it's like every other post. And it's so funny, and it's, it's, you know they don't think that in Paleolithic times there's no bananas. There's just yeah. no. Bananas. In fact, there weren't any anywhere because bananas are tiny and full of seeds, right? They're not in the natural environment. Absolutely, they they're not even like bananas in the shops. So yeah, nonsense. So that's your guest. We've got a new guest waiting to come in. I don't know. How, I don't think you should put a camera on yet. Um, how would you like to sum up what you're offering people? Because you've you've got a lot of interest in the chat, you've you've did a little bit about your big fat challenge, but just tell us a little bit more. Um, I I think we offer something for everybody because you know everything from people who are just trying to lose a bit of weight to people who are severely autoimmune, we've got in there. Um, I I think we've really over delivered with all the other kind of stuff, but I'm going to let Ben say exactly what's in there, even including our upcoming book that you won't be able to find anywhere else. So off you go, Ben. Yeah, yeah. so really, we, we do two main things. We, we help people to retrain their thinking around food, which is a, a, a long journey to take because we, we have been fed an all, a, a huge amount of BS for our entire lives through every channel, you know, even up to proper, proper, you know, beard fiddling science and, and everything it starts when you're very young, goes all the, way, all the way through. So retrain your thinking around food and we help you to retrain your habits because it, it's not easy to, to do this. And in the context of family, co-workers and everything else, can you afford to eat in a species appropriate diet? Well, I'd say, can you afford not to? Um, and in a lot of countries, if you factor in the, the cost of, uh, healthcare then then it becomes a, an absolute no-brainer um now but we so we it's a, like a 13-week program we take you through you can dive in on day one and try and go do the full monty immediately that's absolutely fine but we also include for example our forthcoming book the red pill food revolution that charts the whole history of our our terrible relationship with our degeneration um the degeneration of, of the human condition with regards to food and leading up to this kind of end game that we're in now. Um, and that, that book isn't even out on sale yet, but you can get it in PDF and in audiobook uh, formats as well. There's a bunch of other bonuses and stuff, but really we just set out to answer every single question. And we, and we do, you know, the, the everything from the, the health issues, do you need, Fiber, surely you need fiber. What about vitamin C? Aren't you going to die of scurvy? Well, no, you know, all through to the environmental side of things and even the ethical and spiritual side is stuff that's really, really important for people. Like like, like Stephen just said, you know, we're, we're animal lovers and we, we, we care very much about, about this, but uh, we do believe that every single argument, every single objection out there ha can be answered fully. We, that's what we try to do. To, to help people through and uh, make it through successfully to the other side and just realize a whole new level of health, energy, and well-being. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Phil, um, for, for coming on. Um, I'm going to just quickly well. thank Dr. Kiltz and also Dr. Chafee, who are still looking and listening in after their appearance, which was which was going above and beyond their, um, their allocated time, which that's really great. So you two have a great day. And we're now going to go over to Rachel, who uh, is the founder of Boil and Broth. Do you know each quick, other? Can I just thank Ben and Phil as well? Fantastic chatting. And uh, yeah, I'd like to connect outside of this, if, if we could, to arrange uh, you know, a further chat or podcast maybe. But uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. I, 
Definitely. I don't think can... 30 minutes was enough for us. I think we probably could have gone on for another hour and 30 plus. Yeah. Um, but it'd be a fantastic to network outside this. But thank you both so much for coming on. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Nice so, to meet you. Nice to meet you briefly. Yes, you too. Bye. 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 Cheers, Bye. 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 Well, do you want, Rachel, do you want to just quickly introduce your boil and broth company to everybody that's uh, out there? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm the founder of Boil and Broth. I actually started the business back in 2018. Um, I started bubbling bones, boiling broth back in 2017. And the reason I got into bone broth was because I had a whole heap of gut health problems. Um, I'd not long had my children and I, ha I was overweight. I was actually 16 stone. And um, yeah, and I, I was just on this roundabout of the NHS, you know, going to with my with my symptoms, they'd give me medication, I'd come away. And I went did this for about three years. And then I just really got to the point of I can't keep going on to this roundabout with the NHS. So I had to sort of take my hand, my health into my own hands, which I'm sure a lot of people watching this now have had the, the same experience. Um, yeah, so I started on the rabbit hole journey, you know, deep down in the rabbit hole, what's going on in the gut. Um, and as a result, I learned all about, well, not all about, but I had, a, I gained a good understanding of gut health enough to sort of make me start thinking that perhaps my condition, which was actually candida overgrowth, I don't know if anyone is familiar with it, but it, interestingly, some a, a carnivore paleo diet is, is perfect for it because it can, it, it, it candida overgrowth is a condition that feeds off of sugar in your body so it the more it grows the, the more sugar you have in your diet the more it grows it infiltrates the digestive system and as a result you get a whole ton of symptoms so i started on the bone broth journey and i also started to make kefir water as well which is a naturally um probiotic drink sparkling and yeah I, I i and i cut out all sugars so pretty much went into more of a, a, a paleo carnivore type i just i did have a few you know, sort of veggies and all that sort of thing. But the main core part of the change of my diet was the broth and the kefir water. And within 12 weeks, I'd completely reversed my health condition. I'd completely got rid of candida overgrowth. I'd been struggling at the NHS for, for three years. And then um, after two years, I actually lost six stone in weight. So naturally, I just went into business. And, you know, the passion within me was really about, you know, getting this message out there that, you know, that actually, you know, the, the system is so corrupt and the, they actually want us to be sick. So really the only way to, to make, get to get better is to take health into your own hands and do the research, you know, follow, you know, guys like yourselves, you know, and really important influences in this space who have the correct information that can, can share it out. So yeah, and then obviously Boil and Broth was born out of this. Um, been selling frozen bone broth for, for five years now. We've got a small team, a factory shipping all over the world. We sell for pets as well because the pet space is just as corrupt. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and my husband works for me and it, it's good. You know, we've just innovated the broth to basically make a pure broth protein now. So we remove all of the water from the broth as part of our preservation um, instead of freezing. And then by doing that, that means that the we're left with pure broth protein and then we can ship it anywhere in the world and then the customer just needs to rehydrate it back and can have it as a, a warm nourishing drink so that's what I always say ditch your coffee get your broth instead in the morning so yeah that's brilliant <laughs> excellent that's brilliant have you met Richard before no, I haven't. I've, I've only seen your stuff on social, so it's good to meet you. <laughs> yes, you too, Rachel. Pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on. Fantastic story. Um, yeah, I'd be interested in, in speaking at, you know, off air in regards to that because I, I operate and run um, a keto low-carb carnivore uh, website. Um, so, I mean, if you're looking for stockists for the broth, uh, I'd be interested in, in chatting about that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, and, and it's something that people can do at home as well, isn't it? It's just, it is highly time consuming in regards to chicken, which is around 24 hours, yeah. I believe. Oh, so. it's a nightmare. I mean, look, you know, I, I've, I've had slow cookers. At one point in my house, I had nine slow cookers bubbling away. <laughs> you know, it was just at the point, and then we switched to pressure cooking because it was better for nutrition. It's also cuts down the histamine levels. It's also quicker for our production as well. So now we just cook broth under pressure and it works so much better for, for the product itself. 
Um, but yeah, you know, people, anyone who's tried broth at home, you know, it's time consuming, it's smelly, you know, if you're really bad at it, like I was initially, you know, then I, I didn't remove the fat. I, when I first had my first cup of broth, I kept the fat within. I'm, I'm sure all the cardboard people are thinking, yeah, go for the fat. <laughs> but actually, I didn't really enjoy it. So, you know, it was, a, a, it, you know, and making broth, it is an art because you do have, you know, it can, there's so many variables that can go wrong, you know, in making a really good broth. You know, we don't add any vegetables with it. People often add vegetables for flavor. Um, we don't, we add more bones because we want, protein and that's essentially what broth is all about it's about the proteins the amino acids in the in the broth itself that are the are, are the, the the you know the game changers for people's gut health the collagen particularly you know a lot of people don't realize that as we age our collagen production slows down so you know having a natural source of it to replenish it is great and, and broth is perfect for that because you can't get any more natural Exactly. And I think, you know, people don't give collagen the credit that it deserves. Um, you know, through the carnival community, there's lots of people who won't eat the gristle on the bone um, or the marrow from the bone or the stringy bits in the steak. And that's where the collagen yeah. is, which is incredibly important. So for those people who are avoiding, I, I eat bone and everything. I'm, I <laughs> I'm a bit of an animal when it comes to that. But I mean, these are ideal you know, substitutes, isn't it, in regards to collagen replacement, because collagen, uh, you know, particularly one and three is incredibly important, you know, one uh, predominantly from, from marine, isn't it, which is predominates the body and, yes. and bovine, which is, which is number yes. three, uh, which is ideal for intestinal health. Um, okay. But, you know, it's, we need one and three in particular. Um, and I think even within, uh, you know, the carnivore community, the people that I work with, it's, it's something that is, is missing. Um, my first piece of advice, you know, as I'm sure yours would be, is, is to eat the stringy bits and, and the cartilage off your bones. But if you're not into that, you know, then, then the collagen shots, you know, the, the broth um, shots, I, that's what I drink in the morning occasionally. Um, it, you know, and pe people look at me stupid. So instead of having a cup of coffee, you know, it's a cup of, uh, of, of bone broth, um, <laughs> which is fantastic. You know, it, it's just a case of getting used to something different. And I think that... Uh, I think there's going to be a big change in the UK over the next couple of years in regards to coffee shops stocking things like this because yes. the, the movement is growing and people are understanding how important that you know the replacement of collagen. Well, Richard, collagen there has to be a change, you know, and these, you know, the coffee shops and the places they need to be part of leading that change because people, the, the nation is sick, you know, not just the nation, the world is sick, you know, the amount of people that come to us, you know, even vegans come to buy broth from us because they might have been vegan for you know the last 10, 15 years or something, and their body is literally stripped of all the nutrients, you know, and and they they come to us and they're like, help, you know, my my gut health is in a terrible state what can I do and and yeah I just say you know the best thing you can do is get some protein into you. <laughs> it's yeah. it's really very simple you know because these people have been depleting themselves of these vital nutrients for such a long time and you know and I think unfortunately you know mainstream messaging there is still a lot of the wrong information out there you know you'd go to the doctors that they haven't got a clue they have not got a clue you know and I, I don't I'm not here to diss doctors I'm not talking about all doctors I'm just saying you know the doctors are often the, the GPs that you go in and you're just on a routine roundabout appointment with them and they're not trained it's not their fault they just don't have that education yeah I agree and it's uh, you know we are it's indoctrinated from such a young age that we need fruits and vegetables for vitamins and minerals because that's the first question that I get asked as yeah. a carnivore is where, where are your vitamins and minerals coming from well Fruits and vegetables, I hate to break it to everybody, are not a good source of vitamins and minerals. Um, right. Vitamin A, retinol, we cannot get from plants. Plants okay. contain beta carotene, which is a precursor that needs to be acted upon by an enzyme called BCMO to convert it into the active form of retinol. Plants do not contain high levels of, of B vitamins, particularly vitamin B12, cobalamin. Um, you know, we do not get vitamin K from plants yet. This is what's stamped on kale, isn't it, in the supermarket, right. vitamin K. But yeah. kale contains K1, the human body needs K2, uh, and the list goes on, creatine, carnosine, carnitine, taurine, all of these things that we can only get from animal proteins. And one of the other biggest misconceptions is that vitamin C, where do you get your vitamin C from? Well, meat contains vitamin C, you know, so it, um, unfortunately, we are fed this, uh, pardon the pun, or pun intended, <laughs> uh, you know, we are fed this massive load of rubbish, isn't it, in regards to 
plants being uh, fit for optimal health. Unfortunately, they they bind to lots of the nutrients and they prevent the absorption. They're anti-nutrients. Plants are anti-nutrients. They prevent the absorption of these essential uh, amino acids, collagens. Um, and, and I can understand. So I work with vegans and vegetarians. Um, yes. You know, I, I respect anybody's dietary choice. Uh, but I, I I try to to uh, educate, you know, as much as I can, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, and the people that I do work with, I find that they suffer with sarcopenia later in life, you know, muscle wastage, osteoporosis, yeah. because they're not con consuming these essential nutrients, which we can get from meats and bone broths, you know? Yeah, and Richard, oh, I think you hit a point, good point there, you know, that there is so much misinformation out there. And people, you know, and I, I like you, I do respect everybody's health choices, you know, their diet choices. But at the end of the day, you know, there is a lot of misinformation out there. And it's, gonna, it's getting worse because, you know, we've got all these, you know, I, I, the, the AI chatbots, you know, they write blogs, you know, people when they're searching stuff, they could start be researching really bad things. This is why it's so important to have leaders in the space, influencers, that people can go to for the right information. Because otherwise, you know, it, it really is going to become a major issue. And just going on to the point of vegetables earlier with the, with the lads that you had on prior to me, you know, they were talking about environmental toxins. And, you know, it, they're, they're really, that really is a major issue. You know, people don't realise that, you know, farming... You know, it, they they do they are using pesticides. They are using you know unnatural things on our fruits and vegetables. You know, so if you're going to eat fruit and vegetables, try and make your own. Try and grow your own. You know, yeah. and and people don't need a lot of space to grow their own vegetables. You know, I think that's really you know important to say. You you can you can just grow them in pots. You know, you don't have to have a massive allotment to grow your own veggies. Yeah, definitely. There's lots of miscommunications. I mean, you know, some of the arguments I get are uh, animal cruelty, yet uh, <laughs> anyway, I, say animal lovers. Uh, no, I, I love animals. Uh, that's why I consume my food locally from a farm two miles away, um, all grass fed, grass finished. The animals are well looked yeah. after. One, one cow would feed me for a year, which comes from two miles up the road. So I'm okay. uh, helping, you know, the, the environment uh, in regards to pollution. And I'm not desertifying because what people don't understand is when they eat, you know, vegans and vegetarians, they consume these foods. You need to desertify a field which kills a whole ecosystem, destroys the microbes in the ground. And, and that, that right. land becomes desertified. It can never be used again. Yeah. It, can, it kills a whole right. ecosystem. Um, yeah. And uh, have you seen the combine harvesters when they, they plough a field and there's, there's all the, the seagulls and birds above? That's because yes. of all the dead animals that are caught within that machinery. Oh. And these vegans and vegetarians don't understand that. You know, they, to, to desertify the field kills 10 times more animals, you know, than, than it does to, 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 to feed uh, a carnivore lifestyle. Uh, and what do they do? They, they, they you know, uh, buy av avocados and these exotic fruits which are flown <laughs> in from all know, over the world. Yeah, from Mexico, you know, from the yeah. drug cartel. I know it's yeah. insane, honestly. Yes. And um, I, I have to say, sorry, just to interrupt, because Stephen has brought on his lovely dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I brought my dog in because I just wanted you to say, talk about that you do carnivore stuff for dogs. Yeah, so. absolutely. So I think that this is a just really a testament to how natural our bone broth is because we do we put nothing in it just three ingredients that's it and we home make our apple cider vinegar as well because we're fortunate enough to live on an orchard but the greatest thing is is that we have a dual license to reduce the bone broth for pets and for human consumption the broth that we sell for the pets is actually no different to the one that we sell for the humans we just have to have a license and a different label to put on it but essentially you could buy a pot of broth for yourself and share it with your dog that's how that's how or vice versa. Yeah, or vice versa, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that to the point of us doing this was because, you know, we do see that there are, you know, issues within the health space for pets as well. You know, they are not getting access to a lot of their correct information. And there's a really big drive in the raw feeding community now for pets, which is amazing, you know, because so many vets in the UK really stand for raw feeding. You know, they they highly recommend carnivore diets for dogs. And absolutely, dogs aren't meant to eat you know um they're not meant they're not meant to be herbivores at all you know um so broth is a great way to supplement a dog's health as well so you know for the same benefits is why you would have it for for a human which is for inflammation reduction in the gut 
um, for collagen benefits as well, um, and also joint and ligament benefits, particularly for dogs, you know, especially as they get older, you know, they do need that extra glycosamine, glycosamine and chondroitin in, in their bodies as well. And that's another um, amino acid um, structure that can that, that's found within bone broth too. So, yeah, it's really, really good stuff. And just, just, I just want to go on to something that Rich was talking about there. Uh, this is from the Smith, 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 Smithsonian National Zoo and Conserv <laughs> Conservation <laughs> Biology Institute. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, in a year, 67 million birds are killed due to pesticides, agricultural pesticides. Um, 672, they reckon, across the world. In a year. Yeah. That's Beautiful. a lot of death. And it's destruction. Horrible. So, it is uh, you know, and these are the things that don't really get exposed. Do you know what I mean? You know, mainstream media is just always yep. because they have the power, they have the majority, you know, so they're able to push that that narrative out there. Um, but, you know, the, again, as I'm reconfirming, you know, this is why it's so important to have these sorts of shows on this sort of, you know, network for people to be able to come and get the right information. Um, because, you know, I was horrified when I went on my own health journey to, to see, you know, um, just how you become on a conveyor belt. You know, you go in with your symptoms, they treat your symptoms, you come out with something else. And then, you know, it's, it's not just that, it's when people come to you and they've got the problems. I'm sure you guys have both the same. You hear, you hear that all the time where people are just stuck on, on medication and they don't know how to get off of it. And actually, the first thing to do is diet. It has to be. Oh, for yes. sure. Yeah, for sure. It, uh, it is a shame. I mean, one industry feeds the other. Um, and yeah, I mean, thank, thank you for coming on and spreading the word as well. I mean, it's I, I've, I've been living this lifestyle for 10, 11 years and screaming it from the rooftops, but a lot of my content um, seems to be blocked on, on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. As such, my following hasn't grown. So I've been screaming this for 10, 11 years um, and I, I don't have a following, um, you know, anywhere near the size of some of these other influencers. Um, and, and I think it's because content I've put out earlier, um, which is a shame and it's tough. You know, Stephen and I were speaking about this yesterday with me in, in regards to trying to improve that following in order to get that message out. But a lot of my, my items, posts have been censored over the years. Yeah. I, I must be in Facebook and Instagram jail or something. But these are fantastic ways, isn't it, to get that message out there. I mean, this is the first ever 24 hour, you know, keto carnival live. Um, and I think, you know, a, a big thank you to everybody that, that, that's coming on to help spread that word, you know, and, and thank you in particular yeah. as well. But uh, it's, it's an awesome, I, you know, it's such an important message. I mean, you know, our diets naturally, the human diets are naturally carbohydrate based, you know, and, um, and there's so much science and research information now to say that, you know, more of a heavily protein fat diet is better for our bodies you know and if we go back throughout history you know most you know people were hunting they're hunt, hunting for food you know then they you know and eating grains and and natural foods from the land for for years you know and unfortunately because we've become so massive in terms of population there's just not enough food to go around to feed everyone now so you know everything's become genetically modified you know, trying to get us to eat insects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you and, seen and them Phil, on food yet? Have you seen it on food yet? Yeah. Even, even on some of the ingredients, they're slipping them in, you know? So yeah. it just, it, it's, yeah, it's not great. It's not great. But that's why no. getting the right information and, and doing what you can at home. And eating local, I think, is the most important thing. For sure. You yeah, know, agree, eating local produce, sourced. you know, because you don't know where it's, it, you know, again, for the, it's great for the environment, but also... You know, you don't know how food, what pans they pass through the further afield they go, you know. And I always stand by British farming. We do have the best farming in the world, for sure. I know it's not, no farming's perfect, but compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, I think so. And I think Phil and Ben made a fantastic uh, mention uh, when they were on about um, locally sourced produce and the fact that you couldn't sustainably live on um you know on on plant foods uh no. there's just not enough around we predominantly were animal based you know we would have spent days hunting and tracking an animal we would have caught and killed that animal we would have eaten everything within that animal that animal contains protein and it contains fat 
There's no carbohydrate within that animal. Yet we are told as a society that we cannot live without carbohydrate and carbohydrate predominates everything. And I think one of the biggest um, misconceptions which you know needs to be addressed, I think maybe you know, a point we can come back to you know, time and time again, but I'm sure everyone within the community already understands this, that we look at carbohydrates and sugar as being two different things. They are yes. the same thing. Carbs yes, is true. sugar. All <laughs> carbs break into sugar. You know, okay. I, I haven't eaten. I haven't eaten any sugar, but I've eaten a bowl of pasta. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I've had a bowl of muesli. Um, but it's really you know, interesting. Sorry, Richard, but it's really interesting you say that because for me, in my own personal health journey, that was a real big education for me because yeah. you don't realise that your banana's got carbohydrates in. You, you know, it's just pumped into you. Yeah, your fruit's good. You have got to eat it. You know, but actually, it is full of sugars. Yes, they're natural sugars, but you're still your body doesn't go oh that's a natural sugar that's a processed sugar therefore i'm going to treat it differently your body isn't that intelligent it just or the the, the system isn't that intelligent it just says that sugar i'm going to deal with it as it deals with it you know um yeah i think you know there's so many misconceptions and i was gonna i was gonna say something to, then when, in a minute oh, it's gone from my mind sorry i've forgotten it will come back to me <laughs> broken your train of thought there isn't it but yeah i mean a bowl of muesli um, you know, I used to think was incredibly healthy. Um, you know, that, that bowl of muesli per 100 grams contains anywhere between 70 to 80 grams, which is, you know, around 20 teaspoons of sugar or, or 20, um, yeah, 20 teaspoons of sugar isn't it, per 100 grams. Uh, and what did I used to do? I used to chop up a banana or, or add some berries. So I used to add sugar to my bowl of sugar, you know, and I, I thought that I was being healthy. Um, oh, but no. unfortunately, the, you know, this is... Um, you know the brainwashing that has gone on, you know, since uh, f f the 1950s, isn't it? and it, um, you know, mm. mostly is not uh, your friend. It, no, uh... it's not, and it's even worse for children. You know, I've got two children, and you know the cereals that are around for the children, it's just a nightmare. They're, they you know, they say, oh, they've got extra, you know, vitamin D or you know this and they'll, you know, this and that in there, but actually the sugar in there is just insane. And when they say, so what they'll say on there is fortified with. Now that fortified it, means, it. Fortified that, yeah, that they, they have dug those minerals out of the ground and added them in. That cannot be, that cannot be good for you. You know, uh, digging mean, iron out of the ground and adding it to your food. And um, feeding it surely, to kids. <laughs> and feeding it to kids, yeah. You know, you know it's... it's yeah, so so that, that's what fortified means. It's not is natural. That really, is that what it means, is it? That they've actually yeah, dug it out? They've dug yeah. it out of the ground, yeah, and, and put, put it in, which is absolutely incredible. Our nutrients should come from the food that we eat naturally. Yeah, um not not <laughs> from not from the ground, at least in my opinion, anyway. What yeah, do you yeah. think, Steve? <laughs> well, I, I I was just looking in the chat there because someone wants to go to your website, Rachel. What is your wow. Yeah, yeah, really. oh, you can get free samples as well on the website. So it's www.oilandbroth.com. Um, if there's anyone overseas and they want some samples, just message us at info at oilandbroth.com. Um, but yeah, we've got um, free. So this, so what I was telling you about with the with the broth. So we've just going through a change, and as of, as from September, we're stopping all of our frozen bone broth. And the reason we're doing it is because it's just costing us so much money to make it and ship it now, and we can't ship it overseas because it's it it spoils so quickly. So this is why we dehydrate now the broth. So it gets rid of all the water, it's ground down into a pure broth protein, and then people just rehydrate it back. So five grams rehydrates back to 100 mils of bone broth. Um, yeah, and we're giving away samples on the website so people can go on and, and pick up a sample. They can try the dehydrated bone broth. We've got samples for pets. We've got samples for humans. We've got six different flavors for pets. We've got beef, lamb, chicken, venison, goat, and pork for pets and then for humans we've just got the three chicken lamb and beef but actually we're also going to be launching a new venison flavor for humans as well because then i don't know if you guys eat venison at all but it's becoming really really popular now in the uk yeah um i would i would well, say yeah, that this venison morning well. we, yeah <laughs> it's brilliant um we were talking about coffee and giving up coffee and i think um substituting coffee with bone broth is, is a hack that a lot of people use, and it does work, actually. I think um, coffee is lovely. Uh, I have decaf, and it doesn't cause me any issues, but I understand the social side of it. So if you want to um, get off coffee, as we spoke about with Dr. Chafee and also Dr. Kiltz, um, 
then bone broth is a really good thing to try as an alternative because it is tasty and it is nutritious and it's a hot drink and um you could sit there where you normally sit in the morning say you have your coffee and have your bone broth and uh because it's now dried it, you can su supply it. i mean i remember buying some off of you that was the liquid and i think actually it might be serendipity that you know costs have gone up and you've gone more into the dehydrated because it's easier to post and it's easier to store at home and then you just just make it like coffee granules you know it's just it's, yeah. it's so easy and simple and such a good thing to have a hot drink instead of coffee which is uh deleterious for most people and have something that's nutritious i think um you know hopefully people will take you up on that offer to go to your website so just it's it's boilandbroth.com is it yes it is yeah yeah, yeah and we right, do okay. And we do offer, so um, people in the UK can just go on and order samples normally, but at the moment our worldwide shipping is not great. So just email us um, and we can ship them out to you that way. Yeah. Well, um, I'm just going to answer a couple of the comments, by the way. Yes. Um, just just so people know, we, we've invited as many guests as we possibly could. And yes, we're going to have guests every half hour. So Rachel was very kind to come on. Um, we tried to get Ken Berry, but I think it's just been too busy for him to to get on. Uh, I don't think Dr. Chafe is coming back. He's given us three hours already. Uh, Dr. Kilts may come back, but we have got people booked um, all the way through the day. So uh, we're now four and a half hours into this 24-hour live stream. So Rich, we're out of out of the woods now so you know we've only got 19 and a half to go but rachel thank you so much for um appearing that's yeah, really great. appreciated it yeah thank you i'm really grateful to you for asking me to come on and richard if it is okay i'll contact you separately and um we'll have a chat about what we spoke about at the beginning so yeah thank you very much all the best for today it was really great thank you okay, okay bye bye Yes, so um, that was brilliant. Wasn't I was it? moved it. I didn't realise yeah. I was moved it there when I was. <laughs> Apologies, Richard, <laughs> if you're still listening. Yeah, I did say thank you, and yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, we, so yeah, I mean, just going into uh, what we were saying um, ab about that being nutritious. I mean, just before the next guest, if you want to just talk about what Keto Pro does, what you do, that'd be interesting. From a, a severe health background, and, and as such, I, I've sold uh, three houses, everything I own, to put into the business in order to educate and help people along their journey in carb reduction, removing seed oils, grains, uh, and ideally the transition into carnivore eventually. Um, and we support every stage of that. So we support every stage of low carb, uh, dirty keto, clean keto, and everything is, is signposted on the website. So the, the products and foods that we do. Uh, will either be stamped keto pro approved which is the creme de la creme anything else is you know deemed to be keto friendly or low carb but no matter what what side of the fence you're on whether you're low carb dirty keto clean keto standard carnivore what type of carnivore you know there, there are products uh, and foods and, and snacks on there that um, uh, that can help anybody along their journey uh, obviously we always promote real food um, real food is you know is the way forward what we do stock is classed as foods um, and that's what we do. Part of our journey is to help educate. And that's what Stephen and I do every Sunday on the live. This is what we do on the website. There's a knowledge base on there with lots of free information, lots of free information on the YouTube channel uh, and Instagram, etc. But that's enough chatter for me. Um, on to yeah. uh, on to Dr. Rachel Brown. Hello, Dr. Rachel. Rachel Hello. Brown. Hello. Would you like to introduce Hi, yourself to those people that don't know you? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I work as a consultant psychiatrist in the UK, um, but I'm also qualified in functional medicine. So I have a real interest in um, looking at the root causes of illness, which I think uh, modern day medicine doesn't do particularly well. Um, and I've been carnivore for four years now. Do you know Richard, by the way? I don't. Hello, Rachel. I, I don't think we've met prior to this, have we? No, I'm um, on mute. You've, no. not, you've not met. No, we right, okay. no I'm not. <laughs> so, nice um, to meet you. No, no, Dr. Rachel. no, we haven't met. I think we've interacted a bit on Instagram, but that's been it. Brilliant. Oh, have you? What, did you have a bit of a ding-dong argument about something? No, I don't think so, is there? It, no, uh, no, I'm only joking. Rachel, yeah. can you hear us okay? <laughs> no. 
Sorry, I don't know if I've got a bit of a delay here, but I'll try and do my best. Yes, there is a delay. It's like speaking on a satellite. So do you want to give um, the listeners and viewers a little bit of background about why you ended up with, you know, being a carnivore? Gosh, yeah, sure. So, um, gosh, I've been interested in low-carb nutrition for decades now. It's a couple of decades, which makes me feel really old. Um, but I came to carnivore via keto, and it was really just um, – because of family sort of poor health um, in older generations of my family. And I, I've been doing, I've been a big fa fan of Mark Sisson for years and I've been doing low carb, but not necessarily strictly keto for quite a number of years before I, I decided I was gonna go strictly keto. And then I just came across Carnivore via one of um, my favorite keto influencers, which was Vanessa Spinner. So I'd followed a lot of her work um, for quite some time. And like a lot of people, I thought it was crazy when I first heard of it. Um, and I first saw it, I first was introduced to Carnivore via just a food plate that she shared on her Instagram. And because I trusted her opinion on a lot of things, I felt um, there must be something in this if she's doing it. So I went down the rabbit hole and just researched it myself and, and the rest was history. Yeah, and I, th I think there is... A slight delay, by the way. So, um, Richard, do you want to ask a, a psychiatrist any particular question about carnivore and how it's helpful? Yeah, so it, um, I mean, a, a lot of questions that, that we get within the community, uh, you know, is uh, regards to how the diet will affect uh, the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis within the brain and how the brain functions. Uh, I did an interesting podcast with Jen Anwin recently in regards to food addiction. Uh, and many people don't understand that the food that we consume massively impacts the way that the brain works and, and, and the way that it makes us feel, isn't it? Um, do you want to go into a little bit of detail and, and, and explain a little bit about how this can affect the way we feel and, and the moods and and because everything comes to, to me it comes from, from from diet and I, I used to suffer severely with depression and anxiety and since becoming keto and, and carnivore uh, you know these things have, have gone away and I used to I used to tell people my life was spent living in boxes so I used to leave my box and jump in my metal box I drive to a big box where I'd walk into a small box my life was spent living in boxes because of depression and anxiety and through the foods that I've changed in my diet, I know I've been able to, to come out of that box. And now I do public speaking events to thousands of people, what I couldn't have dreamt of doing before. And all of this is to do with nutrition. But when you tell that to somebody, they won't believe it because it doesn't come from a medication, you know? And it's, um, yeah, so if, if you wanted to go into a little bit of that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, sure, happy to. Um... Gosh, where to start? There's so many different um, complicated pathways within the body that all interconnect. Um, it, all, it, really, it really astounds me. So I'm, I'm part of a critical psychiatry network group and there were some emails this week that I found particularly triggering. And it was in response to one of the psychiatrists in the group asking, is there any evidence that food can make a difference to major mental disorder? And um, someone else in the group, very opinionated, said, oh, there's absolutely no evidence. And I'm sure we'd all be very happy if there was any evidence. Uh, and um, I was just too triggered to actually respond to that email chain because I have emailed them all before, but obviously they didn't pay much attention to my emails. Um, but it, it never ceases to amaze me when people say that what we eat has nothing to do with our mental health because, um, our neurotransmitters, a lot of them are manufactured in the gut by our gut bacteria, particularly serotonin. Um, but don't get me wrong, it's not just about neurotransmitters in terms of having good mental health, but they're certainly a part of the puzzle. And in terms of all the enzymatic reactions that happen in the body, we need uh, vitamins and minerals to act as co those, those, those reactions. So for example, production of serotonin, production of melatonin, um, conversion into those sorts of neurotransmitters or chemically active substances in the body come originally from amino acids, such as tryptophan. And where do we get our amino acids from? But we get it from our food. Um, and that's also where we get our vitamins and minerals and so on and so forth. And I think a good way of thinking about it is that whatever we choose to put into our body really does affect um, 
our body's response. Um, so our body always responds to our environment, um, be it toxins or uh, foods that we're putting into our body. And part of those responses can include an immune system reaction. Um, but really, I like to start off in the gut because I think I think the gut brain connection is absolutely crucial. And, you know, there are certain foods that are just terrible for for health in general, never mind mental health. And one of those is gluten. Um, so we know that foods like gluten, because of a component in the protein of uh, the wheat protein, that leads to leaky gut. And when you have leaky gut, it means that there are certain bacteria and toxins within the gut and toxins that come from bacteria that can then leak across the gut barrier into the bloodstream and travel to sites distant in the body, including the brain. Um, and when that happens, we know it's very clear from research, um, particularly in relation to something called LPS, which comes from gram-negative bacteria. Um, but these bacterial components trigger off an immune system reaction and an inflammatory reaction in the body. Um, and in the research literature, when we talk about peripheral inflammation, we are also talking about immune system activation. And that comes in the form of cytokines um, that are released. And there's a clear connection between the gut and the brain along the vagus nerve, but there's also chemical signaling that goes between those two organs back and forth. And when you have, we know from the research that when you have inflammation in your gut, you also have in inflammation at the level of your blood brain barrier. And your blood brain barrier is quite similar to the intestine is how I often think about it because it's a, a similar single cell layer that can also become leaky. Um, and once you have a leaky blood brain barrier, this means uh, certain toxins and components from bacteria to, can cross over into the brain and cause inflammation in the brain. Um, so those are a few different mechanisms. Um, but there are, other, there are other aspects too, just um, in terms of oxidative stress being one. So having an imbalance between the antioxidants that we have endogenously in our body uh, versus pro-oxidant molecules that are formed as a result of different processes in the body, um, part of which can come from the food that we choose to eat. And so we know that having a high carbohydrate load in the body is inherently inflammatory. And then this inflammation and oxidative stress can trigger off changes in the neurotransmitter pathways. So you, particularly the tryptophan pathway, that's a really good example where you can have tryptophan that's di diverted down the kynurenine pathway which is essentially an inflammatory pathway in the body. And it means there's a bit of a tryptophan steal, so you don't produce as much serotonin um, or ultimately melatonin. And, and so you can see why that might give rise to mood symptoms or sleep difficulties at night. Um, so, so those are just a few, a few different pathways in the body. Um, but ultimately, um, in my opinion, it all starts in the gut. And, and that's often the opinion of other functional medicine practitioners as well. Yeah, I think, you know, looking at that, it, you, know, you mentioned inflammation there. You know, inflammation is the activation of the immune system, isn't it? Uh, and all of these things seem to come from the foods that we consume. You know, you mentioned um, serotonin, which is an uh, endolamine um, and uh, synthesized from tryptophan. Uh, and as you say, there's uh, other cofactors involved like iron, zinc and B12. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the foods we eat uh, that are caused, you know, excess carbohydrate consumption, for example, will lead to insulin resistance and inflammation. Um, you know, this can lower our immune system, uh, in particular, things like the ACE2 receptors, leaving us more susceptible to viruses and infections. And when we get these viruses and infections, um, the body sequesters iron, doesn't it? Uh, it puts iron into ferritin and it takes it out of circulation. Now, one of the main cofactors to produce serotonin is out of circulation. So the body could have an abundant amount of, of iron stored in ferritin, but none of it is bioavailable. And then this affects the serotonin production. Um, so all of this comes back down to the foods that we eat, isn't it? Which, again, people find absolutely crazy to understand. But what we eat massively affects the way that, that we feel and the way that the brain functions um, and I and I genuinely believe I, I, I we've mentioned this before. We, you know we're not against medication in the treatment for certain things, but predominantly I think if you eat uh, a, a carnivore or ketogenic based lifestyle, low in carbohydrates, avoiding grains and seed oils, so we're avoiding glycation and oxidative stress. Um, you know we're, we're combating and reducing inflammation, and that's what BHB does. That's what beta hydroxybutyrate does, and it? it blocks NLRP3 inflammasome, uh, which is the main inflammatory marker in the body. Um, uh, or pathway and it um all of these things uh help prevent 
the, these illnesses. Now our, our need for medication uh, you know, goes away. I, I mentioned earlier in the talk, I can't remember the last time I've taken medication. Um, yet I was on an abundant, I was on a myriad of medication every day for all sorts of things. Uh, and now I am completely medication free all from, from changing my, my, my diet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It really frustrates me um, working particularly in the NHS where the food is terrible that people are fed in hospital and <laughs> um, we're, we're just piling on different medications on top of this underlying inflammation and immune system that activation that's going on and, and no, nobody really spends much time thinking about addressing the underlying cause and yes medications can help and they can help to suppress symptoms um, but as we all know no pharmaceutical comes without potential for side effects and I, I just wish that more people were aware that they could really ultimately improve their mental health by changing their lifestyle and what they eat um, and I don't think it's all about diet so I think other things are super important as well such as light routines particularly for circadian health um, and, and limiting toxins and, and so on. But yeah, diet's certainly a fundamental place to start. And I'd, I'd be very surprised if people could get to a place of um, complete wellness without doing something at least to address their diet. I'm a really big fan of Dr. Sarah Myhill's work and um, it's particularly a paleo ketogenic diet that she promotes for people and suggests and I, I think that's a really good place for people to start if they're you know not everybody needs to be carnivore but you, we certainly see a lot of people in this community who have amazing health transformations and I know of quite a number of people with major mental disorders who um, for whatever reason keto just didn't do it for them in terms of resolving all of their symptoms whereas carnivore is one step further um, in terms of promoting recovery so I think people have got different options and everybody's I always say everyone's bio-individual, so particularly when it comes to our gut microbiome, you just don't know exactly where somebody's starting from unless you do detailed testing. And even then, I think there's so much that we don't know yet about that field. Oh, Steve, you're on mute. I, th <laughs> I think the delay is a little bit disconcerting for a few people, but I just wanted to know... Um, I've got a question about <laughs> sleep, which I'm going to put on. Uh, if you want to answer it, that would be great. It's not as specific as uh, to your job, but somebody here, uh, TFC Lux. Uh, I have problems with sleep on carnival. I wake up in the middle of the night like two to three times. Just wondering what your advice is on fixing this issue. And also wondering, butter is fine for the fat increase. So you got any views on that, Rachel? Yeah, so my first thought is that it might be a bit of a cortisol issue if you're um, waking up in the middle of the night, particularly if you're unable to get back to sleep. And I suppose I would wonder a little bit, um, sometimes gender can be relevant in this in terms of fasting protocols that people are doing. Uh, so I used to, I started off carnivore doing quite a lot of fasting and then in the end just decided to stop s skipping breakfast because um I think particularly for women, having a meal early in, earlier in the day can be really helpful for um, normalizing your cortisol uh, response during the day. Because I think I think a bad thing that some a bad habit that sometimes people run into is if they're just uh, fasting all morning. Um, particularly if you're using caffeine or co have coffee on board, and you can end up just um, disrupting your circadian rhythms because food is a secondary. A signal to the circadian clocks about what time of day it is and as well as getting morning sunlight um, I think if you're doing a lot of fasting particularly skipping breakfast then that might be one thing to try to scale back a bit because fasting can be an additional stressor on the body and uh, the butter yeah I mean I'm a fan of butter I'm not I think there's been quite a big trend in carnivore um, in the carnivore community to add loads and loads of butter and, and brown butter bites and, and um, very intense um, intense fat load into the, the diet. And I think some people can run into difficulties with gaining weight on that. But certainly from a fat point of view, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with butter. I'm just not a huge fan of making it your main your main fat in your diet. So I, I think it can be complementary to other other meats in the diet. 
Um, but there's certainly nothing wrong with butter unless you're someone who's highly sensitive to the casein, so the, the protein in, in cow's milk, in which case you might be better off using ghee or thinking about another fat such as tallow um, or other animal fats. Rich, Fantastic. yeah, com yeah, completely agree with that. And and as Rachel rightly says, you know, fasting uh, can can be a contributing factor to elevated cortisol levels. Uh, you know, fasting is fantastic. Uh, I I tend to fast every day, but it can have uh, negative impacts on cortisol. Um, another thing is, is inadequate sodium. Uh, inadequate sodium, uh, you know, in the diet can elevate cortisol. Um, uh, Coffee. So, you know, what what do we do when you know what do a lot of people do when they begin the carnival keto journey? They begin with you know the, the bulletproof coffee, isn't it? Uh, so they end up consuming way more coffee. Uh, and I know we've covered coffee a couple of times, but too much caffeine um, can cause disruption to the adrenals, uh, leading to increased cortisol. So all of these, it's not just the caffeine, but it's, it's again the interruption with cortisol into the into the system there. And timings as well. So um, you know we're told to eat. Um, well before bedtime but i eat just before bed uh, i find i don't sleep if i eat you know four hours before and, and the reason that i do this one because i eat and i want to sleep but i look at animals in the wild once an animal has caught its prey and eaten it you know it goes to sleep we covered this earlier with anthony chafee isn't it that uh, that's what an animal does once once it's it's caught its prey and eaten it goes to sleep and that's what i do so i tend to eat just before bed um so there's a few things there to uh, to address i think isn't it a few things to try and, and agree completely with the butter. I think there are better sources. I'm a fan of butter. Uh, I think um, the casein is lower in butter than uh, the milks. Uh, you know, uh, again, I sort of put butter into a different category from milk. Uh, the casein content is a lot lower. But if you are susceptible to intestinal permeability uh, and suffer with those issues, then, you know, uh, tallow or ghee uh, would be a better option. But, yeah, a, f a few suggestions there to, uh, to implement and try possibly. But... Um, Fantastic. Any thoughts from you, Steve? Well, I think after a 24 hour live stream, I might not have problems sleeping, but <laughs> actually with the screen for 24 hours, I may, I may. And I think that that's one of the things I would always add. It isn't just about what you eat. It, it, it is about what you're exposing yourself to all, all day. And if you, if you sort of are on your iPad or uh, mobile device and you're watching something scary or the news triggers you you're not making the environment conducive to going to sleep are you you're uh, yeah. using your animal analogy you know if you were out in the um, forest with your dog and you know the twigs were going and rustling was happening on your dog wouldn't sleep you wouldn't sleep because you'd feel like whoa i've got to, i've got to stay awake then if someone was flashing lights at you, you'd be like, oh, I don't like that. So, But we're doing that. We're, we're exposing ourselves to noise and lights and things we don't know and things that annoy us or scare us. And then go, oh, I can't sleep. I can't yeah. sleep. And it's like, you know, diet is in, incredibly important. But I think these other things that we that we expose ourselves to, we do need to look at. So, um, which circles yeah. back to exactly, you know, what uh, what Rachel mentioned earlier about uh, these uh, external, uh, you know, sources. So diet, you know, fundamental, but these external sources are massive contributing factors as well. But what I tend to find is that when you begin this journey, you know, of of self improvement, uh, these incremental changes, you begin to look at other things, don't you? You, you begin to look at um, cold water therapy and 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 grounding and and all these. You become a biohacker. You know what began in, in just taking out bread, <laughs> trying to restrict carbohydrate. Now suddenly, you know you're you're a, you're a biohacker that's doing all of these things and biohacking your body in, in, into better health. And uh, it is an incremental system. But yeah, f fantastic answers there. I think. Yeah, and I mean, this this reality chick, which is a great name, by the way, uh, coffee shops have become the sweet shops of the modern high street. Costa is in every hospital, and the sugar content of their cakes and pastries is off the scale. Um, I included that comment because I lost my parents m many, many years ago, and before I knew about carnivore, and certainly before I knew about low carb. And I have found it quite strange that they would feed this, you know, high. now I look back, high sugary meals and then give my uh, mother a sleeping tablet to help her sleep and she's in a stressful environment she had uh, well she died from it what she was in hospital for uh, but then at five o'clock in the morning they would wake her up 
to, to take all her readings. So they, they were completely messing up her circadian rhythms, feeding her the wrong food. Um, and I think th that's a stressful situation. So we've got a psychiatrist here, but not many people are asking questions that you would expect, you see. They're, they're talking more about environment and, and, and food in that, that respect. So I was wondering, we were talking about cortisol, do you think, uh, Dr. Rachel, that it does raise blood sugar, you know, and if you're stressed, is that, is that part of the mechanism of why some people can't sleep and, you know, feel anxious? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but unfortunately in mainstream medicine, that's not something that we look at or test. <laughs> so in terms of NHS and mainstream psychiatry, um, I, you know, there will be a bit of an awareness about stress hormones and so on and being relevant when somebody presents in a highly anxious or agitated state. But um, I can't say from uh, the last 19, 20 years of working within psychiatry that that's something we actually look at objectively. However, it can be done, um, but people need to go privately, certainly in the UK for that sort of thing. I mean, do you feel quite passionately about hospital food do you feel that they are going to look at that at some point and the cafes or do you just think it's just making too much money for them that you'll never make any inroads in, in getting people to eat properly in hospital gosh yeah that that feels like a mammoth uh, project to take on um particularly gosh the, the nhs is such a massive organization with um and, and very siloed so so many different departments and one health board doesn't necessarily work the same to the next and um, it's certainly something I've had thoughts about in terms of the hospital I work in but in order to make any change on a big scale in the NHS that's very tricky very difficult there's quite a focus on quality improvement these days which can be helpful but it tends to be starting off on a very small scale so test out a very small project and then try to generalize that if you if you um, have good results from it. So I'm not saying it's something that couldn't be done, um, but it's it would certainly take a long time, I think, and a, and a lot of effort to, to make any difference there. So what do you, what do you offer people? Um, do you offer online coaching or can they contact you if they've got any anxiety issues? What, what do you cover? Yeah, so I'm working now with... Um, my business partner, Ali Houston, and we founded MetSci. Um, so people can go to MetSci.com. So it stands for Metabolic Psychiatry, and we do coaching there. And um, so we're doing small group coaching at the moment, and we'll have a course that will run ultimately twice a year for people who are just interested in metabolic approaches to mental health. Um, at the moment, I'm not doing any direct one-to-one -one private work, but that's something that may well change in the near future. So. Um, I'm looking into some different options there. And I've just put your Instagram up on the screen as well. So people want to follow you, they can get that um, link and contact you, which would be really good. So, um, yeah, have you enjoyed coming onto the 24 hour live stream? I have, thank you. But my internet is doing my head in, so I'm going to have yeah. to contact my provider. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually plugged. I know. I'm plugged in, so I'm not on Wi-Fi, and there's still a delay. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, anyway. uh, there is a question just before you go. Uh, let's have a look. Any thoughts on increased ADHD in children these days? Is there a connection with a sad diet? Yes, absolutely. I would say. Um, so we. There's studies that show that um, particularly in autism and ADHD, there can be an increased susceptibility to leaky gut and this can then trigger off inflammation in the brain um, and so on. But there are also some slight genetic abnormalities that can mean that people have higher requirements for certain micronutrients. Um, for example, um, the MTHFR cycle, which is to do with folate and bioavailable folate, is one that a lot of functional medicine people are very into testing. Um, but the, there, there's certainly a lot of evidence that um, 
and certainly in my mind as well, that the symptoms of ADHD can be treated via diet. And I've had people contacting me, just DMing me privately, saying that they've done really well um, in terms of improving their symptoms. Um, and you get cases within functional medicine that, that show complete resolution of symptoms, just looking at diet and lifestyle and environmental um, environmental measures. So, so I, I, I'm not sitting here thinking that ADHD is a deficiency of stimulant medication. I'm not saying that those can't help some people, but I think there are other ways around, around looking at diet and nutrient requirements for that group. Yeah, I think I was listening to an autobiography, actually, uh, Lee Mack's autobiography, and he was diagnosed as, uh, he's a comedian, by the way, for the people that are not in the UK. And, you know, he's, he's as an adult, been told that he's got ADHD. But I think... You also went vegetarian. So I'm just wondering if there is a connection. But anyway, uh, so Dr. Rachel, thank you for coming on. Uh, Rich, do you want to say your goodbyes as well? Yeah, Rachel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I'd love to connect outside this and get you on the podcast as well. So if you're up for that, we'll, we'll get something booked in. But fantastic chatting. Uh, I love going into, into the weeds in regards to the science with things. And um, yeah, you've appeased my... Uh, and my scientific nature with uh, with the combo today. So thank you so much for coming on board. <laughs> Very much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Yeah, happy to chat anytime. Sounds good. Awesome. Okay, bye. Excellent, lovely. Bye. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Yeah, just wow. just to just to go just to go back to that really quickly. Um, you know, this circles back to the polyphenols, isn't it? And um, you know, uh, things like curcumin and turmeric. Uh, again, the oxalates and things in spinach, um, you know, coming back to a comment we made earlier about DNA damage and causing hyperoxaluria, which leads to hyperthyroidism and autism in children. Um, so, it, again, it's, it's all connected, isn't it? It all comes back to, to plants. Um, you know, carnivore is the way forward. And you've got a shoot now, Stephen, haven't you? So, yes, well, let's, um, let's just, to... five, five hours we've done. I have to be away for 30 minutes. And you've got a guest coming in, haven't part you? Part-timer, part-timer, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go and do that. And um, you've got your, you can, and you can let the guests come in, can't you, Richard? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I haven't seen anybody pop up. I haven't seen any um, thing. Um, well, it's uh, Phil, isn't it? it what I mean, yeah, Phil. Can you can you en- can you get them to enter in the room when they're there? I don't think so. Can you, are they on a pre-screen when they pop up? Because I, I haven't seen anything until they come on the screen. Oh, you don't get a little screen at the bottom it's, with them coming on. No. Oh, I was hoping your guest would be on so I could let him in. Uh, but he's I, obviously I've not ju- here. I've just just messaged now, um, so I'm hoping he'll pop on. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. I'm, ho- I'm hoping he's, he's on his way. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I've got access this end to allow him uh, to come on, unfortunately. Right, okay. Right, well, I'll uh, I will have to do my 30 minutes away, but I'll have to wait for your pop-on to pop on, and then I'll pop off. And um, anyway, five hours we've done, so there's 19 to go, and lots and lots of guests. Like I say, somebody asked if Ken Berry's coming on, but he, he uh, he's just too busy, which is a shame. Did ask him. Here we go. So I can let Phil come in and let you uh, do your – your stuff for 30 minutes you fantastic let me in, add him to the stream hello ah there he is how are you doing my man yes I'm right. very well good good so the other the co-host Stephen has just had to leave us for, for 30 minutes so just to give you the rundown fell we're, we're, we're live for 24 hours uh we've got viewers from all over the world we've got some uh, besides myself obviously some world leading speakers within the, <laughs> the carnivore keto community um so Stephen's just nipped out, so it's just you and I to touch base. But what I wanted to do, I mean, you've kindly agreed to come on and share part of your journey. Um, do you want to first let, I'm sure everybody knows exactly who you are, and you need no introduction, but do you want to do a quick intro and tell everyone uh, who you that are? Will be, I am. I, t- I tell you, I'm, I'm Phil, the power sailor, 16 times champion of the world. Well, 16 times champion of the world. But yeah. Uh, yeah, loving every minute of it, loving it. Sixteen. So times far, world so time. far, we've got we've got the we've got the uh, seniors world championships now. So that's what we're working on. 
Exactly, exactly. So just a quick rundown uh, for everyone who's watching now that um, Phil um, uh, reached out to me recently. Uh, Phil has always been known for looking um, at ways to improve athletic performance as well as health and well-being. He's always been known as an out-of-the-box thinker. Um, he's come across, uh, you know, keto and carnivore, that sort of lifestyle and looked into it, found me on a podcast, I believe, Phil, reached out to me through the share chat um, and then we began working together. Yeah, and um, yeah, it's been good. I'm so, enjoying it. Fantastic. It's, it's nice to do different things, Richard. It is honestly. I mean, over the years, ever since I was little, really, I've been an on on and off diet. Probably most of the people watching have been exactly the same. But this is the first time, and I can say this and an art that I don't want to change. I'm enjoying it. It's, it's like you know, we always say it, it's not a diet; it's a lifestyle. And every time someone used to say that to me over the years, I, it was in my head, and I couldn't stick to it. But now, especially now I've got more time, got more time at home, you know, living out of hotels, country to country. I mean, we were literally worldwide, week in and week out. So it was difficult to, 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 to get, get your regime to eat as what you should be eating, you know. So it's, it's a lot more easier now. But it's, it, it, this is what I want to do now for the rest of my life because I'm enjoying it. And it's, it's easy. The first thing my wife used to say to me when I wake up in the morning, what do you want for your tea? I mean, I don't know. What do you want for your tea? It's half past seven in the morning. But we don't say that no more because it makes things simple. We haven't got as many dishes. The sink's empty, which is another one as well. Saves you a fortune on washing up. So it's it's a great it's a great lifestyle, and it's and it makes you feel good. That's the main thing. I've always wanted to get up in the morning and get that feel good feeling, which I never had before. I was all I was always like jet lagged and in a, in a muzzy in my head. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I mean, sure. most people will know this. Know that feeling all too well. And F Phil Escott, we had on a little while ago, has just given you a, a hey, Phil. So glad to see that you're still on it. Um, yeah. So that's, that's Phil Escott giving you a shout out there. And lots of praise coming from, from the live chat as well uh, from everybody. Uh, so, yeah, brilliant. Thanks for coming on. But let's get back to your journey. So, I mean, you're, you're currently, um, what, what's the, uh, what was your driving factor for beginning the journey? You know, for, for most people, it's weight loss. But I, I feel that for you, it was a, a different driving factor. Do you want to go into that? Uh, there, was a, there was a few things. I was I, I, I committed to the seniors for Jason Tame and Jason Francis. Jason Tame is a promoter. Jason Francis is a promoter, but he's Ronnie O'Sullivan's manager. That's how people might know Jason Francis. And Jason Tame's got a company called Modus, which do a lot of promotion work in the dark. So they started the seniors off. They've asked me if I'll commit. Which I, have, which I have, I've signed a contract, so I've committed. So starting off thinking, you know, just do what you used to do, turn up. But I haven't really been competitive for like five or six years. And I didn't realise how hard it is to get back into being match fit, if, if, like a footballer, you know. It's okay on the training ground, but it's when you're on the pitch, when you're under pressure, you know, you seem to lose something. Then my hip, I needed a new hip. So I, I booked that up. And it was on the 28th of last month, and I cancelled it. I re I'm going to rearrange it. If I, do, if I have to do, then I'll get it done again. But I've, I've decided, did a lot of research, that I want to see if going a bit more carnivore, doing everything right, having a bit more fat in my diet rather than carbohydrates, get my weight down and see how I feel then, and see if, see if I can do it without having operations. Operation I want is the last choice, cutting bits out of my body. So... I've decided that I'm just going to give it a go, see how I feel, and if everything's fine, then that's me done for the rest of my life. I won't need any of it. So that, that was the main one. Then, then obviously, then, I wanted my dogs to become better. So I had a little gym uh, built in the back of my yard with a little bit big shed thing. And then, um, so I'm going there, and I do a few shoulder exercises now every night. Don't do a lot. I'm only in there for maybe two or three minutes till I get that really good burn on my shoulders, and then I stop. And it's working wonders. I'm eating more 180s now, I think, than when I was at my best. But wow. what all I've got to do is put that now onto the stage. So yeah. I've got to work out now that little gap in the middle, which is that little bit there, I think. So we've got to, we, we'll do it. We'll put it right. And, and, you know, thanks to people like yourself who were giving me advice. It's great. I'm loving it. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely life-changing. And I think, you know, the, the bait that catches... That fish initially for, for most people is weight loss, but the weight loss is a side effect of being of being healthy and living the lifestyle as you you know correctly mm. coin it. Um, 
So you've lost a little bit of weight to date as well. How much are we down so far, I've Phil? Probably, I've probably done up to now about two stone. And then oh, yes. I've just started to plateau a little bit. So I'll be ringing you tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be ringing you tomorrow. Get ready. Get, get your phone charged. Um, so I'm, I've got a few things in my own mind which I'm going to run over with you. Like today, I'm having a couple bit of carbs today, but not a lot. I've had like 25 grams of boiled rice just this morning. I even ate the rice on its own, and I loved it. So, Was it white then, rice? White rice. Yeah, yeah. Good. Jasmine. So j just for the listeners and the viewers, white rice is lectin-free, so it is the better option of yeah. the rices. So, so I know now, because you, you've learned me, that's 14 grams of carbs. And then... Uh, a little bit later, I'm just going to have a little bit of ribeye, not much, but a good, say, 22, 20 grams of protein. And then for my tea, I'm having a curry with some more rice. So I'll probably have about 50 grams of carbs today, maybe maybe a bit more, maybe 60. But I'm just going to yeah. build my energy level up a little bit. And then tomorrow, I'm going to go clean again. So maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm sort of going to run through you. I'm going to go clean with no carbohydrates at all. And then maybe Thursday maybe 50 grams of carbs and then i was going to go then to sunday and maybe have 100 to 150 grams of carbs just to carb load a little bit so i'll be having yeah. no way with me tomorrow it, yeah it, uh, in, it'll be an interesting chat um yeah i mean again it's uh it, you know just to, to reiterate to, to to the guys listening that um you know we support all aspects of low carb yeah. ketogenic and carnivore um and these changes are incremental we're all on our own journey not everyone is as strict as myself um you know i'm zero carb generally um but obviously you know this, this is an incremental change for phil so yeah um, you know, we're gravitating but I, have been, I have been zero carb for weeks richard as you know so yeah. it, it's yeah. a change but when i go into anything i have to go into it a hundred percent. I can't do it any other way. Otherwise, I can't do it. Like even yeah. me, even me cooking things. You know, anything with tea fell on, anything with a non-stick coating, I've give away. My air fryers, yes. they've gone. So everything oh, yes. now. I'm back. I bought this one yesterday, um, and it's, it's I can't plug in the allergen oven because it's metal, stainless steel, and it's glass. So I'm cooking in that now because I know that the, the non-stick coating is can give you cancers. So that yeah, goes out the window. I don't just cook for myself. Yeah. I do it for my grandkids, my wife, and you know what I mean, my daughters and my sons. So I want them to eat as healthy as I can. My saucepans are made out of titanium, which is the hardest metal, so it doesn't give any uh, taste out at all. So if you boil water in a titanium saucepan, it's just for water. You know, it's a bit expensive, but they're a lifetime warranty, so you save your money in the long run. So I do so, go yeah, in hundred percent, and I love it. I love it. That's it. With, with your world, I find your world, your your expertise. It starts at this, and then it just goes like this. Yeah, and it doesn't stop. It's like a black hole in the universe. You, you just keep learning all the time, and I love it. Love it. Yeah, it is, and if this, uh, yeah, I mean, going back to the conversation we had with uh, Dr. Rachel, who was just on now. Um, you know, it begins with restricting bread uh, or lowering carbohydrate, and then it, it gravitates into changing other foods, removing certain plants and yeah. phytoalexins. And then we look at other external factors. Now, just to show people uh, how strict and dedicated Phil is to this. So Phil recently competed uh, in this, the Seniors Darts Tournament at, at Yeovil, um, uh, stayed in a hotel, and Phil took his own camping stove so he could make his own food in his <laughs> hotel room. Uh, I mean, if that's not dedication, I don't know what is, you know. So you know, dedicated you know, the, to the, the course. Maid, the maid asked me for my autograph, so it was Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, and I thought I it was brilliant. And I'll tell you thing as well, people, what you don't realise as well, because you're eating a normal diet, I'd say a normal diet, where you're eating most things. But when, when I was doing it last week, well, last month, I was sticking to one thing, so I was having a chicken breast. But when you, you, you start introducing other foods, which you, your body doesn't accept, like whey protein, I didn't realise, whey protein knocks me bandy. I don't know why, it just it makes me ever so strange. So I've, I've had to case, cut whey protein out. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I had a food intolerance test saying as uh, cow's milk and whey protein isn't so good for me. So I tried it, I've been trying it, and it did send me a little bit bandy. And the day that I played 
um, at Yeovil and I got beat on the Saturday afternoon. Now, I had whey protein for my breakfast. So I've dropped a, I've dropped one there. So we can put that right. We can move forward and put it right. Exactly. I mean, just to circle back to that, the, the, the first match that you played in, you were the outsider for, um, and you won that uh, comfortably. Uh, I think, you know, in, at one point it was looking at you know, to be uh, four legs to one victory, wasn't it? Uh, but you say, mm. so I think you had the most um, the most amount of 180s. Um, and then, yeah, day two, again, I think a number of factors, again, food-related, wrong food choice, but also the fact that you're back to competition, you're standing for a long period of time, uh, and what mm. people don't understand is, I mean, that is, that, you know, you need to be match fit, standing yeah. in that position uh, is is stress on the body, and uh, I, I know, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, but you're, you're, you're 62, is that right? Yeah, 62. 62 years young and, and still fighting <laughs> fit and looking only 40, it's Phil. Good, it's only a number. It's only a number. I exactly. did that, love yeah. Great. But as we adopt now deeper and become a little bit more strict, the body's going to produce and utilise more beta hydroxybutyrate, and it's going to block NLRP3 and flammazone. It's going to lower inflammation. These aches and pains will begin to, to dissipate. Um, you know, so I, you know, the next match, I think, is September the 2nd in York. Um, and you're going to be a lot fitter for that. Uh, and the booty is as well that BHB, beta hydroxybutyrate, breaches the blood brain barrier and glucose can't. So your concentration now when you're practicing uh, is, is on point, isn't it? I mean, you, you know, you, you're, you're hitting those 180s uh, as if you were back on, on the main tour, um, which is really exciting. We just need 100%. to transfer that now. Yeah. The only Just thing now I've got to work on is uh, like my fitness of walking up and down because because mate was killing me all the time. I never used to do so much practice. I got a little bit lazy. So now when I go in tomorrow, it, it's it, at least tomorrow afternoon, two hours practice. I shall go in any minute once I finish the podcast. I'll go in and have a practice for about one hour. But I'm trying what's the cricket at the same time because England are doing okay in the Ashes <laughs> so far. So. Um, yeah, so I know I've got to get me get me fitness up, like the walking fitness, so I can spend more time on my feet. So, yeah. So first thing in the morning, I've got some electric bikes. Well, me, me and my missus have got electric bikes, so we go, I'm going to go out in the morning first thing before coffee or anything else, because we we'll normally have a cup of coffee. I'm going to go and um, have a little cycle. Maybe I mean you can do four or five mile on electric bike and. 10 15 minutes you know what i mean so i just spend half an hour just toddle around nothing strenuous i'm not in the tour de france yet so just enjoy it yeah. <laughs> and then yeah just get that blood going and get your hips going and get your shoulders going and then i've got three or four hours then to get ready for for, for practice yeah so i mean it you know th this is a multi-stage approach isn't it for health yeah. well-being weight loss and yeah. for athletic performance because I mean, that, you know, that's what people don't understand. Uh, you know, one of the, the advantages of living this lifestyle and producing ketones is, you know, BHB helps you concentrate. So what, what I found in Yeovil was that towards, you know, the latter end of, of that match, uh, because the lights were so intense, you know, you could see that the sweat was dripping off every, mm. everybody up there. And you mm. could see the other players were starting to wane at the end. Concentration was lagging, but you were a hundred percent focused. I was okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd let me electrolyte, but the on stage at Yeovil, it was over fifty-two degrees. That's how that's wow. how hot it was. When you think outside, it might be thirty degrees in Spain. It was fifty-two degrees. It was like being in a sauna. Wow! And standing for that long time. So I mean, all of those, uh, you know, uh, yeah, effects. Uh, or external factors are going to have massive effect on the body, especially in regards to standing that long, the concentration for that long, uh, as you say, rehydration. And again, um, you know, that's something you were doing, wasn't it? Was using my electrolytes yep. to, to rehydrate, to stay, yep. to stay, you know, uh, well hydrated on stage. But it, uh, yeah, it's 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 exciting stuff because you know people look at this as a weight loss thing, and and then you know they look at it as health, which is exactly why you're doing it. But mm. you wouldn't have thought that living this lifestyle would help improve athletic performance to the point of you know of concentration uh, but concentration is incredibly important especially if somebody uh, begins to overtake you in in a professional match and it's, it's easy to become yeah. sidetracked and and, throw yeah, the yeah, yeah. In. Mm. and that's what i noticed with you your, your concentration was was 100 percent on point um and i'll be honest i'm super excited for september the second because i think we're going to see a new phil taylor i think we oh, need definitely. to um yeah, 
I think so. I mean, so you've recently it started to introduce a little bit of carb, but I mean, prior to that, you know, we've experimented with strict carnivore as well, haven't we? Um, yes. So what what you, what were you typically eating um, on the strict carnivore um, days? Before, I mean, I did have a little bit of cabbage and a little bit of broccoli, uh, maybe once a week. But mainly, I'd have in the morning, I'd have an omelette with a little sprinkling of cheese, maybe maybe three eggs, but I'd only have two yolks and three egg whites. So that would be my first meal. And then at dinner time, I, I love I love chicken, the breast of chicken, but I pound it down to about the thickness of my little finger, then I pan fries. And I pan fries, I put it on fairly warm at the beginning, and then I put coconut oil in, and I do it about two minutes one side, flip it over two minutes, then I put some butter in, and turn it right down to about medium, and then I cook it until I get my temperature of 165 in the middle. I've got a little um, thermometer that you stick in, a little probe, so I'll get to 165, and believe me, it's the nicest chicken you'll ever ever eat, and it's lovely. And I used to steep that on its own. Maybe I should have a little bit of avocado with it, really, but I thought maybe the fat from the coconut oil and the, and the butter would be okay. And then a little bit later on at night time, which was which was about 220 grams in cold weight, in raw weight, which is probably about 60 grams of protein. So probably up to about 80 grams of protein there. And then I'd maybe have a little bit more chicken a little bit later on and try and try and get me protein up to about because you you set a figure at 190 which <laughs> it, you think it's easy but it, it actually isn't but you have to get used to it and, and do it but i did it become quite easy towards the end especially eating the way eating the chicken like that it's great yeah and you know it's it is important to remember that um you know lean meat uh, lean meats are fantastic but we need the fat as well within the diet, isn't it? Which is where, you know, you, you were adding the fats in. So, I mean, we always try to promote eating protein yeah. with, with fat. Uh, and we've experimented. I mean, the reason that you gravitated more towards the leaner cats uh, is because you didn't seem to get on very well with, um, uh, I think, eggs seemed to be problematic, didn't it? Because uh, we believe yeah. it's the, the overmucoid, and, um, which is a protein in the egg. And uh, uh, the, the fattier cuts of steak, I think, were causing issues um early on so it's all about experimenting and seeing what works for you isn't it so do you want to tell us a little bit about that do you know what i've done though richard with the eggs i, I noticed when i had a boiled egg because the yolk was all in one piece you know obviously that's when i was getting heartburn off it acid reflux but when i mix the egg up so it's all mixed together don't get it so i've had a, i've had an omelet this morning and i, I haven't had it i haven't had it at all and then for dinner right. Well, say dinner time, I'm going to put some little chicken wings in because I've got the fat yeah. on it. So I'm getting some chicken wings, maybe six six chicken wings or something. And then because uh, Karen likes them as well, so she'll finish the rest off. Because you, you can get like a big box of chicken wings from the supermarket for a pound. You know what I mean? It's great. It saves you money and it saves you a lot of washing up as well. But uh, And then for tea time, I've got the uh, ribeye out defrosting. So we'll slice that up then. And we'll make a curry. Karen makes her own curry. So I think she's doing a balti. Um, we'll have onions in, mushrooms. And then we'll have a little bit of rice with that. Maybe about 50, 50 grams of rice. which is 100 grams of rice is 28 grams of protein. Uh, 28 grams of carbohydrate, sorry. So that's today. And then tomorrow, as I said, I'll go back. Go back to, I mean, because um, we went sometimes. I mean, yesterday, I didn't have that much food. And I get on the scales and I put half a pound on it doesn't make sense so it's but, but it's only water weight obviously but i'm still working at it and i'm enjoying it and i'm gonna keep going i'm, I'm too addicted to it now and it's yeah. so and this, so easy anybody struggling with the weight believe me you don't crave for anything i mean these sweets they can be in there they've probably gone rotten now and don't even want to look at them cakes biscuits not interested bread there's bread on the side there that could be do Robbie's dad eats, eats breakfast and everything, but other than that, we don't eat it. Never. Yeah, which is fantastic. And again, yeah, I mean, it's just to reiterate the fact, isn't it, that uh, it is a journey. Um, you know, some of the foods that um, that you consume, it's, it's about experimenting and see see what works for you. Yeah. And I think over the next couple of weeks, you know, we're going to gravitate into being a little bit more strict. Uh, we're going to look at you know the the macro ratios uh, of your fats to protein. Obviously, see would aim to reduce or completely remove the carbohydrate but um 
it is interesting been an interesting journey isn't it because um you know you, you were thriving in the beginning uh, and then there was sort of uh you know a, a drop out in between with mental clarity and things isn't it? and, and stall yeah. weight loss um and then it's, it's almost done a sort of a, a, you know a, 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 a 360 and now you're back sort of looks looks to be gravitating back more into a more yeah. animal based type yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you've got to get used to it. You find red meat, red meat can be a little bit hard to digest for some people. Depends on you. On it takes time. I think over the years, because I've experimented, you know, been on different diets and everything else and done this and done that, I think it's knackered my stomach up a little bit. So I think I've got to re, re, get, me, get my body right first. I think my body's got repaired and get running properly. Like having your engine retuned, I think. That, that's the only thing I can put it down to. And then uh, start from afresh. So I'm going to keep doing it, as I say, and then hopefully my body will repair itself and then it can run properly. Because I'm having no heartburn now at all. Before, I was having tablets off the, off the, from the chemist every five minutes. You know what I mean? I was having heartburn every day. Drink of water would give me heartburn. For, for, you know, just that one advantage, you know, it's worth continuing with the lifestyle. And I think when we looked into this, um, it was the the high lectin content in the food that you were consuming. Mm. Isn't it? The lectins were binding to the mast cells and causing the release of histamine, which was leading to acid reflux. And when you took certain foods out, because early on we were still consuming things like tomatoes and bell peppers, things yeah. that do contain lectins. And when we took those out, the acid reflux just cleared up almost overnight, I think. Yeah, it? yeah. Tomatoes um, was a big one. Tomatoes, yeah. And again, you know, within the keto community, tomato is... A staple is one of the ones that we are told that we, mm. you know, we can consume ad lib. But it uh, again, it just adds more weight to the fact that these plants contain these phytoalexins, these plant toxins, which cause issues within the body. Uh, and it goes well beyond. I mean, we remove grain so that you know we remove the breads, the pastas, the rice, and all this because of because of a carbohydrate binding protein called lectins uh, in the form of wheat germ gluten. But what people don't understand is. That these plants contain lectins in the, in the form of phytohemagglutinin. Um, so we need to remove, you know, these foods. And when we did, you, you massively, uh, you know, repaired and recovered from from this uh, uh, from this acid reflux. But it is a journey. Um, you know, we're getting there. Um, I think it's um, it's an exciting journey. Uh, I'm really excited to see your progress and, and how you develop in mm. in regards to health. And I think it's it's one of these things that. We, we can't fail it because from one aspect or another, you, you know, you, you're either going to lose a ton of weight and be healthier and improve athletic performance uh, and make, you know, this big comeback in, in the seniors tour, or it's going to be two, two of those at least, you know. Um, <laughs> the, the, be the best results, Richard, for me, uh, is the tape magic. Of course it is. Yeah, exactly. Where, where I've, 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 I got one, I mean, I did one measurement just above my belly button. So I went round my waist, just above my belly button. And when I first started, I was 53 and a half inches around my belly button. So God knows what I was like when I was sitting down. So then I, I did it this morning and I was, I was 47 and a half. So it's coming down, my tracksuit bottoms wow. where I was going to throw them in the bin because they were too tight and now too baggy. Yeah. Even though, you know, your weight, weight loss is like plateaued a little bit. My inches are coming down. And that's a bit yeah. strange as well. It's 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 weird. So yeah. just going to carry on, keep going, and then see what happens. And I'm yeah. I'm not going to stop because this is so easy to do. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of people seem to not understand is that they overcomplicate things in regards to mm. what to eat, timings to eat, um, and it's just simply a case of eating intuitively. Eat when you're hungry. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Uh, you know, we went through a spell initially with you where you said, look, I'm not hungry. And we've almost had to force feed, isn't it? Um, yeah. You know, Two days, we, we, we never had nothing to eat. Two days, I yeah. wasn't hungry. And on the third day, and, I had to make it off. Weird. Yeah. And, and that's fantastic. I mean, fasting, you know, we've covered the benefits, the ups and, and the downs of fasting and the benefits of autophagy and things. But it's, um, you know, to go two days fasted without feeling hungry is incredible uh but for for the sake of testing your metabolism for the next mm. stage uh that we're going to implement you know we have actively tried to increase the protein and fat of me and i remember yep. when we had the conversation via zoom i'll never forget the look on your face when we worked out how much protein you were eating intuitively and then i think we almost quadrupled this didn't we uh, I, thought you, you, I thought you'd lost it honestly <laughs> he's gone 
he's, he's not right. How can anybody eat all that food and shed weight? It's, but you did. Well, I'll tell you, yeah. what, what's been in mind now, Richard? We've been down the local supermarket this morning and we bought a big bag of rice. Honestly, it's, a, it's like that. And it was £7. So, I mean, there's, there's probably 100 portions of rice there. So it's quite cheap. You know what I mean? Anybody that's struggling a little bit, because I know the electric bills and every, you know, everybody's bills have gone up, it actually isn't that much more expensive than buying junk food. In fact, I think yeah. it's a lot cheaper. You know, exactly. but, you I, mean, get the, I mean, we use Asda, so we get their own brands. Even though I've got money, it's no good chucking it away. So we buy the yellow brand, so you can get your chicken breasts and they, they'd be brilliant. As long as you have your little you also get a lot of your protein from uh, a, a relative of a family as well, isn't it? I mean, when we look at uh, the cost of living in regards to protein, I'm, I'm carnivore, all I eat is meat. I spend £60 a week on meat that feeds myself, my wife and my little girl. Um, and again, just circling back to what you said, uh, I mean, not not that we're pushing or promoting rice, um, you know, by any means. But it again, it's these incremental changes, isn't it? Um, you know, it... Uh, it's, it's you know we don't we don't want to get everybody eating buckets full of rice um, no no but but it is these incremental ch- ideally you know we wouldn't put it in at all isn't it but it uh you know we do understand that it's these incremental changes we don't expect you to begin a journey immediately and for you it's this gravitation from low carb and and the low impact carbs in regards to lectin uh, content yeah. um replacing the foods that you eat with highly nutrient dense meats uh quality fats uh, and making these incremental changes, and as we go along, you know, we're gonna mm. we're gonna facilitate these changes, and, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, within the next couple months, we'll grow. My, my my ambition is get me body where I feel a hundred percent. When you wake up in the morning, I don't know, I need, I don't know if I need no carbs or I need a hundred carbs a day. I don't know. So I've got to work everything out with you, and then find out exactly like a, like you would if you had a sports car. Whatever petrol goes in that car, it's perfect that person because we're all different so some, so. some people need more some people need less you know so it's, it's a matter of working everything out and that's yeah. that's what makes it so um so exciting i think it's yeah. great and we're making progress every every week you know those figures yep. uh, and the mental clarity and your sleep i think which is uh, you know a, a real important factor that we've uh, we've touched base a couple of times so mm. we've been live since eight o'clock this morning um, so we're five and a half hours in, uh, but one of the reoccurring topics keeps coming up is, is sleep. Um, you know, some people say that they struggle with sleep, but you've noticed a massive improvement in your sleep since, yeah. uh, you know, removing a lot of these toxic foods, isn't it? Yeah, not every night. I mean, every floor during lockdown and just before we, we were waking up every night on the dot, poof, two o'clock, three o'clock watching the TV, try and get back to sleep again. And a lot of people were doing the same thing. I don't know why, whether it was these injections they give us, I don't know, but, but something <laughs> was not right, seriously. Yeah. And every yeah. night, bang, wide awake, three o'clock, putting the TV on, and then by the time seven o'clock comes, you won't go back to sleep now, you, you've gone tired. So there was a lot of nights, it, it all depends on the weather as well. I mean, there's been a couple of nights up in Stoke here, which has been red hot. So, you know, we woke up at like four o'clock in the morning because we were both red hot even though we've only got like a little throw over on the bed, you know, about as thick as a tea towel. But it, it's just the weather as well can affect your sleep. So, hello. Well, we're up. <laughs> Stephen's back. This is, uh, this is Stephen. Co-host, this is Phil. <laughs> I thought we'd go around then. Hiya, Steve. <laughs> hello. Nice to meet you, Phil. And you, buddy. How are you? Sorry? I said, how are you? I'm 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 good. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, well. Missed... Yeah. well, yeah. I mean, I'm 59, mate, and I'm all, an right. all right, chill all right, chill me off. Right, we've got our next guest lined up now. Oh, uh, we Rich. are fantastic. We're going to have Phil. the beautiful You're welcome. Emily. In. God bless. Yeah, it's been Thank an you. absolute pleasure. Thanks for sharing your story so far, Phil. Look See forward to morning. touching base tomorrow, and we'll implement those changes. But brilliant stuff. Thank you, Phil. I'll give you a invite dinner time. No problem at all. No worries. Look forward to chatting. Take care, man. Yeah. There we are. That's the legendary right. 16-time world champion. <laughs> hey. Hello, no, Emily. Coach Emily. Hello. Hello. Have you met Richard before? No, I don't know Richard. Hi. No. Oh. Hey, Emily. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on board. Super excited. 
Yeah, yeah. I am yeah. super be- excited actually because Coach Emily was on the Reverse TV series. She's one of the coaches at the Steak and Butter Gang. But do you want to just quickly for everybody that's out there because we've got quite a massive audience today, uh, give us your story, a little sort of sizzling short story about why sizzling. you went. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, now now I've got to really think about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I have been carnivore for two and a half years. So, what are you at now, Stephen? How long is your carnivore? How long have I been carnivore? Uh huh. Four years. Four years. Okay. Well, I guess I can't ever gain on you, gain on you, but you know, over time, the amount is going to like get shorter between us in a way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, so that has been uh, carnivore for me was like the finisher to my health journey. So my health journey was keto fasting, extended fasting, intermittent fasting. Um, I definitely come from that history of morbid obesity. So I was double my size in my previous life. (laughs) And uh, so I was up at 300 pounds and had been at that for um, uh, many different periods during my life with mom. It was, you know, having four kids and um, just not understanding the, the, the types of food that were ruining my life and were just making everything a disaster in my life, emotionally, energy, sleep, my capacity to just um, live the life that I wanted to live. Um, and so it was the the fasting journey in 2017 when I read Dr. Fung's book that kind of got me started in all this. But what really what happened for me is I needed that nutrition part because I we know so many people now that have been on that keto and fasting journey and it didn't take, it didn't solve their food addiction. It didn't solve their emotional issues with food and because they really never got the nutrition that they needed. So it was one thing like what to do um, in the fast. I learned how to fast like a champ and I loved it, but I really, um, the keto, the keto treats, the artificial sweeteners, this, you know, the nuts, um, vegetables like that just they were not my friend and they were not helping me and they couldn't help me to make good solid decisions for my life I never had that food peace so carnivore for me gave me the peace with food it gave me that food could be in its in its uh, the spot that it needed to be as nutrition amazing delicious nutrition and it gave me um, this huge mental clarity and um, the the lasting success on maintenance because you know, there's, there's a whole situation of that. Uh, if you didn't lose the weight and gain your health, um, in a way that is sustainable long-term as a way that you want to live your life long-term, then, um, you can't expect those results to stay with you because you're not going to like it. You're just going to abandon it. So that's my story. My, I lost my first hundred pounds with keto fasting, my last 50 with, um, fasting combined with a carnivore diet. And then I've been able to get involved in coaching. I've been able to help others figure out just all the journey, this, you know, cooking for your kids and family dynamics and how to social dynamics. And so I love just problem solving and helping people through those and just, you know, just being an example of, yeah, you can do this long term. It's absolutely sustainable. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's kind of where I've been. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. So losing about 150 pounds is no mean feat, is it? But we've talked a lot, uh, Coach Emily and I, about um, health is actually more important because uh, the weight loss is a side effect. And many people think it's the other way around. I've lost this weight and everything's going to get better. But no, I think once you um, eat the right nutrition and your health gets better, because it's the right nutrition, you're not making yourself Overweight. I mean, it just seems everyone looks at it the wrong way. So, Richard, have you got a question for Coach Emily? Yeah, I mean, it, what a fantastic amount of weight to lose. I mean, you've you've beaten me there, 150. Mine is 107. Um, so you've beaten me hands down. Um, absolutely incredible. Now, a question that I get asked quite often, and probably more so for you, um, is the skin. You know, you've lost all this weight. Um, are you left with any saggy skin or stretch marks? And I'll, I'll give you, you know, an example with me. I'm, I don't, I don't have any saggy skin, any stretch marks at all. Um, and I was just wondering how, you know, that that is with yourself. Have you noticed the skin has has, has regressed tight again? Um, uh, and I've got a theory behind this as well. But I'd just like to hear, you know, if if you've noticed anything similar in regards to stretch marks and and uh, and, and skin elasticity and. 
Yeah, phenomenal. So, um, I yeah, you know, I've always had some level of stretch marks, even as a as a girl, I did, and so I don't know if that was just like a. I mean, I've struggled with my weight from that whole time, so I cannot claim. <laughs> there's there's things that I can say that are noticeable and not noticeable. I I don't have, um, hanging curtains, which is phenomenal because I I would think that I would. Um, and so I, I don't have the typical, when I hear about people that have lost that amount of weight and I've seen, and they've had to have surgery. No, I really haven't had that. So for me, I attribute that it took four years to lose the weight. So it wasn't a super, super fast. And there was so much autophagy involved in that process for me. And then, um, I also enjoy um, lifting weights. And so I think that probably just like the weightlifting has had a big impact. The fact that it wasn't super um, quick, that it happened over time. And the fact that so much of it involved water fasting. And so it just, to me, there was a lot of autophagy that was happening during that process. Um, I definitely have some, but it's just, I don't know. It's not, um, it's not what you would think. So yeah, that's phenomenal for you, Richard. I know I want to hear your theories about this. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, you've just hit everything on, on the head. I mean, uh, you know, when we're fasting, it puts us into a state of autophagy, which is cellular repair, regeneration. Uh, you know, the, the, the body will use amyloid plaques from, from out the body and through scar tissues and stretch marks. Uh, and this is why So I used to suffer with stretch marks along my arms, mm. um, especially when I began sort of weightlifting lift, lifting and things. But um, it was only fairly recently when somebody asked me because I, I used to compete professionally um, in, in the in the sport of, of bodybuilding. Uh, I won't bore you with, with you know with my story, uh, but it um, uh, yeah I, I was left with with no stretch marks and and somebody somebody recently asked you know where has all of your loose skin gone where you know why don't you have stretch marks and I didn't realize this until they'd mentioned it uh, and I put it down to to fasting and the fact that I was ketogenic and coming back to you know a point that we made earlier just by being ketogenic your body is in a state of brown fat activation it's in a state of mitophagy autophagy uh, lipolysis and the, the the body will benefit from from all of these things whether we fast or not but the fasting especially i, I believe has cleared out a lot of these amyloid plaques and and, and repaired my my, my uh, stretch marks and scar tissue um again i mean i lost the weight incredibly quickly over the course of a year it was 107 pound uh, but I didn't begin competing until a year or two after that. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I'd given the skin time to, to repair the foods that we're eating. Uh, you know, a, a highly nutrient dense allows the body to heal and repair. I, I've always been a big lover of um, of the grisly part of my food. Um, the, you know, the parts are on the chicken bone that the people don't eat, which are full of the collagen. So I've always had a high concentration of collagen in my diet since I've been living this this way. Um all of these factors, I believe, have contributed to that. But that is a big concern, isn't it? You know, especially from, from females when they begin to lose a lot of weight is, you know, what about my stretch marks and a loose skin? But it just seems to be a case that, you know, the body, the body heals itself, doesn't it? Um, the body's an incredible machine and it never ceases to amaze me that, um, you know, what it can do when we supply it with the correct nutrients. And more importantly, when we, we remove these nutrients or anti-nutrients, I should say, because they're not nutrients in the foods that we think are nutrient dense. But yeah, that, that, that's my that's my short version. Is that short enough? You see, I usually get I usually get told off for going off on. <laughs> you see, Emily is worse than me for long answers. But yeah, I think I think I would just put a little caveat in there. There are some people that just have to resort to surgery. Yep. Um, Laura Spath comes to mind, who is incredibly transparent, and I take my hat off to her to, for going online and saying I'm going to have this done because she's a big advocate of this way of eating. So I think um, Emily's been, you know, not lucky because it took her four years, and I think also how quickly it comes off makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's great. So Emily, this is your your uh, little guest spot. So is there anything else you want to tell us about that you're up to, like a cookbook, for instance? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so, you know, uh, we have all these friends in carnivore space, right? And so we had, uh, I, I don't know what it is right now. Oh, sardines or something. I'm not going to make a sardine. Believe me. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so back, um, I had tried to go up my fat and do like the higher fat version of carnivore um, would have been in uh, last year, 2022. And so during that time, I just developed tons of high fat recipes that I was trying for myself. And so I really wanted to share that with folks. So yeah, I do. I'm, I use a ton of tallow. I've developed like and so, you know, it's like you were saying with the anti-nutrients, because we're all on different spectrums of what we can tolerate. So some of my recipes have a little bit of vanilla in there or, you know, something. So they would be more on the um, keto spectrum. Um, but yeah, I was just experimenting with so much. Like I needed sauces. I needed little candies. I, um, you know, I mean, you don't exactly need a recipe for browned butter, but we started doing all kinds of fun things with the brown butter, putting bacon in it and adding some other, you know, components to it. Um, so yeah, I do have a, a cookbook for sale. It's for sale on uh, the Mighty Networks on the Steak and Butter Gang. Um, so uh, that is super helpful. And, you know, for me, I, I have always been oriented towards a higher fat approach that has just helped my mood. It's helped my sleep. Um, but I did this on purpose for a while. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is out there and I try to add to it. It's actually uh, at this time right now on my networks, I can continue to edit and add. I don't have it out there available on um, like a, it's, it's not in a static form quite yet. Um, so yeah, that was a ton of fun. Definitely put like our family favorites in there because yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great uh, lifestyle change, but it doesn't, uh, I, there's not a lot of resources out there for ideas for getting the cookbooks going. Go on, Rich. Have you got any more questions? I've got questions, but I know Emily. So, yeah, look, you you fire away. I, I'm going to be incredibly rude for two seconds and, and nip to the loo. You've had 30 <laughs> minutes <laughs> oh, away. So, we've been, we, I know, Paul, we've oh, been live for, for just, just under six hours. Um, but yeah, if, if you don't mind, I, I'll do that one. Yeah. You, you, you carry on. I'll be two seconds though, I promise. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll shut the door. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, brilliant, Emily. So, um, what what I'd like to ask you about is, uh, are you still interested in priming and talking about that and food freedom? Because I think that's one of the big things that you're, you're pretty much an expert on. Mm, yeah, I mean, I think that that is when people are, are new to carnivore, uh, that carnivore is can be um, you can you're not used to eating a large amount of meats. And so mm -hmm. we're used to what did they tell us? Our plate was like this and it was half was vegetables and then maybe a quarter was meat. And I don't know what the quarter carbs or you know, all these ideas that we've had about my plates or what to put this together. And so when people are thinking about what is a serving size of meat um, and they're wanting all these benefits, they've heard they want the health benefits. They've you know heard what an incredible plan this can be that um, they're going to revert to, oh, maybe one piece of chicken is the appropriate serving when we're getting started with carnivore. And so they're going to um, fall into under eating by just on accident and not even know that's happening. And then the thing is, is that, um, yes, carnivore is a wonderful plan, but under eating on any plan is going to have a lot of problems and you're not going to feel good. And so when people are coming, going through carnivore, they're already going to be in a keto flu and an adaptation flu and a huge adaptation from their body getting used to things. And then if you're under eating at the same time, you're basically putting yourself into a calorie restriction mode right in the beginning of your journey. So I do think that so priming is um, a two week period where you are feasting on meat and you are, um, you know, actually eating three times a day plus um, to um, really fill up every nook and cranny nutritionally and to get your body to transfer to use um, animal foods instead of the other foods. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's like the best way to start if you're going to start this out is to take a priming period and then to let your appetite naturally kind of fall down from there. Um, but what can happen too is that you will it will prep you for fa fasting. So you probably start doing some intermittent fasting. Um, and then if you're wanting to do some intentional fasting, it really sets the stage for doing that as well. So yeah, for people that don't know about that process, we're talking about priming, Richard. Um, so have you? I, I assume you've heard about this concept. About this is a Raymond Nazon developed this concept, but you know we've just been teaching it for 
a long time in steak and butter gang. And so many people have just had amazing benefits from this, from taking this period of time of feasting. Um, but, you know, I, I heard of it, something similar when I came to carnivore, there was a philosophy about that. Eat as much as you want meat, but I never heard anybody sort of um, let's push this to the next level and actually on purpose um, have a period of time where you're kind of hyper um, nutritioning yourself <laughs> to get your body really, really ready and to have it coming over and to, um, you know, that fasting will oftentimes come out of that as well. But just to make sure that you're not um, under eating that you can't under eat when you're priming, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, I actually did the experiment with Emily. We're not with her personally, but at that, that period of time uh, last May, and I was gobsmacked actually because Coach Raymond said to me, I'd been carnivore three and three years ish, and um, well, three years. And he said, You're not eating enough. And I, I, so, you know, there you are, three years of carnivore. And I thought I was eating enough. And somebody just eyeballed my pictures and we were doing a weekly live stream. And he said, You're not eating enough. Now, um, that's why I put that comment up there because that, that's uh, a few of the messages I'm getting. Uh, personally as well under eating is a big issue because people want to lose that 150 pounds like emily did or 107 oh, yeah. pounds like richard did and they think oh yeah eat less eat less and move more and that isn't going to work because if you're underfed undernourished and in my uh, diabetes and obesity practice i have many people that are very overweight and malnourished and they just don't get that because they are thinking of volume of food and the fact that they're fat must mean they're eating too much, but they're actually under eating the things they need and overeating the things they don't need. So you have to unlearn that. Sorry to nick that phrase from one of the, uh, one of the Instagram things, but yeah, I had to unlearn and rethink and eating more was counterintuitive, but I got it. I understood it. And I found in the first week of priming, and I don't believe in calories, but people wanted to know. So I was having three and a half thousand, four thousand calories for seven days, three meals a day and snacks. And I lost four pounds mm -hmm. because all of a sudden I was absolutely satiated. And the following week, I didn't want to eat any more. But I mean, that's the beauty of this way of eating it gives you that food freedom. And I used to laugh at the time. Poor old Emily's heard this a few times. But it's the only way of eating where I've ever heard someone go, do you know what? I don't want to eat anymore. That's it. I, I've actually had enough of eating. Whereas other types of diets are you're always hungry, you're always thinking about food, and you're underfed. Well, this way of eating was eat so much. And the analogy of eating so much is like, you know, the 1950s dad who would lock his son in a cupboard with 10 packs of cigarettes because he found him smoking said right you smoke all them you'll never want to smoke again and you're not coming out until you smoke them all and I, you know that's what it was i was just eating so much i suddenly got to the point where uh, raymond said to me you're okay for next week eating you know three meals and snacks i was like i don't ever want to eat <laughs> that's it i am i'm genuinely actually full and that completely changed my food freedom and even my wife jane said you know you don't talk about food at all since you've done that i mean obviously yeah that looks nice that ribeye looks nice but not in between meals not go oh what we're we gonna have tonight you know what what's gonna what we're we gonna have tomorrow there was just a complete food freedom and i would say i'm gonna i mean i i've tried to get raymond to come on but he didn't reply properly but anyway emily's come on it would be really nice to take my hat off to raymond and, and thank him for it because it was a great thing to do and i think under eating sounds like the best thing for people that are overweight but it actually is about the worst thing you can do because you just end up binging you end up getting all the stuff that you crave i mean how can you crave something when you're full you you just can't because you're full you don't want to go out and eat stuff because you're full. And, and, and to me, that seems like a really obvious thing. Sorry, I'm talking too much. It's Emily's time. But I just wanted to say that, Emily, while you were on, that uh, that really was a revelation for me to overeat so much and to lose that much weight. And Bart K had done the same thing previously at tons of food and saw the weight come off. But when I'm saying tons of food, it really literally was, you know, quite, quite a big volume. But then by the third week, you know, everything had settled down and 
I was just eating what I would call normal amounts of food, which was just to my hunger and then stopping when I was full. So big, it was a big thing to do. And that's what Emily does. She does this chisel program and it's, it's, um, it's based on that, isn't it? I know you then change it and you have uh, alter alternate day fasting and a few things like that as well, which is, which is great. So what else you get, what have you got coming up, Emily? I'm um, let's see. Oh, you know, I just started doing a podcast for my YouTube channel. So Steve and I have to have you come and come on for a podcast. <laughs> So that has been fun. Um, so yeah, I've just been interviewing folks and stories. And that's the thing is, is being in this community, you hear so many incredible stories. So I just recorded with Cassie, you know, Cassie, right from Rivero a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. And she was one because her weight loss is up in the 300 type category. She did have some surgery, she had to, needed some on her arms and you know, whatnot. Um, but yeah, we just covered like every little basic that we the two of us had been through, we we're kind of like little sister twins or something our journeys were so parallel <laughs> so because we had the fasting we had the carnivore we had you know had done a little bit of that under eating thing had figured out that priming had figured out that full nourishment and how much it actually really helps to the fast um so uh yeah so i've got that going on you guys can uh check that out on youtube um and i just had uh anthony chafee i just recorded an interview with him that went I, you guys had him on earlier today for a couple hours yes mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I mean, he was great. I think I asked him like one question, just shoom. Like, okay, <laughs> I got every anthropology, every hist historical data, every cultural data, every like, all right, we've got it right now. <laughs> so, so, yes. Now, come on, you've got to be better at plugging your YouTube channel. How do we find it? Um, I mean, I think it's just under my name. <laughs> I got to get better at everything. I only have a couple of episodes out. You're right. Yes, yeah, Stephen. Thank you. How do I do that a little bit better? You're ready. <laughs> and you need Richard as a guest because if you like someone giving you a really long scientific answer, I do. You are looking at okay the epitome of that. And in fact, we had Richard and Anthony this morning for three hours, and I literally could have just turned my screen off. It was just brilliant to hear them. The energy was pinging and rocking. Beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. so on Instagram too, I link everything on Instagram. I'll, I'm running the little bites of the inner tubes, uh, the interviews through that. So it's uh, healed by meat on Instagram. So you guys can follow me there too. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm still, uh, we're still doing stuff at the steak and butter gang. And so we, I love being, you know, just involved in community. Everything that we do here is just so community oriented with your YouTubes. And so any, any place where people are, have excitement and, um, you know, problem solving or helping people figure out the steps on their carnivore journey. Like, I'm just so happy that these things are happening. That's okay. So we've got a question here from, and I, I'm sure people use these names. So when I read them out, it sounds incredibly difficult for me, but flump. Oh, I don't, I'm not even going to bother with that. I can't read that. But uh, the question is, what's the proper alternative thinking we have on cholesterol? Does the body specifically try to increase cholesterol levels? when it knows you are unwell, for example. Now, you don't have to answer that one, Emily. That could go to Richard. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I will just say, no, I'm just going to say from my personal experience in eating the high animal fat diet, what that the benefits that that does for me, just mentally, energy, hormonally. Um, but no, I, I'm definitely going to punt that to what's actually happens to okay so they're talking about when you're in an illness is your body gonna what's what's you're gonna what is it gonna raise up and what is it gonna have to kind of uh bring to that site so no go ahead richard <laughs> <laughs> thank you it's a nice uh, side step uh, so yes, I mean, yes, typically yes. ldl cholesterol helps us fight off viruses and infections it's imperative for life cell formation cell communication nutrient absorption nutrient transportation the production of hormones is essential for healing uh, we need it to fight off viruses and infections. And typically LDL will come down when we have an infection. When we begin a ketogenic or carnivore lifestyle, cholesterol can increase, but this is just a cholesterol returning back to its natural physiological level because we've had a lifetime of abuse from uh, phytosterols, which artificially lower our cholesterol. So when we remove these and we see an increase in cholesterol be by becoming keto and carnivore, it is simply the body just restoring uh, cholesterol levels back to its natural level um and, and the production of ketones use uh, uh, uh the, the same pathway the mevalinid pathway which we spoke about earlier um uh which uh, is the same pathway that produces cholesterol so there may be an argument there that um, the production of ketones and any overspill will, will raise cholesterol although that that's just a hypothesis um 
you know, there's no data to back that up. But what we do see is when we become keto and carnivore, the increase in cholesterol is nothing more than uh, a, a, an elevation back to its natural physiological level. But LDL, when we become sick, in short, it typically comes down because the body's fighting that virus and infection. But an increase in, in cholesterol, um, to put into perspective, mine is double figures. It's uh, around 10.26, um, 8 point something. I think my LDL is, uh, and to be honest, I'm disappointed that it's not higher. <laughs> yeah, so we mine's right around. Uh, in we measure in you know different forms or whatever. Mine's right around at that two thirty, and I'm just like great, like that. I mm -hmm. I don't I don't have a concern about it. I feel so good. To me, I feel like it's you know lubing my vessels with the right slippery types of substance that I need. That I'm you know to me, it's just very protective. And so um, I I celebrate the high fat and the high cholesterol. And yeah, our body's so wise. Our body has so much wisdom. That's why it's just like okay, reverting back to this ancient ways, these ancient ways of eating fasting is, is, you know, ancestrally appropriate, then it lets your body turn the knobs. We don't have to turn the knobs, y'all. Our body can do it. And it's, it's you know, has that wisdom to um, adapt. And to, when you're fighting an infection, when things are coming up, it knows what to do. I yeah, that. I'm, I'm just going to just here. share. Oh, sorry, Richard. Sorry. I'm just going to share a screen just very quickly. Um, we have the technology to do this, mm -hmm. um, which is a little graph, uh, a about uh, from a study and um, this was recently shared by Ken Berry but basically good um, a good graph to show when it looks at LDL levels so this is as your LDL increases along here and this is your likelihood of dying and these are hard endpoints these are actually people that died it's not like guesswork and as you can see as your cholesterol so as your cholesterol is low your risk of dying is nearly twice as much as here when it starts to increase and the sweet spot there you know seems to be 120 right up to 200 40 even going up to 300 it still looks much better your chances of living with this high LDL uh, are twice as good as um, as over here and these dotted lines these areas of confidence really it actually shows up here that possibly LDL is is um, protective so I think that's pretty interesting personally so let me just get rid of that now uh, because we haven't really got time for that. Um, so, yeah, that's brilliant. Emily, that's your half an hour, which is fantastic. Thank you. So great to be with you guys. So, you know Dr. Yeah. Sabrina, you know Dr. Sabrina Sort? Do you know her? Of course, of course, yes. You, you do. Let's, let's get her to come in through the door. <laughs> Hello, beautiful. <laughs> How are oh, you? Hi, so good to see you Thank and you. both of you guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, beautiful. Oh, Have a so. wonderful talk and uh, enjoy. I'm so excited for your new life in Florida, Dr. Salt. It just sounds oh. like things are coming it's, along. It's great, but it's so humid right now and I'm so pregnant. So it's just oh. a little uncomfortable. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can't wait to see that baby. Have a great Thank session, y'all. Thank you. We're good. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Emily. So, uh, hello, Dr. Sabrina Sort. Do you know Richard? Um, I think that just via social media, uh, but I don't think we've ever actually the pleasure of speaking. So, nice to yes. formally meet yeah. you. Nice to meet you too, Sabrina. Thank you very much for coming on board. Oh, my pleasure. I'm excited to be here. This is so fun. I was thinking just like how cool this whole concept is. And <laughs> I mean, if you haven't already, this should definitely be at least an annual thing for sure. Uh, <laughs> right. <okay. laughs> Ooh, uh, the pressure's on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. You can go now. So, yeah, we're six hours in. Six hours in. It's not bad. Um, just for the viewers who don't know you, could you just give us a little intro to who you are and why you're here? Yeah, um, I'm Dr. Sabrina Solt. I am a naturopathic medical doctor by training and certifications and all that good stuff. Uh, used to live in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I currently still uh, operate a regenerative and anti-aging medicine practice. Uh, currently live in Florida. Um, I have been a carnivore for over a year and a half now. Uh, somewhat shifted in the last, I would say, seven or so months because I've been pregnant. So I've been incorporating a little bit more ketovore, animal based, just due to some meat aversions and stuff that I've had. Um, otherwise, my whole, I think, I feel purpose in this community is to share health information that helps people um, really try to figure out what might be happening underneath as far as 
root cause issues as to why they might have had to find their way to carnivore in the first place to help heal a lot of things, or also why carnivore may be challenging for some people as well, too. Brilliant. Now, Richard, have you got a question? Do you want to start with a question? I'll leave you kick this off and I'll jump in with something for, for okay. about half an hour probably. Yeah. <laughs> Well, something piqued my interest straight away. Now, you said now you're pregnant, Sabrina, that you felt some cravings and you've added some stuff. So what, what have you added? So when I when I first got pregnant, I mean, I'm 32 weeks now. So we're, we're seven months in. We're very close to the end, which has been great. Um, and it wasn't necessarily that I was craving anything as much as I had meat aversion. And I it honestly broke my heart. Like, I can't tell you how upset I was because I was sitting at work one day and I had my ribeye that I normally would bring with me to work, cooked it up, got my butter on it. And I sat there and stared at it. And I was like, I cannot eat this for the life of me. I knew I was pregnant already at that point. I was really hoping that this wouldn't happen. This happened with my first pregnancy as well. This is number three for me. And I got out my phone, Uber Eats, and I got some uh, sashimi delivered to the office because that was all I really wanted at that point was just, just give me some fish. Um, the meat aversions lasted until somewhat into second trimester. So I ate some chicken. Um, we had a period of time where we actually did a vacation to Turkey and Egypt, and this was planned before I ever became pregnant. And we were in a situation where we were on this cruise ship. There was only one option for food, one option for meals, specific meal times. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but I didn't trust a lot of the meat they were cooking. It was mystery sauces. Um, could have been thickened with flour, which I have a pretty severe gluten intolerance. The only things that were safe for me on that cruise ship were fruit and uh, full fat yogurt. So I kind of sustained on those for about four or five days, um, which not ideal, but it's what I had access to. Even all of the eggs were cooked in seed oils. They had the fake butter packets, which were actually mostly seed oils. And I, I react very poorly to those. Uh, so I, I keep them out of my diet. Other than that, um, to get over a lot of the meat aversions, what I had to do was condiments, we'll say. So if I was eating ground beef, I would need to like chop up tiny pieces of pickles to go with them. Or I would add in like um, a small amount of sauerkraut, like just these these things that I knew I could tolerate, um, or even a little bit of avocado, things I knew didn't bother me. I got into carnivore because I had health issues, severe gut issues, skin issues, anxiety, things that all really dramatically improved. So I, if I am going to quote unquote stray from it, I'm going to do it with things that I know aren't going to upset my body. Um, besides that, though, the period that I'm in right now is actually really weird. I am all about pork. I am bacon. I am pulled pork. I am pork ribs. It's just it's just a crazy flux being pregnant. You really have no control, and it's kind of weird. So I'm, I'm excited to get this baby out and get back to my, like, normal way of eating. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, we've got a few questions in the uh, comments section. One thing that we were talking about before you came on was LDL. We had a little look at some data about whether high LDL is, is deleterious or not. Um, and I know you, uh, not one to shy away. So I'm happy for Richard to have a pop first if you want to. Does APOB and APOA matter in carnivore? So, uh, Richard, do you want to pop, pop an answer on and then we'll get Dr. Salt to add something? If you yeah, want. go on. Let, let this, Dr. Sabrina just jump in. I've taken up way too much air time at the moment, I think, isn't it? So <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I've, got, I've got a couple of things lined up um, So I, I'll for, for Sabrina. So I'll let her jump in on this and I'm going to go into something a little bit more technical now as, uh, as we go on, if that's okay. So anytime I get a question about a specific value and does this value matter, I almost always say no, not because the value is not important, but because it matters within what context are we looking at this. You can have these elevations in an otherwise metabolically sound person, and you can also have these elevations in somebody who is metabolically very unfit. So the context absolutely matters. And if a person is carnivore, that doesn't always necessarily mean that they're metabolically fit. How long have they been carnivore? What type of carnivore are they? What other things do they do? Are they still really overweight? Have they developed some sort of insulin resistance because they've been carnivore for so long, which I've seen clinically actually happen. People who have almost no insulin levels that if they were to reintroduce something like carbs, um, they would absolutely go into very diabetic symptoms. So 
I don't think that they are the end all be all by themselves. I will look at them in the context of everything else. So are their triglycerides elevated? Are their inflammatory markers elevated? Things like HSCRP, myeloperoxidase, PLA2, um, even things like oxidative LDL. And if we are seeing these elevations within that type of picture, then yes, absolutely, we might need to do something about them. But then that context also changes. So how are we going to address it? Do we adjust the diet? Do we consider statins? Almost always never. But again, it's all case by case. Unfortunately, we're all individuals. Yeah, and I think that I think one of the things when we talk about cholesterol is if you start with a false premise uh, that high LDL cholesterol is causal for atherosclerosis, then everything, all your ducks are in a line. So if you look at apo B or with apolipoprotein, all that means, apo just means attached to lipoprotein, Greek. It's just, so if you assume that high LDL was a problem, therefore high apo B is going to be a problem because it's attached, if you see yeah. what I mean. So um, I think there's a lot more nuance to it. And I think people just need to go back to the drawing board and firstly decide what is what is the issue here. That's personally what I think. And, um, you know, there's there's... There's lots of things to say. Actually, when you look at where plaques form, it's always in a high pressure area. It's always in an artery. It's, you know, to, so there's many reasons to say it's all, also where there's not laminar flow of the blood. There's lots and lots of things that point to it not being LDL necessarily, but the environment around that. So anyway, and, and also how does it get into the into the space? Well, what's caused that gap, that lesion for that thing to get into it? So that's maybe the cause, you know, inflammation. Or you could look at the other theory, which is about thrombosis. And anyway, right, I don't want to get into the, the weed <laughs> too much because I've still got 18 hours of this to do. Um so let's uh, let's have a look. So uh, there's a nice phrase here, which I just wanted I think to bring up. You, you bring up a very good point, just to really just to hone in on that is that cholesterol is not a root cause of anything except high cholesterol. Like unless you're just a assigning the diagnosis of high cholesterol, it is not a root cause. So we really do need to be better investigators versus just attacking one singular thing because one of the concepts of elevated cholesterol is that it's elevating in response to a process that needs repair. Well, if you're not looking at that underlying process that needs to be repaired, whether it's you're producing more cholesterol because your hormones are declining in middle age, or you're trying to repair something else in your system, unless you're actually looking at, okay, where, where is this happening? And then you just go to try to lower it because that's what you've been told. That's what you've been taught. You're actually going to make things worse overall. And I think that's what's actually really disappointing is that you end up with these people who are consistently getting sicker and sicker, despite doing what the medical, you know, the whole medical paradigm suggests, which is lower that cholesterol to prevent disease. Yeah, and I think one of the things Rich, I was trying to find the comment here because he really liked it. We were talking about levels you know, globally, because, you know, I do the phlebotomy side of things and these levels, these normative ranges are not optimal. It's, it's a range. So people can be outside of those ranges and be optimal and people can be in range and not healthy. So I think it, it's much more holistic than that. And also we were talking about um, language and how we say high cholesterol. But of course, if you take out the plant sterols, is it high or is it actually where it should be? That's just what we was talking before you got on. So, and it is how you talk about things. That's quite emotive to say, oh, you got high LDL. Well, no, actually you've got the LDL you should have had. In fact, it was too low. That was the problem. It was artificially, uh, you know, reduced because of what you were doing. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, right. The biggest, the biggest takeaway when it comes to cholesterol is it's imperative for life. It's essential for cell formation, cell communication, nutrient absorption, nutrient transportation, the production of hormones, and it's essential for healing. And I, it doesn't matter what the level is. If you were eating a ketogenic carnivore lifestyle, then your cholesterol, including LDL, is healing and repair, repairing the body. We, we referenced the study uh, first thing this morning with Dr. Chafee that shows, uh, published on the BMJ, 68,000 participants. And it shows a reverse uh, in um, uh, representing 92% of the participants in regards to high LDL and all cause mortality, um, which should tell you everything that you need to know. Uh, but cholesterol wants to heal and repair the body. We can go into the science 
you know, behind that if you want to, Stephen, but it'll probably take about five or ten minutes by the time I get <laughs> into the weeds. Um, maybe we can jump on that a, li a little bit later on. But cholesterol is essential for life. We should, certainly shouldn't fear cholesterol. Um, you know, if anything, I'd, I'd like to get mine higher. Um, in fact, the most recent test, it could come down ever so slightly. And uh, and I was a little bit upset. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I love that. Yes, I agree with you for sure. Yeah, so I think um, I've got some questions that were pre, um, pre-submitted. Uh, I'm trying to find one that I can read quickly for you. <laughs> Please don't laugh at this, all right? Because uh, I said, any questions, this could be a parody question, but I'm going to tell you. Um, Please don't laugh. Uh, can I have nuts? Or are all herbs and spices, vanilla and cinnamon, onions and garlic allowed? What about pickles, fermented veg, olive, salad, cabbage? Any sources, ideas, please? Thank you. Um, and the, the rationale for this is they need some variety uh, and tasty food. She thinks it might get too boring. Um, so uh, do, you, do you have any ideas for sources that are 100% carnivore that can really spice things up? Um, and, or are there sort of pickles you can have that are least, least problematic? What, what do you think? I mean, the Pluck seasonings, I have no affiliation with that brand whatsoever, but they're seasonings that are made out of organs. So if you wanted like a pure carnivore option, I'd say that would be the thing to go. Um, I am, gosh, I, I feel like, so being clinical practice for as long as I have been working with patients, the best way to get somebody to create lasting change is to meet them where they're at. So if somebody is embarking on carnivore and they need some sort of transition period, which was me personally too. So I can strongly relate to this and, and the feeling of, okay, I can't go full in yet just because it's not agreeing with me for whatever reason, whether I think I need variety or in my personal experience, it was a history of eating disorders where I absolutely could not have rules um, or somebody else's rules, so to speak. It was fine if it was coming from myself, um, but I couldn't have that because it would trigger those previous feelings. So I can, I can empathize with that need. And the ultimate goal I think for all of us should be, well, what's going to get me towards this level of optimal health? And if right now what you need is a small amount of spices, maybe you need to put some, I don't know, maybe you're whipping up some egg whites for some sort of fake dessert and you got to put a little bit of cinnamon and vanilla in it fine. Like get the egg whites in because those are going to be beneficial for you or even put the yolks in too because those are way more beneficial. But if what you need is a small amount to, again, get you to that eventual, we'll say strictness or eventual pure carnivore, go for it because mm -hmm. it it can work for some. Now, there are some people that absolutely need the cold turkey method where they have to cut everything off in order to you know, release what might be food addiction or those really specific cravings that might come up, that's fine. Only you can know yourself. And unless you're actually working one-on-one -on -one with a provider or somebody who says, oh yeah, no, this food may actually be a food intolerance for you. You should get rid of it right away. Don't even ease out of it. Um, I think that it's, you know, we, it's fine to be flexible, totally fine to be flexible, but also totally fine to still continue to do things that are going to work towards your goals. And the definition of carnivore can be different from everybody. I've seen some people use the definition of hyper carnivore, which is anything that's 70% or more animal based. We have obviously the definition of lion, meat, salt, water, definition of ketovore, which is more, mostly carnivore with the addition of small, maybe plant foods that are not going to, you know, spike your, to, to take you out of ketosis, I should say. Um, as far as like safer options, you're asking about pickles. Uh, I personally actually do terrible with pickles, pickles and cucumbers. But for me, I can do like half of a fermented pickle and it won't bother me. The fermentation process seems to uh, attack those lectins that I react very strongly to and it seems to be okay. Sauerkraut seems to be an okay thing for some people, again, with the fermentation, um, which would bring us into more of like a Weston A. Price sort of approach to carnivore where you're including these more uh, traditional foods. And I think that can work for some people as well too. And ultimately, you know, once you've healed from whatever might be ailing you or why you found your way to carnivore in the first place, maybe that becomes how you live flexibly, right? So if you wanted to go to restaurants or you want to go to dinner parties or things with other people that aren't necessarily needing to eat, eat this way, you can have that freedom. That's brilliant. Richard? 
Yeah, I, I think that's important. I mean, it's you know, we, we it's a, a point we keep coming back to, isn't it? Um, we see this within the carnivore keto groups quite often, where somebody will post a picture of a meal and everybody will jump on their on their back. That's not keto. That's not carnivore. And look, you no, know, for, for a start, you know, all carnivore, all carnivores are ketogenic. Mm -hmm. um, if you're carnivore, you're in a metabolic state of ketosis. And what is what is ketosis? It's a metabolic state. It's the metabolic state we're born in. It's the metabolic state that we've evolved in our entire existence. Um, what we eat, uh, you know, what can we eat? Technically, we can eat anything and still maintain a ketogenic state as long as it does not pull us from that ketogenic state by altering that insulin to glucagon ratio. So if it takes a food, as you rightly say, that we shouldn't, many would deem to be non-ketogenic or carnivore, but if, if it takes that to keep it on the straight and narrow, but you understand that there are negative effects to that, then that is, that is absolutely fine. I think we need to try to stop jumping on or down the throats of these people who are new to, because what I find out, I've got a keto group, um, somebody new will come on and they're super excited, they'll post a picture or something, and the first comment, that's not keto, that person removes themselves from the group, throws the towel in and never progress. We need to support these people, not, not attacking them. You know, we need to c commend them. You know, congratulations for joining the group. Um, you've made the first step in your journey. Uh, the benefits are fantastic. You know, what you're doing is brilliant. There are different types of, as you rightly say, being in a ketogenic state and subsections of being carnivore. Where you want to fit on that path or where you want to be, you know, end your journey, um, reside on that path as it were is is entitled to but it's down to knowledge and understanding that wherever you are now you can be better off but if you are at this point in your journey and you were benefiting and you were healing your body then that's fantastic but always understand you can go deeper down it but i think we need to support these people uh, i i'm i'm carnivore to the core um that's a new term we can use that kind of to the court. Um, Love it. You know, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. I, I support all aspects of, uh, of low carb. And, you know, we, we've touched base with this a couple of times this morning already, but, uh, you know, Coach Stephen was, uh, deals with a customer who is dirty keto. Um, he doesn't want, want to gravitate away from that, but he's changed his life, lost a stupid amount of weight, healed his gut, and he is reaping the benefits. And, you know, kudos to him for doing that and i think we should support that if that's the choice he decides to make that's fantastic but always be aware and this is what we do this is what these pieces are for isn't it these education pieces they show people where you are is fantastic but if you remove this this and this you'll be further down the line but you need to make that decision yourself we can't force this upon people um and we need to remember where we are in our journey as well i mean it's you know i've been on my journey for 10 11 years it's taken me you know, six or seven of that to become carnivore. I didn't just flick a switch and wake up. It's been these incremental changes. So if you need those those um, pieces, you know, those sources or, or condiments, whatever it may be, to, to, to allow you to maintain that journey, then then so be it, you know. It, uh, yeah. So that's my two pounds. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It, it's good. And Dr. Sabrina there is um, soaking up your lovely Welsh accent. I can see that. And I think one of the things that... The reason I asked so many people on it was to actually prove this, that you don't have to be zero tolerance. None of the influencers that have come on are, are flat out, you can't do that, you can't do that. And, and most people do have that angle of if it's the only thing that's going to keep you doing carnivore or be closer to carnivore and get rid of all the processed foods and seed oils and all that, then do it. You know, if someone says to me, I fancy an avocado, I'm like, okay, well, eat an avocado. I mean, what is the big deal? Yeah. Uh, but I think there are, you know, a little bit of demarcation. If someone says, I really fancy a donut and I know that client, you're going to have one. Are you going to have one a day? Are you then going to have two a day? You know, so you have to moderate but something like sauces i mean a big thing that helped me was finding a carnivore mayonnaise which is just an egg yolk and some butter whisked up yeah. together and i was like why did i not know about this <laughs> nine years ago this is amazing so i mean and that's mayonnaise that you can make literally fresh there and then i mean you don't have to you know just yeah. steal it or do anything to it so i, I thought that was good i do have an, a, another question oh by the way i will tell you another thing that has got me in trouble when i've done what i eat in a day i'm just going to show you something yeah and it's the sausage because that's processed <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh, uh you know 
I I laugh because at this conversation because just yesterday I had an Instagram post with like this meme um like ready to go and it was about this topic it was about the people who are policing carnivore and keto content <laughs> with the don't do it and I had the whole caption like it was ready to go it is saved in my drafts right now and I'm just like Oh, I just didn't want to deal with the backlash from the purists. And this this is exactly what you're saying. I don't know another, you know, I, I don't know if you want to call it professionals, influencers, whatever, in the space that is a quote unquote purist. It's always these people that are in these Facebook groups that say things like, you're right, okay, oh, that's not carnivore. And I have never encountered a person who was on the receiving end of that that was like, you know what? Thank you for that. My life has changed. I am now going to be the purest carnivore and you have fixed all my issues. It just doesn't happen. And it's so crazy to me that this is how people want to, are trying to help other people. And then I think, well, maybe they're not. Maybe they're just trying to be the person who flexes on social media. Maybe they are sad and unhappy. Maybe they're actually not even carnivores themselves and they're just trying to troll these groups because maybe they're vegan and they're trying to get people to not be carnivore. Who knows? But ultimately, yes, we should be guiding people along, offering true assistance when needed, because we all know the benefits of this way of eating and how much it can cure different diseases. It can put people in better metabolic states. It's just overall, and it's better for the environment too. I mean, my gosh, there's benefits all around. Yes, uh, better for the environment is a is a big deal that I'm really pushing at the moment. Um, I showed a, a, a thing earlier from the Smithsonian about 672 million birds are killed by pesticides, agricultural pesticides, in one year. 62 million in the states. So that's not environmentally friendly, is it? Um, it's not good for animals. And anyway. We could get very political. What Richard doesn't know about you, Dr. Sabrina, is uh, you're pretty feisty about these sort of things, which is great. <laughs> I've got a brilliant question. It is a bit nuanced. I don't think you're going to shy away from it. And I think Richard might end up doing the rest of the 18 hours on an answer. So here we go. <laughs> right. so here we go. So, and, it, and I don't I think it's, I don't think it's a, a negative comment. It's a genuine question. I hear a lot about bile flow in other nutrition communities, specifically the vitamin A toxicity groups, and the idea that we need soluble fiber to help prevent bile essentially stagnating in the body, and as far as I can understand it, causing toxicity issues. Have has it, either of you come across this uh, theory? I've never come across the theory or I've never come across that clinically. No. Honestly, I, I truly have not. I truly have not had a patient walk into my office where I've been like, yeah, your bile is stuck. Like It's just, it has never no. happened. And maybe it's because I'm ignorant to it, right? Maybe it's because I just don't know to look for it. Um, but that's, it's honestly never been a concern. Have you come across no. that, Richard? No, I haven't. And it just adds, adds more weight to the fact that um, you know, fiber, um, I hate to break it to you all, is not essential. Um, it's an anti-nutrient. We do not need it. Um, there is no benefit to consuming fiber whatsoever. Um, it negates the body's ability to absorb other nutrients. Uh, it's usually one of the main contributing factors uh, to um, you know, bowel, bowel issues, uh, IBS, amongst other things. Um, we have no need for fiber. And that's one of the big concerns of people beginning a keto and carnivore lifestyle. Carnivore in particular, you know, where do I get my fiber from? You no, know, fiber um, feeds um, or breaks down into butyrate or feeds the colonocytes in the gut. But, uh, and, and that's the big thing that people will, will come back to when it comes, comes down to fiber. Uh, but what people don't realize is that all protein breaks down into uh, isobutyrate, isovalerate, and propionate, which which is a, a short chain fatty acid, which feeds the colonocytes in the gut at a higher rate than butyrate from vegetables. So we can think of animal protein as animal fiber. Uh, and the interesting thing is that technically we don't even need that because when we're ketogenic, um, we have beta hydroxybutyrate flowing through our our veins, every colonocyte within our body is fed with beta hydroxybutyrate and the butyrate, the short chain fatty acid butyrate is further broken down into beta hydroxybutyrate. But we don't need to do that to feed that single colonocyte because every colonocyte is being fed. So it doesn't matter which angle you look at in regards to, to fiber, um, we don't need it. Uh, we need saturated fats uh, for the production of bile. Fat is essential. Um, ditch the fiber, increase your fat.
<laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah. Is that okay for, for a short version? So with you on, on all of that. Yes. And it's, I mean, personally, like that was what really, I would say cured my issues because prior to this, I mean, as a naturopathic doctor, I had access to every single gut healing protocol you could imagine. And I did them. I would, I would say I did almost all of them, everything like, because my gut was so destroyed and it truly wasn't until I cut out all vegetables, cut out all fiber and was fairly, I would say strict carnivore. I don't like the word strict. I was just carnivore because that was what felt good to me and what was doing really well for me that I actually finally healed and I had normal bowel movements and I never got bloated and I never had gas and like nothing bad else ever happened. And even with that, taking out the anti-nutrients finally allowed me to get my nutrient levels up to good standards. I had hair grow back that I didn't even realize I was missing. Like I had like these spaces right here were back. Like there was no hair there and now I've got hair there. So it's, it's just amazing what properly fueling the body can do and no we don't need fiber for proper fuel at all at all full stop yes i'm not a fan of fiber I, and uh, i often quote dr paul mason's brilliant video which looks at the study where they had high fiber medium fiber and zero fiber and the resolution of all symptoms and bleeding and constipation was only well it was everyone in the in the zero fiber group had full resolution and the high fiber and medium fiber did not. So uh, that's a pretty good study. It's a very small, bit underpowered, only like 65 participants, but it's the best study we've got. Um, and, and another interesting question. Um, so just, just so you know, Dr. Sabrina, we um, asked people to put some questions forward before we started. And um, <laughs> I got quite a mixed bag. Uh, so that was one of them. Here, here's another one. There's often talk about long-term zero-carb spiking cortisol and leading to issues longer-term for certain people. Sally Norton recently emailed saying that long-term zero-carb can cause issues, especially when dealing with oxate dumping. Uh, so I'm keen to understand this more. And if anyone does recommend tactical, cyclical carb intake to prevent cortisol or other hormone issues long term. Hmm. Such a good question. This is something that I've touched on in, in some of my social media content, which is this relationship between um, being in a high cortisol state and diet. And I think the misnomer here is that people are saying that diet is the cause of the high cortisol state. And in my experience, that's almost never entirely true. So you can do things diet wise that can exacerbate a hypercortisol state like coffee on an empty stomach, for example, especially if you're a female, that's going to exacerbate your cortisol. But it's, mo it's mostly the other habits that we have throughout the day consistent scrolling on our phones, consistent exposure to blue light, working at jobs we hate, being like not having proper connection with other human beings. We are in, unfortunately, this, this day and age where we have so many things that are stressing us out and can, creating these consistently elevated cortisol levels. And we're, mis we're misappropriately attributing them to a diet state. Now, one of the things is that, yes, carbo consuming carbohydrates can blunt the effects of cortisol, but I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't recommend that as the treatment per se. Um, I would recommend getting to the root cause of what's actually spiking the cortisol and start there. So if it's, if you are consuming coffee on an empty stomach and you are having a tough time with, you know, this being in that ketosis state, figure that out. Um, because what's going to happen if you are consistently putting yourself into into ketosis with a high stress state or you're at least trying for that, you're actually going to likely to eat away at some of your lean muscle mass. You're going to detrimentally affect your muscle. Um, so that's important because, well, we need muscle in our bodies. Well, some people will call it the organ of longevity. Um, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, I don't know if you guys know who she is. She's got a lot of really great content on just this exact topic, why having muscle as you age is so important, uh, preventing sarcopenia, preventing frailty, preventing fractures, um, being just an overall active tissue in the body, all very important. But the cortisol issue is, it's not caused by diet in pretty much anybody. So I don't think that you should, I think you should, you can support it with diet. And if anything, higher fat can be beneficial for some people. If you wanted to, if you wanted to, cycle carbs, I think you could. 
I think that's actually a reasonable thing for a different population. Um, in my experience, working with women who have damaged their metabolism from years of yo-yo dieting can actually get better results for, instead of being strict by actually cycling some carbs very strategically with guidance. That's almost the only population type that I would rec recommend that for. Uh, the rest of us seem to do just fine, but again, focus on the root cause of the cortisol. Richard? He's sitting there listening so intently. Yeah, it, look, again, I mean, this is a, a topic that popped up earlier, isn't it? Uh, Long-term, you know, ketosis causing uh, negative issues in the body. I mean, I've I've been ketogenic for 10, 11 years. Um, I've, cortisol tests are diff difficult ones, especially when we do it by, by blood because cortisol is elevated in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have to do X amount of, of blood tests for cortisol throughout the day. So, you know, these, these studies that show elevated cortisol levels, I, I question some of them anyway. But look, coming back to a point we made earlier, um, you know, being ketogenic, I think, can cause an elevation. Um, you know, fasting can cause an elevation um, in, in some people. Uh, usually, if the biggest contributing factor within a low-carb ketogenic lifestyle is, is lack of sodium. Um, mm. And again, coming back to a point we made earlier, you know, when we begin keto, we, we all hit the coffee and, and the fat bombs and the bulletproof coffees and... This increase in caffeine affects the adrenals. Um, it causes adrenal dysfunction, which can increase cortisol. So, you know, if there is a link between diet, I, you know, I, it's not direct in regards to being ketogenic, you know, is what I would say. But um, I've, you know, I've measured my CRP and my DHA, uh, DHEA, and, you know, my CRP, which, which is directly correlated um, in one of the studies that I reference in, in one of the talks that we do in regards to elevated cortisol levels. My CRP is always incredibly low. Uh, my DHEA uh, is always high. Um, you know, I never have, um, it, it doesn't appear that I have any uh, adrenal dysfunction or any elevated cortisol, and I've been ketogenic for, for a long, long time. Um, another factor that people, you know, will put down to damaging effects of being ketogenic is, um, you know, something called the Randall cycle, which, um, you know, Professor Barkay, I'm sure, will enlighten us. He, that's a topic that he's well versed in. So, I'm you know, looking forward to chatting to him in regards to that one. But look, it's, um, I've lived this lifestyle for 10, 11 years. Uh, all I've seen is benefits. And when we look at some of these influencers who, you know, show that, um, you know, testosterone is, is lower or thyroid hormone is lower, uh, you know, in, in women especially, well, it, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is also lower. And if that was an issue in regards to hormone being lower, thyroid stimulated hormone would be elevated. So all of these things, you know, we need to look at them in context. And it's not just as, as easy as looking at a, a, a one thing. There's, there's a bigger picture to this. Um, I truly believe this is the healthiest way to live. But coming back, you know, to, to the point, um, it isn't one size fits all. And, you know, I, I do believe that some people will get away with consuming carbohydrate. I don't think it's essential. I believe that any any so-called lack of carbohydrate can be i don't think we need to test the metabolism or uh testing the insulin by cycling carbohydrates at all um these are things that i've tried and tested over the years and i just seem to not benefit from them I, okay i'm one person the clients that i work with seem to have similar results to myself we all look for what we call this like metabolic flexibility where we can start introducing carbohydrate again but when these people do they seem to be worse off for it and gravitate yeah. back into an animal based lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I've got questions on that. And, and I, I just believe that living, uh, you know, it's almost people looking for excuses, isn't it, to come away and, and feed sugar addiction again. But um, yeah. I'm all for living the animal lifestyle. I, I'm all for people experimenting. You know, you need to try these things. But uh, I only see benefit for, for living long term ketogenic and carnivore based lifestyles. Um, but that's my two pen, I think. <laughs> for yeah, I, think I, agree. I think the way you yeah, I mean, I think the way we look at testing is, is is just so wrong because, like I say, I do the phlebotomy and I, I, I don't do that much now, but I used to. And people would say, I failed a glucose tolerance test. Can I take it again? And I'd be like, why do you want to be able to cope with a drink that's got 15 <laughs> teaspoons of sugar in? That you haven't you failed. It, yeah. Your body has said to you, that's too much sugar. I mean, exactly like if you have a drink that's got too much salt in, go, well, that's too salty. You know, yeah. that's what you should be doing. You should be taking a sip of that and going, um, excuse me, man in the white coat or female in the white coat. I don't want to drink this. This is too sweet. That's what you yes. should be saying. You know? Yes, yes. That's the tolerance, right? Like that it's just too sweet for you. I didn't do, I didn't, they, they make pregnant women do that test. 
they make pregnant women do a glucose tolerance test to check to see if you have gestational diabetes. And I'm like, I, I'm refusing that. First of all, I'm not really doing any care for this pregnancy, but I'm refusing that on the account of I, my metabolism is going to go crazy if I do that because I haven't had anything like that. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that to this baby. I'm not going to do that to myself. There's zero point to it. It's, it's terrible. I, oh, we could do a whole topic on the whole uh, pregnancy care disaster that is our medical system, but we don't have to do that today. The fat addict there, um, Adam, there, I've read effects. I've read effects that coffee can cause an even bigger increase in cortisol within the first two hours of waking. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a stimulant. Yeah, uh, and, it's, is a banned substance in and it's compounding on your body's own natural cortisol production in the morning. You're supposed to get a cortisol response in the morning. And to your, to your point um, about the testing of the cortisol, there's some things that can impact just the testing of itself. So you, when you're getting it via blood draw and you are freaked out by needles, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> your cortisol levels are going to go up. And of course, we do have... Um, a pattern in which cortisol releases throughout our body. And it's four, supposed to be four times throughout the day that you're supposed to get these cortisol responses and they're supposed to follow a specific curve. So some people will do uh, salivary testing. I did that for patients. Gosh, I think the last time I ran one of those was 2016 um, because I, it was much easier to just correlate symptoms versus make them pay for this $200 spit test that they have to spit into a tube four times a day. Um, so that I kind of took that out of my toolbox. But one of the other things that I test beyond the HSCRP that you were talking about that's always included as well um, is the hormone prolactin. So prolactin is a, it's a hormone that promotes lactation. So it's a hormone that should be elevated in women who are pregnant and or breastfeeding. When we test this in people who aren't um, alongside cortisol and we see a spike in prolactin, but cortisol might be normal or it might even have an elevation, I'll, I like to call pro, prolactin cortisol snitch. And it's because the, the signaling for those two hormones, it's almost like sister signaling. So there can kind of be a crossover on that. So if somebody has elevated prolactin, and of course we want to rule out something like a prolactinoma, which is a small uh, prolactin secreting tumor that might occur in the brain. And it's usually almost always benign, but um, again, it's in the context of the rest of the labs and their, their clinical presentation. But if you have an elevation in prolactin, you can almost always guarantee that there is an issue as well with their cortisol response. So that's one of the ways that I kind of check my work, so to speak, um, because again, you can just have a, a false elevation because somebody was freaked out by getting the blood draw. Fabulous. Yes, I think Richard's speechless. You, you see, Richard, <laughs> another potential guest for your YouTube because... The, the carnivores out there, they know their stuff. So thank you, Dr. Sabrina. That's really good. I'm going to now make you a little bit um, – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote you a little bit because I'd like to know about your stem cell applications, what what that's about, because I think Richard's ears will prick up, which they already did. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do in the area of stem cells? Yes. So, gosh, I've been in the stem cell – or I've been in the regenerative medicine field since about 2013, so it's been about uh, just over a decade now. Um, that I was performing regenerative injections. And the regenerative medicine field, that, that, that term can comprise various different modalities, uh, including things like prolotherapy, stem cell therapy, uh, PRP, uh, and even things like birth tissue products, things like umbilical cord products, amniotic products, exosomes. Uh, and I've been doing this, like I said, for about 10 years. And the most common thing that we treat, I would say, are musculoskeletal disorders. So chronic pain, chronic injuries, um, things where people either don't want to do surgery or aren't a candidate for surgery, or have previously only been um, treating those with things like pain medications or hyaluronic acid injections, or trying to rehab them with physical therapy and not getting the results that they would like. Uh, basically, what we do is we use these regenerative medicine tools at our toolbox, depending on what the patient's presentation is, and we actually cause the area to heal. One of the things that I actually started doing was incorporating a, we'll call it a spectrum of carnivore diet for all the patients. So anytime someone comes in who wants to work with us, they actually get access to a whole online learning platform where we take them through transitioning them into mostly a keto carnivore-ish uh, type of way of eating because 
oh my gosh, it has skyrocketed results. I mean, for us at this point, a failure almost doesn't exist as, as far as our patient base goes, which is amazing because um, we're we're kind of covering all of the bases when it comes to getting all that proper nutrition in and of course, treating the areas that we need to be treating. That's great. That's great. Um, and Richard, surely that has inspired you to ask a question, a follow-up question. Yeah, for sure. It. Um, I mean, it, 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 obviously a lot of your research is around Satuwins, uh, I'm guessing, uh, Sabrina, uh, and, and in regards to NAD plus and NADH and things. Um, you know, when, when the body is created, as we age NAD plus through the electrical transport chain, um, or cellular respiration is converted into NADH and this NAD plus is lowered and this is what leads isn't it to this damage and and this sign of, of aging um and when we become ketogenic uh we can alter this ratio so it, pro it, it costs the body four NAD plus molecules to process one glucose molecule uh but it costs the body one beta hydroxybutyrate or one NAD plus molecule to process one beta hydroxybutyrate molecule so it's 400 percent more efficient um you know first question one part of two I mean, uh, you've, you've gone down the carnival route. Do you attribute a lot of that benefit down to that um, that increase in the NAD plus to NADH ratio? And then coming on from that, some of the therapy that you're using. So NAD plus is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, uh, but you can use a supplement form of this in the form of nicotinamide uh, mononucleotide. Uh, do, do you use any of that? Or is it a case of you're just using, you know, the the increase in NAD plus through, through the diet and lifestyle? Uh, or do you attribute it a, co a combo of, of the two? So good question. I actually never even put the two and two together, which is the increase in the NAD and the decrease in the carbs, but it makes a ton of sense because as like, you're right, as you're saying, the amount that we make naturally just as humans goes down dramatically as we age. And it's kind of one of those hallmarks of aging, I would even say, because um, it, it relates directly to mitochondrial dysfunction and how your cells are able to function in that energy production way. So that makes complete sense. And yes, we use NAD frequently in our practice because, well, it works. Um, we, we actually just do either intravenous administration or we do subcutaneous administration. I, I understand that there are the precursors that are avail available in oral form. I've personally never seen great results from them. That doesn't mean that there isn't people that are getting them because I always talk about this. The doc, the built-in doctor bias is that the people who are doing great aren't coming to see us. So for me to say that I'm, I haven't seen this, don't take it too, you know, too much of the grain of salt, but so I don't know exactly which ones are working. I just know what my patients are coming in for when they aren't working. And normally if they haven't been working with like the NMN, like you were saying, um, or even the NR, um, Dr. David Sinclair is the person who really speaks a lot about this. And I think he, he has gone back and forth on those two, as far as which one's more potent. Do you know for sure if it's the NMN or the NR at this point? <laughs> uh, I, you know, it, as you say, the research is to win or throw in, but, um, I mean, most of the research I've done is in regards to NNM, which is a mouthful to say, isn't it? It's, it's yes. almost easier to say nicotine than I want. I But yeah, yeah it, uh, it's, it's an interesting topic. And um, it's, it's, it's one that, uh, you know, that, that when we look at health and well-being in regard, so I'm all for supplementation, um, but I mean, living, living the lifestyle as well. And it was just interesting when you said there that, you know, you're using therapy treatments um, and in conjunction with living the lifestyle and you've seen massive improvements. I just wondered whether that, that was the case, but it, um, you know, I, I'm all for supplementation. Um, you know, as I, I own a supplement store, um, which you know, I, I personally call, you know, a, a ketogenic carnivore store, if you like, because mm -hmm. the, everything there is classed as foods, um, you know, to me anyway, at least, but it, uh, I'm always interested. I've never, it never used NNM myself. Um, I do work, I don't know if you know, um, uh, Lisa Tamady, uh, an award-winning author from New Zealand. Uh, she uh, and her, her mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer um, and was given a few months to live. Five years later, she's still alive and trains five days a week. Um, and she's done this, you know, through a uh, ketogenic-based uh, lifestyle. But she's a, a, a big advocate of NNM. Um, and she's the type of person that looks into this, you know, to the nth degree. So, I mean, it's, you know, I respect her opinion on it, but I've, ne I've never tried it myself. Uh, but yeah, in regards to which is best, I'm unsure. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting to say the least, isn't it? 
It is. It's it's cool stuff. And I think it's important that the other aspect too, I'm with you on supplements. I've, I've used supplements personally with patients strategically over the years. And I don't think that, I think that it's important to be, again, very strategic with what you're doing. Aim for short term while you dial in everything else. And then also take into consideration, can this person actually even absorb what I'm giving them? Um, there's so much gut dysfunction that's kind of rampant throughout the world, we'll say. Um, so if you are giving a person something, like just make sure that it's it's not a waste. That's brilliant. And um, I've been dying to say this name. Bob's Pistols and Pay Dirt has asked a question. Question for the panel. We all understand the physical and mental benefits of carnivore lifestyle. Why is it so difficult for others, friends and family, to understand slash accept carnivore? It's I think there's layers to this. Most most common layer, I think, being that everybody's just been kind of brainwashed. I mean, I certainly was. You know, I was I was brainwashed to we have to eat the vegetables and all the things that have been fed to us literally and figuratively over the years. Um, it's just kind of hard to get people to break free from that. And until a person reaches their own true breaking point, whether it's their health and mental or physical ways, they're not going to seek out other solutions. And even then, the amount of people that actually do find their way to this, I feel like is very, very small, because most of the other people are still under the impression that their family physician is the person to go to for a solution. And that's often not the case at all, because all they're going to get is maybe a pill that might make them worse, cause other side effects, get another pill for that, continue on this trajectory. And they're never actually going to see these positive changes and they're going to end up with those diseases of lifestyle that are killing everybody, heart disease, diabetes, certain types of cancers. Um, and that's why we're in the situation globally that we're in with the health of humans. It's people don't, they don't know to change. They don't want to change. It's sad. Yeah. I think you're right about the brainwashing or I call it yeah. grainwashing. But <laughs> I, I definitely was that person. I can remember in my twenties, I did my bodybuilding show. Yeah. And, um, not as good as Zach's, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Zach is Sabrina's husband. Um, right. So, yeah, I did a bodybuilding show. And I can remember going through Muscle and Fitness magazine and seeing an experiment where they – because I was high carb at the time, low fat. Um, here's an experiment. Some of our bodybuilders are going to eat high fat. And I just literally just flicked straight past. Well, that's not going to work. You know, I, I wasn't open to it at all in any way, shape, or form. And, and you know – even when I started doing my qualifications, diabetes and obesity, it, it, was, it was just the things not adding up. It, it took a long time for me to start thinking properly. So, and the reason I'm saying this is for those people that are upset or worried that their friends, family don't really accept it, try and put yourself back to before you discovered carnivore, how you found it difficult to understand, how you were saturated, no uh, pun intended, saturated with news about fat being bad for you. All of that stuff is in there. You know, it is absolutely deep in, in that person. So I always say you've got to just actually wait it out, play the long game, because if you're convinced about it, and I, and I get this with lots and lots of people I've coached, <clears throat> and I mean, I'm lucky enough to have over, you know, 500 people to draw from now that I've coached. The ones that have the friends and family supporting definitely have a much easier journey, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. But those that have the pushback, and again, I had it, uh, strangely enough, I know we've mentioned this person a couple of times, but it was amazing. You know, they'd lost 250 pounds, reversed uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, off diabetic medications. Actually, they literally could not move. All right, They could not get off uh, the couch. They lost their job because they couldn't do any of their daily activities. So they went carnival. Now, um, he said to me, oh, everyone thought it was, it was crazy. You know, I was, I was mad. I got to the point where I didn't want to live. I mean, that's how bad it was. Then by the end of the interview, long list. My mum's doing it. My mother-in-law, my father-in-law's doing it. My brother, da, da, da. you know, because huge difference. This person who was basically lost in the uh, minutiae of the, the NHS and medications was this fit healthy person back at work, by the way, and, and, and everything's really great. Well, you could put yourself into the, I mean, that's both the spectrum there, you know, the, the, the real worst case and the best case. But if you're in the middle and your partner's saying, I want you to eat some fruit and veg, please eat some fruit and veg. It's because they actually think they're doing the right thing by you. But if you stick to your guns and in six months later, you're, you know, 
looking better, you're off your diabetic meds, they will come round, I promise you, without you having to talk to them or have an argument because it's self-evident that it's worked for you. And that doesn't mean they've got to eat like you either. I mean, yeah. you've got to accept their autonomy because you've made this decision that you wanted to do and it's worked for you. It doesn't mean it will work for them. It probably would. Of course, you know, I think it would. You probably think it would. But if they don't want to do it, if they're not open to it, it's not worth ruining your partnership, your marriage, or, you know, falling out with your family over. Because, you know, that really crap phrase, you do you and I do me, is is true. All right? If, if you eat this way and you feel great and i promise you i live in a in a real world of a family that think i'm weird um you just got to do what's best for you but don't try and push it on to other people the joke about you know if you go into a into a restaurant or you go into a bar uh, how can you know the person in front of you is a vegan because they tell that's you, you. <laughs> that's it <laughs> because they can't stop talking about it don't be that person just be yourself and people will come to you. I mean, that's that's the way I, I look at it. Um, right. Uh, we have come to the end of the questions, which is which is great. Uh, Dr. Salt has kindly stayed on for a bit longer because I think she was down for 45 minutes. Do you want to see the hour out? I'm or happy to hang out with you guys. I think this is so much fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, any books? Oh, let's put this. Uh, oh, <laughs> Bishop's Deep Learning. Any books, suggestions for converting people? Something easy to read with lots of compelling images and diagrams. Honestly, I have no idea because I I only read, I don't, say, I wouldn't even read it, listened to it, one carnivore book, and it was uh, Dr. Paul Saladino's. And I, the thing I enjoyed about it was his... Um, Arguments for all the plant toxins. That was where I really got my my first education on the negativities. I I have not read it. I admittedly, I'm sorry, I'm a bad carnivore. <laughs> but it's um I yeah I could see that one being a good one too. Um, I, yeah. Otherwise, I don't really have a lot of book suggestions. It's it's just something that I, like you said, I dove into it based on watching my husband do better on it because it was that it was the physical proof, right? The, this conversation is so interesting because people, they want to do good. Like this is why I, I love people and believe in people because we see this in our community, people being like, how can I help everybody else? Because it helped me so much. And I'm like, it's beautiful. It's great. Slightly misguided because nobody likes being told they're wrong. Nobody likes being told what to do, especially if it's uninvited. And I get that you have the, the greatest intentions for it. My husband certainly did. It took him um, a little bit of time to actually convince me but I had to see his results in real time. I had to see his eyes getting whiter. I had to see his skin getting better. I had to see his mood improving. I had to see, I had to see all of it for myself. I even had to see his poop. So, you know, we have one of those marriages where we're just open about everything, but I, I had to actually see the evidence for my own eyes before I was like, all right, let me give this a shot. Because again, that brainwashing ran really, really deep for me. Um, so Books are, are a fine suggestion, but at the same time, you can find books on everything. I mean, the medical medium has books, you know, it's just because you have evidence that you deem good doesn't mean it's going to be automatically received by the other person. And, and, and we see this, you know, we've, we've seen the vegans push their stuff. We've seen the, the breathitarians, the fruititarians. I mean, everybody's got their hill that they're dying on and their, their evidence and their resources for why they're doing their things. Um, and it's, it really, I don't think it, it's, it's about that. I think it's honestly this movement in particular, it's that social proof. It's the people that are truly healing from these really, really deep medical issues and sharing their experience. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's basically what I was saying about your friends and family. Mm -hmm. Nothing beats seeing somebody or learning. I mean, you know, Zach's looks amazing. He's a lovely guy, you know, and, and, uh, bit shy you know doesn't put his opinion out there that much um but you know i'm not plugging books for guests just i mean sean baker's book is a very good gateway into carnivore if you're interested uh, my website has some really good tips if you want to start there's a video on my thing 19 tips for starting um then we've got maria emmerich and craig emmerich the carnival cookbook uh, lies my doctor told me ken berry who sadly we couldn't get on um judy cho Carnival Q is very good. Um, one of the things I would say about uh, Judy Cho is 
she gets into some real brilliant stuff about things we rarely talk about, like food additives and coloring and dyes and stuff in food. And I think that's that's pretty good as well because there are a lot of additives. I don't think we really suffer that much, Richard, in the UK, but I think in America there are a lot more, um, you know, additives and colors and stuff. What, what what would you say about books or anything like that, Rich? Um, to be honest, I mean, I'm, I'm not a massive book fan. Um, I find, you know, YouTube to be a fantastic source of information. Uh, but you need to be able to read between the lines of certain things because, you know, as Sabrina rightly says, there's there's an argument for everything. But, I mean, it um, you know, you only need to look at the likes of you know, people like Dr. Chafee, um, you know, 130 odd thousand followers. Um, you know, the information he's given out can't be that bad if he has that many followers, you know. Uh, the information, you know, the reason we are doing this, the information that we put out, the information Sabrina puts out, the information you and I put out, it's all content available on our YouTube channels. Uh, it's free. And it's available on all of our websites. Um, and I think we all make an effort to try to break it down into simple terms. I know, you know, we like to go into the into the weeds a little bit, into the science and stuff as well. But, um, you know, there are uh, simplified versions of uh, of how it impacts health and well-being. And just circling back to a point that um, you guys made earlier, uh, it, it is incredibly difficult beginning your journey. Um, you know, I, I received a lot of backlash. Um my friends, family, you know, uh, my mother in particular, and, and, and that side of, you know, of the family, were, what about your, your cholesterol and your saturated fats? All out of, you know, of, of goodwill uh, and care, uh, but not understanding that, um, you know, cholesterol is essential. And it comes back to this misinformation we've been fed for the last 50 years, that saturated fats are bad for us, cholesterol should be feared, too much sodium is bad for us, we need to eat our whole grains and consume our seed oils. Everything that we're told is, 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 is back to front, isn't it? Um, but I, I, you know, there's a point there that I've highlighted and, and DC 77, you know, sh uh, should you not be more pushy if it saves lives? And I almost feel like that I'm that person because I am that vegan, the, the, the anti, anti vegan in the pub, although I don't go to a pub. But, you know, it, I am that person telling people in the street um, and maybe I shouldn't. But it, I do feel that it's, you know, it's, it's almost my duty to tell people Um but I've lost friends and family over it because, you know, I, I almost seem too pushy. But I, I feel that we have the magic elixir to help them. And it's just really disheartening when they're not willing to, to step back and look at the evidence and, and listen and take it on board and change their life. Because the information we're given out is life changing. And I think that we should be pushing it. We should be pushy, uh, you know, to, to a degree. But as you rightly say, the proof is in the pudding. We continue on our journey. We improve our health and well-being. We've all lost a tump of weight, improved health and well-being. The people we work with see these improvements and that ripple effect, you know, will we'll, we'll draw further down the line and convert those other people moving forward. But, um, yeah, it's online it is the best references for me. So <laughs> that's the long version of <laughs> Yes. You've, you've probably noticed there's another person on the screen, and we're, we're introducing him in a second because uh, he's, he's early, which is fantastic. But what we found, Coach Bronson, is that as people have been passing the baton, it's nice to come in and hear the tail end yeah. and then segue into the next thing. Um, and I want to just say, I am looking at the comments. I'm trying to organize 30 odd guests, a live stream, and the subject to question. And the chat, I can't do everything. But the really interesting thing, the guy that asked about the books has just said, it's all well and good, you son, about YouTube, but my dad's old. He doesn't look at YouTube. He wants to read a book. So that's why we recommended the books. So, uh, Dr. Sabrina, last question, and then, and then we'll introduce Coach Bronson, who's looking very studious there. Uh, Bob's Pistols and Pay Dough. would really like to hear Dr. Stoltz's opinions on four stem cell. Uh, Wharton's jelly versus cord blood, etc. Does that make sense to you? Uh, IV stem cell, IV. yes. IV. Yes, yeah. I am 100% a proponent for intravenous stem cells. However, not necessarily Wharton's jelly or cord blood, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's different regulations in the United States versus other countries. And in other countries, you can actually get pure cord blood products, Wharton's jelly products that are prepared properly. In the United States, our birth tissue market is... Um, sad and deceptive at best not to say these are these products are all bad all the time but according to the fda and this doesn't mean we like the fda um but according to the fda they it is illegal to do the transfer of live cells from one person to another which means that these products that are created from birth tissues don't actually contain live stem cells by the time they reach the patient 
both legally and due to how they're produced. So they have to go undergo cryopreservation, irradiation. They undergo what's called a shock thaw in the office where it's just kind of warmed up by that room temperature by your hands. Um, stem cells are very sensitive cells. They die. And so that's that topic. Now, intravenous stem cells, the absolute best way, in my opinion, clinically, I can back this up with data. I can back this up with studies. Um, in the United States, at least, is through intravenous stem cells as a result of getting them from a patient's own adipose tissue. Um, that has been by far the greatest results that we have seen. And we can do this for autoimmune disorders. We can do it for it's simply anti-aging benefits, neurological disorders. I mean, anywhere the blood travels in your body, putting stem cells intravenously, you're going to benefit from. Um, I could go on for this topic for a while, um, but I will, I will leave it at that. Um, is that great thing to do? Do not trust any of the birth tissue products in the United States. If you have a company that is selling these to you um, or pushing them for you or a clinic that's, that says this is the best, ask them if they do any other stem cell therapies because a true regenerative medicine practice will offer all of it based on what the patient might need, um, not just kind of one tool because that means that they don't actually have the, the skill set or understanding. And I'm just going to throw shade there really quick um, is that, yeah, they just don't. Um, so find a place that can do all of it ask them which company they source their products from and contact that company to get a third party analysis of their final product after it's been thought out. They won't be able to provide it for you to actually say that it contains live stem cells. So I will leave it at that. Brilliant. Dr. Sabrina Salt, do you know Bronson Dent? I don't think I do. Hi. Ah, okay. Uh, well, Vir Bronson virtually, Dent is virtually somewhat, but not, we haven't actually met met. Oh. Yeah. I think you two guys, <laughs> yeah, you should do do a, a, a um, podcast together because I, I will speak of Bronson Dent's amazing brain and and his capabilities to listen to new stuff is is, is incredible. And I just want to say it's seven hours in Bronson, and I've just read IV as four <laughs> because, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm that old. I used to write in Roman numerals. So right. anyway, uh, Dr. Sabrina Salt, that has been a pleasure. Thank you for doing that extra Thank 15 you. minutes. So many. Thank questions. you, Sabrina. Absolute pleasure. Guys. Absolutely. Great. Good luck the rest of the carnivore-thon. Hopefully you guys get to eat and drink something, you know, meaty and refreshing. But yeah, you guys are doing awesome. So good job. Good Thank job on this. You guys should have a whole 30-minute session where it's just you eating. Yes. <laughs> part of the whole, part of just putting a ribeye away. I, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabrina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank you. Right. Bronson Dent, Coach Bronson star of the reverse tv series now i <laughs> i have this i've written introductions for everybody but uh, it's it's not really working i'd rather you to just introduce yourself sir if you don't mind sure um coach bronson i've been carnivore for a little over five years i'm 51 years old i didn't get started on this journey really until my late 30s i was almost 40 years old when i decided hey i need to do something because i'm fat and out of shape and depressed and can't do anything like i want to do so uh, my journey has not been short. It's been up and down. I've been fat. I've been skinny. I've been fat. I've been skinny um, until I realized that it's not about being fat or skinny. It's about being able to do the things that you want to do. And that's really what my message is all about right now. And do you know Richard? I do not. Hi, Richard. Hey there, coach. How are you doing? Are you okay? I'm doing fantastic. Got my Brilliant. coffee. I'm good to go. <laughs> right, Fantastic. Richard, you have 45 seconds to fill Coach Bronson in and your journey, your weight loss and where you were. And where just you are 45? <laughs> yes, just 45 <laughs> seconds. We haven't got long. We've only got 14 hours left. <laughs> just, just the 14. So, yeah, um, I used to be type 2 diabetic. I was clinically obese. I suffered with daily debilitating migraines would make me blind, chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety, arthritic pains. In my mid to their 20s, I could barely walk up the stairs without stopping or being severely out of breath. Super long story short, changed my my uh, my diet um, unknowingly. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that bread used to make me feel uncomfortable, and that's where I began on my journey. Uh, 12 months later, I'd lost 107 pounds, reversed my diabetes, uh, no longer suffered with chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety, arthritic pains. My migraines had cleared up. I still suffer with migraines, but this is usually to do with lack of sleep or stress which when you work for yourself, uh, unfortunately, go hand in hand. Um, <laughs> uh, 
But I used to suffer with these daily debilitating migraines every day that would make me blind, which I was on three different medications for. Um, I went on to compete as an amateur in men's physique bodybuilding and then became professional, won the British Championship and then the European Championship. Yeah. Awesome. So I went from being unable to walk up the stairs in my mid-20s to being number one in Europe uh, within five years of living a ketogenic, carnivore-style lifestyle. Uh, and now I try to teach others to do the same, uh, which is where you jumped in on, I believe, in, in, you know, early on in, in regards to preaching. Um, yeah, we try to scream it from the rooftops in, in the same way, I guess, as, as you do. You know, you, you've come across uh, what, what I tell people or regard as a secret. You know, I found a secret and I'm trying to tell as many people as I can about my secret, this secret that goes literally against the grain, goes against everything that we've been told. Uh, but it's so simple and it comes back down to and, and I know we've highlighted these other contributing factors, environmental factors, but most of this comes down to diet, um, uh, you know, nutrition. Nutrition is key. Uh, and unfortunately, that is negated or, or passed to one side, if you will, in, in uh, lieu of medications, um, mm. which is unfortunate. But that's the short version. <laughs> was right. short was that a little, over, a little <laughs> over 45 seconds. I don't know. <laughs> 45 minutes fact, maybe <laughs> yeah uh bronson i mean that's that's why i had to do 24 hours just to get richard's answers in. <laughs> no other reason uh but anyway you two guys should hook up at some point and do a podcast because you two are fantastic your knowledge about training and exercise and this isn't flannel to the people out there that think it's, it's not you know i've invited people on because i think they have got a lot to give and um these two guys Oh, great. Richard is my co-host today, so we're doing 24 hours. But Coach Bronson, we got for an hour uh, or 45 Ooh. minutes. So um, I asked people to submit some questions right now. Sure. Your followers are about the best there are because they don't do these long. They don't do these long novels. They do this question. Right. So here's from one of them. Hey, why carnivore? I love it. <laughs> it's funny because sometimes the shorter questions have the longer answers. Yes. That could be, we could do the whole 24 hours on just why. I mean, that's what this whole thing is about, right? This whole 24 hour thing is yeah. about why carnivore. So um, why carnivore? Gosh. Maybe well, let's, let's make it easier. Why carnivore for you then? I was just going to say my story for carnivore for me, uh, there's a couple of things. Number one, I had, um, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, urgent bowels. My life was pretty much governed by how close I could be or how quickly I could get to a bathroom. So there was uh, uh, anxiety, stress. I, you know, I tell people that I didn't lose 150 pounds. Um, I had a 70 pound overall loss, but I didn't lose 150, 200 pounds. I wasn't severely obese, morbidly obese, but the biggest change from the reduction of stress, anxiety, feeling of, lim of limitations in my life came around my, the tether and the, the chain that I had to a bathroom and uh, just my ability to travel, my ability to do things, enjoy things where I wasn't always thinking about, am I okay? Is something going to happen that I'm not ready for? And um, that going away, that took less than 30, uh, less than 90 days. Uh, from me going carnivore. I went carnivore May 1st, 2018. Within so within a few months, I realized, hey, look, all these things that I'm stressed about, all these things I'm doing to prepare for the inevitable, <clears throat> I didn't need to do anymore. And it's been five years, over five years since that. So living free of that anxiety has been one of the, the biggest changes in my life. On top of that, from a physical performance perspective, from a feeling perspective, from feeling my age, you know, I was 40, almost 40 when I started this, this journey. I was 45 when I started carnivore and I just felt like I was 65, 70, 80 years old. I owned a CrossFit gym. I worked out all the time and I thought it was just my level of activity that was keeping me worn down. Uh, I was at a point where if I worked any more than, if I worked out any more than three days a week, I felt horrible. I had aches and pains and injuries and pulled hamstrings, torn meniscus, torn labrums, um, uh, torn calves. I, I just, one injury after another, one chronic pain after another, I just could never feel okay. I felt like I'm doing all this stuff to get in shape, but I'm always in pain and everything always feels bad. What's going on? Um, again, within about three to six months of going carnivore, everything changed. 
uh, I went from three days a week to being able to do five or six days a week of my CrossFit workouts and feeling absolutely great. The chronic issues of pain and the issues that I've been dealing with for years previously, not only did I not have any new things come up, but they all went away. The things that I had been dealing with, I no longer had to deal with. I didn't wake up in the morning and have to take 10 minutes to warm up just to start my day. I didn't have to warm up for 30 minutes before my workout and then stretch for 20, 30 minutes after my workout just so that I felt okay the next day or two days or three days. I could go in, do a quick general warm up, get ready for the work that I was going to do, do my workout, you know, do a cool down and go home and be ready to do that again the next day. And I felt fantastic. So not only did my quality of life improve by getting rid of the injuries, getting rid of the pain, the chronic issues, but I was able to actually improve even beyond where I was because I was able to actually train more and get the consistency back into my routine that I hadn't been able to do before uh, I changed the way I ate. So for me, the two biggest things were health and uh, performance. Well, I, I thought Richard would dive in there because you are birds of a feather because the training is, is a big part of your life. Um, but I think, isn't it funny that it has to happen to us, even though we're interested in fitness? You know, I've, I've been a personal trainer for a long time, and it was only when I really realized my health was going south that I, I got serious about research and i think yep. that's one of the things that is you know i'm i'm ashamed to say that I, I will be honest and it took me a long time i didn't start low carb until i was 50 uh and then keto and then carnivore when i was uh, 55 so now i'm 59 and i just look back and think my eyes should have been opened but we are saturated with such misinformation it's difficult to see through that that screen which is deliberate they they want to keep you ignorant of what you should be eating um so that's great did you want to ask a question rich no, I mean, ju just to add to there was something you just said there now that um, I think the reason that we do what we do is because we've been in that situation prior. I think if we were um, you know, thriving in our 30s and 40s, then maybe we wouldn't have made the decisions that we have now. So it's, you know, we look at these events as being unfortunate, but it's what it's what's made us the people that we are today. And because of that, we've learned and we are now able to teach others you know so they don't have to fall into the same pitfalls and make the same mistakes that we do um but yeah si similar story really i mean it um you know the three of us have come from massive ill health uh and, and improved you know health and well-being from from being carnivore you know i used to get gastro distressed uh, issues uh, i've worked with clients with severe ibs who have paid private and paid thousands and thousands of pounds uh for uh you know medicines to help and you know, the, the, the one thing that changed their life was two weeks of going carnivore, you know, and it's, it is as simple as that. When people think, what people quite, quite often ask me, what would you do for this? What would you, and it's the answer, it, it sounds boring, but it's almost always the same. It comes down to food and there are variances within this. And, and I think this is the reason why a lot of influencers um, who I do respect within the community seem to deviate from the message lately. I wonder if it's because you can't keep on saying, go and eat a steak. You know, it's the same message. And I think that they need to change um, the message they are giving for attention because they get paid well, for these, you know, these views, you know? Yeah. And that's, and that's the challenge when you have people who are trying to be influencers versus people who are trying to coach and help people. And again, I talk a lot about context and you've got to listen to where the people are coming from, what they're what their experience is and what their purpose is. So there's a lot of people out there in carnivore space and I, I you know, I'm not, not disparaging anybody, but I want everyone to understand that there are a lot of people in, in the carnivore community who are on YouTube or social media who are not doing this to help people. And you have to look at the background. You have to look at what these people are actually doing and track their message. Is their message consistent? Okay. Because here's what, here's the deal boring works best every single time. If you're not getting a consistent message and that message changes, or now there's a difference between I learned something new, so I need to make a tweak or change or nuance of what I'm saying, but the core value, the core basics and principles of what I'm saying should never change if you're really trying to do something that works. Okay, if you're just trying to keep up with the latest trend so that you can get good views and get your monetization on YouTube up, that's a whole different conversation. 
So, you know, boring works best. I like, I look at myself as a lighthouse, you know, I'm not going to attract everybody, but the people that need me are going to see the light. And then at some point in time, they're not going to need me because they passed me and now they're looking for the next thing in their journey. So I'm not going to go out and get in a boat and try to go all over the ocean and try to say something different and catch everybody's attention. I'm sticking my, 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 my flag in the sand and this is here for people when they need it. And that's how it should be for each of us. Yeah. And I think one of the things you'll find interesting and Rich doesn't even know this. I've not, not done this publicly, but when I decided that we should do a 24 hour live stream, Okay, I, th I think some people don't understand that everyone is giving their time up, but you know, there's no money changing hands, nothing's happening, and um, we're just doing it because we think it's great to get the word out there. Well, I had quite a few messages, and you won't believe this, that just didn't like what I was doing, and, and in essence, they were saying, uh, "How are you going to stretch out 24 hours saying just eat steak?" I, I had that, and no, I get that, I got that totally. And, um, you know, I would, I answered everybody. I said, well, <laughs> I agree with you, but it, it's not going to get people doing it. Yeah. You, you've got to be different. You've got to get out there and spread the word because someone that could survive from just eating steak needs to hear personal experiences, personal stories. They need yes. affirmation because they might be in a group where everybody is like, I used to be when I was 20. Oh, yep. Don't eat fat, man. You've got to have loads of carbs. So it, it, it is how you look at stuff. And and, and, I, and I think a lot of people just didn't believe that there was no monetary thing going on. Oh, sure. you're going to do 24 hours of your time. Now, the other thing is, and I defend it, and I, I said, look, the other side, you know, the, the anti-carnivore lot or the anti-low-carb uh, lot have money. They have loads of money. They can <laughs> yeah, they make do. beautiful yeah. videos, great advertising. They've got the media in their back pocket. The only way you can get some traction is to do something different, something unusual. We've had tons of comments saying, is this really going to be 24 hours? How are you doing? You know, so I think people have watched purely because no one's ever done a 24-hour live stream. And um, that's it. It's just trying to get the word out. Now, if at mm -hmm. the end of it, Let's say every single hour we get one person and, uh, you know, I did a, a success story recently. That one person then got all of his family. Yeah. You know, and that's it. You know, they're off medications. They haven't got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They're not got diabetes, right? Well, I can sleep at night with that. I can really sleep at night knowing that's Absolutely. happening. See, I'm getting a bit emotional now because I was there. I was coronary artery calcium scan 639 i was having a colonoscopy i had lower left quadrant pain i lost lost my mum to colon cancer i was in that ward after that colonoscopy thinking that's it i'm 49 i'm gonna die because it's yeah. genetics yeah. never once did i go maybe it was what i was eating because i didn't smoke i didn't drink and i didn't have red meat and i didn't eat fat so i'd done everything right and here i was tubby you know i was a personal trainer i was training people in the olympics to throw javelins you know see i was not a slouch and mm -hmm. anyway right so that's why we're doing it guys <laughs> so i've just maybe 20 emails there have just been dealt with in one one thing so we've got the word here <laughs> calling themselves saved and that's some, that's the other thing so saved that's implies awesome. they've done this and something's happened here's a question does number of ketones matter i i'm only able to get to 1.8 if fasting for more than 20 hours, normal day, just 0 0.2 to 0 0.5. And for those that are listening on the audio, Coach Bronson just shook his head. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, do they matter? What do you reckon? Yeah, ketones matter because we, you know, they're great, um, but having extra does what for us? So there's a couple, a couple of principles to think about, and that is one minimum effective dose. You know, we talk about that in medicine. We talk about that when applying solutions to things. And there's a certain amount that you need so your body can function. But anything over that, what's the point? If we look at ketones as excess fuel in the blood as being a good thing for some reason, I'm not sure why. But if we look at excess glucose in the blood, that's a bad thing. So in one hand, excess fuel is good. In one hand, excess fuel is bad. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, what makes sense to me is the processes that go into creating and utilizing the fuel. How well are those things functioning? And ketones doesn't tell us that if we're looking for high ketones. Lower ketones does tell us that. So 
in a lot of cases, when somebody is first getting started, high ketones, great. Your body's transitioning, you're adapting. Um, but you should expect to see those ketone numbers go down the more your body gets good at using them. If you are ingesting a lot of extra that your body can't use, then what's the point? Again, that's it's really like, I only need so much. Why am I going to put extra in? Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. So it also leads to thinking about this as a weight loss solution, not a lifestyle solution. So most of the time when people are looking at their ketones, it's because they want to be in optimal fat burning, right? How am I burning enough fat off my body? Well, how about let's look at how is your body working? Do you, are you building lean mass? How is your movement? Uh, do you have energy throughout the day? Uh, are the other aspects and, and we need to get away as much as possible from thinking about weight as being our metric for success. There are, it, just looking at, let's just say we talk about the medical, what we, we consider medical, right? The blood work. Let's, there's 15, 20, 30, 50, 100 different measures and metrics in blood work that you can look at to see if you're making an improvement. If we add in fitness and quality of life aspects, how well do you move? How well does your metabolism function? There's another 30 or 40 things that we can look at there from a, a things that we can look at. Are we getting better? Am I getting stronger? Am I getting more flexible? Can I move easily? Am I have aches and pains that are going away? Just looking at weight is looking at one symptom of a problem, not even looking at the problem itself. And you're focusing all of your decisions on that symptom. And instead of looking at what is causing the weight, what is causing the extra fat and then trying to deal with that. So um, long story short, no, ketones don't matter. Worry about how your body's actually functioning and you'll have a lot more success. Rich? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think there are situations um, I've noticed in regards to some of the athletes that we work with that um, increased ketones uh, may improve you know, uh, athletic performance. Um, there's other studies when we look at in increased ketones for, for cancers and things like that. But look, I was chasing ketone levels when I began my journey. Uh, my ketone level is, if I test it now, is probably 0 0.4, 0 0.5 if I'm lucky. And again, as Coach Bronson says, you know, initially the ketones are elevated, but the body uh, begins to utilize them as beta hydroxybutyrate and not waste them as acetoacetate and acetone. So your ketone levels drop. So what we see in the Facebook groups is people looking at their blood glucose and their ketone levels um, and chasing the ketone readings. And the ketone reading is, it doesn't mean anything. If you are uh, keto adapted, if you've been ketogenic for a long time or carnivore, um, your blood ketone levels are going to be lower. And this scares a lot of people. So a lot of people along their journey will test on the urine test strips uh, which is the first thing to, to go on. And I, I, I am an advocate of people using these because it does give them the indication initially if they are consuming the right foods. Because for us, I mean, we've, we, we're we seasoned Ketonians, if you like. Um, you know, we know exactly what foods. <laughs> Ketonians, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you can use that one. <laughs> um, you know, we've been living the lifestyle for a long time. We know exactly what affects our ketone levels, you know, we uh, our blood sugar. Um but early on in the journey, you know, I was consuming foods that, uh, you know, I deemed to be healthy that were detrimental to my health. Um, so it is it's a learning phase. And, and I think the, the urine strips are a way, um, a segue, if you like, into um, learning about which foods affect that. But yeah. they, they won't work for long. They won't work for long. The urine yeah. strips will begin to stop working. And then soon after, you know, you spend a fortune on, on a blood uh, ketone monitor and then these stop working because the ketone levels in your blood become lower and lower the best way as coach bronson says is how you move how you feel um you know if you were not consuming any of these foods that are detrimental to your health if you were not consuming foods that contain grains or foods that contain uh, uh seed oils or uh, foods that, that are high in linoleic acid if you were causing no glycation, no oxidative stress within your body and you feel amazing, does it really matter what your ketone levels are anyway? You know, and yep. it, it doesn't. It, no, I you, could not tell you what my ketone levels are because I have not tested for such a long time. Yeah, I think I tested just because I, I heard about it when I first got started for like three months and then I stopped. That was five years ago, right? Um, you just took the words right. I just wrote down a note that I was going to say, like, it doesn't matter. 
people that are for worried about testing, the only thing you really need to worry about testing is if you're doing something that might throw it off. So if you're not doing the things that you should be doing from a dietary perspective, then testing can be helpful because you know, okay, this is affecting, this is doing that, whatever. And like you said, from a learning perspective, it's trying to see as you make these changes in your life. But in general, if I'm putting 93 octane in my car, and that's the only thing I'm putting in my car, do I need to test my exhaust to see if 93 octane is what my car is using? <laughs> right? I'm not going to put 93 <laughs> octane, <laughs> test my exhaust, and it's going to come out and say, oh, you use 85. Like, no, if I'm putting 93 and that's all I'm doing, then what else is there to do? Why do I need to test it? Yeah, I mean, I think with the ketone Sorry. urine strips as well, I often say to people, because I do the, the phlebotomy side of things, you do realize that urine is waste. Okay, so whatever's on that strip is your body. I said, don't need those. So, yeah, it's telling you maybe you've got a lot of ketones and we're not using them. It doesn't doesn't really matter. What matters is is what's happening at the tissue level, level and yep. how you feel. I mean, it really is that simple. How you feel and how you act, how you look is – is better than numbers. So with that said, Scott Sider has got this. What advice would you give someone who has had success with, <laughs> look at this, rubbing his hands, uh, who has had success with carnivore and is thinking about becoming a coach? Well, I'll give you one bit of advice. Don't do a 24-hour live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Not right off the bat, at least. Um, okay, so this is fantastic. Uh I love this question because this is for me, this, I, I love, I am a coach's coach. I love working with coaches. I love helping other people help other people. Um, my passion and my long-term goal eventually is to have something in this realm where I'm doing coaches, coaching for coaches. Um, because I feel like as much as I can help an individual, as much as I can do challenges and programs and all that other kind of stuff, I'm limited in my ability to spread myself out and help people. So helping coaches who can do that again, right. Get that ripple effect going is what it's all about. Um, Scott, I think the, the biggest thing that you can do, number one, is just start telling your story. Okay. The imposter syndrome and people feeling like, well, I'm not, who's going to listen to me. I'm not polished. I'm not professional. Who cares? Okay. The biggest part of being a coach is being able to share your story find people that connect with that story and then help them through their journey. That's really all it is. So your story is going to be different than my story. It's going to be different than everybody else's story. So there's going to be people that be people that connect to it, start sharing your story. That doesn't mean become a YouTuber. That could just mean just talking to people that, you know, that could mean, uh, you know, when you meet people, when you're out. Okay. This is another, this is one that, that I see that I try to do all the time when you're out, and you're eating dinner and the waitress says, do you want your bun with your burger? And you say no. And they look at you weird. You could tell them why. Don't be afraid to share your story. That's that's the number one thing. From there, get as much information as you possibly can. Read all the books. Listen to all the YouTubes. Listen to all the, the different podcasts that are out there. Um, and then thirdly, start networking with people. Get involved in the community, get involved in events, go to all the, the conferences you possibly can go to, go to all the meetups, meet people, get to know other people that are doing it and expose yourself to the community more so that you can be in touch with what people need and it will help you find your message and how best you can help people out. What about you, Rich? Have you got any advice? Yeah, love that. It um, Again, it comes back to that vegan in the pub statement that you made earlier. Um, you know, I've almost been ostracized from friends and family sometimes when it comes to uh, events. You know, they, they'll go away on holiday or they'll go for a meal somewhere and I don't get invited. Um, and the reason being is that, you know, I probably preach a little bit too much. Um, and, and I think that some of this, again, comes down to them feeling, feeling un uncomfortable because if I... For example, I used to get invited to to go to the pub with a few friends. Um, I used to drink an awful lot. So I don't know if, if Coach Bronson knows this, but I, I used to come home from work and I would drink a glass of wine. One glass led into two. Two is nearly a bottle, so it was a bottle. And then before long, it was two and then three bottles. So I was drinking up to three bottles of wine a night or a litre of whiskey. Um, technically an alcoholic, um, although, you know, I didn't feel that I... I 
I wasn't, you know, I had a professional job. I wasn't, you know, a, a bum drinking on the side of the road, you know, but yeah. technically from the unit, I was alcoholic, but I don't drink anymore. So when it came to going out for drinks with friends, I would drink at the time, uh, you know, a lot of coffee. Uh, as most of us do, as we gravitate into keep on carnival. So I'd sit there with my coffee and cream uh, and I'd feel content and happy, but they would feel uncomfortable. Why aren't you drinking a beer? Have a beer. I've bought you a beer. Use the beer. I don't want the beer. You know, I, or do you want some whiskey or something? I don't want it. Yeah. Um, they'd, they'd order a plate of chips uh, or, you know, whatever. You know, have one. I don't want it. You know, oh, you must want it. I don't want it. Um, why would I? And, and then... It gives me a stage and to, to say, you know, do you understand that these foods contain this, this, and this? This food contains, you know, it's, it's high in lectins or it's cooked in these mm -hmm. seed oils. This is this is the damage it causes. So that almost gives me a stage then to, you know, to, 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 to spout off. But I, if I eat out, I make a point of going into the restaurant uh, and when the waiter, waitress comes up to me and asks me what I'd like, the first question is, what do you cook in? Uh, and it's always vegetable oil. So I'll say that I'm allergic to vegetable oil. Um, you know, I'll make a point of telling them that, uh, you know, vegetable is detrimental to your health. Uh, so I'm all getting up on my, so coming back to the point you made about every opportunity of, of telling people and spreading that word, um, you know, it has had a negative impact in regards to friendships and, you know, and, and family events, but I thrive on that because that's what drives me forward. I make a point, people will say, oh, one won't hurt. I don't want the beer. I don't want to eat you know mm -hmm. th that burger or, or those fries or chips or whatever whatever it may be um i'm ha so i like making that point and making that stand so that's a, a a really that's a highly important point that i think is is worth making you need to almost be that i know steven said you don't be that vegan at the bar i am that anti-vegan at the bar then if you like you know telling everybody that i'm keto um you know i've i, I usually my number plate on my car, which I've sold recently to put into the business, was Keto. The, the license plate number was K77ETO. Um, I had Keto. <laughs> keto to the core. Um, you know, I walk around with Keto all, strapped all over me. And, um, you know, I try to scream it as much from the rooftops as I can. And I think that's really important because it comes back yeah. to this ripple effect. Um, you know, this is the best way to, 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 to press it forward, pass it forward, it? pay it forward um people will become jealous you'll begin to and they won't believe it because you need carbs for energy you need carbs to build muscle you need fiber in your diet etc and then we begin to improve our health and well-being year after year after year we begin to run faster than these runners who are carb runners we begin to cycle harder and faster we whatever it may be we begin to lift more in the, in, in the gym um we begin to start looking younger you know all of these things over time it sinks in and i think through sheer um grit and attrition you know we'll 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 wear them down one by one but it does come it does come at a price but look i'm fortunate well, enough to be surrounded sorry go on yeah yeah i was gonna say it, it 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 comes at a price but i think that price is worth it because there's a couple things that happen when you believe in something well, and that's part of the part of the process is you have to believe in something enough to put yourself out there so if you act, if you're looking to be a coach to answer the question, if you're looking to be a coach, the first thing you have to do is really understand, am I willing to take a stand for what I believe? That's the first question, because you're going to have people who, who challenge your thought process, who challenge the information and challenge you. So part of the process of being a coach, and I've been coaching for almost for a little over 12 years. And, you know, even now there are things sometimes where I'm like, am I right? You know, so being willing to evaluate your own belief system and exactly. the things that you've interpreted and the information that you have, but then also say, look, these are the principles of values and the, the concepts that I've that I've established as the basis for my decisions, my protocols, my methods. Do they still work? Yes, they still work. Am I validated by this, that or the other thing? And when someone challenges that, being able to explain and say, look, even even if you don't get into a debate with someone else being comfortable to, to be able to in that internal debate. Why do I believe this? Is this something that is still passionate for me and that I will still want to help people with? So being willing to go through that process, I think is a big part of coaching. Yeah. I think it's the why that makes you cry, mate. Do you remember? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yep. Yeah. You've got, you've got to be uh, passionate definitely. Um, and I like the way that leads into the next question because 
evaluating what you believe, and I'm going. I think I might be out on a limb here uh, against you two. Uh, Bishop's deep learning has put stretching is a scam, just like mm -hmm. toothpaste. So I'm not going to get into the second part of that. Uh, <laughs> I used to... Why not? It's a conspiracy. <laughs> I'm, I used to be a big fan of stretching, and I have got into the science, and I am completely against stretching now. Uh, a jokey thing that one of my instructors taught me was um, if a tiger came into this room, you would not say to the tiger, hang on a minute, I've just got to stretch my quads. All right, you would run. So we we designed that way. And when I was in soccer, and I've got an FA coaching badge, a football association coaching badge, um, more injuries happened in the warm-up than actually in the game. And it, mm -hmm. it seemed like stretching actually seemed to be detrimental. And I've, I found that with my own training. Uh, when I go into a session now, I don't stretch. So that's com a complete 180 for me. And that's why that that is on there. I don't think Bishop's Deep Learning has ever seen me before, but I do mention <laughs> that I, I am not. I'm not into stretching. I don't think it's 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 good. I understand why people think it is. Uh, this is different to visualization and practicing. That's different. You know, if you go onto the football field and you haven't kicked a ball about, you might be the sort of person that needs to do that and that needs to stand at the edge of the penalty box and have a shot into the top corners and just get your eye in. You know, I get that. But what I, I'm talking about is sort of the stretching that is prescriptive. Uh, you've got to stretch before you do your workout. You have got to. And I don't think that's that's true necessarily. So I'd love to know, because you're both, I mean, you know, you're both at the top of your game when it comes to training. What are your views on stretching? Yeah, um, you're mostly right. I think the the last five to 10 years, a lot of the, the studies and information coming out about stretching has been opposite of what I was trained initially. Um, you know, I was always told from the earliest I can remember is, you know, in your warm up, you're stretching to get ready to work, right? You're, you're getting your body ready. And that's in general, that's what a warm up is for. But the stretching should be dynamic because you're getting ready to do work. And then at the end, you're stretching to increase range of motion. You're warmed up, your synovial fluids out, your body's all warm, you got blood pumping, you can increase range of motion at the end of the workout. Um, and again, what a lot of the science is showing, a lot of the studies are coming out now is saying that the benefit of stretching in some cases is a net negative to performance. And in most cases, it's probably a net zero. It really doesn't make any difference from an injury perspective or performance perspective. So um, I would agree with you there. I do think there are some cases for stretching um, from a proprioception perspective for beginners, especially just and building that habit of doing something. There's some people who can't work out, right? I, I'm not at a point where I can spend 38, 30 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day in the gym. I don't know what I'm doing. So, hey, maybe your initial entry into a fitness routine is 15 minutes of stretching, just moving your body, building that mind-muscle connection, learning how your body works, learning what positions there are, understanding how to move your joints in your body, that kind of thing. So I think that can be beneficial. Um, from a general perspective of stretching, my over the past few years, I've pretty much gone into the your stretching should be movement focused in the work that you're doing. That's kind of where I look at. So you should be looking at getting maximal range of motion when you're doing your exercises. And that should be your stretch because if you're doing functional movement, then your range of motion in those movements is also going to be functional. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for quality of life and mobility and, and physical independence as we get older. And that means functional movement. So doing a lot of uh, stretching just for stretching sake. Um, I haven't seen a lot of, uh, a lot of benefit from that in the long term. Um, and I've seen more mobility and that's another, another aspect of it. A lot of people get the, the word mobility confused with flexibility. Mobility is flexibility plus strength. So if you wanna get range of motion and get strong in all those different positions, then there has to be some resistance or some stress in that equation. So doing the combination of range of motion while you're doing your weight training, while you're doing your exercises under stress is going to do a lot more for you than just building flexibility. Rich, any views? Yeah, completely agree. I don't stretch. Um, my warm up before the bench press is a lighter bench press. <laughs> um, I don't stretch before I go for a run. 
I go for a jog before I run. You know, if I'm going on the bike, um, I'll spin at a higher cadence on the bike. So you warm up the muscle that you're getting ready to use, uh, but I don't stretch. Um, you know, the research shows that stretching, especially for explosive movements, reduces the amount of power output uh, within that movement. So if you're a sprinter and you're stretching your legs, you are losing power in your sprint. Uh, same thing with uh, sprinters on the bike or, or anything that's power related yeah. for that matter. So I don't do any stretching. Yeah. And I would add a lot of the, I think there was a study I, saw, I read a couple of years ago or an article, something I read a couple of years ago about hamstring injuries in soccer, or I should say football for you guys. Yes. Um, absolutely. <laughs> and that is uh, they determined that like 80% of the injuries or more than 80% of the injuries that are hamstring pulls in soccer are not because of tightness. They're because of weakness. So the injuries that we've commonly attributed to not being stretched out, not being warmed up are really not that at all. It's a weakness. It's, it's the strength of the activity, the, the, the muscle's ability to, to hold its tensile strength and keep its integrity under stress. It's not that they overextended their knee, right? If you look at anybody, if you look at anybody in sports who pulls a hamstring and watch when they pull the hamstring, their knee is bent. They're not fully stretched out, right? That muscle is not at its maximum length. So it's not an issue of strength of, of, of stretching or length of the muscle. It's an issue of strength in that muscle to hold that pressure. So uh, if you want to avoid those types of injuries, get stronger. Don't get more flexible. Mm. Now we've got a question. It says to Coach Stephen, I got all excited. Someone wants to know the answer from me. And the question is, do you work with older patients, 65 plus? And if so, what have you noticed from them switching carnivore? And then they added this. Sorry, I meant coach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, but, yeah, uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's a question. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm a little bit facetious with these sort of questions because yeah. I say, yeah. Because when they were 64, they were very, very different to when they were 65. But, yeah, um, we're talking older populations sure. in, in general over 65. Sure. The, the, nothing changes. It's the same. If, if you're 35, you're going to see benefit. If you're 65, you're going to see benefit. And they're all the same things. It's just a matter of degree. Uh, Greg Glassman, the founder of CrossFit, uh, is quoted, and I'm going to get this quote completely wrong, but uh, the needs of a grandmother and the needs of an Olympic athlete are the same. They just vary by degree. So we all need the same things. We need more muscle. We need less fat. We need less inflammation. We need more uh, metabolic flexibility. We need all these things. It's the same thing we all need. So for somebody who's in their 60s, and, and I'll use my mom as an example. So I've been working with my mom for almost 10 years. She got started on her journey at 60 years old. Okay, I started personal training her. She joined my CrossFit gym. We started doing a bunch of stuff. She went carnivore about four years ago. She just turned 69. Since she went carnivore, with the combination of strength training, she's reversed osteoporosis. She's re lowered, she's hypothyroid. She's lowered her, uh, her thyroid medication. She's increased bone density, increased strength. Like the, the physical independence that she has right now at 69 years old is far and above where she was in, in her 40s, okay? So her favorite thing to do is deadlift. She loves working out. When she can't work out, she gets depressed. Uh, she It's absolutely amazing to see the things that have happened for her um, as a small frame woman who started out not doing anything her entire life. She didn't do any fitness in her life until she was 60 years old. And now uh, we're, having, we're actually having a conference next week in our, in our area, and she's speaking on the journey and what it's been like for her to go through this process. So uh, if you're 60s, if you're in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you're just getting started and you're doing carnivore, number one thing is don't get caught up in the minutia. Just keep it simple. And it really is, like you guys said, eat more meat, move your body, get more sleep. Those are the big three things, okay? So uh, it will make a difference if you're looking at increasing bone density, if you're looking at increasing lean mass and fighting sarcopenia, which is probably the number one thing that you need to be worried about over 60, is keeping your lean muscle as high as possible so that you can maintain in the physical independence, um, then this is a great way to go. Rich? Yeah, just touching base on um, uh, 
the sarcopenia sort of a thing there. I mean, we um, we're told as we age that uh, you know muscle wastage is a fact of life and osteoporosis. Osteoporosis can be reversed uh, with protein. When we look at uh, bone, uh, bone is mineralized protein. That's protein and minerals. Uh, what do we consume lots of on a ketogenic carnivore lifestyle? Lots of protein and minerals. <laughs> Um, you can not only stop osteoporosis in its tracks, but you can reverse osteoporosis. And part of um, building bone or the absorption of calcium within the bone is directly correlated with uh, the consumption of sodium. We can't send calcium into the bone without increasing sodium consumption. Uh, again, you know, another thing that we, we consume lots of within uh, the keto carnivore community. And another thing that goes against, literally it goes against the grain. You know, we're told to avoid uh, consuming high amounts of sodium. Sodium is essential for life protein is essential cholesterol and and, uh, and fats you know are essential for life um so age just a number and i think you know you guys have all shown that i'm a little bit younger than than the two of you but i'm i'm nearly 40 um and i'd like to think that i don't look it <laughs> no comments please no you look um, about 50 but, yeah thanks, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> well, come on seven and a half hours Eight, seven hours and three quarters and you know i think we're absolutely flying to be honest i mean we've been yeah, non-stop I was joking. and i'm i'm still feeling full full of energy um mm -hmm. my bum isn't dead yet you've been st fair play so I, I may have to do some stand a little bit later on but it must be all this uh transitioning from bodybuilding into cycling this uh this um hardened my uh my bum because uh yeah i'm still going strong but it, uh, I wanna, well, age is just a number. Yeah, I want to so, add to that, and that is, um, if I can remember, because because that question just popped up, and now I totally forgot what I wanted to talk about. Don't you hate <laughs> when you have a thought on your head? You have a thought, and you're like, oh man, um, oh yeah. You, you we talked about you know amino acids and protein is required for building muscle and or, and bone, right? That is one aspect. But even for bone, and I think a lot of people don't realize this is your body still needs a stimulus in order to make the change happen. You have to tell your central nervous system, you have to tell your body, I'm doing more than I've done before. So now that you're getting all this extra protein, here's what I want you to do with it. Okay. And that goes for muscle growth. We have to stimulate the muscle so that our body 100%. says, Hey, we need to add more muscle fiber. We need to add density. We need to add myofibrils, whatever it is. But the same thing happens for bone density. If you're not stressing the bone structure, the bone structure is not going to grow. It's not going to get stronger. So Resistance training is also a requirement for reversing sarcopenia. You've got to get your body, put some stress on your bones, and move some weight. Absolutely. Uh, and, and this and, doesn't have to be lifting weights, does it? I mean, this could be body weight exercises, absolutely. banded exercises. Yep. You know, we're not talking about, you don't have to hit the gym if, if that's something that you're, you know, fearful of. You can do these exercises at home, you know, plain and simply. And you don't have to do an awful lot. You know, we think that um, from the days of, you know, the, the bodybuilders like Arnold Schwarzenegger and things, you know, the, spending four or five hours in the gym, anything beyond an hour, in my opinion, is is negative. 45 minutes to me is optimal because we raise cortisol. Cortisol is catabolic. Get in the gym or at, at home, do your body weighted exercises, do your band exercises, whatever it may be. You don't have to do an awful lot to, to stimulate the muscle protein synthesis. But yeah, yeah completely agree. And the thing is, I mean, you're evidently sort of into the high performance uh, athletic arena but i just want to add a little um a much broader statement that any improvement on your health is good so if you can't get out of a chair okay getting out of a chair is an intense exercise for you all right yeah you can I'm go glad you said that yeah you can be sitting in a chair and i i actually had this a woman with a zimmer frame sitting in a chair and she said my well this is really sad sorry maybe i'm getting emotional uh and she, she said to me, my world has just shrunk. You know, I, I can remember her saying, the NHS has given up on me and my world is just these four walls. Absolutely pitiful. Lovely woman, bright, you know, wrote poetry for a local magazine and all this sort of stuff. Well, six months later, she's not got the Zimmer frame. She was bent over like this. She was straight now, walking out into the garden, you know, uh, to the point where uh, you're both, get this because i'm sure you've had people like this that you've coached well i want to walk to the end of the street this is the person that couldn't even get out of a chair you know yep. so um 
your horizons start to get better. The oldest, and that was a very old person, that was in their 70s, the oldest person I've actually trained and seen a remarkable difference to was, was 89, and uh, he came to me. I do rehab in this room as well, with a little bit of um, spinal manipulation, all this sort of stuff. Anyway, he came in, and his son had to bring him in. He was old school. He didn't want to take painkillers. He had a handkerchief in his mouth because he was in that much pain uh, and uh, basically could hardly get out of his car. So anyway, a little bit of manipulation, talk about diet, stuff like that. Six months later, I'm walking in the park with my wife, Jane, and uh, I said, look, that's Doug. That's that client. No cane, bolt upright, doo -doo -doo, walking in the park, 90, right? Uh, and I said to him, whoa, Doug, it's me, Stephen, remember? Bright as a button. Yeah, yeah, you sorted my back out. I mean, yeah, okay, um, what have you been doing? And he said, oh, it's my 90th birthday yesterday, and I've just played nine holes of golf, right? That's awesome. So you haven't got to look like a bag of walnuts. You know, you haven't got to look like that. We're just talking daily functions, a little yep. bit extra if you want to, walking in the park, walking yep. your dog, enjoying the beach. All of that is exercise. It's not. It's movement. It's living. You know, it's yeah. being out. I, it's living. And that's the thing that I want everyone to understand is the, the fitness routine that you develop for yourself or the things that you start doing to improve your fitness should be based on the vision you have for how you want your life to look. Right? If you just want to be able to go for a walk, play with your grandkids and do some gardening without feeling like crap, then do the things that make that easy. You don't need to worry about going and running a 5K. You don't need to worry about lifting 300 pounds. You don't need to do all this stuff. What can I do? I want my life to be walking with my husband or my spouse, playing with my grandkids and gardening three days a week. What do I need to do? I need to walk. I need to learn how to get up and down off the floor with no problem. And then I need to, to figure out how I can do the things outside for gardening. What are the things that, that that requires and make those things easy? It's about taking the things that are limiting you and slowly removing them from your life. It doesn't have to be this giant expectation of, of what you see on Instagram or what you see you, me, or, or anyone else doing. It's it's 100% based on what life do you want to live. Yes, that's great. Now, this name... Primal Mike. Primal. Oh my! I know so Mike. It's, it's Primal Mike, and he's got Raw in the middle of his name, which is very clever. Uh, to put on weight in brackets, mostly muscle, on kind of a, is there a protein limit above which there is a diminishing result in muscle build rate, and I should increase fat instead? Great question. Okay. Uh, yes, there is always there's always a point where you're going to get more than you need. Uh, the, the process of finding that, uh, if you want a rough number from what I've seen, and maybe this is something you guys can corroborate, or maybe you've seen something different, uh, somewhere around 1.2 to 1.25 grams per pound of lean mass is about where I've seen people max out on what they need in order to get optimal growth. Anything above 1.25 is probably too much, uh, too much in meaning it's not really doing much for you. Uh, and I think there's some studies, I think Menno Henselsman had some stuff out where he did a meta-analysis about that. I think it was around 1.2 as well. Um, basically, you want to find what I call your protein threshold. Start at a number. And I like to start people at one gram per pound of lean mass. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you're 25% body fat, you want to get in 150 grams of, of protein per day. Uh, start there. Am I gaining? Am I losing? Is my performance good? How am I getting stronger? Whatever performance metrics you want to have if you're trying to build muscle, build athletic performance. If you feel like, okay, I'm good, but I think I could do better, go to 1.1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, something like that. Slowly bump it up till you get to a point where even if I keep going higher, nothing is improving faster. And then you can bring it back down and try to find that thing. So it's a process of experimentation. Add a little bit, see if you notice a difference. If you're not noticing a difference, you can bring it back down um, and just playing with those numbers. But again, on average, I think it's about 1.2 to 1.25 is what I've seen for most people. You can ask me, no, you're on mute, Steve. <laughs> Rich, you must have. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it that, that seems like a sensible number. Um, I mean, looking at the research that I've carried out over the years, 0.5 is minimum to maintain. Around 0.82 grams is what's required to build. At one gram per pound, which Coach Bonson mentioned, is, is what I, I generally you know tell people, which is what we mentioned earlier. Um, around no, uh, one gram per pound for men, around 0.9 for, for women. Um, I'm considerably higher than that, being carnivore. Um, but yeah, that makes perfect sense. About what 1.25 sounds about right. I would say a perfect start with with one gram per pound. It's nice and simple, uh, and exactly as Coach Bonson says, if we you weigh 150 pound, that's 150 grams of protein. I wouldn't be fearful of going over protein. Um, the fear of gluconeogenesis pulling you from a ketogenic state is a myth. Um, that's not going to happen. We can go into more detail than that if if you want to. But don't fear your protein. Do not fear your fat. We need protein and fat to increase muscle protein synthesis. Uh, we can build muscle with just protein alone. We need leucine to activate mTOR around three grams, give or take. Um, but carbohydrates do not further increase muscle protein synthesis at all. So the co-ingestion of carbs does not increase muscle protein synthesis when adequate protein is consumed. Um, but protein with fat does increase muscle protein synthesis. So a ketogenic carnivore lifestyle will build muscle quicker than, uh, than protein and carbs. Um, so look at nature. Nature provides us with everything that we need, the perfectly packaged present, if you like, uh, protein combined with fat. Sorry, it's the bell, my end. Um, <laughs> yes. <yeah, so laughs> um, you know, an egg is protein and fat. A steak is protein and fat. Chicken with the skin on is protein and fat. Eat food as nature intended. And, you know, people will come back and, well, you know, when I've built the muscle, what about building uh, or cutting down on body fat and, and maintaining this lean mass? Then it's a case of, of experimenting and reducing the body fat, the dietary fat ever so slightly. The less dietary fat we consume, the more body fat that we're going to to uh, you know to, to to burn or utilize for fuel. Um, there is no figure with this. Everybody is 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 independent and individual, and you know you have to find that number for yourself. But around one gram per pound is a perfect place to start. I'll leave you cat. I'll leave you chat on a second while I go find out who's ringing the bell there. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would add to that is that is the other thing too is is um, what is the impetus for putting on weight? You know, Mike, Mike is asking this about weight and should he increase fat if the protein isn't working? Uh, there there are some cases where overall weight is needed. I deal with a lot of women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who have been starving themselves for 30 years, and they're at a great body fat percentage. They're super lean, but they're 15, 20 pounds underweight because they just have not been feeding themselves enough for so long. So when I look at them and say, you need to increase your protein and your fat, they kind of, their head explodes because they're like, well, but I don't want to gain any weight. Well, guess what? You need to gain weight. So we're upping your fat and your protein because you need more fat and you need more and you need more muscle. Um, so that is a case. Most people really don't need to worry about gaining overall weight. They just need to gain lean mass. So that's just something to be mindful of. Yes, brilliant. Um, I mean, now he's away, we could talk about him, but let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So um, oh, all capitals. So should I shout this one? A.K.A. Yes. Zins. Insomniac, right. okay. Yeah, question. My mum has arterial fibrillation. Hey, fib. uh, can she do the Carno diet? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, just it's a little bit different. You got to it's a lot more experimentation with with electrolytes and activity and the things that have to that you have to do. But in general, I haven't seen anybody that has a fib that hasn't been able to do it. Excellent. Uh, we're coming to the end of your hour, but I'm trying to get these questions in. Uh, there you are. Yeah, there's Richard is back, hey. which is great. Uh, who was at the door? It was my wife. So I'm in the uh, shop. So this is where I do. Yeah, so she's um, she's busy. So the shop is closed today, um, but she's busy working as always. I mean, when you work for yourself, I don't think there's ever a day off, is it? Um, we work seven days a week, so she's she locked herself out. Um, she was in the bin <laughs> and the door closed behind us. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's Bishop, super exciting. Bishop's Deep Learning, who has uh, got a few questions through, which there you go. Uh, Coach Bronson, do you get resistance towards eating only meat from your clients, and how do you handle this? Um, no, I don't force anything. So, it's, it's there's a there's there's a sustainability and meeting somebody where they're at is always more important 
than getting in someone to do something the way that I do it. So there's the principles and the concepts that we talked about before. The principles of what makes carnivore successful is the goal. So carnivore is successful because it eliminates, it eliminates, eliminates processed food, it eliminates seed oils, it eliminates carbs, it eliminates the sugar. It does all these things, right? So taking all those things out is part of the process. The level at which we do those things to start somebody out may be different. So I may have someone come in who's completely, oh no, not Dr. Sarah. Hi. I may have someone who's coming in who's completely standard American diet, where if I go to them and say, hey, we're going to switch you overnight from sad to carnivore, they're going to quit day one. So for them, it may be, let's get the first principle in line and let's say, hey, let's just stop eating bread out of a box or a bag. If it's processed, that's step number one. And then go from there over a period of time and understanding that this is a process and uh, maybe it's not even doing any of that. Maybe it's keep eating everything that you're currently eating. Let's just increase the amount of red meat that you have. So everyone's going to be different, but we're, we're trying to get people to understand and follow the principles and the concepts of why these things work, not fit within a specific methodology or protocol. Brilliant. Coach Brunson and Dr. Sarah Zaldivar. Yeah, I've got her name right. You know what you're right. You <laughs> I were both on, <laughs> you were both on the reverse TV series. Um, just while you're swapping the baton, that's okay. You, and we've got you both here. Firstly, uh, Dr. Sarah, do you know Richard? Absolutely. Yes. I had him over on my YouTube channel. It's one of the best oh. interviews ever. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Besides you need mine. To too. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, reverse, the reverse thing that you're both on. I mean, do, do you want to share something about doing that? Did you think it was worthwhile? And oh, have you seen a difference? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll go just go real quick. I think first of all, getting to meet Dr. Sarah was fantastic. So that was that was that was very fun. Uh, for me, I think the biggest thing about Reversed was um, outside of my personal experience of getting to meet all these people and getting to build those relationships, which was fantastic. But just seeing that um, much like what I just said, where it's about concepts and principles, we all have our own little nuances, our own context, our own backgrounds and experiences that make us talk about things differently than each other. But that's what makes this powerful. And I wanted to say this earlier, Stephen, when you're talking about, can we talk 24 hours about just eat meat? Yes, we can, because it's not about eating meat. It's about relating to other people and all the different stories that we all have that bring people to what it means to eat meat. So it's not eating meat isn't the message of this 24 hours. The message no. of this 24 hours is that no matter who you are, where you come from, this can help you move forward. And that's probably the biggest thing that I got is, you know, I eat a little, you know, I have some things that Dr. Sarah and I probably don't agree on. There's some things that Kelly Hogan and I, there's some things that Dr. Barry or Dr. Kiltz or Dr. Chafee or Bella or Emily, who I, you had on earlier, you know, all these different people, we have little nuances and things that we do differently, but it all comes down to eat meat, don't eat crap, move your body and get sleep right? That's the, those are the four main things. If you do those things, 90% of your problems are going to go away. Absolutely. What about you, Dr. Sarah? Yeah, I likewise, um, Coach Bronson, like I just was so happy to meet everybody in person because I had interviewed pretty much everybody there. Like we knew one another digitally. And so to see them in person was really cool. And everybody was so kind and friendly and uplifting um and so it was really my first time actually meeting everybody in person so that was really really um fun and it exceeded my expectations and then just the fact that we got together in the first ever show on carnivore diets is something huge i think and hopefully this will mark the beginning of more to come you know just bigger better more carnivore programming so that we reach the whole world. I mean, you know, imagine the diseases that we can reverse, imagine the lives that we can impact if we remember our species specific diet, you know? Brilliant. So Coach Brunson, uh, thank you for doing your hour shift. Much appreciated. Uh, the yeah, lovely Dr. Yeah, well, 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 pleasure to meet you. 
Absolutely. Thanks. Nice meeting you guys. And next time I got to do like two or three hours. This was not long. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, when I, when I came up with this stupid idea, I thought, oh, 24 hours, how are we going to feel that? Uh, and honestly, we could have done this for for three days, couldn't we, Rich, already? Yeah, yeah for sure. Chafee didn't really want to go. Dr. Kiltz is already beyond. I can come back if you want. You know, seriously, uh, um, the, the questions, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. So that's really, really great. So, yeah, so, so thank you for doing it. And we, we'll guys. definitely do yeah. something again. Thank you, Coach. Hey, take Dr. Him, Sarah, take it easy on them, all right? I'll try. All right. See you guys. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. That's fine. So, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, for those that don't know you, would you like to give yourself a little introduction? Sure. Um, so I'm a nutrition professor at Miami-Dade College. Um, I uh, am a classically trained dietitian. So I grew up in Lebanon. I got my bachelor's and my master's um, in nutrition and dietetics over there. And I did, you know, the whole year long internship being uh, brainwashed <laughs> into the high carb, low fat um, guidelines and, you know, became a licensed dietitian. And then um, I flew to Miami and I got my doctorate from the University of Miami in exercise physiology and nutrition. And I spent five years out of that doctorate researching and doing my dissertation on sugar addiction. And I did that for, you know, five years between literature review and, you know, collecting the data and then defending the dissertation. And even with that, I was still in denial with regards to the addiction. I was still... I literally wrote a keto dessert cookbook <laughs> after I defended my dissertation on sugar addiction. So um, that was like the academic background. I also worked with the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, and they uh, so basically they hired me in order to train potential personal trainers to become certified with the ACSM, which is the hardest one to get. So I would conduct like intensive three day workshops, um, teaching the basics of what, like, what are the things you got to do in order to pass that exam from the first try? Cause the, the passing rate was pretty low. So, you know, I've taught for ACSM. I've taught at the university of Miami at Miami Dade college, DeVry university, um, nutrition courses and also exercise physiology courses. And all throughout that whole period of time, I am, also struggling with binge eating, sugar addiction. Um, I've struggled with weight all my life. And so eventually, um, through enough personal research, realized that everything I was taught was wrong. <laughs> and so um, I did keto. And after seven days of keto, I felt like my brain came back online. And uh, that's when I was sold. And I was doing keto for anxiety first. It wasn't even for body composition. And then I realized, like, wait a second. I started dropping weight like crazy. It's like, okay. <laughs> and then from there, though, um, I still struggled with binge eating. And every time I would go through an episode like that, I would, um, as a reaction to that episode, to try and prevent that from happening in the future, I would watch more podcasts on the topic. I would go buy books. I would do research um, on PubMed and Google, like uh, Google Scholar and all of like scientific, peer, like whichever place I could get my hands on data, I was doing that. So I became like the, the, the master researcher. I mean, I've always been a nerd. Like I've always, like I wouldn't even, they wouldn't, make me do my final exams throughout school because I was always at the top of my class. I was like, she doesn't need to, <laughs> to do her final exams. We know she's just going to do well. So it's like for me, collecting information and nerding out came easy to me. And so, uh, but still, even with that, it took like thousands of hours, I would say, of like so many books and so many podcasts and so many articles reading until finally it clicked for me. And I realized that um, everything I thought I was taught was wrong and then and keto wasn't enough and addiction is real and there are plant toxins and carnivore is our species specific diet and it's been a long journey basically and hopefully um, what I try to do is try to bridge that uh, gap and try to help my students at Miami Dade and also my clients try to get them from point A to point B in like a few months as opposed to decades which is what it actually took me. 
Fabulous. That's a fabulous introduction. I think that's the best one we've had so far, Richard. But I'm not really allowed to say that because every guest has been fabulous. <laughs> the best. Sure. Hashtag the best. Don't <laughs> <laughs> dare take that away from me. <laughs> I, I couldn't take that away from you after you saying that uh, my interview was the best that you've ever done. So, yeah, I agree. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I knew that's what I was doing. That, that's recorded, so that's going on air. I'm, I'm, I'm re, yeah. reusing that and repurposing that again and again. <laughs> so, um, we had some yeah. questions submitted beforehand. Yeah. Um, excuse my bad reading, but this one is from Jenny, who's been kind of all five months, uh, cut out dairy recently, and she's asked, um, can she eat ground beef and eggs long term and get all the nutrients that she needs? Yeah, I think we have enough people doing that for decades and they're thriving to know that, yeah, you totally can. Um, it's a good idea just because we don't have thousands of people that have been studies and randomized control trials or like, you know, very high quality scientific studies. We don't have this data just yet because nobody has bothered to study our species specific diet for some reason. <laughs> um, it's a good idea to just uh, get a nutrient panel just to see where you're at. I know that um, Michaela Peterson um, was doing a, a lion diet for a very long time and it turns out like folate levels were low. But even even with that, like I would see and look for symptoms as opposed to just having the blood test marker. So um, you could get those labs, check for symptoms, or you can just to be on the safe side, take organ supplements, or if you do enjoy eating organs, you could do that. But we, we know, and I think we all in this community have uh, a very good knowledge of so many people who are doing, um, you know, just meat and eggs for decades and no nutrient deficiencies, no scurvy. Um, and if anything, it's like, it's not like they're not dying. They're actually thriving. So, you know, and it would make sense, right? It is our species specific diet. That is the diet that we ate for 99.99% um, .99 of our existence as a species here on earth. Yeah, that's cool. Rich, have you got um, something to add to that? Yeah. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? No, of no. course. You can share um, your screen. Let me see if I can uh, do this again now because it didn't. Took me a bit of thing last time, didn't it? It worked That's earlier, fun. mate. There we are. Oh, by the cool. way, that Can question's so good. Sean Baker's coming on in a, in a couple of hours, and I'm going to ask him that very basic question because I think that was a great answer, Dr. Sarah. And I might actually answer, ask a few people that because there are there is that common worry. I'm giving you some time, by the way, Rich, while you sort your screen. I'm, re I'm ready. I, th I think you, you need right. to okay the screen, do you? Um, it's, it's sharing my end, but it's ready to All go right. whenever you are. Yeah, I think um, that's what the, all I was going to say was a lot of people worry about not getting enough nutrients. Yeah. Strange when they're on this processed, sad diet that's <laughs> deplete of anything. Right. You, know, um, you know, so let's get your let's get your screen share. So the t two two slides to this. One is taken from si the Seiku Cow book by. Um, um, oh my goodness, I can't remember his name. Uh, and the other is uh, is from um, Paul Saladino's book, um, yeah. The Carnival Code. Uh, now, if you look at the amino profile on the left, instantly we can see the amino profile is far superior in animal proteins compared to, to plant proteins. And the slide on the right where we look at blueberries and kale compared to animal proteins uh, in the case of uh, ribeye, beef liver, fish roe and an egg yolk. Just by looking at that slide on the right hand side, we can instantly see that there's a massive um, increase in, uh, in micronutrients in, in, in every aspect. Uh, and, and when we break it down, I mean, we look at vitamin A, Vitamin A does not exist in plants. I think we covered this in our talk, didn't we, when I was on with you, uh, Sarah? But, uh, uh, no vitamin A in plants. Uh, plants contain beta carotene, which is a precursor. Uh, it needs to be acted upon by an enzyme called BCMO to convert it into the active form of retinol. So no vitamin A. B vitamins incredibly low. Cobalamin does not exist in plants. Contrary to popular belief, vitamin C does exist in animal proteins. Vitamin D you cannot get from plants. You get this from the sun and from animal proteins. Uh, vitamin K does not exist in plants. You know, kale is touted as being a good source of vitamin K, but kale does not contain any active form of vitamin K. The human body needs vitamin K2, kale contains vitamin K1, and then choline, creatine, carnosine, carnitine, taurine, all these other things that we can only get from animal proteins. Every vitamin and mineral that we need, not just to survive, but thrive, is found 
uh, in, in animal proteins. Um, so there we are. That's my beautiful 30, 30 slide. Seconds. I love it. it uh, yeah, fantastic. And, and what the, that presentation also highlights further on is when we remove these plant foods that are high in uh, in lectins and phytic acid, we actually absorb more of the nutrients. So when we become carnivore, not only are we getting more nutrients, but the body's absorbing way more of them as well. Um, but yeah, that's a, a, a super short uh, <laughs> yeah. slide or presentation in regards to the nutrient dense yeah. uh, food like, like, from animal bodies. You know, papayas, we all grew up watching it. I know I grew up watching papayas cartoons and, you know, he's downing the spinach you know and right. it's so strong for all the iron and it's like no you actually absorb almost none of the iron because of the high exactly. oxalate content in the <laughs> in the spinach you know and that Popeye that's was wrong Popeye what, was yeah wrong. and that and <laughs> he was very wrong and that was that's why he was pulled off the air <laughs> are they still making it <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Um, I haven't seen Popeye for, for quite some time. No, exactly. It, uh, we need heme iron, which we can only get from animal proteins. Um, spinach is, is incredibly high in oxalates. Um, I, I think sort of around by memory, um, you know, one pack of spinach in the UK is 200 milligrams uh, of, uh, uh, 200 grams, sorry, of spinach, which contains around 1500 milligrams of oxalates. 5,000 milligrams of oxalates has been known to kill people. Um, so, you know, what do we do? We take this package of, of, uh, of spinach, we chuck it into a blender and we mix it up with turmeric, which is also high in oxalates. Right. Um, yeah, this turmeric. That's, that's and, what, and, and uh, Lee, so Liam Hemsworth is a celebrity here in the United States, and I'm sure you probably know him too. He's like a famous actor and um, he went vegan. Him and uh, he was married at a time with uh, um, Miley Cyrus and they bo were both vegan both eventually had to stop because um, Miley Cyrus, and I quote what she said on the Joe Rogan podcast, she had to stop because, and I quote, her brain stopped working. And the moment she started adding uh, omega-3s in the form of fish, like it was like as if the brain came back online. And for him, he had to stop because he had kidney stones because he was starting every day with a shake with the almond milk and the spinach. And it was thinking, oh, that's like the healthiest start to my day. And it gave him really painful kidney stones that required surgery. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I've got a, I've got, sorry, I've got, I've got another question. What I've learned, by the way, sorry, Sarah, is we've got so many questions and we end up not getting everyone that's, that's bothered to go, go online. Go so for I'm the questions. Just going to stick, stick this in. Now, I actually find this quite an interesting question because most of them are pretty positive. This one's sort of maybe not so positive. Uh, Dr. Sarah, why does it seem that most carnivores keep slipping up and can't stick to the diet? And Ooh. before you answer, I'm going to say uh, that's not my experience, actually. I find yeah. most people can stick to it. Actually, a lot of people can't. I mean, pretty much everybody that comes to me is because they can't stick to carnivore and uh, it's because of the addiction. And while I do think that you have a much higher rate of success on a carnivore diet because it's a sober meal plan, it doesn't have anything addictive in it, no carbs. Um, and if you don't do too much dairy, it's not as addictive. It's actually the, the least addictive food on the planet is a carnivore diet, especially when you exclude the dairy. So it is a little bit higher with success rate just because if we're going to follow it, you're not going to be constantly taking the drug in the form of sweets or artificial sweeteners or piece of bread. Even bread lights up the dopamine centers or those addictive centers in the brain. So it does have a slight, slightly higher rate of success, but the addiction is still there. And so people can do it and they feel great and they don't have cravings, but then they don't realize that they still harbor that addiction. And so when they let go a little bit of the control or of the uh, motivation of uh, that comes from trying something for the first time, it's like, I just discovered carnivore, I'm so excited. You got that momentum, you got all the dopamine coming from this novelty factor. Eventually after a month or most commonly between like one month to 90 days, one month to three months, is when most people kind of let their guard down a little bit and they go to a wedding or a birthday or something happens and they think to themselves, what's one slice of cake? It's not the end of the world. And before you know it, 
the next day they're having and they're craving more sugars, more carbs, and they don't realize what just happened. They don't realize that they just relapsed because they're not even thinking from an addiction point of view, right? Hey, Ayana, hi. So if you're not fully aware of what you're dealing with, you're not treating it with the respect. You're not treating the drug foods with the respect that they deserve. And so you're too casual about it. And, and this is what ends up happening. And so this is why what I've been working with recently is kind of revisiting really my dissertation and the thing that I specialized in and uh, realizing like that is the answer. And, tr and basically fixing that dopamine deficit that everybody comes into carnivore with. Um, and even if you're not a carnivore, like most people who are struggling with their weight is because of that dopamine deficit. Because every time you engage in a drug, whether it's a food drug, remember, sweet taste has been shown in multiple studies to be far more addictive than heroin not just cocaine like the cocaine studies are old now it's like it's more addictive than heroin so like yeah you stand no chance if you don't know what you're dealing with and so if you've dabbled with drugs like sweetness um or real sugar or fake sugar or um alcoholism any kind of drug it all does the same thing it destroys the dopamine centers in the brain specifically it destroys the dopamine receptors in the brain because for you to feel good and have energy and be productive and not have cravings you got to release dopamine in your brain and the dopamine has to attach to its receptor called a d2 receptor on the cell surface of your adjacent brain cell and so when you have that dopamine attaching to D2 receptors, it's like a lock and key situation. Once the attachment happens is when you feel amazing, perfect memory, mental clarity, zero cravings. Every time you have a craving, it just means you're feeling what a dopamine deficit feels like. You're low on dopamine in that state. And so the craving is not for the cookie or the cake or the drug. The craving is really to get a dopamine hit. Or it could be, you can even get it from social media. You, you can get it from so many different areas. And so what I work with is, yeah, carnivore is a great sober meal plan. But what I'm more focused on is optimizing and fixing that dopamine deficit. I want to fix it. And then why just stay here? Why don't we optimize our dopamine? Why don't we raise our baseline level of dopamine? Because now all of a sudden, my clients, they're not just losing weight. They're losing weight and getting sober, but also making more money, having more confidence, setting boundaries. It becomes easier to confront people when you need to confront them. People respect you. They treat you differently when you're operating at a high dopamine baseline because they can sense. It's kind of like the... Uh, how you have like alpha and beta in any uh, interaction, that's kind of equivalent to how much dopamine that person has. The more alpha you are, the more dopamine you have. The more beta you are, the less dopamine you have. And people can sense it when they're around you, when they're interacting with you, when they're in the room with you. And so they're less likely to treat you negatively or poorly because they know you're, you're tough and you know, you're not going to take that. And so the whole, their whole lives transform because we're dealing with the root cause of so many things. So the weight gain is just a symptom of a dopamine deficit. You know, not making enough money is just a symptom of a dopamine deficit. Having anxiety and depression is a symptom of that dopamine deficit. Having, um, you know, a poor memory is a symptom. Not being productive is a symptom of a dopamine deficit. And so when we tackle the dopamine deficit, and I like to do it with exercise, intense exercise, it's a very, very different type of exercise. Not, I'm not talking about, you know, doing like walking for five hours. That's not what I'm talking about. When we do that, then we optimize dopamine centers and every single area of your life is going to be maximize and you can determine how high you want to be in every other area because the fitter you get the more dopamine you have every other area now is also improved rich have you got anything to add let me unmute that no I, I sarah has uh, hit everything on the nail there i mean it um, it comes back to what we mentioned earlier about the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis um the body's ability to create these neurotransmitters comes from the food we eat, specific cofactors like zinc, iron, magnesium, vitamin B12, etc. 
Um, you know, when these are negated by certain foods that we consume, then dopamine is, is no longer produced and we are hardwired to chase dopamine. So uh, if we are not getting it through our diet, you know, from natural sources, then we are um, we're trying to get it from, from other sources. And this is why we crave sugar things. This is why food addiction um, you know, is a real thing. And this is why we end up binge eating. And as Sarah uh, you know, eloquently said, that uh, you know, a, a piece of bread is still sugar. You know, it could be pasta. It's not, it doesn't have to be a chocolate bar, a candy bar. Um, it could be a, you know, a bowl of pasta, rice. Uh, you know, it could be a bowl of vegetables even. Um, but this is why I believe that you know, a, a vegan <laughs> lifestyle is not optimal. We, you know, we're not getting the vitamin B12, the iron. Um, you know, we're not getting, um, we're, we're, what does a vegan and vegetarian consume? Lots of, you know, it, it's lots of lectins and phytic acid, which is blocking the absorption of zinc, iron and magnesium. Um, you know, this is leading to depression, anxiety. And we know from studies that uh, vegans have a higher rate of depression and anxiety, um, high, higher su suicide rate, I believe, as well. Um, you know, we need to be the meat. You know, this isn't um, uh, uh, a fight against, you know, we have the same interests. We care, you know, you brought your dog on earlier. We, we are animal lovers. I care for, for, you know, the condition of the animal that I'm going to eat. You know, I don't want to see uh, cows in sheds. Uh, you know, contained and fed grain. I want them roaming, you know, the countryside and, and living a happy life. Um, you know, we all want the same thing, but it, it comes back down to the foods that we eat and, and the neurotransmitter signals in the brain and what we consume massively affects that. It keeps coming back down to the same thing. And it's a re reoccurring um, message here, isn't it? That it, it, everything comes back down to what we put in. What we put in is what we get out. Your diesel car doesn't run so well on petrol and vice versa. Um, yeah, so I think uh, yeah. it hit that purely on the head. Yeah, fantastic. Love it, and yeah, like you said, you know, if you the more you love animals, the more you should eat meat because you actually end exactly. up killing yeah. up twenty five times more sentient or emotion feeling animals to feed a plant based or vegetarian or vegan diet. When you're harvesting the soy and the wheat and the corn, the sheer amount of animals that are sacrificed, brutally murdered because inadvertently just in order to produce this food is just shocking and they've actually done a study on that it was published i did a youtube video on it and you can check that out and there is the, a direct link to the paper 25 times more sentient animals are uh, definitely not humanely uh, murdered um so which do you want to save more lives and if so all you need is literally red meat and you're good and Absolutely. vegans and veg vegetarians also eat a lot of mushrooms mushrooms are sentient beings uh, they're one of the most intelligent species on the planet yet <laughs> you know they'd happily consume a mushroom you know a lot of people don't understand that but uh, as a, a little piece of information i uh, learned from um uh, a gentleman we've got coming on later uh sean uh seiko sakonofsky uh he taught me that one during a podcast um incredible piece of advice but yeah they're, they're quick enough to eat mushrooms mushrooms are sentient beings you know so yeah it, is that uh, why they say they're fun guys it's <laughs> just just like you and i <laughs> why why would you want to kill fun guys just kill the boring exactly. ones exactly so uh, a nice a nice question that's got the zeitgeist here Dr. Dr. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, based on your experience in nutrition research do you see the tide turning in favor of low carb diets in recent years I think we've shamed the American Heart Association and some of those and the American Diabetes Association. We've just so publicly shamed them to the point where kind of they're trying to weasel their way back into low carb. You know, <laughs> they're not doing it willingly. They're, it's like it's like grabbing a child that's throwing a tantrum and like dragging them into uh, to see the light. And so that's what's happening. It's just, uh, you know, they're they're just so closely aligned with the food companies that's the problem and so their paycheck and their funding um, dollars and their jobs rely on keeping those large food companies happy and what is the thing that sells the most drugs sugar and carbs right there's a reason why the food companies can make so much money it's easy to make money when you're dealing with highly addictive foods in broad daylight without any checks or balances and hooking children where their brains are still developing from a very young age and nobody says a word 
right? We regulate smoking, but when it comes to sweetness that's far more addictive than heroin, it's okay to feed it to a two-year-old, you know? It's, it's okay to go to school, the preschool, and give them all the, the, the candy and the sugar. And so, yeah, that, so they, they, the, the food companies are, are literally um, addicting the population from a very young age, which makes the vast majority of people have a very hard time reversing decades and decades of, uh, of addiction. Age of onset of a drug use is a very strong determinant of whether or not you can get sober from that drug. And so what is the age of onset with sugar? Some are like one year, one year of age. When I was two or three years of, uh, two or three months old, I was given condensed sugar, condensed milk, which is all sugar and cream and milk, condensed milk instead of breast milk for a whole, whole month straight until my mom found out because she had to leave me. Lebanon was in a civil war. She had to leave me for a year or so with my, uh, with my grandma. And so I wouldn't have the formula when she left. And, um, and so I, uh, <laughs> I was given condensed milk. It's like, oh, she'll take the condensed milk. They'll shut her up. <laughs> it's like, and here we are 36 years Rich. later. Yes, absolutely. Rich, do you want to add, um, you know, feel free to, to dive in. Do you think, I mean, you sell supplements, right? So have you seen a tide turning? Do you see more people coming to you for keto and carnivore products? Um, yeah, uh, again, I mean, you and I do these free lives every week. You know, I, we don't get paid for them. We do the public speaking events. You know, we put a lot, an awful lot of effort into spreading the word. Um, and, and I think it is working. You know, uh, people, the average person in the high street now knows what uh, keto and carnivore are. Um, you know, five years ago, you would stop 10 people in the street and you'd be lucky if one knew what, what keto was. Uh, I think what they think it is and what it actually is are two different things. I mean, they still view it as a diet and they don't understand what it is. So there's a big education piece and, and then there lies the problem. Um, and it's through episodes like this that I think we're going to get that out there that, you know, ketosis. Uh, and again, just to reiterate a point we've made previously, if you are carnivore, you were in the metabolic state of ketosis. Carnivore and keto are the same thing. They're just different subsections of the same metabolic state. Um, you know, and that seems to be a, a big bugbear within the community. I'm keto, I'm carnivore. Um, you know, it's one and the same. It's just that you're in a different group, um, a different subsection of the same thing. But um, it's a metabolic state. It's our natural metabolic state. It's the metabolic state we're born in, and it's the metabolic state we've evolved in our entire existence. When we understand that we're living in this natural metabolic state that heals and repairs the body, uh, then we can move forward. But um, unfortunately, we are constantly up against it for every piece of information that is published in regards to the benefits of of protein and uh, you know the benefits of saturated fats and cholesterol. Uh, the Sugar Association will release another one to say that you know eating Kellogg's cornflakes is essential for you know to start your day. The, the study you referenced earlier, um, uh, but it is increasing. It's certainly getting out there, um, and I, I'm quite shocked to be honest. Sometimes I get customers and clients who come into the shop. And I'm astounded by the level of their knowledge and understanding in regards to some of the things that we speak about. So it is death. The tide is definitely turning. Um, how and when that impacts. So, you know, you and I are members of the Public Health Collaboration. You know, we work with doctors and, and nurses from the medical community. Um, you know, we are trying to spread that word as part of the Public Health Collaboration. And it is spreading. Dr. David Unwin and Jenny Unwin, who are guests on Next, I believe, um, you know, they yeah. are uh, predominant figures within that and, you know, and they're pushing and, and pushing this within within the community, uh, you know, as we all are. It, it is turning. Um, when will it be accepted? <sighs> you know, who knows? But I think, you know, as, as Sarah, you know, quite elegantly said that, um, you know, at some point the banks have got to burst. We are flooding it with, with this information. And it's only a matter of time, I think, until something will give but when that happens i don't know let's just hope it's sooner rather than later you can't help but feel that there's an underlying um you know thing going on behind the scenes i don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist or anything but you know it, it, it all seems to be 
you know, there's, there's a machine here to, to keep us sick. Yeah, you know? you're, you're um, not rich. I mean, it's, 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 demonstra it's demonstrable. <laughs> you can see that big pharma and big food do not want you to eat this way because it stops yeah. their profits. I don't think it's that's going to get my channel shut down saying that. I think that's, that's absolutely <laughs> obvious. <laughs> I do. It's just it's, obvious. And I think it's not going to come top down. It's going to come from the bottom up. And, yeah, the I tide agree. is turning. Yeah. But it's, it's people that are going to accept it. I tell you, the a big Food is never going to accept it. It's not going to be in the mainstream media. But then that legacy media is is defunct, really. Most people get their news from this sort of thing. So, uh, and yes, obviously, YouTube tried to shut down discussion and stuff like that. But in the end, they've got to make money. And if the views go down and if uh, people only look at, you know, Sarah's videos, your videos, Sean's, Chafee's, Dr. Kilt's, you know, everybody's videos, if they're getting traction and advertisers are advertising on there, that it's where the money is. I mean, it's where the money is. And and the legacy media is just, you know, anyway, let's not rent. Let's, let's keep it nice and light. 24-hour live stream. Uh, we've got H. Young's question here. Uh, I'd like to start by just giving a little bit of context and then I'll hand over to Dr. Sarah. Any research and dialysis patients on Carnival? Um, if we look globally at dialysis machines before Carnival, let's be honest, Carnival is not a very big way of eating at the moment. Neither is live carb. I think Ken Berry actually looked into the numbers, dialysis centers where he lives and around the area, there was something like eight in the 1950s, something like 12 in the 60s and 70s. Now there's about 20,000. This is off the top of my head. It's a huge growth industry and uh, business. I'm sorry, we're talking health, but it is a business. And dialysis is, uh, you know, they're making money out of these patients. That's a really horrible thing to think of, but th that's that's a reality. Um, I, I seem to remember Dr. Chafee at the beginning talked about somebody coming off dialysis because of carnival. Um, so I know that's an N equals one. But this is also one of the things that bugs me a bit, because if you've got an N equals one and I've got an N equals one and you've got an N equals one and everybody's got an N equals one. Well, that's actually data, isn't it? That's not that's not an anecdote. If I got 500 clients and they've all got better and 250 have reversed type two diabetes, that's that's reality. That's data. So um, anyway, right. That's my little bit. I'm going to take a back seat. Um, any views on yeah. dialysis on carnival? Yeah, well, no, thank you for the little background. Um, what is the number one cause of kidney failure? It's type 2 diabetes, <laughs> right? Now, it, unfortunately, if you get to a point where you've damaged um, your nephrons, your, your kidney cells so much where they cannot handle now the metabolism of protein because you have to, to digest protein, you break it down into amino acids to uh, utilize the amino acids in a lot of cases, you would have to remove the amino group, which is like that nitrogen atom that's part of the am amino acids. And so that deamination um, reaction leads to nitrogen being converted into um, ammonium right away, NH3, which is highly toxic. So the kidneys have to come in very quickly and they have to convert it. In, actually, the liver does that, but it has to convert it into a less toxic form. So it turns the ammonia into urea, which is a less toxic form of nitrogen waste product from protein metabolism. So it's a lot of work, um, you know, and then the, the kidneys have to release that urea excreted. And so the more protein you eat, it is true that your kidneys have more work to do because they have to excrete more of the urea because you have more nitrogen coming in. And so if you got to a point where the, you know, your, your kidneys no longer have that ability, now you need regenerative treatments. Um, in some cases, you could be lucky enough that your body regenerates itself just by removing um, plant foods if the cause was some autoimmune reaction and you remove that and the, the cells can regenerate. But it, it's, it's, it's uh, really hard to say that um, this is going to be the norm because it really depends on how far along you are, how much damage you have to your nephrons. And, you know, whether and what the actual cause of the kidney failure, was it just high carb content for a long period of time? 
Is it an autoimmune reaction? Are you reacting to certain foods? Uh, you know, are you, so is there, there could be so many um, different um, causes which, which can determine whether the diet alone can reverse this, uh, the, the end stage kidney disease or not. So it gets harder. The more far, the, the further you are in, in any kind of uh, condition, the, the harder it gets to say with complete certainty, like, yeah, you can reverse it. You know, even with type 2 diabetes, like type 2 diabetes is very easily reversed in the beginning. But if you've had it for 30 years, then, you know, you, you, you start having so many things that happen because of that, that it's like it's not enough to just eat red meat now. You know, you have to do so many additional things. So, yeah. I hope this makes sense, and I hope that this answered the, the question. And I don't know if uh, Richard, too, or you guys want to jump in on that as well. I think you've covered it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, nothing to add. <laughs> First time for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, hashtag the best. <laughs> yes, ex exactly. <laughs> I'm messing with you. People are going to be like, oh, no, <laughs> people can't <laughs> handle that. We're joking, guys. We're joking. <laughs> uh, let's have a look then. Um, do you know, I mean, you know Coach Bronson. Has his torn meniscus, meniscus healed? Does anyone know that? Torn meniscus. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> let's go oh, to a question. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't even know he had a torn meniscus. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, wonderful live stream. Thank you, Michelle. Dr. Sarah, where can we find the study on plants slash animal to share with those who are concerned about sacrificing animals? If you just go to YouTube and put my name, Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, uh, 25X sentient animals, vegan diets. If you put those keywords, my YouTube video that I filmed on that topic should, should show up. It's very quick. It's literally like a three minute video. But the article that I'm referencing is also um, in the description box, so you can have a direct link to it. Yeah, and I think, Rich, you mentioned earlier something about the um, the harvesting. You mentioned on monocrops. Do you, do you want to just quickly repeat that? Because I don't think that was during Sarah's section. You were talking yeah. about animal dying. Yeah, when we you know desertify a field to grow crops, um, there's a couple of things, you know, basically we destroy an ecosystem. The combine harvester will, will go through that field. Um, and I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, birds and seagulls will, um, you know, will, will circle the combine harvester. And that's because of all the dead animals that it's picking up as it's going through the field. Um, but then we grow crops in that field. It's treated with toxic chemicals. This, this destroys um, the microbes in the ground. It kills an entire ecosystem. Birds and bees die off. Um, so lots, considerably more animals die as a result of growing crops compared to eating one cow. So I use a local butcher. Um, the butcher from me is, is two miles away. Um, you know, the distance traveled uh, is incredibly small. I'm using, you know, as a carnivore, I, I probably consume one, the equivalent of one cow a year. Uh, but a vegan who drives to the supermarket kills an entire family of, of animals every time that they get in the car. You know, I know they're not doing it on purpose, uh, but if you do really care for, for animals, health and well-being, then being a vegan or vegetarian is, is not um, the, you know, the best, best uh, source for that. Even when we look at impacts on environment, um, you know, vegans will consume. And this isn't a dig at vegans or vegetarians. I just want to re reinforce that I'm not against uh, anyone's. Uh, personal choices, but I think that um, information out there is is scarce, and we need to repeat this, don't we? And we'll bring back that study now. So, sorry, Stephen. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll read that again now. Um, but uh, you know, we fly in these exotic fruits from all over the world. Yet, you know, uh, uh, carnivores are blamed for the cow farts that are destroying the ozone layer, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, especially when we look at the amount of methane that a vegetarian will release from eating plants. You know, it, uh, it's, yeah, it's preposterous, isn't it? But that's the, did you want to bring that back up again? That's a fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. And uh, they've got a global estimate that 67 million birds are killed each year due to agricultural pesticide use. Wow. Let me take a picture of that. I'm taking a picture of it. I love that. Yeah. Do you want me to do this? Uh, and um, 
you know, that, that, that extrapolates to about 672 million birds poisoned in total just from pesticide use, just birds. Uh, I, you know, now I'm a member of the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. And this, but this bothers me in, in, in a big way. And I think it is quite surprising people don't realise that carnivores are also animal lovers. You know, if you yeah. want to get play on my heartstrings, yeah. you show me an animal being mistreated. I mean, yeah. this morning I was looking. I'm really in, very interested in this. This is a side I don't really put out publicly. I mean, uh, like rescuing animals, uh, part of uh, one of the donations I made, that they had a, a, a puppy, four months old, you know, been uh, kids covered it in glue and dragged it through the mud and left it for dead in this, this cardboard box. You know, we should be looking at stuff like this, like this agricultural pesticides. We should be looking at cruelty. We shouldn't be looking at cows that are out in a field, you know, eating grass and actually having. I've got footage of cows loving where they are, you know, jumping around and stuff like that. And they have a much better life than, you know, animals in circuses and all this sort of stuff. So I think, um, don't want to get into that too much because it's, it's yeah. quite sad. But anyway, let's have a look. Let's get back to the live stream. Um, let's have a little look. Uh, yes. you What you what you said about mushrooms, Rich, has definitely ignited the chat. Uh, <laughs> Kel there, she had a chat with the mushroom one or two times. I had a chat with the mushroom. That's hilarious. I'm glad you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Sarah, what exercise do you do to raise dopamine? The painful one. <laughs> <laughs> it is the sensation of pain that upregulates baseline levels of dopamine, especially D2 receptor numbers. This is why, like, if you're just walking, there is no pain there. So it's not going to upregulate your dopamine receptors. The only exception to that rule would be if you were bedbound. And now you want to upregulate dopamine levels, but to go from bed bound to you can't jog, you know, so walking even a quarter of a mile feels so difficult for you. So it's the sensation of difficulty that keeps upregulating your dopamine receptors. So let's say if you're fit and you're running and you're doing great, if you keep doing the same intensity, you keep maintaining the same baseline level of dopamine. If you want higher, you have to. Now push yourself to be able to run faster, which means in order to go from where you normally run to go to a faster, more intense speed, there is going to be pain involved because that's the only way you grow, right? If I want to grow a muscle, I can't lift the same weight that I normally lift. I have to pick a heavier weight that's uncomfortable. It's that discomfort that allows me to progress and become stronger, have stronger muscles, and also increase dopamine receptors. So anything that is painful will do the job. My preferred method, I think it's fastest, most effective, honestly easiest in my opinion, way to raise dopamine levels is, is via exercise. And a lot of times, most of the people that come to me, um, they have weight, they want weight loss and they're struggling with sugar addiction. And so exercise targets both. It helps them lose the weight very quickly while at the same time targeting the root cause of their addiction, the root cause why they can't stick to a carnivore diet. So it's like two birds with one stone. Rich, what would you say? Yeah, fantastic. It, uh, I mean, for me, the exercises, um, as you know, I used to come from a bodybuilding background, so it was lifting weights, and now it's destroying myself on a bike <laughs> <laughs> or, go, or going for a run. Yeah. Um, yeah, running and cycling is uh, my new form of uh, chosen torture. But uh, <laughs> as long as you're torturing um, yourself, you're doing good. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it it is a hard place to push yourself to. Sometimes I I was on the bike indoor yesterday. Um, I was short for time. Uh, I didn't get a chance to uh, to get out on the bike, so I jumped on the indoor trainer. Um, and it's incredibly difficult to stay motivated in in indoor. Um, but I pushed, uh, I was hurting, I was sweating, I did about 40 odd minutes. Um, yeah, it, uh, it it hurt, but you know, it, you've got to push these boundaries. If it's not hurting, it's not working. Uh, and take that with a pinch of salt to a degree. I mean, I don't want you to go injuring yourself, but you've got to push these boundaries. Um, you know, moving is fantastic. Uh, and, you know, Stephen uh, mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, the, the, the elderly person sitting and standing from, from the chair. Uh, and that was uh, an exercise that was um, 
hard and difficult for them at the time but then they progress from working you know walking through and through and it's about pushing these boundaries so you know begin at the level you can push to the boundaries uh but it, it, it's got to hurt a little bit it um if it's, yeah. if it's not hurting it's not yeah. working and then yeah, you, I mean, you, that... yeah sorry go ahead yeah, I, sorry, just you referenced, uh, just someone did message me about that woman that I helped get out the Zimmer's frame. And they asked, how do you do that on the NHS? I don't work for the NHS. It was private. So um, sadly, to get the sort of rehab and nutrition advice that I offered, the National Health Service doesn't do those things. So uh, for that. But what was you going to say, Sarah? Sorry. Um, I was going to say that the pain threshold goes up too. So if um you feel a lot of pain when you first try to push yourself a little bit just know that that intensity of pain you will eventually not feel the pain as much and the more you do it eventually you become numb to the discomfort you're still pushing yourself beyond your limits and you would expect to feel a lot of suffering but you actually are numb to it like that's that's another thing to look forward to. And I think that's what stops a lot of people because they cannot imagine going through 10 minutes of such discomfort forever. And they forget or they, they don't realize that your tolerance to pain also gets better. You adapt to the painful sensation because dopamine is an anesthetic too. That's the reason why dopamine is being upregulated. It's like, uh, oh, you're, I don't know what you're doing, Sarah. You're having a lot of pain. Let me upregulate your dopamine receptors so that in the future, you're not constantly feeling those painful moments because they seem to happen every day for you. <laughs> and so eventually you become numb to it. So I can push myself beyond my limits without really suffering as much or feeling the same intensity of discomfort the way that I used to in the past. You know what I mean? Yeah, that training, that training response is, is fascinating. And it, it, and I always use an analogy for um, the bed of nails. Okay. We have ascending pathways and descending pathways. So if you lie on a bed of nails, initially that's going to be quite painful. So that goes up the ascending pathway across your spine up into the somatosensory part of your uh, your brain. And then there's the homunculus there that knows where that pain's coming from, sends a message down, down through your spinal column to where that area is, and it lessens the pain. It sort of cuts it off at the at the uh, you know, the impasse. So what happens is you can lie on a bed of nails, it can be really painful. And then 10 minutes later, you'd be fast asleep because mm -hmm. you you have this instant physiological response. And I know that sounds really not true, but that's what happens. And that's the popularity of the Shakti mats, these mats that you can buy mm -hmm. that are acupressure. They're very painful. Yeah. I use one when I have lower back pain, you know, yeah. if I've trained too hard. Well, I don't get the pain, but I just think it's good prevention, by the way, which we haven't spoke, spoken much about. Uh, prevention is better than, you know, trying to restore yourself after you've injured yourself. And I think that, that's fascinating. Um, I'm rushing because when we're coming towards the ninth hour and Dr. Sarah, we want to make the most of having you around. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna be be wary. I'm gonna do a little joke here. So we've got someone called T Ford. I'm wondering if you're a model. Anyway. No? All right. <laughs> Could Is you it you, Tom? <laughs> Send me a suit. <laughs> Could you please give advice with regards to gout? and high uric acid levels with regards to diet. I seem to react badly with any fructose well spotted with gout and wheat. Yeah. So um, that's the thing that keeps a lot of people away from carnivores. Like, oh, you eat carnivore. It has a lot of purines, which turns into and increases uric acid, which can cause a gout flare up. And that's just not true. Um, if you talk to anybody who suffered with gout and did carnivore, they will tell you that it completely eliminates gout attacks. And that's because your own body can create its own purines. And so as a matter of fact, like you very, um, very accurately realize that, you know, it's the fructose and it's the wheat and it's the carbohydrates, but especially fructose um, that um, increases your own body's production of uric acid, which then um you know you you start having symptoms of gout with the joint pain and the inflammation so don't uh 
don't fall for this myth that, oh, you know, purines can only come from the meat that you're eating, you know? And so if you're eating meat, then that's going to raise your at- number of attacks as bad. Like that is actually the complete opposite. And I think with from, from my history of bloods, you can have high uric acid and no gout, and you can have low uric acid and gout. The correlation between uric acid and gout is not there. Uh, and that's from thousands of actual bloods and thousands and thousands of data points and people that are coming in and having their bloods taken. And, um, you know, this, this is where you look at it and you think, right, now I should say to you, have you got gout because you've got this high uric acid level? Well, no, I haven't. Right. So that's where bloods and uric acid, you know, they don't, just don't yeah. correlate. It's a little more all. complex than, than just that. Yeah. Very yeah. well said. Thank you. It's okay. Rich. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, purines get a bad rap, but, you know, these are created naturally in the body from the big breakdown of cells for energy, for ATP and GTP. You know, purines do not cause gout. Um, five to ten times more created within the body than we get from the diet. Uh, when we look at uric acid, uric acid, it can be increased by purines, purines but these exist in normal joints uh, as well as, you know, people who suffer with with gout, but uric acid is actually an antioxidant. Um, it's, it's excreted by the kidneys, but over 50% of it is reabsorbed back into the body. So something that is toxic, the body, you know, wouldn't be reabsorbed back into the body. So yeah, this whole thing about purines and gout and, and eating meat is, you know, is, is a fallacy. It, um, it, it's inflammatory in nature, which is what you know, the standard diet would do in regards to carbohydrate and the foods that we eat fructose, as we know, um, you know, that's a contributing factor. Um, uh, sucrose, uh, elevated insulin, so insulin, res- insulin resistance, alcohol, um, all of these can be a- other factors. And ma- magnesium, potassium um, are known factors to decrease gout. So it comes back to our, our electrolytes again. But uh, again, it's, it's, it's all of this mis- misinformation uh, in regards to, to protein. It comes back to protein all the time, doesn't it? it um, protein has such a bad rap yet it's the most nutrient dense food on the planet. Um, But yeah, these studies are out there, unfortunately, but yeah, Mm -hmm. nothing to worry about in regards to protein and and gout. So we've got our new guest in the waiting room, Dr. Jen Unwin and Dr. David Unwin, who I'd like to bring into the meeting uh, and and say hello. And then we'll finish with your question, Sarah, if that's okay, which is about tryptophan. So let's add. Let's add Dr. Jen Unwin and David Unwin to the stream. Hello. Hi. Uh, <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, Hi, both. <laughs> it's a busy screen. Uh, we're just finishing off this hour with Dr. Sarah Zaldivar and this final question. Um, so, Dr. Sarah, how do you get tryptophan for sleep on a carnivore diet? So, sleep is actually one of the most commonly reported symptoms that improve on a carnivore diet and that's because there are so many things that could trigger insomnia there are so many things that could lead somebody to to struggle um, with the falling asleep quickly and staying asleep um i like to remind people that when your brain is not inflamed and you are optimal in your dopamine and serotonin production serotonin eventually turns into melatonin and so now that regulates uh, your your sleep cycle and your your circadian rhythm and i think that that is one of like the biggest reasons why people report just massive improvements in their sleep and a cool thing is like the sleep latency improves so much so instead of tossing and turning for half an hour before before you fall asleep I've noticed so many people reporting on a carnivore diet. It's like the moment you go to bed, you're done in like five minutes. And, um, and so it's just, it affects every single hormonal system in the body. Every single physiological system in the, in the body is affected positively. The inflammation goes away. Your needs also for sleep decrease. So you might actually feel like you're going to require less total number of hours of sleep and to, you wake up feeling refreshed because now your body isn't having to deal with the inflammation from the seed oils and the sugars and the addictive foods that you were eating previously. So it, all in all, it's one of the strongest things. It's like that and better skin, better mood, better joints. Those are the top, top 
most improvements that we see when people first make the switch to a carnivore diet or our species specific diet. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Zaldivar, that's a brilliant hour you've given us. I really want to thank you so much for your time and the great answers to all the questions. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Very much appreciated. Great chatting again. And thanks for the comment on being number one. I'm using that again. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Enjoy. Take care. Thanks, Sarah. Take bye. Care, bye. bye. So, Richard, I'm going to hand over to you because I think you know Dr. David Unwin and Dr. Jen Unwin, and I don't. So, so I've, um, yeah, I mean, I, I did a podcast and had the pleasure of meeting Jen in the PhD conference. Uh, I didn't get chance or the pleasure to meet David in person, but hello both. Uh, welcome on board. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Jen mm -hmm. and I recorded a podcast recently uh, on food addiction, which is one of the, the things that we wanted to go into detail today. Uh, amongst other things but look, look thank you both so much for coming on um huge huge pleasure to get you on here uh it's been uh, how, how long are we in nine hours into the 24 hour live oh I, mean, I, was um, I was wondering if we were at the tail end or at the beginning so <laughs> you, you you're just getting in your stride now nine hours yeah. <laughs> That's it, yeah. amazing you crazy you crazy guys <laughs> yeah do you know initially we were concerned that we wouldn't have enough content uh, but it looks like we're running out of time with the speakers. I don't think we've, I think, I think no. we should have allocated more time. But uh, time. yeah, nine hours and counted. Do you both know uh, Stephen? No, hello, Stephen. Stephen. Hello, Dr. Jen, and hello, Dr. David. I mean, I know of, I know of you two, and um, I'd love to get you onto my podcast. I mean, I, I'm a specialist practitioner in diabetes and obesity. The diabetes oh, thing, I love, I love the the sugar infographics and all that sort of stuff that, which is great obviously disappointed david hasn't got his bow tie on but um because i was expecting that today. yeah expecting the signature um, bow tie we'd just been next door it's our neighbor's 50th wedding anniversary and we were like oh we gotta go we gotta go <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. I, I thank you so much. I just had this crazy idea that we might be able to spread the word by doing something unusual and it just had a ring to it, a 24-hour live stream, the biggest conversation about keto, low-carb, and carnivore. It just seemed yes. to get people's interest. And, uh, and nine we're, the hours. People, we're the only people with enough energy to do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, in fact, that's the first thing. We opened with that, saying that when we were high-carb, if we were trying to do something like this, we would be thinking, oh, we've got to eat three times a day. Oh, this is no good. We've got to have breakfast, you know. And we would have panicked trying to do 24 hours. Literally, yeah. I have a little sort of selection of stuff there to possibly eat, and I haven't touched it once. It's incredible. Yeah. And Amazing. you're right. This way of eating definitely does that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rich because for the viewers that don't know you, we do need a little bit of an introduction of what Dr. Jen and what Dr. David do. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, um, Stephen has kindly written introductions for everyone, but um, we've been handing over to the guy. So would you both like to introduce yourselves and give us a little rundown on uh, on what you guys do? Yeah. Do you want to go first, fantastic. David? I was in the back. <laughs> I've opened my mouth now, so I'll, uh, I'll carry on, carry on. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, a, a GP from north of Liverpool, and... Um, I'm really interested in what are the true causes of the chronic illnesses that so many of my patients have. Why are they ill? And I realise now that I wasn't very, I didn't show much interest in that. I lacked curiosity about why are people ill for the first 25 years of my practice, and I defaulted I data communication far too often. Now that I've really got into why are people ill. I'm discovering that lifestyle is often um, at fault. And if you change lifestyle, we're not using uh, drugs. Specifically, I'm obsessed, uh, and that isn't too much a word, I'm obsessed uh, with helping my patients with type 2 diabetes control their diabetes or get into remission without using drugs. And I look after the physiology side of it, and Jen will talk to you about the psychology side of helping people change behavior. 
Uh, we've been doing it for 10 years now in HS practice, and we've uh, published a lot of papers. We go all over the world, spreading the, the, the word. And arguably, we've now got the best results of any clinic in the world. And this is in an NHS clinic looking after people with type 2 diabetes. So this week, I saw my 130th patient that's achieved drug-free remission of their type 2 diabetes. And it just gives us such joy and such pleasure. And we hadn't seen remission of diabetes, drug-free remission mission of diabetes. I hadn't seen it once in the first 25 years of my practice. And now we've seen it 130 times. And it just get back to said at the beginning, um, really, if, if, if the problem with diabetes is a high blood sugar, it seemed reasonably logical to think, well, where did that sugar come from? And could I have eaten it? And that's the basis for us of the of the low carb diet that we use. Um, so it's in 10 minutes appointments we're doing this, but we also have run groups, group consultations for 10 years. And that's a new thing for me in general practice. So that's, I think that's enough from me now. Jen? Yeah, you're a bit, you're, I don't know, you're, um, you're, a bit, uh, you're a bit fuzzy as well. We can't hear you very well. well we've got a thunderstorm here. So it's, I, it's yeah, but, to speak. yeah. But um, maybe it's just over you then. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> Jen's feet seems fine. <laughs> yeah, mine seems mine seems fine. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Dr. Jen Unwin. I'm a clinical health psychologist by background. So I've I've always worked. Uh, I've retired now from the NHS, but I was in the NHS for all my career, helping people with chronic conditions to live as best they could with those conditions so it might have been chronic pain or some sort of disability or disfigurement or some some sort of life limiting um condition and helping them to sort of um live their best lives with with whatever that condition was so i was always really interested in motivation and behavior change and um and hope so hope was my big topic and i did my doctorate on hope and the difference that hope makes to to how people adjust to physical health challenges and to be honest hope makes such a massive difference it even makes a difference to how long people live so people who are more hopeful are uh, and to take more steps towards sort of um you know their their goals and their and their best hopes are, are actually more likely to to live uh, longer, to take less medication, to consult doctors less often, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, you know, it makes, it makes a big difference. So that's the psychology side. And then, as David said, about, about 11 years ago now, um, we just thought it would be nice to work together. We haven't put our skills together and worked on anything bef before then. And I just recently found low carb. I'd struggled all my life with, with weight and uh and so on and i read dr john briffle's book um escape the diet trap that some people will have come across he was also a british gp but he was one of the first to sort of talk about low carb in this country and so we thought and it worked for me so we thought right we're going to try it we could see how it could work we're going to try it with david's pre-diabetic patients because there were just more and more of them and they were just getting sicker and sicker and um the first 18 patients um, we wrote up for the um, for a research article, and and it's just been going on ever since. the The rest is history. Practical, so, uh, practical, practical diabetes. On, yeah, in practical diabetes, and then um, I also real, uh, realized that low carb ketos it's fantastic, but it's kind of yes if people stick to it and um people people like me with food addiction problems <laughs> and body weight problems often have problems st sticking to a low carb diet even when it's worked fantastically for them you know or they felt amazing on keto and we've got all those benefits that you've been hearing about in the last nine hours and we even know that then some of us really struggle to to stick you know to stick to that lifestyle so i started getting more and more interested in in that and wanted to really understand this thing that um 
that that looks like an addiction you know it, it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck it looks exactly like an addiction um people who you know still craving foods that you know they don't actually want to be eating are losing control of, e of eating those foods and continuing to eat them in in spite of the fact they know they're harming themselves physically and mentally and you know what what else would that be apart from someone with someone with diabetes who continues to eat um sugary uh, carby and ultra processed foods it's a it's kind of a form of self-harm so i'm just super interested in that and that's that's what um i've been concentrating more on in the last sort of four year four years or so love this fantastic and an incredible comment there um incredible 130 lives that should say saved i think opposed to change i mean because that's exactly what you guys are doing is saving lives isn't it um and unfortunately i mean there's this there's, there's this common uh, disassociation between carbohydrate and sugars within uh, the community you know we, we view carbohydrate and sugars as being two different things uh, they are and one and the same carbohydrates break down into sugar and unfortunately within society people who are consuming lots of bread pasta uh, cereals um, but unknowingly consuming high quantities of sugar, uh, okay. as well as uh, damaging lectins and phytic acid and things. But circling back to a comment you just made there, so you, Jen, were the catalyst that began all of this in the first place, which I wasn't aware of. So fantastic, yeah. brilliant stuff. <laughs> yeah, so you I mean, it's it's like that. Um, I I don't know whoever said it, but I love it. Is to to make your mess into your mission. So. You know, it's 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 that thing of if you've struggled with something and you've tried to understand it and you've actually, you know, you, you, you feel that probably through that struggle, you can you can help other people to live a better life. You know, I think there's there's nothing there's nothing more rewarding than that is there and to carry on learning and helping more people. It's um, yeah, it's very it's very, very rewarding. And we get to what's lovely is that we get to do that together. You know, it's not we had two separate careers, but now. As David says, you know, we get to speak together and people invite, invite us to go all, all around the place speaking. So what could be nicer? Yeah, fantastic. And I think, you know, we're all in a similar board in, in that regards. You know, Stephen and I, um, we give up much of our time for free to do lives every Sunday, uh, free coaching, public speaking events in regards to, to spreading the word. I mean, I think... Um, you know, we touched base on it earlier, Steve, wasn't it, that uh, we feel that we found a secret and we're trying to spread that mm. secret to as many people as we can. Um, yes. You know, during our podcast, you know, I, I mentioned to you that I used to be a type 2 diabetic, clinically obese, suffered with depression, anxiety, arthritic pains, daily debilitating migraines that would make me blind, for which I was on three different medications for. Um, I was unable to walk up my stairs without stopping or being severely out of breath. And from changing the food that I put into my mouth, uh, I didn't only reverse every one of those things. Uh, I lost 107 pounds, reversed the diabetes. I went on to become uh, a professional uh, champion at a pro level, a European champion. Um, and this is all down to diet and lifestyle. And, and you know, similar to similar situation, my wife and I have sold three houses to put into the business where we try to re-educate people. And, and this was the, the whole idea behind this, this live, this crazy idea that Steve came up with where we go live for 24 hours, um, which I'm sure he's beginning to regret now nine hours in, but no, <laughs> fantastic. You know, and coming back to something you said there now, I mean, it's food addiction um, and something you told me during the podcast, food addiction is not a recognized illness within the NHS. Is that right? So we've got yeah. alcohol addiction, drug addiction, gambling addiction, gambling. But food addiction is yeah. not recognized. Yeah, so at the moment, obviously you can't because it's not recognised here or, or in the state anywhere internationally, in the even in the US. Although they're probably a little bit further ahead than than we are in sort of acknowledging that it may be, um, it may be a problem. Um, yeah, so of course that means because it's not acknowledged, there's very little research being done, and there's very um, little indication about you know how you effectively help people and therefore there, there's no help we think that conservatively i mean really conservatively 10 percent of the population probably have this problem a bit a bit like you know all of us drink alcohol but not all of us develop you know a, a kind of clinical problem with with alcohol 
And the same with food. A lot of us eat these kinds of foods and many of us struggle, you know, to resist them. But th there is this this group of us that, that, you know, really have this really addictive sort of relationship with processed foods and particularly sugars and carbohydrates. Um, so 10% would would equal about four and a half million adults in, in the UK. Wow. So that's four and a half million adults who are doing themselves harm on a daily basis, um, don't know what to do with themselves, you know, struggling. And if if they go and see their healthcare practitioner, unless they're lucky enough to live in Southport and they get to meet David, those healthcare practitioners aren't wouldn't know what to do with them. They wouldn't probably ask about it. They wouldn't know where to refer them. You might get sent to mental health services, but they wouldn't have any idea how to treat you. You know, the, the even the addiction services, they're not going to be interested because they only treat alcohol and you say like drug addiction. These are these other addictions. So it's um, it's yeah, it's a sort of um, hidden sort of emperor's clothes thing. Like we all if you ask the public, is it possible to be addicted to to certain foods they they're going to say yes. But then there's no help for people or, you know, you're actually kind of laughed at if you say that certain foods are addictive and people say oh food can't you know how can food be addictive we have to eat kind of thing so we well, do have, sad, of course the, i think the, one, one of the things is <laughs> one of the things is shame that people yeah. in every clinic i do i'm discovering people who uh, they know they are a, a, a carb addict but it's the shame they say it's so ridiculous. I can't give up bread. In fact, bread is is one of the things, one of the foods I buy most. Mm. And here's a funny thing: I never found a single bread in the first twenty five years. But if you never ask, you never will find them because they're so ashamed. Yeah. Um, and they nearly all yeah. cry when they tell me because they sound so ridiculous. It's almost a relief when people understand why they're behaving in this odd way. Intelligent people eating yep. stuff that's shortening yeah. their lives. And it, it's a great pleasure, really, to help people with that in terms of at least they know they're not mad. They, yeah, you know, and I think they get that. Sorry. Yeah, I, th I think it's the, the big problem is they blame willpower. You just mm, lack yes. willpower, which is absolutely ridiculous to say. I mean, yeah. I've never met anybody that smokes for their health. And I've never met anyone that smokes and says, I'm just choosing to smoke. <laughs> you know, and it's, yeah. it's the same with this carb, carb addiction. There are people that say to me, I know I shouldn't eat bread. I know I shouldn't eat donuts. I just can't stop myself. And it yeah. is just an addiction. Can't. That's right, yeah, exactly. on, because they're driven. The the primitive brain is 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 driven uh, to you know to kind of stop you starving, basically. And it's you know you're you're driven to to eat these foods, even though when the frontal lobes are telling you you don't want to eat those foods, but you, your hand reaches for the foods. It's it is the most incredible process, and yeah. of course you know makes you feel like you're a bit bonkers if you don't un understand that that mechanism yeah. and so as david says people kind of hide it they're ashamed that they can't control themselves um also there's the kind of denial factor because although we know we should give up our foods the thought of and david will tell you this the thought of giving up the bread or the chocolate or whatever it is which is kind of your best friend well it's not your best friend is it but it you know life without those things feels incredibly you know it just feels impossible as well so people are often often in in denial about the harms that 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 are happening and also they don't know what what to do anyway so they just sort of deny it's a problem yeah and again another i mean supplementary it's point I'd like to, sorry another supplementary point i'd like to make is that you know i can help patients with cigarette addiction with alcohol addiction and even gambling, gambling there is no substance so I can mm. refer you for yeah. your gambling addiction, which is very serious and ruins lives. And yet here we have this thing which is affecting so many people and we're denying that the condition actually exists so that there is no help for any of those, which is a real tragedy. Uh, but it is shortening lives, it is killing people. And I'm so mystified how I missed it 25 years 
And it, it, it's such a tragedy that many people are suffering privately and secretly, and mm. there's nobody they can tell. And any doctor you go to is going to say, well, we don't have anywhere to refer you uh, for that. Time to tell them about your book, Jen, probably. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, um, I don't, for, oh, I have got a copy here. You'll be able to see. So I wrote, I wrote a little book in lockdown called Fork in the Road. There it is. Put it in the face there. Hopeful Guide to Food uh, food Dream. And uh, all profits go to the Public Health Collaboration, which is the charity that um, Rich was at the, the conference for. And it's just got all the all the basic things that I'm probably talking about uh, this evening are, are, are in that um, in that in that little book. And uh, you'll also be helping helping the charity that David and I both work for and, and support to spread, you know, this thing. What I was so sort of saying about raising people's awareness, spreading, spreading the good news. And hopefully soon we'll be launching some courses for professionals to understand the problem and also for the public themselves um you know we'll be doing groups and courses um so that people can people can start their journey to recovery yeah love this it's fantastic and do you know it um it baffles me how this isn't recognized as an addiction because for me it's the single most um uh detrimental thing you know, within society um you know, we look, it comes back to this name and shame thing, isn't it? We become ashamed of the food. We, we, and I've been there. I've hidden the food that I eat. And I know that I'm doing wrong. I'll, I'll nip out to, uh, you know, or used to nip out to a fast food restaurant. Uh, I'd hide the wrappers. Um, and it's this it's this name and shame um, society where people will just say to you that, um, uh, you know, uh, you need some willpower. But it goes well beyond that, doesn't it? Which is what we touched base on during our talk. It's uh, it, it's how it affects uh, the neurotransmitter signals within the brain. It these these foods block certain pathways, the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters within the brain. Um, they they block the cofactors like iron, zinc, and vitamin B12, which we need to synthesize things like serotonin and dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Um, do you want to go into a little bit more about that in regards to how these foods that we consume are blocking the absorption of these cofactors and and the production of of these 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 neurotransmitters? Because when our brains, when we're not receiving these signals, you know, we go chasing dopamine, for example, don't we? We're hardwired to chase dopamine, and I think yeah. you know this is a massive contributing factor to to this addiction. And it, it isn't that person's fault. It's about understanding that the food that they are yeah. consuming is contributing it, it's this vicious cycle isn't it that where you need yeah. you need to understand what's causing it in the first place remove one or two of these offending foods then our neurotransmitter signals um the catecholaminergic neurotransmitter synthesis began you know begins to to, to ramp back up and, and we feel a lot better but we went into a lot of detail in, in this didn't we during during that talk yeah. do you want to expand a little bit more yeah, certainly can do. And someone's just made the comment, haven't they, that the common denominator in alcohol and food is is often is often sugar. And all of these things are operating in, in the same part of the, the brain. So whether it's alcohol, sugar, cigarettes, you know, it's it's all to do with these neurotransmitters. And um um yeah, you you're absolutely right that dopamine is is a big part of it and we're hearing more and more about dopamine aren't we people are sort of you know yeah dopamine that's kind of interesting and we know it's also involved in things like um mobile phone you know addiction addiction to kind of scrolling as well that you know we we we're all very we wouldn't be here today if we weren't sort of motivated to get certain things and achieve certain things that's how we've survived is being really motivated to find the food that we needed or to you know to to do the jobs that we needed to do during the day to survive so when we have um ultra processed foods or you know even just simple sugar sugars and and carbohydrates um one of the things that happens is we do get a, a nice a nice sort of dop dopamine boost and kind of we love that but what goes up must come down like all like all things and the brain doesn't really like these high levels like everything in biology there's a kind of balance in the body you know one thing's going to sort of interact with another thing so 
Um, when the dopamine goes high for a long period of time, the brain thinks, oh, there's a lot of dopamine slushing around here. We'll just um, we'll just knock out a few. We don't need so many dopamine receptors in the brain. Um, but of course, the problem then is that um, when you don't have as many dopamine receptors in the brain, in the normal course of your life, when you're not eating sugar, you, you're feeling a little bit flat because it doesn't feel that, you know, this... There's, there's enough dopamine so then you're looking for the next hit to sort of give you another boost and then the brain thinks oh you know there's another bit of high dopamine we'll knock out a few more receptors and it, it's a really bad idea to not have enough dopamine receptors because we start to feel more and more depressed and more and more anxious and it's been shown in studies that you know these high sugar diets do leave you genuinely feeling more depressed and, and, and more anxious so um, so that's one thing. And then there's a similar path that goes on with with serotonin. Um, when if you have a, um, sugars are high, then obviously insulin's high um, to deal with the sugars. But when insulin is high, um, tryptophan can cross into the blood brain barrier more easily than normal. And tryptophan gets converted into serotonin. So you get a big, nice serotonin high. You feel great. But what goes up must come down. And again, so. So it's um it's a vicious cycle going in a bad way. It's a, you know it's a trap that's difficult to get out of because you do get withdrawal symptoms, not physical withdrawal symptoms, but um, psychological withdrawal symptoms of feeling l more low, feeling more anxious, etc. Um, and you have to get through that and out the other side to, to to start to feel better, which is what I experienced all those all those many years ago. Um, but at that time, I was just thinking of it as a sort of physical withdrawal, if you like, um, which it which it is it is to some extent, but it's it's also psychological. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and to circle back to something you just said about um, the tryptophan, I mean, the opposite is is also true in, in a state of insulin resistance. Isn't it? Insulin resistance and inflammation will block um, the dopamine pathways, and we're hardwired to chase these dopamine hits. So we we end up searching for other ways to, to stimulate, you know, these uh, these dopamine hits. And, and we get this through sweet foods. Sweet foods release dopamine into the mezzanine pathway. So we chase these sweet foods. It's and it, it can even be carbohydrate from bread or anything. But, uh, yeah. you know, an another factor that is that th these foods we are consuming are incredibly high, not just in carbohydrate, but in lectins and phytic acid, which are blocking these cofactors, isn't it? You know, the iron, magnesium, uh, vitamin B12, which we need to synthesize uh, you know, the, the um, uh, tryptophan uh, yes, as well exactly. as creating. Someone was asking uh, about absorption of nutrients, weren't they, about caffeine. I'm, I I don't know that much about that, whether whether that is the case or not. Um, but, but definitely, yeah, there does seem to be a factor that when you start chasing this high, then, then people start focusing on chasing that. And, of course, the other foods drop out of their diet. I mean, I remember this happening to me where I would just – eat pasta and ice cream and pizza and i wasn't having any foods with with nutrients in because they they weren't giving me that kind of buzz so then then you're crowding out the 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 good foods in in your diet and then people become they are literally deficient and they're craving stuff which you know they're craving real foods but then it, that all gets confused and you end up just chasing these uh, dopamine highs yeah, and so I think also, I mean, we're, we're overfed and undernourished. 100%. Really, yes. yeah, it, I agree. Overfed and undernourished. And it's worth thinking about the nutrient density of food. It gives you a new, a new perspective on uh, what nourishment means, because it really is not about calories anymore now. Um, the, I'm just thinking about the vitamin deficiencies we get in the practice. So uh, vitamin D deficiency, very common. Folic acid deficiency, uh, I've stopped measuring that. It's so very, very common. And then iron deficiency itself, um, uh, internationally, that's a, a very big one. Yeah, and again, I mean, segueing from there, it, um, we know that processed foods and these sweet treats are bad for us, but then there, there are groups of people out there who are actively trying to improve their health and well-being. They're eating lots of fruits and vegetables, 
thinking they're doing the right thing while neglecting yes. uh, animal protein. So the issue with this is, yes. you know, vegan, and this isn't a stab at vegans and vegetarians. I've repeated this you know, multiple times today. I work with vegans and vegetarians. I respect anybody's uh, decision uh, in regards to diet and nutrition. But unfortunately, vegans and vegetarians lack iron. You know, we can't get iron from, from spinach. Popeye was, was, was incorrect. Uh, the human body needs heme iron. We need this from animal proteins. Uh, a vegan and vegetarian diet is lacking in vitamin B12. We cannot get B12 cobalamin from, from plants. Um, and zinc we're lacking. So these 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 standard uh, you know healthy diets that people are going on who are consciously making an effort to improve their health and well-being, these are being counterintuitive in regards to this, this production of the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters because these are again, missing the cofactors of iron, zinc, and B12. So even the vegans and vegetarians who are actively trying to be fitter and healthier um, are, are causing issues. And I think, did you and I, Jen, or was it another podcast we referenced, I think, a study where um, vegans and veg vegetarians have a, a higher rate of depression yep. uh, and suicide. So, I mean, it, it comes, it all comes back to this food, isn't it? So it's not just yep. these sweet treats. It comes back down to even the foods that we believe are highly nutrient dense in regards to, to fruits and vegetables, animal proteins. And I, and I think you guys will agree are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. And this is what's missing, yep. you know, predominantly from, you know, from, from a healthy diet. From uh, the that's my kind of point of view. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, certainly the people that, that we see when we, so we, we sometimes do weekends where actually with people and we've obviously done all the catering and we're watching people, you know, choose, choose what to eat and um they they so so often um you know don't choose enough protein they don't prioritize pro prioritize protein oh yeah see that's a lovely comment yeah that's why that's why you want carbs yeah because you your brain feels like you're searching for something aren't you you just kind of feel flat you want you want to boost and um of course the other side of um of treating this is not just that you focus on the right foods to eat that's the foundation you know people should eat yeah high quality proteins and fats as, as a basis if they want to add in a bit of this and that then you know that that's fine as well um but it's not just about it's not just about that it has to be about how how in your life in your modern life are you going to get your dopamine serotonin oxytocin and endorphins in um in a good way, in a way that isn't going to cause problems like getting it from ultra processed food or smoking or alcohol or binge watching Netflix or, you know, whatever it is, how how in your life you're going to kind of. David and I like to think of it like going back, like if you were in the tribe back in the day, what would you have been doing, you know, to to to, to feel good, like, you know, natural things like singing gardening walking um i mean there's, there's so many different hobbies that people could have that would help them and these are the sorts of things that we've given up in modern life because we're you know we're too busy at work or you know we are too tired or you know whatever it is and we need to you know really make these things habits throughout the day to to balance the, the brain chemistry and to keep us feeling good so that we're not falling back into feeling bad feeling stressed feeling tired you know sleep so important because all of those things will trigger us back into the these food problems or or other behavioral problems that are, that are bad for our health so it, it's really important to to work on those daily, daily habits that that keep you keep your brain well led direct yeah. sunlight is really important sunlight um for serotonin, I think the last lady was talking about serotonin and, mel and melatonin. We need to get outside. We need to walk. You know, we need to plug our dogs, <laughs> talk, talk to the family. There's all kinds of things that we can do to kind of feel better that, that aren't going to be about relying on food. Yeah, Bad fantastic. Food. Love that. Love that. <laughs> David, pa pass it over to you um, really quickly. I mean, uh, obviously, um, expert in insulin resistance and inflammation. So we, we've covered uh, the psychological effects out of, of food addiction. Um, and again, I mean, Jen, I don't think that gets anywhere near the airtime that it should. Um, you know, this is a massive thing that we should be plugging and pushing a lot more. This, this, you know, this is a massive addiction. But coming from the other side now, David, when we're consuming these foods, we're suffering with insulin resistance. 
uh, and inflammation. How can you explain to the listeners how this is damaging to the body uh, and what we can do to, to repair this? Yeah. Yeah. I think the first thing, remember, the whole thing is that a high blood sugar damages the lining of your arteries in hours. We've got a non-stick lining of the arteries to your brain and your eyes and your kidneys. And that is called the glycocalyx. And only a few hours of a high blood sugar damages the glycocalyx. And then against that, let's think about insulin and what it's there for. It's there to protect you and me uh, from a high blood sugar. So insulin re reacts quickly to get out of your stream where it could do damage. And it actually, it's a good question is where does the sugar go? And I'm often asking patients, where do you think that sugar goes? And it actually gets turned into fat inside the cells. So some of the sugar is used up obviously for running around, but we us consume more carbohydrates than we need to run around. And the extra sugar is turned into fat inside your cells gives you a bigger tummy which Richard it sounds as if you had a bigger tummy at one point uh, but more importantly the um, the fat increases in your liver and this is really important this is the work of Professor Roy Taylor from Newcastle University where you continue to eat breakfast cereals rice potatoes biscuits and your liver is filling with fat and unfortunately, the fat in the liver interferes with the work of insulin so that uh, you become less sensitive. So your insulin doesn't work as well. And that means uh, that you're less able to deal with blood sugars. So for a while, you're only if, if your insulin doesn't work as well, you are forced to produce more insulin. You become hyperinsulinemic. You produce more insulin. But unfortunately, there's a double whammy here because the pancreas, the gland that produces insulin, is also filling with fat. So your ability to produce more insulin is compromised. And this is absolutely at the heart of how millions of people become uh, type 2 diabetic. Uh, so the Two problems, one is your insulin doesn't work as well. And the other is producing insulin is a problem. So that uh, after a while, you actually have type two diabetes, which means you cannot anymore regulate your blood sugar to within safe levels. And those high blood sugars can damage the lining of your artery, as I told you at the beginning. It's got to a point now, I think it's 38% of the entire uh, of the developed world have fatty liver. So that's more than one in three of everybody we know. And I know in the practice, um, the number of people with abnormal liver function and fatty liver, it, there are thousands and thousands of patients and they're getting younger and younger. So one of the main effects of too much carbohydrate in your diet is that that all has to go somewhere and uh, it becomes fat in your belly. It also uh, becomes fat in your pancreas and uh, can, somebody just point put in the point, yes, there is a connection be between um, hyperinsulinemia and pancreatic cancer. And actually there is a link uh, between hyperinsulinemia and eight cancers. So I have seen um, an increase in certainly colorectal cancer in people who are very heavy. That's definitely happening. And of course, insulin, we, we talk about insulin and glucose, but it does lots of other things. Insulin is a growth factor. And so this would make sense really uh, around cancer and insulin. So if insulin is a growth factor, you need it for puberty to grow, but it's also part of how tumors uh, can grow. 
And I'm afraid it doesn't even stop there. Um, in our early work together, Jen and I were really confused and surprised by the improvements in blood pressure that our patients were showing. And I personally uh, found my blood pressure improved. And it took me two years to find out what is the link between giving up carbs and improving your blood pressure. And this is it, the answer. So we've known since 1932 that a high carb diet is a high insulin diet and insulin causes your kidneys to hoard salt. So high carb is high insulin. Your kidneys don't wee out salt properly and that puts your blood pressure up. And significant improvements in blood pressure for people when they go uh, low carb. I expect most of you notice when you first went low carb, you weed a lot. You're actually weeing out lots of salt and it's why uh, if you go keto particularly, you might need more salt at the beginning of the diet because otherwise you get headaches and keto flu because suddenly you're weeing out uh, salt you've been hoarding for a while. And I, Jen and I both have a lot more uh, salt than we used to. I think I've probably said enough now. It's time, Jen, for something. Yeah, no, fantastic. Love that. I, I, spot on. I mean, high blood pressure is an insulin-dependent state. Um, in states yes. of elevated insulin, insulin will pull sodium from four points in the nephrons in the kidneys back into the blood, wherever sodium goes, yes. water follows. This is why we get high blood pressure. Um, uh, a lot of research into the ren renin angiotensin aldosterone system uh, you know, reveals yes. several mechanisms in, in regards to why we retain um, uh, you know, elevated uh, sodium levels, but we shouldn't fear sodium. It's not the source of, of high blood pressure. No. And unfortunately, it's something else that's been demonized within society. Sodium yes. is in fact essential for life. We cannot live without it. Um, there's a study that I yes. referenced in one of the talks that shows when we go below 1500 milligrams of sodium per day, uh, all cause mortality increases massively. So sodium is, is another thing that's been demonized within society. Uh, and it's another thing that we shouldn't be feeling. We should be consuming lots yeah. of sodium, particularly from natural sources like pink Himalayan and yes. Celtic sea. So it's a, a fantastic point there on, on, on blood pressure. Uh, and again, yeah. coming back I, to, I to often, the insulin. No, no, go on. I often By say way, that, well, it's just a point of true causes of illness that I made at the very beginning. That again, for 25 years, I'm just giving out drugs for high blood pressure without thinking why do they have high blood pressure. And this demonization of salt is unfortunate. Salt is dangerous in a high carb environment. So it's true. Carbs and salt together um, give you problems. And of course, just as Jen was talking about, how were we designed? We weren't designed. Uh, to do in a high carb environment because that didn't exist uh, yeah. for okay, so this is a very situation find out and by saying we we're just blaming the wrong crystals we're always blaming salt for what the sugar did yeah, yeah. yeah. Agree. can i answer shall i answer about uh, so rose says um, how do you feel about being abstinent from sugar and flour? Carbs, is it necessary and is it possible? So it's definitely possible. So there's absolutely no need for us to ingest any carbohydrate because your liver is just going to make the right amount that, that you need of glucose, the, the little bit that your brain needs and there's one or two other needs that we have is about a teaspoon of sugar in your entire bloodstream at any one time. So you can see that if you eat a banana that has about five teaspoons of sugar, you, you've already got too much sugar and people think things like bananas are incredibly healthy and necessary if you go to the gym. Well, um, as you can see that Rich <laughs> has done very well going to the gym without any carbohydrate. And I do my little old lady boot camp four or five times a week and I, I seem to do okay um, without without any carbohydrates at all. Now, whether it's necessary is, is more of a kind of individual question. I'd say it's, it's probably a good idea. I don't know why any, uh, it's probably a good idea to give up sugar if you, if you can, 
Um, that's it's a, basically a poison, so it's never never going to do much for you. Um, in terms of how low you have to go in terms of carbohydrate, depends on your goals and also your reaction. So, you know, if you're type 2 diabetic, it's a good idea to, to go low. But obviously, if you're on medication, check that out first because we don't want people uh, falling over with low blood pressure or low blood sugars if you're on particular kinds of medication. Um, but from an, an addiction point of view, again, it's really individual the foods that people have to give up and it depends which foods to you are a little bit like drugs so for many of us with food addiction we end up giving up all all carbohydrate type foods apart from maybe some you know gr green veg and, and stuff like that other people who perhaps aren't quite as far along the journey or who who maybe the metabolism and they're you know they've not they've not got so far they're not so so damaged they can sometimes cope with a little bit of sweet potato or you know maybe some some you know some some things like that um but but a lot of us find that we just feel better cutting out um all sugars and, and carbohydrates so it's a bit of a long-winded question but it's kind of an individual thing and it depends what your personal problems are really um how how far you want to go and and see see how you feel um does the liver make sugar in type 1 diabetes um yes i think the answer to that is yes it would ha would have to wouldn't it david because you yeah you need yes. it your brain needs a certain amount so that's part of the problem for them is they make sugar but they can't deal with it because they haven't got any insulin so they have to they have to inject a certain amount of insulin to deal with the the sugar that the liver's making although i'm i'm kind of answering i'm answering david's questions here <laughs> <laughs> love it love it just, just to add on to the back end of that as well i mean coming back to the insulin resistance um you know we all know someone who has actively tried to abstain from eating um or at least tells us that they're doing so and they don't lose any weight and we think that they are up in the middle of the night stuffing their face with pies and pasties when in fact they may be telling the truth because this weight loss is controlled by the endocrine system it's not uh, calories in versus calories out and it comes down to predominantly insulin uh, and insulin's role within the body coming back to this insulin resistance um that while insulin is elevated insulin upregulates uh lipoprotein like biz uh which singular signals the body to store fat isn't it um and while insulin is elevated it's biologically impossible for us to burn that fat for fuel we need another enzyme called hormone sensitive like biz to break those bonds on the glycerol backbone to put those fatty acids back into the bloodstream now the issue with someone who is highly insulin resistant is insulin is elevated for, for such a long time they may go hours and hours and hours without eating but insulin is still elevated they are not burning any fat for that entire time so someone coming from a state of high insulin resistance is going to take a little bit longer uh, to reverse that that's why it's critically important to go uh, low carbohydrate um and you know Everybody is individual. So if you're coming from that state of severe insulin resistance, it may take a little bit longer. Um, but this isn't a diet, is it? You know, we're not uh, teaching about this is a lifestyle. This is about eating real foods that are having low impact uh, on, on insulin response, uh, keeping that insulin low, keeping um, uh, the glucagon to insulin ratio low. So we, we're able to, to utilize that fat for fuel. But that's an important fact, I think, with the curve of that insulin resistance, because Insulin resistance, um, you know, we we associate that with type 2 diabetes, um, but type 2 diabetes, so if you to go to be tested with yourselves uh, in regards to type 2 diabetes, um, a person may come back as not being type 2 diabetic because you're testing blood glucose and not insulin, isn't it? So um, the reality is that insulin may be increased behind the scenes and you are in fact insulin resistance because the point that you were diagnosed with diabetes began 10 to 15 years prior to that so if you have been tested for diabetes through um you know glucose uh, a glucose test then it's, it's probable that you are insulin resistant and a way to tell is central adiposity skin tags skin irritations and i think that most of us on the high street are highly insulin resistant and and uh, you know this is why we need to, to actively look at carbohydrates foods that are listening this insulin response and foods that are high in lectins as well also, because I think lectins, um, they they tend to get uh, uh, 
They don't get the airtime they deserve, but lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins which bind to insulin receptors and signal the body to store five times more fat than insulin does itself. And, the, and then we've got seed oils, which are high in oxidized omega-6 linoleic acid, which causes insulin resistance, I believe, around 6% higher than carbohydrates or the effect of insulin does. So there's all of these contributing factors. Uh, I've thrown a lot at you there. Do, do either one of you want to jump in and, uh, and add or, or, or yes. add anything like I said? Well, I just wanted to say, Rose, oh, I, mean, I think... Um, a little bit about <laughs> hunger. Oh. Go on, then. <laughs> yeah, I'll go first, then, and then... Okay. You, there's, a, there's a delay, so it's a bit difficult. I wanted to talk hunger uh, in the context of what you were saying, really. So I'd, I'd summarise it. We are actually a dual fuel engine. So it's genius. We can burn fat, or we can burn glucose. Problem... Uh, the sting in the tail for insulin is because of insulin's um, priority to deal with sugar, it prevents you from being able to burn fat. So in a carby environment with insulin uh, resistance, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to burn your fat. And this explains why somebody might be very overweight, but they're genuinely hungry. So they are genuinely hungry. And hunger actually is the problem. People eat because they they might be addicted, but they're hungry. They say they're hungry, and they are. Yeah. And this is just a, a point that might interest some people. So, if you get your insulin down low enough, then after an adaptation period, which can take up to two weeks, you start burning the fat. And then again, in every clinic that I do, people tell me they're suddenly surprised not to be hungry. And they're saying things like, do I have to eat breakfast? Because I just don't feel I have to. And I'm saying, hooray, no, you're burning fat. No, you've got fat to burn. And that's what you're about. And I think, uh, I know myself, if I'm feeling really hungry, I've usually, something's wrong somewhere in my system if I'm, um, I'm really hungry. So I just wanted to underline what you said around the dual fuel engine and around hunger, and uh, we're talking about keto, and keto is really, that's when you're burning fat and you tend to be less hungry. So I'll shut up now, and it's Jen's turn. <laughs> no, but I was just going to go back. Rose, yeah, Rose was saying it's so hard, isn't it? I've really, really sympathised, Rose. It is, it, is, it is really hard for those of us who uh, have got this... Yeah, you know this real struggle and probably I don't know like me you've probably had it since you were born I can't remember a time when I didn't you know just love sugary carbohydrate -y stuff um and was kind of thinking about it a lot of the time and, you know some of us are, are, are kind of really really born with that so it, it is really hard um and you've got a support group so that's superb that's great yeah just keep trying don't don't be dieting don't be sort of thinking that it's about restricting what you eat have plenty of your protein and your good fats eat eat on a re eat on a regular basis don't be trying to sort of think of it like a like a diet that's that's my main advice and then also work on this other stuff in life that's you know going to going to give you that feel good factor that's that's not to do with food those of us that are food addicts just get obsessed with food and it's all we think about and we need to force ourselves to exercise and do other things and have other hobbies and um uh you know get get all of that going in life so i'm just really sympathizing with anyone on here who who's uh who's struggling with the with the food addiction and um you know we're going to be setting up some groups and support groups as well through the phc so maybe you can join us as well you can never have too many support groups that's brilliant. I think we'll put a link to the public health collaboration in the description on YouTube. And then when we put the clips out from this as well, we do exactly the same thing. Um, we're going to have to wrap up this section because StreamYard can't do 24 hours in a row. So we're going to have to say goodbye to Dr. David Unwin and Dr. Jen Unwin and then spend about five minutes telling people how to follow us for the next uh, <laughs> next 10 hours. <laughs> so, Great. Wow. 
this is the end of this section. But I've learned so much. I, I love listening to you both. I think you're sort of like a yin and yang. It's quite nice to <laughs> to see your different approaches. It's it's excellent. Um, I Richard, think, do you uh, want to I, wrap up because you. Yeah, I, look, I, I, thank you both so much for coming on. I don't think the time that we've had is is anywhere near long enough. Um, I I'd love to do this again with both of you. Uh, maybe we could do a joint thing, Stephen. Maybe you know for for another podcast, but. There's lots of information to put out there. I think we've only just scratched the surface, but thank you both so much for taking the time on a Sunday, especially as you're celebrating a wedding anniversary, I believe you said it was. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you both so much. Um, I, Steve, can we pop the links when we post this? Uh, obviously, this is live, but we're going to post this moving forward. We can pop links to, to their... their, their uh, yeah, what, uh, what's going ha to happen is, is, is YouTube will have 10 hours, uh, which I am going to edit down to, to hours. Um, but there will be one version of this, which will be 10 hours. Um, so just give me a couple of weeks <laughs> to edit it all down. And I'm, I, it will take a bit of time, but it will be worth doing it. And you'll have all the links. And then I'll try and do some clips of, you know, like, you know the main points if I can. But it's going to be a bit of a task. <laughs> but anyway, I want to thank you just for turning up. But it, it, it'll all be out there soon. By the end of July, hopefully, it'll all be there things included yeah fantastic thank you both massively appreciate appreciate it thank you both so much hope you've enjoyed um yeah it's been fun but uh thank you guys take care and we'll speak to you soon bye bye, bye, yeah, bye. thank you both now fantastic. okay so we're nine Four hours minutes. 55 i have to put some links for everybody um just bear with me i don't want to um get this wrong so what's going to happen with it basically with the live stream Streamyard could not um do 24 hours in a row so if you want to carry on watching uh you're going to have to go for to a different youtube let me just come back to where we are uh i'll post it in the comments that's where you would go to watch the next the next well, it's going to be seven hours, actually, because I split it ten uh, hours, and then we're going to do seven, and then we're going to do seven. So, so StreamYard couldn't do 24 hours. I'm not knocking StreamYard, by the way. Um, the difference in price was incredible. For those that want to know what goes on behind the scenes, I pay £25 a month of you StreamYard, and I can record 50 hours. But you can't record 24 hours in a row. If I wanted 24 hours in a row, that £25 a month goes up to five grand. Uh, so we just had to split it into three, which I'm sure you'll understand. So there's 208 people currently watching. Hopefully you'll flip over to um, watch the next seven hours. And we should have Sean Baker starting us off. We've got Kevin Stock. We've got Judy Cho. We've got some really great guests um, if you're watching on the playback, exactly the same thing on my channel, on Rich's channel, uh, you'll be able to watch the playbacks in that full entirety if, if YouTube are up to it of 10 hours or seven hours. And then I will be editing this down. So the link is in the chat. Um, it will be on my uh, Coach Stephen Bachelor of Science YouTube channel and on Keto Pro's YouTube channel as well. We're going to hop over to there. Uh, I put it in the chat, the link. Uh, I just did it. Let's do it again. Yeah. I think there's uh, – uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, I did it. I did do it, I promise. Yeah. Um, it, it, but, it, it shot up the screen. It shot up the screen with the extra comments. Yeah, there's a lot of messages. So, yeah. Cammy, the link is, I promise you. You can also go to my Instagram, UK Carnivore, uh, and use the link in my bio, which will take you to the second part. But – it, it's definitely there, I promise you. We don't want to miss you, Cammy. Uh, so, right. Okay, Rich, I'm going to go now. Do you want to yeah. say, do you want to keep people going to the, the, the bang on 10? And I'll set up the new, uh, I'll set up the new thing. I'm going to put it in comments again. People say no link here. It's definitely there. It's, really <laughs> the comments. it's there. But you yeah. can find us on our YouTube channel, I promise you. Um so let's see how it goes. I'm going to go out and log into the other one. And don't forget to send me the link to sign in too. <laughs> have you, oh, you haven't lost that, have you? Yeah. Well, it'll be the different link, or is it the same link that you All sent right. me prior? Uh, yeah. No, I'll, I'll send you a new link to enter you into the studio. 
Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Awesome. So while you're doing that, is there, uh, and I'm guessing this is going to cut off in about one and a half minutes, but are there any questions there that um, uh, that any of you guys want, uh, want well, to, to look at? Well, there are the name ones? of the channel. My channel you can find as uh, Stephen Thomas, Bachelor of Science, or Coach Stephen, or the UK Carnivore on YouTube. You will find the next, you will find the next thing. I promise you. Uh, it's in my <laughs> playlist of lives. And everyone's saying no link here, and I have put it in the comments quite a few times. I don't know why it's not showing up. But... It is showing up. It's uh, it's being there. We are. Let's repost it again. It's uh, the comments keep pushing it uh, out the screen. I think. Um, there yeah, we are. I've just posted it. Again. You've done it. Yep, that's it. Right. Okay, I'm going to go. And uh, actually, you're going to have to come out as well, Rich. And I'll send you okay. the link, and I'll go straight uh, into the other. There we are. Brilliant. Right. I, we'll see you all in two minutes. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye.